Chapter twenty seven of Scott's Official History of the American Negro in the World War by Emmett J. Scott. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. Chapter twenty seven Negro Women in War Work by Alice Dunbar Nelson. When the World War began, even before the United States had entered the conflict, the women of this country were thrilled as women have ever been since wars began, with the desire to serve. As if in anticipation of the days soon to come when their own men would be sent forth to battle, they began to sew and knit and plan relief work for the men of other nations. It was but an earnest of the days to come when every nerve of the nation would be strained to care for its own men. When, after that day in April, 1917, so filled with direful possibilities for the nation, the women realized that they were indeed to be called upon to give up their all, there was but one desire in the hearts of all the women of the country, to do their utmost for the men who were about to go forth to battle for an ideal. Overnight careless idlers were transformed into busy workers, social butterflies into earnest grubs, thoughtless girls into poised women, card clubs into knitting circles, aspirants to social honors into workers whose sole ambition was to be a definite factor in helpful service. Where there had been petty bickering, there was now a realization that this was no time for the small things of life. The one common sorrow of loss of the men dearest to them of seeing their sons, brothers, fathers, and husbands in the great conflict, welded together the women of the nation, and purged the dross of littleness from their souls by the fire of service. One thing which served to strengthen and intensify the feeling of responsibility and seriousness of the women of the country was the fact that for the first time in the history of the world, a nation at war recognized its women as a definite asset in the conduct of the war. Hitherto her place had been that of those in the poem, For men must work and women must weep. Hers was the task of sending her men forth to return with their shields or upon them, while she remained at home to weep and perhaps make bandages against the return of her wounded men. As a factor in the war she was nil, save in those isolated and abortive cases in history where she became an Amazon or a Molly Pitcher but in April 1917 all this was changed. The nation called upon its women to do definite and constructive work, far-reaching and real. It called them not only to nurse the wounded, but to conserve the health of those at home, not only to give aid and comfort to the fighting men, but to preserve the health and morals of the women whom they must meet, love, and marry, not only to make bandages for the stricken soldiers, but to provide ambulances, and even drive them, not only to give love and tears, but money which they raised from every legitimate source, not only to cheer the men as they marched to the front, but to keep up the morale of those left at home, and to fan into a flame the sparks of patriotism in the breasts of those whom the country denied the privilege of bearing arms. With one stroke the government organized every woman of the nation into an inclusive body and mobilized the formerly overlooked greatest asset of the nation. Into this maelstrom of war activity the women of the Negro race hurled themselves joyously. They asked no odds, remembered no grudges, solicited no favors, pleaded for no privileges. They came by the thousands, hands opened wide to give of love and service and patriotism. It was enough for them that their country was at war. It was enough for them that there was work to do. Centuries of labor had taught them the love of labor. A heritage of service had taught them the beauty of giving of themselves, and a race record of patriotism and loyalty had imbued them inherently with the flaming desire to do their part in the struggle of their native land. The problem of the woman of the Negro race was a peculiar one. Was she to do her work independently of the women of the other race, or was she to merge herself into their organizations? There were separate regiments for Negro soldiers. Should there be separate organizations for relief work among Negro women? If she joined relief organizations, such as the Red Cross Society, and worked with them, 
would she be assured that her handiwork would reach black hands on the other side of the world, or should she be great-hearted and give her service simply for the sake of giving, not caring who would be benefited? Could she be sure that when she offered her services she would be understood as desiring to be a help and not wishing to be an associate? As is usually the case when any problem presents itself to the nation at large, the negro faces a double problem should he essay a solution, the great issue and the lesser problem of racial adjustment to that issue. However, the women of the race cut the Gordian knot with magnificent simplicity. They offered their services and gave them freely, in whatsoever form was most pleasing to the local organizations of white women. They accepted without a murmur the place assigned to them in the ranks. They placed the national need before the local prejudice. They put great-heartedness and pure patriotism above the ancient creed of racial antagonism. For pure, unalloyed unselfishness of the highest order, the conduct of the Negro women of the United States during the World War stands out in splendid relief a lesson to the entire world of what womanhood of the best type really means. Colored Women and the Red Cross At the very beginning of the war, the first organization to which women of the country naturally turned was the Red Cross Society. It was to be expected that the colored woman, preeminently the best nurse in the world, would necessarily turn to the Red Cross Society as a field in which to exercise her peculiar gifts. Red Cross branches were organized in practically every community in the country. Yet it is extremely difficult to tell just what the contribution of the colored woman has been to this organization. We are told that the American Red Cross during the war enlisted workers without regard to creed or color, and no separate records were maintained of the work of any particular auxiliary. We know that some eight million women worked for the Red Cross in one way or another during the war, but we have no figures indicating how many of them were colored. In the northern cities, the colored women merged their identity in the Red Cross work with the white women, that is, in some northern cities. In others, and in the south, they formed independent units, auxiliaries to the local branches presided over by the women of the other race. These auxiliaries sent hundreds of thousands of knitted garments to the front, maintained restaurants, did canteen service where they could, sent men from the local draft boards to the camps with comfort kits, in short, did all that could be done, all that they were allowed to do. But the story of the colored woman and the Red Cross is not altogether a pleasant one. Unfortunately, her activities in this direction were considerably curtailed in many localities. There were whole sections of the country in which she was denied the privilege of doing canteen service, there were other sections in which canteen service was so managed as to be canteen service in name only. Local conditions, racial antipathies, ancient prejudices militated sadly against her usefulness in this work. To the everlasting and eternal credit of the colored woman be it said that, in spite of what might have been absolute deterrence, she persisted in her service and was not downcast in the face of difficulties. The best part of the whole situation lies in the fact that in the local organizations of the Red Cross, the Negro woman was the beneficiary. The home nursing classes and the classes in dietetics not only served to strengthen the morale of the women engaged therein, but raised the tone of every community in which they were organized. This was shown during the influenza epidemic of 1918, when a panic-stricken nation called upon its volunteer nurses of every race and color, and the women of the Red Cross were ready in response and in training. Theodore Roosevelt has said, All of us who give service and stand ready for sacrifice are the torch-bearers. We run with the torches until we fall, content if we can pass them to the hands of other runners. If that be the case, the gray chapter of the colored nurses in overseas service is a golden one. Early in 1918, the government issued a call for nurses. The need was great overseas. It was greater at home. Colored women, since the inception of the war, had felt keenly their exclusion from overseas service. The need for them was acute. Their willingness to go was complete. The only thing that was wanted was authoritative sanction. In June 1918, it was officially announced that the Secretary of War had authorized the calling of colored nurses in the National Service. It was an act that did more complete justice to our people in enfranchising our women for this noble service than any other of the war. All colored nurses who had been registered by the American Red Cross Society 
were thus given the right to render service to their own race in the army colored nurses were assigned to the base hospitals at camp fuston kansas camp grant rockford illinois camp dodge des moines iowa camp taylor louisville kentucky camp sherman chillicothe ohio and camp dix wrightstown new jersey at these camps a total of about thirty eight thousand colored troops were located the service of colored nurses colored people throughout the country felt deep satisfaction over this authorization of the enrollment of colored nurses at the base hospitals and camps hundreds of competent colored nurses had registered their names for many months with the nursing division of the american red cross in the hopes of finally securing positions where their skill and experience could be utilized to proper advantage these last were particularly gratified over the happy turn of affairs at the convention of the national association of colored graduate nurses held in st louis missouri a formal message of appreciation was sent to the war department the american red cross society and other agencies that had been instrumental in pushing their claims mrs ada b thomas r n president of the national association of graduate nurses attached to the staff of the lincoln hospital and home in new york city gave a typical expression of the sentiment of the colored nurses and the colored people generally with reference to the admission of colored women to this branch of service she was the first to offer herself for overseas service indianapolis indiana sent a contingent for active service at once elizabeth miller of Meharry medical college nashville tennessee answered the government call and was assigned to duty at a nitrate plant in alabama these were but sporadic instances indicating the instant response to the long-waited call to service unfortunately before any considerable change in existing circumstances surrounding this branch of service could be made the armistice was signed and history will never know what the colored woman might have done on the battlefields of france as a red cross nurse rumor more or less authentic states that over three hundred colored nurses were on the battlefields though their complexion disguised their racial identity young women's christian association of the remedial agencies at work for the relief of humanity and the shouldering of responsibility for the health morals and happiness of those also working for the relief of humanity the young women's christian association in its operation among the colored girls women and men stands out preeminently the reason for this is not hard to seek the qualities of personality in the leader of this work among colored women miss eva d bowles at the time the country faced the possibility of war the national board of the young women's christian association was confronted with the great responsibility of helping to safeguard the moral life of women and girls as affected by war conditions request came from the united states war department commission on training camp activities and from the young men's christian association for women workers to undertake work among girls in communities adjacent to army and navy training camps hence the formation of the war work council it was organized in june 1917 with a membership of 100 its function to help meet the special needs of girls and young women in all countries affected by the war allied with this was the junior war work council and the patriotic league the extension of these activities among colored girls and women was simultaneous and one of the brightest chapters in the story of women in the war is the one which records how this work measured up to the responsibilities laid upon it the war work council and the young women's christian association recognizing the loyalty and the need of the colored women and girls of the country devoted four hundred thousand dollars of its nineteen eighteen budget to the work among the colored girls when it was organized there was one colored national secretary and sixteen associations or communities with nine paid workers the great demand for a better morale among the girls of the country soon raised that number to twelve national workers three field supervisors and forty-two centers with sixty-three paid workers there were opened up in the various camps fifteen hostess houses with complete staffs of colored women these houses served a splendid purpose when the war department planned the great training camps it may not have remembered the women of the country in the stress of making up the army of men or it may have thought that if it said there were to be no women in the camps there would be none but every woman knows that as long as there is a path to the camps that path the women will follow be it on foot by boat in cars trains trolleys motor-cars or on horseback and if there be no trail the women will blaze one they must see if their men are ill or living and how they are living 
If they are ill, they must get to them. If homesick, they must cheer them. If they are leaving for overseas, they must say goodbye to them. And if there are none of their own, they must be charitable enough to extend their good will to the lonely and heart-hungry of others. Hence the birth of the hostess house idea. A bit of home in the camps, a place of rest and refreshment for the women folks belonging to the soldiers, a sheltering chaperonage for the too enthusiastic girl, a dainty supplement to the stern face of the camp life of the soldiers, an information bureau for women and soldiers alike, a clearing-house for the social activities which included the men in the camps and their women visitors. As the colored troops came into the camps in large numbers, there was an urgent appeal to meet the needs of their women. The first house to be opened was at Camp Upton, when the Buffaloes, 367th, were being made into the crack regiment that it afterward became. Mrs. Hannah C. Smith, the pioneer among the hostess house leaders, going there to take charge in the early part of November 1917. Only great enthusiasm and faith in the value of the work to be done could have brought about the results which Mrs. Smith achieved at Camp Upton at this time. The temporary headquarters for the hostess house were in a barracks with few conveniences and almost no possibilities. Mrs. Smith, with her co-worker, Mrs. Norcombe, soon made the place as homelike as possible. This was the beginning of the hostess house work for colored women. In no very great while, hostess houses in seven of the large camps were in operation and others soon followed. In some camps, where there was a definite surety, work was begun in the barracks. From many southern camps came the request for the immediate erection of houses on an insufficient plan, but those plans were rejected. Finally, in the natural progress that came, the houses were erected, and used the same as other hostess houses. The relationship of the staff to the whole staff of the camp developed into an ideal, and all groups working under the general tutelage of the Young Women's Christian Association understood each other and had a better appreciation of mutual problems by working together. The YWCA and War Industries As the war progressed, our colored girls were taken into almost every phase of the industrial field. It was then recognized early in the work that the success of the movement depended largely upon the correct interpretation of the colored girl to her employer and her white co-worker, and of a fair, just attitude of the white worker toward the colored girl. The war opened up many avenues of employment and service to the colored girls that had not hitherto been her privilege to accept, principally in the industrial field, and with the opening up of these new lines of work, new problems were developed. Consequently, there came a demand for women to go into localities where factories were located, to make investigations as to working conditions, housing and recreational facilities, to create a better understanding between the employer and employee, and to assist in the opening up of new opportunities for work. As a result of this, an industrial worker was placed at such vital points as Detroit, St. Louis, Louisville, East St. Louis, Nitro, West Virginia, Penniman, Virginia, and Philadelphia. With one appointed for Baltimore and an acute situation in Washington cared for, not only was there need for the care and protection of the girl in the factory, but equally as much so for those in more social communities. This led to the development of club and recreational centers, especially in cities near which camps were located. Today these centers reach from New York to Los Angeles, California, and from St. Paul, Minnesota to San Antonio, Texas. These clubs and recreational centers are also an important feature in industrial communities. Splendid Colored Women Workers Not only in groups, but as individuals, the women felt the call of this great and important work and responded from every walk of life. There were many offers of volunteer service, and Miss Mary Cromwell of Washington, D.C., was one of those to offer. She spent the summer at Camp Dix as a volunteer information and emergency hostess and completed her two months of observation and service feeling that there was an imperative need for the workers to be able to differentiate between types of people and to deal with each type scientifically as well as sympathetically, to know enough about such things as home service, war risk insurance, protective agencies, and allotments to answer any question that might be asked. Miss Cromwell was well fitted both by training and experience for her work. As an undergraduate at Ann Arbor, she spent her summers in New York doing special investigations for the Charity Organization Society. After graduating, she became a teacher in the Dunbar High School of Washington 
and there she became interested in the Washington alleys, and opened a settlement in one of the most congested districts. Later, she received her master's degree from the University of Pennsylvania for special research work in psychology. The arduous task of directing the work of the industrial section of the War Work Council was given over to Miss Mary E. Jackson, a special industrial worker among colored women for the War Work Council. She was appointed in December 1917. Prior to that time, Miss Jackson did statistical work in the Labor Department of the State of Rhode Island. Associated with Miss Bowles in this War Work Council of colored women as heads of departments, in addition to Miss Mary E. Jackson, were Miss Crystal Bird, girls' worker, Miss Vivian W. Stokes, who at one time was associated with the National Urban League and assisted in making a survey of New York City in connection with the Urban League of New York. Mrs. Stokes' work in connection with the room registry work has already been mentioned. Mrs. Lucy B. Richmond, special worker for town and country, Miss Mabel S. Brady, recruiting secretary in the Personnel Bureau, Miss Juliet Derricott, special student worker, Mrs. Cordelia A. Wynne, former teacher in the public schools of Columbus, Ohio, Mrs. Ethel J. Kindle, special office worker. Miss Josephine B. Pinion was appointed a special war worker in August 1917. She is a graduate of Cornell University, a former teacher, and a student YWCA secretary from 1912 to 1916. The field workers were Mrs. Adele Ruffin, South Atlantic Field, appointed in October 1917. Mrs. Ruffin was a teacher for some years at Kittrell College, and then secretary of the YWCA branch at Richmond, Virginia. Miss May Belcher had charge of the South Central Field, and Miss Maria L. Wilder of the Southwestern Field. Miss Elizabeth Carter was loaned to the association work by the Board of Education of New Bedford, Massachusetts, where she is the only colored teacher in the city. She is chairman of the Northeastern Federation of Colored Women's Clubs and former president of the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs. She was placed in charge of the center in Washington, D.C. Aside from these, there was a small army of club and recreation workers, hostess house workers, industrial workers, and supervisors. Throughout the trying ordeal of directing the work of these assistants, and meeting the huge problems presented to the council, Miss Bowles remained perhaps the most effective and achieving, and at the same time noiseless worker among the colored women in this country. Women's Division, Council of National Defense the Council of National Defense made the best organized attempt at mobilizing the colored women of all the war organizations. In most northern states it was felt that separate organizations were superfluous, yet, on the other hand, in many cases it was agreed that the work could best be served by distinct units. There were many ramifications to the work of the Council of Defense, registration of women, the weighing and measuring of babies, the establishment of milk stations, health and recreation centers. Supervision of Women in Industry correlation with other war organizations. Different states excelled in different phases of the work. In the establishment of child welfare and the conservation of infancy, Alabama seems to be the banner state, the best work emanating from Tuskegee, where the examination of infants was under the care of Mrs. J. W. Whitaker. At Birmingham, Alabama, Mrs. H. C. Davenport had charge of the activities of the council, and was particularly successful in the establishment of community houses at two great industrial centers, Asipco and Bessemer. In the first community, where the managers of the plant had established a model village with community house and all forms of community life, the entire program of the Council of Defense was carried through. Conservation of children, attention to health and recreation, with a very strong emphasis on food conservation. In the latter instance, a community house was established in the heart of the village of Bessemer concentrated on child welfare, food conservation, and war gardens. Service in Various States Two women in Florida stand out as doing yeoman service under the work of the Women's Committee of the Council of Defense. Mrs. Mary McLeod Bethune, who at Daytona, where her splendid school is situated, pushed forward the work of the Emergency Circle, Negro War Relief, and Miss Eartha White, the State Chairman of the Colored Women's Section of the Council of Defense. Under her direction, Florida was organized into excellent working units, with a particular concentration on a mutual protection league for working girls who had taken up the unfamiliar work of elevator girls, bell girls in hotels, and chauffeurs. From this it was not far to a union of girls in domestic service, 
a by-product of war conditions that might well be continued in every city and hamlet in the country. In Colorado, the women formed themselves into a Negro Women's Auxiliary War Council, a Negro Women's League for Service, and a Red Cross Auxiliary, all apparently working under the general management of the Council of Defense. In Georgia, the president of the Georgia State Federation of Colored Women's Clubs, Mrs. Alice Duggett Carey of Atlanta, reported organizations in Tallapoosa County, a community canning center in Bremen, Coweta and Cobb counties, with other organizations in every important city. The Illinois women, organized into a committee on colored women, worked in cooperation with the Urban League for training of Negro women. Delaware did not have a separate organization of the Council of Defense, but the race was represented on the state committee, and through them the work was carried on. Mrs. Blanche W. Stubbs, president of the City Federation of Christian Workers, represented the women, and through her efforts the usual classes in food conservation were established at the Thomas Garrett Settlement, while a baby weighing station was established and a public nurse appointed. The work in Indiana was carried on by a separate division, largely directed by the state president of colored women's clubs, Mrs. Gertrude B. Hill. Kentucky, with no special women's division, specialized in the protection of girls. The best work done in Louisiana was in the conservation of children through the weighing and measuring of babies, and in the effective registration of the women and the conservation of food. Maryland did some splendid and effective work under the direction of Miss Ida Cummings, the state chairman of the Colored Women's Committee. Practically every phase of the inclusive program mapped out by the Council of Defense was carried through, and a public speaking class at the Bowie Summer School was most successful. Mississippi was organized by Miss Sally Green of Sardis into eleven sections, corresponding with a similar organization among the white women, with good work done in child conservation at Jackson. Mrs. Victoria Clay Haley saw to it that Missouri did effective work. Colored women in North Carolina merged their war activities into one and were most successful in training camp activities, the War Camp Community Service maintaining an interesting work in Charlotte. In Portland, Oregon, the Rosebud Study Club, as was the case with so many clubs, turned its attention to knitting and a practical study of food conservation. In Columbia, South Carolina, the Phyllis Wheatley Club opened a community center to be used as a clearinghouse for war activities, welcoming all war organizations to work within its walls, YWCA, Red Cross, War Camp Community Service, and Council of Defense. In Tennessee, Mrs. Cora Burke of Knoxville had a successful work Registration of nurses was particularly complete. The colored women of Nashville had a tag day to raise funds for their branch council of national defense. Virginia concentrated on food conservation and the children's year with most successful war gardens. A colored woman's volunteer league was organized at Newark, New Jersey, as a branch of the mayor's committee of the women's committee of the council of national defense. Mrs. Amarel Cook, president. This league established a canteen and specialized on making soldiers feel at home. War Problems of Living The problems of living made by the war, which were solved sometimes in whole, sometimes in part, by the Women's Committee of National Defense, were many and various. For instance, there was the shifting of the percentage of women in the rural population, particularly in the South, the same condition which was met in the North in industrial plants. The employment of women in the cotton fields was as great a problem in its way as the mass of girlhood in the northern mills. This employment of the women could not but react upon the child, with the consequent lowering of child vitality and raising of infant mortality. It was this condition which the Council of Defense tried to meet, and to forestall the inevitable problems of reconstruction. Hence the establishment of stations where babies were weighed, measured, tested, and placed under weekly supervision with competent nurses in charge. Perhaps the various units did not always accomplish this end, but it was an ideal worth striving for. THE LURE OF THE KHAKI One of the fundamental problems of the war, no new one but suddenly aggravated by the abnormal atmosphere and excitement accompanying the presence of large numbers of soldiers, was that of the relationship of the young girl and the soldier. What has been called the lure of the khaki is but an expression on the part of the girl of her admiration for the spirit of the men who are willing to give their lives, if need be, in the defense of their country. How to win this feeling into the right channels was one of the problems of the women in the war. It was met by two organizations, the Young Women's Christian Association, of which we have spoken, and the War Camp Community Service. 
it was the duty of the latter organization to recreate home ties for the enlisted men in cities adjacent to training camps it was in providing this home atmosphere that the war camp community service was most successful entertainment was developed for the colored soldiers concessions let for pool rooms picture shows canteens and cafeterias in connection with the work but where the war camp community service was most successful was in the chaperoned dances given at the club rooms here the lure of the khaki might find conventional self-expression the largest of the negro community service clubs were in des moines iowa battle creek michigan louisville kentucky chillicothe ohio charlotte north carolina petersburg and newport news virginia washington d c baltimore maryland atlanta georgia montgomery alabama and columbia south carolina this working together for a common purpose is resulting in building up a new community consciousness among our own people and in turning our thoughts to community projects of a permanent nature early in the war work was started at des moines iowa from that time with the next two centers at chattanooga tennessee there were established in all sixty six centers located in richmond newport news lynchburg norfolk petersburg Penniman, virginia nitro west virginia pittsburgh philadelphia williamsport germantown pennsylvania san antonio houston and fort worth texas st louis and kansas city missouri washington d c winston salem and charlotte north carolina youngstown dayton cincinnati and columbus ohio st paul minnesota orange jersey city burlington and montclair new jersey atlanta and augusta georgia brooklyn and new york city charleston and columbia south carolina detroit michigan indianapolis indiana little rock arkansas louisville kentucky chicago illinois with a special industrial worker at chester pennsylvania in the person of miss sarah fernandez of baltimore an experienced social worker the circle for negro war relief time and time again it was borne in upon the inner consciousness of the women of the race that though the various organizations for war relief were doing all that was humanly possible for the soldiers of both races they were inadequate for all the needs of the negro soldier and his family there were avenues open for more extensive relief there were places as yet untouched by any organization there were programs of direct war relief and constructive relief work which needed to be carried out and some separate organization for this work was an imperative necessity so the circle for negro war relief came into existence in november nineteen seventeen the leading spirit in this movement was mrs emily bigelow hapgood the president and associated around her were the best minds of the country white and colored the circle was incorporated and dedicated itself to the purpose of promoting the welfare of negro soldiers and their dependent families as they might be affected by emergencies of war the success of this circle was immediate and phenomenal within a few months sixty units were formed extending from new york to utah to the far south throughout the east and middle west each unit dedicated itself in its particular locality to the relief of some vital need in either the community or in some nearby camp for instance ambulance unit of new york gave a two thousand dollar ambulance to camp upton unit number twenty nine in st helena south carolina not only did the usual war knitting and letter writing but during the influenza epidemic formed itself into a health committee in cooperation with the red cross it would be difficult to give a complete record of the work of all the units it forms a voluminous mass of interesting and illuminating statistics the activities of the circle ranged from the making of comfort kits to the furnishing of chewing gum to the soldiers from the supplying of victrolas and records to the introduction of theodore roosevelt irving cobb and needham roberts at carnegie hall from the giving of christmas trees in harlem to southern dinners for the homesick boys in augusta georgia from contributions of air cushions from altoona pennsylvania to the issuing of educational pamphlets on the subject of the negro soldier the circle of negro war relief and the crispus attucks circle organized in philadelphia in march nineteen eighteen constituted the nearest approach to a red cross or other organization of this character through which the colored people cooperated during the war the crispus attucks circle did for philadelphia what the circle of negro war relief did for new york its name fitly commemorated the first negro who gave up his life to help make the world safe for democracy the one great project to which it devoted all its energies was the attempted establishment in philadelphia of a base hospital for negro soldiers in which negro physicians and negro nurses should care for their own 
it may be objected and is frequently a source of controversy that separate hospitals are non-essential idle and fallacious reasoning they are needed in some places as schools churches and social organizations are needed a moot question not to be thrashed out here merely a remark in passing that the crispus attic circle saw a need a vital need and aimed to fill it certainly if every individual in the world saw the vital need in his own particular home circle or community and met that need with joyous service there would be no more wars this is what the women of the race have done since april nineteen seventeen as the circle of negro war relief radiated its influence from new york city and the crispus attucks circle concentrated its efforts in philadelphia so all over the united states various independent and private organizations for the relief of the soldier came into being the soldiers comfort unit of the war service center opened headquarters on massachusetts avenue boston it was one of the hundreds of similar organizations made up of women who instinctively got together to work for the great cause and who with a small beginning found themselves a part of a big work with possibilities only limited by the ability to meet them in february nineteen eighteen mrs h c lewis called together a small group of women who in a week's time supplied an urgent need for knitted garments at newport news from this beginning made with a dozen women the unit grew into an organization of a hundred and seventy seven women and eventually connected itself with the circle of negro war relief in the first days the work was almost exclusively for the comfort of the soldiers but before many months had passed the scope of the organization had widened to a place of entertainment for the soldiers visits to hospitals visits to the nearby camp devon's with homemade pies and cakes liberty sings on sunday afternoon lectures on social hygiene and special educational lectures cooperation with company l auxiliary and with the red cross the officers of the soldiers comfort unit were president miss m l baldwin first vice president mrs c h garland second vice president mrs mary e rollins recording secretary mrs george w torby financial secretary mrs william l reed treasurer mrs c henry robbins executive secretary mrs u a ridley executive committee mrs lucy lewis chairman mrs william j williams mrs maud cooney hare mrs william cromwell mrs george b lewis mrs amos mason mrs alice casnow mrs james hilton mrs agnes adams chairman red cross mrs a m gilbert chairman house committee mrs george drummond chairman hospitality committee mrs nellie brown mitchell after a year of work the soldiers comfort unit found itself facing a still larger field the returning soldiers coming from scenes of horror and devastation with problems and needs like all of the war organizations of the women of the race they found their work had only just begun women's auxiliary of the fifteenth regiment in the early days of the old fifteenth new york regiment when colored men were volunteering as members of the military organization which was to become the first new york state guard composed of colored men it occurred to a thoughtful woman of the race a new yorker by birth that earnest colored women banded together could be a potent factor in the life of the regiment the idea was carried out and the women's auxiliary fifteenth regiment was organized may second nineteen seventeen with one hundred members it received its credentials from colonel william hayward may ninth the first definite work undertaken was the investigation of the cases of men whose dependents claimed exemption for them this was an important factor in the perfect recruiting of the regiment and won commendation from the commanding officer and his official staff it is the exclusive privilege of the colored people to adopt the slogan no color line it would seem a strange commentary on the magnanimity of the american people to note that those who are the first to adopt the policy of no discrimination are the ones against whom that discrimination is most often practiced we have noted how in every instance where organizations of colored women have been formed for war relief there is a definite policy of no color line now and then the fact was proclaimed publicly in sign or in motto as in boston and by the josephine gray colored lady knitters of detroit michigan who knitted for all american soldiers regardless of race color or nationality colored women in the loan drives but not only in the definite work of relief in knitting sewing care of dependents of soldiers or in the more spectacular forms of war work were the women engaged the raising of the sinews of war was a problem which the united states faced every man woman and child in the country needed to be taxed to the utmost 
how to make the giving a pleasing privilege rather than a doleful duty devolved upon the women of the country five liberty loan drives six red cross drives the constant thrift stamp drive and a tremendous united war camp drive wherein uncountable billions were spoken of airily staggered the average mind both in prospect and retrospect but americans learned to think in big figures everyone got in the habit of saving and the purse strings of america were permanently opened for the relief of the needs of the nation and to aid needy people overseas this reaction on the national conscience is of inestimable value charity will never again be the perfunctory thing that it was before the great war penury in giving will be frowned down upon as immoral and this quickening of the national conscience this loosening of the national purse is due in no small measure to the fervor and zeal with which the women of the nation threw themselves into the campaigns for filling the war coffers as was to be expected the colored women were foremost in all the financial campaigns the national association of colored women organized at the very beginning of the war to cooperate every way with the women's council of defense mrs philip north moore president of the national council of women says no women worked harder than the women of the national association of colored women mrs mary b talbert president of the national association of colored women which has a membership of a hundred thousand is authority for the statement that in the third liberty loan the colored women of the united states raised about five million dollars savannah georgia alone raised a quarter of a million dollars poor colored women in a tobacco factory of norfolk virginia subscribed ninety one thousand dollars macon georgia subscribed about twenty thousand the national war savings committee appointed colored women to conduct campaigns for the war savings committee one of the most notable of these appointments by the secretary of the treasury was that of mrs laura brown of pittsburgh she maintained an office from which whirlwind campaigns emanated and set a standard of efficiency of organization not easily equaled war work among negro children one of the most effective ways of reaching the people of any community is through the children hence the work of the colored teachers in reaching the race through the children under their care has been in the highest degree effectual throughout the south in the middle atlantic states in which there is a separate school system in the middle west and in the southwest in public schools in endowed institutions in colleges in short wherever colored teachers are employed to teach colored children there was a constant and beneficial influence being exerted in the entire race through its children this influence made for loyalty patriotism unquestioning and devoted and particularly did this influence raise the quota of the race's contribution to the national war chest colored schools taught by colored teachers sent in every community a pro rata to the thrift stamp red cross united war campaign and liberty loans in considerable excess of the natural percentage it would have been easy to have failed just here with the children it was difficult in many communities to overcome the natural obstacles but they were overcome the amounts raised in all national drives through the colored women teachers working with their children are a monumental credit to the women of the race the negro exodus of 1917 to 1918 such a move as this was more important than appears on the face of the bald statement of the fact in the northern cities directly affected by the exodus of southern negroes in 1917 and 1918 a by-product of the war there was suffering intense and widespread among the negroes suddenly thrust into a climate and conditions for which their life in the south had given them no preparation some cities notably detroit met the situation with a wholehearted desire on the part of the civic authorities to cope with the condition correctly and humanely other cities lamented the influx into their borders and let the new population shift for itself as best it could resulting in a pitiful increase in the death rate in pneumonia the unprecedentedly hard winter of 1917-1918 was trying even to those inured to the rigors of a northern winter. Some cities drove out the invaders, or made conditions so uncomfortable that they drifted away or suffered in silence. In other cases, notably Chester, Pennsylvania, the colored women of the city took the matter into their own hands and saved as best they could the pitiful strugglers in their search for homes and work. The tide of migration swept northward, and broke in a huge wave beginning at chester pennsylvania in the east st louis and east st louis in the middle west and los angeles in the west the crest of the wave breaking in philadelphia detroit and chicago it was a situation which the war had inevitably brought about 
the increase in munition plants and shipyards with their need for more help and consequent high wages it was helped by nature the boll weevil devastating the little which the southern laborers owned in the cotton fields and home it was fostered by the growing unrest and bitterness due to lack of economic and educational opportunities and to injustice dealt at home when the true history of the great negro exodus of nineteen seventeen nineteen eighteen shall be written it will prove as fascinating and as peculiar in its psychological ramifications as the story of the exodus from egypt not the least interesting and splendid is the part played by the colored women in these cities where the crest of the wave broke hunger and privation even in the face of the big wages paid by the huge war plants stared the newcomers in the face for there was not always work enough and illness laid off many of those who had made places for themselves in the industrial elysium the housing conditions or rather the lack of them constitute one of the blackest chapters in the history of the movement here is where the christian fortitude and love of the colored women who lived in those cities shine forth resplendently they gave up their own homes to the newcomers they endured discomforts and inconveniences to help the women thus pitifully thrust into these adverse conditions they taught the women from the south the art of coping with the northern climate they nursed them when the inevitable sickness broke out they gave them warm clothing and taught them how to spend money to the best advantage in purchasing suitable clothes and proper food they took women and children into their homes and helped them in ways that only women understand how to help each other maintaining negro morale rumors many and various of the disaffection of the negro of his lack of patriotism of the influence upon him of so-called german propaganda of the need of stimulating his patriotic fervor swept through the country in the spring and summer of nineteen eighteen just how much of this so-called propaganda was german and how much american and how much of it rumors which had their rise in hysterical fear is not given to us to know why there was a loss of patriotic interest in certain localities was not hard to discover here and there studied indifference on the part of certain organizations toward the well-meant efforts of the colored women in attempting to help in war relief labor conditions the old old stories of prejudice and growing bitterness in the labor situation rumors of increased lynching activities from all these a lukewarmness towards the conduct of the war had grown up in various cities and it was here again that the women met a difficult problem and helped to solve it again we look to the army of women teachers and their subtle and pervasive influence over the youth of the race and through children over their parents it would be difficult to measure the service of these women in this particular direction here and there however there was a more spectacular appeal made to the patriotic emotions of the race through pageants demonstrations or mass meetings in some cases the schools through school pageants and plays appealed directly to the patriotic emotions plays written by negro authors were staged commencement exercises became rallying grounds of calls to the warmth of the race in its love for the nation colored women in war industries war has a way of forcing expedience from nineteen fourteen until november nineteen eighteen the economic balance of the nation was sadly upset first by the stopping of the tide of immigration from europe second by the exodus of the negro to the north third by the drastic sweep of the draft law the first opened the door of opportunity to the negro laborer the second depleted the fields of the south the third plunged the colored woman pell-mell into the industrial world an entirely new place for her for generations colored women have been working in the fields of the south they have been the domestic servants of both the south and the north accepting the positions of personal service open to them hard work and unpleasant work has been their lot but they have been almost entirely excluded from our shops and factories tradition and race prejudice have played the largest part in their exclusion the tardy development of the south and the failure of the colored woman to demand industrial opportunities have added further values clearly also two hundred years of slavery and fifty years of industrial boycott in both the north and the south following the civil war have done little to encourage or to develop industrial aptitudes for these reasons the colored women have not entered the ranks of the industrial army in the past but war expediency for a time at least partially opened the door of industry to them it was an experiment and like all experiments it fell against problems and those problems were met by the earnest consideration of several agencies we have already spoken of the splendid work of this department of the young women's christian association under the direction of miss mary e jackson of providence rhode island in june nineteen eighteen a joint committee was formed in new york to study the employment of colored women in that city and its environs 
Serving on that committee were representatives from practically all the philanthropic organizations in the city, and the result of its labors, through two investigators, Mrs. Gertrude MacDougald, colored, and Miss Jessie Clark, white, were given publicity in an interesting pamphlet from which the above paragraph was quoted. It is a significant fact that the colored woman in industry, in a short time, had reached the point where she merited trained investigation. "'Come out of the kitchen, Mary,' was the slogan of the colored woman in wartime. She doffed her cap and apron and donned her overalls. Some states, such as Maryland and Florida, specialized in courses in motor mechanics and automobile driving. The munition factories took the girls in gladly. Grim statistics proved that their scale of wages was definitely lower than a man's doing the same work, and sad to say a considerable fraction below that of white girls in the same service, although Delaware reports some very high-priced skilled ammunition testers averaging seven to twelve dollars a day. The colored girls blossomed out as switchboard operators, stock takers, wrappers, elevator operators, subway porters, ticket choppers, track walkers, trained signalers, yard walkers. They went into every possible kind of factory devoted to the production of war materials, from the most dangerous posts in munition plants to the delicate sewing in aeroplane factories. Colored girls and colored women drove motor trucks, unloaded freight cars, dug ditches, handled hardware around shipways and hardware houses, packed boxes. They struggled with the discomforts of ice and fertilizing plants. They learned the delicate intricacies of all kinds of machines, and the colored woman running the elevator or speeding a railroad on its way by signals was a common sight. Just what the effect of this marvelous influx of colored women into the industrial world would have upon the race was a problem viewed with considerable interest. Pessimists predicted a sociological and psychological upheaval in the ranks of the women of the race. A strange thing about it was there was no perceptible racial disintegration, and the colored woman bore their changed status and higher economic independence with much more equanimity than white women on a corresponding scale of living. The reason for this may perhaps be found in the fact that the colored woman had a heritage of three hundred years of work back of her. Her children were used to being left to shift for themselves. Her home was used to being cared for after sundown. The careful supervision of the War Work Council and the Council of Defense over the health and hours of the women in industry averted the cataclysm of lowered vitality and eventual unfitness for maternity. The possible economic effect of this entrance into the unknown fields of industry on the part of the colored woman will be that when pre-war conditions return and she is displaced by men and is forced to make her way back into domestic service, the latter will be placed on a strictly business basis and the vocation of housekeeping and homemaking will be raised to the dignity of a profession. We have touched lightly the Negro women of the World War, lightly perforce, because of her innate modesty and reticent carelessness in proclaiming her own good deeds. She emerges from the war more serious-minded, more responsible, with a higher opinion of her own economic importance, with a distinct and definite aim and ambition to devote her life to the furthering of the cause for which her men died in Flanders' fields, she has served the Red Cross at home and begged to serve it abroad. She has probed to the depths of the real meaning of the word Christianity. She has formed a second line of defense at home. She has learned the real value of community service and what it means to give of her time, means, and smiles to the weary soldiers passing through her town. She has organized special circles of war relief on her own initiative and given all that she could afford from the homely apple and sandwich and cigarette to an ambulance for service overseas. She has given regally, munificently, of her little help to fill the national war chest, and when there was no more in her slender purse, she has given her time and persuasiveness to induce others to follow her example. She has endowed and maintained hostess houses and helped support the wives and children of the men in service. When disaffection threatened, she fostered patriotism and overcame propaganda with simple, splendid loyalty. She gave up ease and clear skies for the dangers and hardships of death-dealing labor. She shut her eyes to past wrongs and present discomforts and future uncertainties. She stood large-hearted, strong-handed, clear-minded, splendidly capable, and did, not her bit, but her best, and the world is better for her work and her worth. End of Negro Women in War Work by Alice Dunbar Nelson
selections from the first issue of Stars and Stripes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Selections from the first issue of The Stars and Stripes, Volume 1, Number 1. The Official Newspaper of the AEF by and for the soldiers of the AEF. France, Friday, February 8, 1918. To the Colors. With this issue, the Stars and Stripes reports for active service with the AEF. It is your paper, and has but one axe to grind, the axe which our Uncle Samuel is whetting on the grindstone for use upon the august necks of the Habsburgs and the Hohenzollerns. The Stars and Stripes is unique in that every soldier purchaser, every soldier subscriber, is a stockholder and a member of the board of directors. It isn't being run for any individual's profit, and it serves no class but the fighting men in France who wear the olive drab and the forest green. Its profits go to the company funds of the soldier subscribers, and the staff of the paper isn't paid a sou. If you don't find in this your own weekly, the things in which you are particularly interested, write to the editors, and if it is humanly possible, they will dig up the stuff you want. There are so many of you over here now, and so many different sorts of you, that it is more than likely that some of your hobbies have been overlooked in this our first number. Let us know. We want to hear from that artist in your outfit, that ex-newspaper reporter, that short story writer, that company funny man, and that fellow who writes the verses. We want to hear from all of you, for the Stars and Stripes is your paper, first, last, and all the time, for you and for those of your friends and relatives to whom you will care to send it. The Stars and Stripes is up at the top of the mast for the duration of the war. It will try to reach every one of you every week, mud, shell holes, and fog notwithstanding. It will yield rights of the roadway only to troops and ambulances, food, ammunition, and guns, and the paymaster's car. It has a big job ahead to prove worthy of its namesake, but with the help of all of you, it will, in good old down-east parlance, do its gall derndest to deliver the goods. So forward, march. Men on leave, not to be led round by hand. Impression that they will be chaperoned, wholly erroneous. Savoy for first group. Zone system to be instituted and rotated to give all possible variety pink tickets for paris special trains to convoy soldiers to destinations rules are explicit as a great deal of misapprehension regarding leaves the conditions under which they are to be granted etc has existed in the aef for some time past the complete and authoritative rulings on the subject are given below aef men whose leaves fall on or about february fifteenth will be allowed to visit the department of savoy in the southeast of france during their week of leisure that department constitutes their leave zone for the present when their next leaves come around four months hence it is planned to give them a different leave zone and to rotate such zones in future in order to give all an equal chance to see as much of france as possible while the YMCA has worked hard and perfected arrangements for soldiers' accommodations, and provided amusements at Aix-les-Bains, one of the famous watering places in Savoy, no man is bound in any way to avail himself of those accommodations and amusements if he does not so desire. In other words, there are no strings attached to a man's leave time, provided he does not violate the obvious rules of military deportment. The widespread idea that there will be official or semi-official chaperonage of men on leave by the YMCA or other organizations is therefore incorrect. Leaves every four months. The general order from headquarters, AEF, on the subject of leaves is both complete and explicit. Leaves will be available for soldiers only after four months' service in France, and will be granted to officers and men in good standing. The plan is to give every soldier one leave of seven days every four months, excluding the time taken in traveling to and from the place in France where he may spend his holiday. 
as far as practicable special trains will be run for men on leave a man may not save up his seven days leave with the idea of taking one of longer duration at a later date he must take his leaves as they come regular leave will not be granted within one month after return from sick or convalescent leave in principle leaves will be granted by roster based on length of time since last leave or furlough length of service in france length of service as a whole lot officers authorized to grant leaves are required to make the necessary adjustments of leave rosters so as to avoid absence of too many non-coms or specially qualified soldiers at any time not more than ten per cent of the soldiers of any command are to be allowed away at the same time nor it is stipulated is any organization to be crippled for lack of officers leave areas as stated above will be allotted to divisions corps and other units or territorial commands and rotated as far as practicable allotments covering paris however will be made separately from all other areas so as to limit the number of american soldiers visiting paris on leave for this reason the leave tickets will be of different color those consigning a man to his unit's regular leave area being white and those permitting a visit to paris being pink dividing the american permissionaries into white ticket men and pink ticket men exceptional cases in case a man has relatives in france it is provided that he may for that reason or some other exceptional one be granted leave for another area than that allotted to his unit with the stipulation that the number of men authorized to visit paris shall not be increased in that way for the present officers will not be restricted as to points to be visited on leave other than paris any leaves which may be granted by headquarters to go to allied or neutral countries will be counted as beginning on leaving france and terminating on arrival back in france the french zone of the armies and the departments of du jura Aisne, haute savoy seine inferieure and pyrenees oriental and the arrondissement of basse pyrenees touching on the spanish frontier may not however be visited without the concurrence of the chief french military mission leave papers will specify the date of departure and the number of days leave authorized the leave will begin to run at twelve o one a m night following the man's arrival at the destination authorized in his leave papers and will end at midnight after passing of the number of days leave granted him after that the next leave train must be taken by that man back to his unit or if he is not near a railroad line over which leave trains pass he must take the quickest available transportation back to connect with a leave train each man on leave will carry his ticket as well as the identity card prescribed in general order sixty three a e f and he will be required to wear his identification tag travel regulations before going on leave a man must register his address in his own handwriting he must satisfy his company or detachment commander that he is neat and tidy in appearance he must prove to that officer's satisfaction that he has the required leave ticket and so forth and sufficient funds for the trip all travel on leave by men of units situated within the french zone of the armies will as far as possible be on the special leave trains transportation on these trains will be furnished by the government and rations will be provided for both going and returning journeys commutation and rations while on leave will not be paid in any case travel on regular trains will be at the expense of the officer or soldier so traveling at one-fourth the regular rate commissioned officers and army nurses will be entitled to first class field clerks and non-commissioned officers to second class and all others to third class accommodations on regular trains except on special leave trains soldiers will be allowed to purchase second class seats but if a shortage of such seats should occur they will not displace regular passengers lodgings in leave zone on their arrival at destination all men will have their leave papers stamped with the date of arrival and will have noted on them the date and hour of the train to be taken on expiration of their leave 
by the American provost marshal at the railroad station, or by the French railroad officials. They will report to the provost marshal for information, for the looking over of leave papers, and for the selection of an assignment to lodgings and registry of address. If there is no provost marshal in the place to which they go, they will register their addresses and submit their leave papers for okaying at the French Bureau de la Place of a garrison town, or else at the gendarmerie or police station. They will exhibit their leave papers to the French authorities at any time upon request. Lodgings will be paid for in advance. If they prove unsatisfactory, a man may apply to the provost marshal for a change. Men who are unable to pay, or who commit any serious breach of discipline, will be promptly returned to their units. Misconduct will be reported by American provost marshals direct to the man's regimental or other commander for disciplinary action, and for consideration at the next turn of leave. In case of groups of men on leave traveling, the senior non-commissioned officer will be responsible for the conduct of the men. No liquor and no firearms or explosives of any sort may be carried by any soldier going to or returning from leave. Tooth Yanking Car is touring France. Red Cross Dentist's Office lacks nothing but the lady assistant. The latest American atrocity, a dentist's office on wheels. Go on, you say. Go on yourself. We've seen it. Most of the chauffeurs have seen it. The colonel and everybody else who gets about at all has seen it. That's what it is, a portable dentist's office. Chair, wall buzzer and all, with meat axes, bung starters, pinwheels, spittoons, gobs of cotton batting, tear gas, laughing gas, chloroform, ether, eau de vie, gold, platinum, and cement to match. Everything is there but the lady assistant, and even she may be added in time. If you wanted to be funny about the thing, you might call this motorized dentist's parlor the crowning achievement of the Red Cross. For strange to say, it is the Red Cross, commonly supposed to be on the job of alleviating human misery, that has put the movable torture chamber on the road to ply one-tooth stands all along the countryside. But no one wants to be funny about a dentist's office that, instead of lying in wait for you, comes out on the road and chases you, it's too darn serious a matter. You might almost say it flies in the teeth of all the conventions, Hague and otherwise. It looks part like an ambulance, but it isn't. An ambulance carries you somewhere so that you can get some rest. A traveling tooth yankery doesn't give you a chance to rest. It's white, is the outside of the car, just like a baby's hearse, and just about as cheerful to contemplate. On its side it says, Dental Traveling Ambulance Number 1. The number one part gleefully promising, no doubt, that this isn't the end of them by any means, but that there may be more to follow. Useful as a tank? Somebody had a nerve to invent it, all right. As if we didn't have troubles enough as it is, dodging the regimental dentist, and ducking shells, and clapping on gas masks, and all the rest. It is designed, according to one who professes to know about it, to kill the nerves of anything that gets in front of it. So we one and all move that it, instead of the tanks, be sent over the top and tried on the Bosch. The minute they see a fully lighted, white-painted car with the dentist, arrayed with all his instruments of maltreatment, standing ready for action by his electric chair, those Bosch will just turn around and run and run and run, and won't stop running till they get smack up against their own old barbed wire on the eastern front. The crowned heads of Europe tremble before the advance of the crowned teeth of America, as you might say, if you were inclined to joke about it, which we aren't. For French patients, first, one of the Red Cross people, who was standing by ready for the command, clear guns for action, told the Stars and Stripes that the peripatetic pain producer wasn't to be used so much for the American troops' discomfort as to fix up the cavities and what not of the civil population of France. That was encouraging news, for while we don't bear our allies any ill will, we think they ought to have the honor of trying out the experiment first. Après vous, mon cher Gaston, as the saying goes. After all the French people in need of dental treatment have been treated, however, the Red Cross person went on to say that it might be tried out on the Americans, 
Yanks for the Yanks, as you might say, if you were inclined to be funny about it, as you ought not to be. But we prefer to think that the war will be over by that time. Anyhow, who ever heard of an American who would own up to having anything the matter with his jaw? Be that as it may, when you see the cussed thing on the road, jump into the ditch and lie low. It's real, and it means business. His is not a happy lot, says Army Postal Clerk. Works eighteen hours a day, and has to be both a directory of the AEF and a Sherlock Holmes. Private Wolf Tone Moriarty, Fighting Umpth France. The Army Postal Service clerk surveyed the battered envelope on the desk before him, pushed his worn Stetson back from a forehead the wrinkles in which resembled a much-fought-over trench system, adjusted his glasses to his weary eyes, spat, and remarked, Easy. The fighting umph was changed over into the Steen Hundred and Umpty Umph, wasn't it? The last that was heard from them they were at Blankville, Sir Bum. Now they've moved to Bingville or something or other. Clerk, shove this in box four eleven forty four. Lieutenant Brown, care American Army, somewhere in France. Again the Postal Service man, once covered the envelope, purplish in hue, went through the motions of pushing back his hat, expectorated, and began, That's Lieutenant James Brown, I reckon. There's a lot of that name in the medical department, but hell, he's married. Nobody writes to him on purple paper. Then there's another one in the 1,917th Motor Ammunition Ration Revittling Woodchopping Battalion. His and all his rights to him on that kind of paper. I guess that's him, all right. Hey, feller, shove this in 88966543, will ya? Thanks. From the rear of a line of scrapping frantic mail orderlies, each one trying to corner all the packages marked tobacco and chocolate for his particular outfit, the reporter, by standing on a box marked fragile this side up, was able to see the scene depicted above, and to hear, above the din, the postal clerk's momentous decisions. Nothing like that had ever come into his ken before. He had seen Colonel Roosevelt at work in his office, talking into two telephones, dictating to four stenographers, and writing a letter with each hand simultaneously. He had watched the President of the United States dispose of four senators, eight representatives, three governors of states, seven Indian tribal chiefs, and the German ambassador, in exactly seven and a half minutes by the clock. But never in all his experience had he witnessed such concentration, such rapidity of execution, as that which the lean-worn man at the big desk possessed. It was better than watching a machine-gun in action with all stops out. Worming his way up to the desk, the reporter started on his set speech. Mr. Army Post Office Superintendent, will you consent to be interviewed for— when he was summarily stopped, by the wave of an ample hand and the booming of the P.S.'s voice. "'Want me to talk, do ya, eh? Want to know what I do with my spare time? All right, son, just jump over that gang of pouch-robbers and come on inside. Here, you!' This to the still-combatant orderlies, at the same time throwing an armful of mail and papers at them. "'Here's all the stuff for your outfits to-day. Divvy up among yourselves, and then breeze, beat it, allay. "'Now, then, you want to know what I do with my spare time? Well, I work eighteen hours a day in this office.' and the other six I spend worrying whether or not I gypped some poor buddy when I cashed his American money order in French paper currency. Like the saloons in Hoboken, we never close. That's just about the way it was, no kidding, during the Christmas rush. In about a month, enough tobacco, chocolate, chewing gum, knit socks, mufflers, fruit cake, safety razors, lump sugar, to judge from the contents lists on the outside of the bundles, came through this office to stock the whole of France for the next year and a half. Now, though, tossing a long yellow envelope across the room into a numbered pigeonhole, things have slackened up a bit. A week ago I had half an hour off to shave. Do the people back home cause you much bother by not addressing their letters correctly? asked the reporter. Mm, no, replied the P.S. meditatively. Although I did get one the other day, addressed to Private Ethan Allen of the American Revolutionary Force. At first I was going to send it back to Vermont, after changing the private to Colonel, 
and have the D.A.R. see that it got somewhere near old Eath's final resting place. But on second thought, I guessed she, it's generally a she, meant the American Expeditionary Forces, so I went down about three or four regimental rosters, and finally I found the guy. Now he's probably wondering why he didn't get that letter in a month instead of a month and a half, and cussing me out for the delay. The most trouble comes, though, from these birds what don't stay put. They come over here all right with one unit, and then they get transferred to some other. Then the unit is moved around, and the folks back in the States, not knowing about it, continue to send stuff to the old address. But generally we get them located in time. How about the mail from this side, the reporter queried? Do you think that the franking privilege causes the men to write more letters than they ordinarily would? Does sending their letters free pile things up for you? I don't think so, the mail magnate replied. Because the lads are being kept so all-fired busy these days, they don't honestly have time to write much. On the bundle proposition, though, we have an awful rush of stuff just after payday, when it seems as if every man was bent on buying up all the lace handkerchiefs in the country to send to his girl. Oh, take it all in all, it's a great life if you don't weaken, the P.S. concluded. I've been in the government post office service for sixteen years now, and I never had so much fun before. I do wish, though, that the boys would get stouter envelopes for their letters, because the ones they get from the Y.M., and ninety-eight per cent. of the letters that go out from here are written on Y.M. stationery, are too flimsy to stand much manhandling, and when they get wet they're pretty much out of luck. Goodbye. Drop in again some day when we're really busy. His morning's mail is eight thousand letters. Base censor reads them all, including six hundred not in English. Now, how the devil did he pick mine out of the pile? Shuddering, a young American in France gazed at the envelope before him, addressed in his own handwriting, to be sure, but with its end cut open and a stout sticker partially closing the cut. Stamped upon the face of the envelope were the fatal words examined by base censor and the words, because of the gloom they brought the young man, were properly framed within a deep black border. It was this way. The young man in question had been carrying on, for some time, a more or less hectic correspondence with a Mademoiselle Très Charmante in a not far distant town. That in itself would be harmless enough if he had sent his letters through the regular military channels, that is, submitted them to his own company officers to be censored. But dreading the kidding he might receive at the hands of his platoon commander, which he needn't have dreaded at all, for American officers are gentlemen and gentlemen respect confidence, he had been using the French postal service for his intimate and clandestine love-making. That, as everyone knows, or ought to know, is strictly forbidden, but the young man being wise thought he could put one over on the army. Result, that much-dreaded bogeyman, the base censor, knew just how many crosses he had made at the bottom of his note to Mademoiselle X. But he needn't have worried a bit, for the bogeyman isn't a likely rival of any one. In fact, he isn't a man at all, but a system, just as impersonal as if he wrote his name, Base Censor Incorporated. Also, he is pretty well nigh foolproof and puncture-proof, which again removes him from consideration as a human. All delusions to the contrary. The censorship, though it learns an awful lot, doesn't care a tinker's hoot about nine-tenths of the stuff it learns. It isn't concerned with Private Jones's morals, with Corporal Brown's unpaid grocery bills, with Sergeant Smith's mother-in-law, with Lieutenant Johnson's fraternity symbols, it is, however, actively concerned in keeping out of correspondence all matters relating to the location or movement of troops, all items which, if pieced together, might furnish the common enemy with information which would be valuable to him in the conduct of his nefarious enterprises. In addition to keeping such damaging information out of soldiers' and officers' correspondence, the base censorship is lying in wait for everything and anything in the mail line, which the senders hope to slip through uncensored. It regularly goes over a large proportion of the mail which has already been vised by company officers. It sifts through all mail for the army from neutral countries, 
and finally it censors all letters in foreign languages written by men in the AEF, letters which company officers are forbidden to OK. In the exercise of this last-named function lies perhaps the greatest task allotted to the base censorship. Our army is probably the most international in history, and it sends letters to the base written in 46 different languages excluding English. Out of 600 such letters, a typical day's grist, the chances are but half will be written in Italian, followed in the order of their numerousness by those inscribed in Polish, French, and Scandinavian. The censor's staff handles mail couched in 25 European languages, many tongues and dialects of the Balkan states, and a scattering few in Yiddish, Chinese, Japanese, Hindu, Tahitian, Hawaiian, Persian, and Greek, to say nothing of a number in Philippine dialects. An interesting by-product of the censor's work is the discovery of foreign language interpreters within the ranks of the army. One soldier, for example, wrote in Turkish, and wrote so well that the censor handling the letters in that tangled tongue passed on his name to those higher up. As a result, the man was detailed to the interpreter's corps, where he is now serving his adopted country ably and well. Seldom, say the members of the censor's staff, is anything forbidden found in the foreign language letters. The only striking feature about them as a whole is the small number that are written in German. In fact, the Chinese letters, as a rule, outnumber those expressed in the language of the Kaiser. Besides all this, thousands of letters are sent direct to the base censors every day, in cases where soldiers are unwilling that their own immediate superiors should become acquainted with the contents. To humor, therefore, the enlisted man in a former National Guard unit, whose censoring officer he suspects of trying to cut him out with the girl back home, the base censor takes the responsibility off the company officer's shoulders, and the enlisted man feels oh so much relieved. Those clever chaps who devise all sorts of codes to tell the home folks just where they are in France meet short shrift at the censor's hands. For example, one of them was anxious to describe a certain city in this fair land. You know grandmother's first name, he wrote naively, thinking it would get by. But the particular censor it came before, having a New England grandmother of his own, promptly sent the letter back with the added comment, Yes, and so do I, can it? Another man was so bold as to write, The name of the town where I am located is the same as that of the dance hall on Umptumpus Avenue in, well, a certain well-known American city. He was also caught up, for the censor, being himself somewhat of a man of the world, shot the letter back with a tart comment, I've been there too. Those two men, however, were more fortunate than the average in having their letters sent back to them for revision. The usual scheme is for the censor to clip out completely the portion of the letter carrying the damaging information. In case, therefore, a man has written something innocuous but interesting nonetheless to his correspondent on the other side, he is simply out of luck. One can see it pays to be careful. On the whole, aside from the mania which seems to have possessed some men to give away the location of their units in France, the censoring officials declare that our army deserves a great deal of credit for living up to both the letter and the spirit of the censor's code. They do, however, find fault with the men who continually over-address their letters, that is, who persist in tacking on the number of their divisions to the company and regimental designations. This, for military reasons, is forbidden, but many men seem as yet unaware of this fact. During the first half of January, the base censor's office alone handled more than 8,000 letters a day, 2,000 a day increase over December, due, no doubt, to the thank-you letters which our dutiful soldier men felt compelled to write in return for those bounteous Christmas boxes. In the spring, though more transports will be coming over, more men will be writing letters, but still the work will go on. The abuse of the letter-writing privilege by one man might mean the loss of many of his comrades, so the long and tough job of censoring must be seen through. 
So, you smarty with the private code to transmit all sorts of dope to the folks, have a care. No matter how the letters pile up, Old Base Sensor Incorporated is always on the job. Like the roulette wheel at Monte Carlo, he'll get you in the end, no matter how lucky and clever you might think yourself. Or, as Indiana's favorite poet might put it, the censor man'll get you if you don't watch out. Free Seeds for Soldier Farmers Congress votes us packets, but overlooks hoes and spades. Prizes for Big Pumpkins AEF garden enthusiasts speculate upon probability of flower pots in tin derbies. Sergeant Carey, quite contrary, how does your garden grow? Tomato buds and Carey spuds and string beans all in a row. That's the song some of us will be singing when the ground gets a little softer. Oh, yes, it will be much muddied before long. And the grass, what there is left of it, gets a little greener and the dicky birds begin to sing sweet wee-wee in the treetops. For be it known that by and with the consent of the Congress of the United States, that ancient and venerable and highly profitable body which votes the money to buy us our grub, has out of the kindness of its large and collective heart extended the privilege of free seed distribution to the United States Quartermaster Corps. So if you haven't received your little package of bean seed, pea seed, anise seed, tomato seed, lettuce seed, pansy seed, begonia seed, and what not, trot right up to the supply sergeant's diggings and ask him when it's coming in. No kidding. You know yourself you're grumbling now because all you get in the line of vegetables is spuds and beans and tomatoes and beans and spuds and spuds and beans and beans and spuds and beans and beans and beans and beans and beans and beans and what was that other vegetable you gave us last night mess sergeant oh yes beans all of them canned with now and then on christmas st patrick's day yom kippur and halloween a few grains of canned corn if you want fresh vegetables therefore it's up to you to grow them Unfortunate people who live in big cities are able to grow them in cute little window boxes, and thus cut down the high cost of living. Why shouldn't you, with a steel helmet for a flower-pot, be able to do the same? Go to the French, thou sluggard doughboy. Consider their ways, get wise. They're hard up for food, as you know, and at that, to judge from the reports back home, there are no blooming curiosities. But look at what they do about it instead of folding their hands saying c'est le guerre they go out and dig and then plant and then hoe and finally they have fresh vegetables and back aches to show for it you can't go anywhere along the roadsides or up the hillsides these days without stumbling over their neat and well kept up little garden patches and with butter selling at what it is and eggs selling for what they do and everything else in the eats line sky-booting in price those little garden patches come in mighty handy. It's worth trying. Although no official announcement has been made as yet, it is safe to surmise that some company commanders will offer prizes for the squads producing the biggest pumpkins, the best summer squashes, and the most luscious watermelons. Texas troops, please heed. Company commanders, you know, have never been in the habit of awarding prizes for the squads producing the most lemons. But then war changes everything. So keep your old campaign list for garden wear, if the Q.M. will let you. Make a pair of overalls out of the burlap the meat comes done up in. Use your trench pick and shovel, plus your bayonet, to do the plowing, and scatter the tender seedlets. If a few acorns come along with the rest of the plantables, plant them too, for if we're going to be over here a good long time, the shade from these oaks will come in mighty handy when we are old men and have time to sit down. Mentioned in Orders New Headgear The Oversea Cap, the latest thing in military headgear, has been officially adopted as part of the uniform for officers, soldiers, and other uniformed members of the AEF. For the latter two classes, the cap will be of 20-ounce olive drab cloth, or perhaps a little heavier. There will be no show of coloring on the cap and the stiffening of the flap will be the same color as the cap itself. When the cap is issued to a man, he will be expected to turn in his service hat to nearest quartermaster depot. 
the officer's overseas cap will be the same model as that worn by the men but the material will be that of the officer's uniform for officers other than general officers the stiffening at the edge of the flap will be the same color as the arm of the service to which the officer belongs and will project far enough above the edge of the flap to give the appearance of piping when the cap is worn with the flap up general officers will have caps with stiffening of the same color as the cap cloth itself with a strip of gold braid an eighth of an inch to a quarter of an inch from the outside of the flap except where the helmet is prescribed officers actually commanding troops will wear the oversea cap at other times the oversea or the service cap is optional trench uniforms officers are also authorized to wear the so-called trench coat with the insignia of rank on the shoulder this may also be worn on the raincoat officers serving in the zone of advance will be issued all articles of the enlisted man's uniform and equipment they need and when their duty in the trenches is over they will return all such articles neatness in dress in connection with these new regulations concerning clothing it is strictly laid down that every effort must be made at all times by the officers and men of the aef to present a neat and soldierly appearance when men are not actually engaged on field service it is directed that uniforms will be pressed and brushed and that belts leggings shoes boots and brasses will be cleaned and polished even when on active service it is required that advantage be taken of every opportunity to clean uniforms and equipment no soldier says the order will be permitted to leave his command on pass unless he presents a neat and soldierly appearance which will be determined at an inspection by an officer ambulance ventilation ford ambulances in the service of the aef are to be bored with one inch auger holes at three inch intervals in double rows through the wooden front just at the driver's back and immediately beneath the roof in the tailboard also there will be fifteen holes this is to secure proper ventilation as deaths have been known to occur in other allied services within the enclosed bodies of the ambulances which are equipped with exhaust gas heaters ambulance drivers are cautioned to investigate the condition of their passengers at five minute intervals typhoid prophylaxis any men in the aef who have not as yet taken typhoid prophylaxis will be required to do so in the near future and in all cases where it is shown that complete protective measures have not been taken the surgeon will administer triple vaccine prophylaxis red cross searchers one searcher of the american red cross may be attached to each statistical section of the adjutant general's department throughout the aef and in each hospital subsection except in field hospitals information as to casualties etc will be furnished freely to red cross searchers subject to the necessary restrictions as to what may be forwarded and at what times more rations the meat coffee and sugar rations of troops engaged in work involving hard manual labor of eight hours or more a day will be increased twenty five per cent up to the end of march this holds true in future from november to march inclusive reckless driving reckless driving by chauffeurs is frowned upon severely in general orders number eleven in consequence of past accidents it is now required that every driver of an aef motor vehicle which sustains a collision with any french vehicle or person or kills or injures a domestic animal will prepare a report on form number one two four q m m t s immediately after the collision and before resuming his journey it is impressed upon the drivers that this must be done in every case regardless of how trivial the injury may appear to be the driver after making out his report will deliver it to his immediate commanding officer with the least possible delay court-martial proceedings must in every case be instituted against any driver who fails to render such a report immediately upon his return to his station hard liquors soldiers are forbidden either to buy or accept as gifts from the french 
any whiskey, brandy, champagne, or, in fact, any spirituous liquors. Commanding officers are charged with the duty of seeing that all drinking places where alcoholic liquors thus named are sold are designated as off-limits. They are also directed to use every endeavor to limit to the lowest possible number the places where intoxicants are sold, and to assist the French authorities in locating non-licensed resorts. ANZAC MAKES SAFE GUESS A company commander received an order from battalion headquarters to send in a return giving the number of dead Huns in the front of his sector of trench. He sent in the number as 2001. HQ rung up and asked him how he arrived at this unusual figure. Well, he replied, I'm certain about the one, because I counted him myself. He's hanging on the wire just in front of me. I estimated the two thousand. I worked it out all by myself in my own head that it was healthier to estimate them than to walk about in no man's land and count them. From Aussie, the Australian Soldiers' Magazine. Marines advise swigging. For hikers, they say, it is better than sipping. Quantico, Virginia. The drinking of water at frequent intervals while on long hikes is not recommended by the U.S. Marines stationed here. While the average man should consume, according to medical authorities, from two to three quarts a day, troops on the march should drink this amount at regular periods, and not sip a mouthful at a time, say the Marine officers. In Haiti, the Philippines, and other countries where the Marines have been compelled to hike long and hard, men who have constantly sipped at their canteens were the first to become exhausted. On the contrary, the men who drank their fill every two or three hours, and not between times, proved to be the best hikers. Shaving in France The order says, shave every other day. Now you personally may need to shave every day, or you may need to shave as often as twice a day, or, again, you may be one of those lucky and youthful souls who really don't need to shave oftener than once a week. But as the order makes the every-other-day shave obligatory, you, no matter what classification you may fall under, decide to compromise on the every-other-day shave. In that way, and in that way only, can discipline be maintained, and a pleasing variety of growths up and down the company front be secured. The order being such as it is, you dispense with washing your face every day. You wash your face on your non-shaving day, and on your shaving day you let the shave take the place of the wash. To be sure, if you are a generous latherer, you have to wash your face all over, including the remote portions behind the ears after you get through shaving, but being anxious to save time and economize water, thus living up to another order, you never count that in as a real wash. When writing home, you say simply that you wash and shave on alternate days. A USE FOR HELMETS To begin the shaving process, you secure a basin full or a tin helmet full of water, such water as the countryside affords. Usually it is dirty, sometimes in the regions bordering on what has been in German hands since 1914, it minutely resembles the drink that Gunga Din brought to his suffering Tommy friend. You remember, it was crawly and it stunk. At that, you can't blame it for being crawly and stinking if it had been anywhere near the Bosch. If you are in billets or barracks, and there is a stove therein, both handy and going, and if all the epicures and snappy dressers in the squad are not trying to toast their bread or thaw out their shoes or dry their socks on top of it at the same time, you may be allowed to heat your shaving water, if it can be called water, on said stove. If you are allowed to, which again is doubtful, you are generally saddled with the job of being squad stove stoker for the rest of the day. This is a confining occupation and hard on the eyes. If, however, you are in neither billets nor barracks, but in the open somewhere, or if there is no fire in the stove, or if somebody else has got first licks at it, and you don't fit with the cook of the mess sergeant so as to be able to borrow a cup of hot water out of the coffee tank, why, there is nothing left to do but shave in cold water. This is hard on the face, the temper, and the commandment against cussing. 
also if you neglected to import your shaving soap from the states and had to buy it over here it may mean that you are out of luck on lather anyway after quite a while of fussing around you get started you smear your face with something approaching lather if you've got hot water with a sticky milky substance that resembles more than anything else a coating of lumpy office paste this done and rubbed in a bit around the corners you begin to hoe indoor versus outdoor shaving in billet shaving somebody is always trying to climb into the bunk above you over your slightly bent back while you shave for it is impossible to get your little trench mirror directly in front of your face while you are in an upright position in outdoor shaving usually performed in the middle of a village square near the town fountain one is invariably bumped from behind by one of the lowing kine or frolicsome colts peculiar to the region to say nothing of a stray auto truck or ambulance which may have broken loose from its moorings these gentle digs of course produce far less gentle digs in one's countenance in this way america's soldiers long before they reach the front are inured to the sight of blood after you have scraped off a sufficient amount of beard to show a sufficient amount of skin to convince the top when he eyes you over that you have actually shaved you shake the lather off your razor and brush dab what is left of the original water over the torn parts of your face seize the opportunity while you have the mirror before you of combing your hair with your fingernails and button your shirt collar the performance concluded you are good for forty-eight hours more having a perfect alibi if any one comments on your facial growth you are not however in any condition to attend a revival meeting or to bless the power that be who condemned you to having to shave in france two samaritans in skirts in the modern parable they aid a poilu chauffeur the woman motor-car driver has made her appearance in the zone of the army a few of them are driving big motor trucks for the y m c a and are making good at the job during a recent heavy snowstorm two trucks driven by young women were sliding along a winding road carrying supplies to a hut from a depot when they came upon a big french lorry stalled in a ditch the french soldier in charge was tinkering with the engine having stalled it while trying to pull into the road again he wasn't having much success both the women garbed in short skirts high heavy leather boots and woolen caps that pulled down well over their ears climbed down from their seats and between them first managed to get the engine in the stalled lorry started and then one of them took her place behind the wheel and by skilful manoeuvring brought all four wheels to the road the frenchman stood to one side during the whole of the operation and watched the women with astonishment supplies first aid to chili airmen red cross canteen serves two thousand sandwiches and mugs of coffee daily the red cross does a lot of work over here its activities in taking care of the population of the hun devastated districts in clothing and feeding the ever-increasing hordes of refugees that pour in over the swiss frontier in supplying french and american military hospitals and in furnishing the american forces with auxiliary clothing are well known it is not known however that somewhere in that nebulous region known as somewhere in france the red cross has gone in a bit for what has generally been considered the y m c a s own particular game that of running the festive army canteen so far as can be found out at present writing this canteen is the only one operated by the red cross in france it is run primarily for the benefit of the young american aviators whose training station is hard by and because aviators breathing rarer and higher ozone than most of the rest of us are in consequence always as hungry as kites and cormorants this particular red cross canteen does a rushing business it is situated in a long barrack-like building of the familiar type which is partitioned off into a social room and a combination officer's dining room and a storeroom kitchen the kitchen as always in anything pertaining to the army is the all-important part this kitchen is noteworthy for two things it has a real stand-up-and-sit-up lunch counter and its products are cooked and served by the deft hands of american women 
no dinners are served at this canteen for the airmen those favors are reserved for the convalescents in the hospital nearby but the airmen are dropping in all the time for sandwiches and hot coffee particularly after coming down chilled and chattering from a flight into the upper regions of the sky if they don't drop in to get warmed up in that fashion they know they are in for a scolding by the head of the canteen an Englishwoman possessed of all an American mother's motherly instincts and all of the English army's ideals of discipline. There was one night that the little Red Cross canteen was put to a severe test. Eighteen hundred Americans arrived at the aviation camp after a thirty-hour trip, punctuated by no saving hot meal. The manager matron and her girl helpers, however, stayed up nearly all night, minting hot coffee and sandwiches, so that the hardships of sleeping on the cold bare ground of the hangars was somewhat mitigated for the eighteen hundred unfortunates in all the canteen disperses about two thousand sandwiches a day with mugs of coffee to match in addition to that its workers equipped with norwegian fireless cookers sally forth to the aviation fields in the mornings long before dawn so that the men who are going up may have something warm to eat and drink to fortify them against the cold not content with doing that for their charges the red cross people soon hope to have enough workers to take care of mending the aviators clothes for aviators have to wear lots of clothes and when they land in trees in barbed wire on stone walls and so forth their clothes suffer in consequence a doughboy who wears one suit at a time doesn't have a hard job keeping it in order but an aviator with heaven knows how many layers of clothes oh my the young women who constitute the red cross working staff at this particular base are for the most part prominent in society in the larger american cities voluntarily they have given up lives of luxury to tackle the job and a hard job it is they live in small barracks of their own as do the tommy wax women's army auxiliary corps of the british army but they are roughing it gladly to help uncle sam win his war fooling the flea you'll march in the flea parade and be glad of the chance after you've lived a week in an old french sheep shed say i'll be glad to get back to the mosquitoes said a young hand grenadier from dallas texas as he dumped his other clothes in the flea soup cauldron these babies chew you to death day and night a mosquito's a night rider only the line forms on the right of the cook shack the cooks build big fires out in the open and set out great kettles of water when the water begins to boil the parade begins each man dumping in his flea infested clothing uniform socks underwear wristlets and blankets the cooks keep the fires stoked up with wood and the garments boil for a solid hour then the men form another line and collect their stuff they wring out the clothes the best they can and then sit down to pick em off they're fast little devils most usually said the dallas man but the sudden shock from warm water to cold air makes em stiff and you can catch em easy the a e f s living in sheep barns simply can't keep clear of the things they're in the rafters, in the hay, and in the planks. Weekly boiling of the clothing only gives a short relief. Really, they aren't fleas at all, but a form of sheep tick. But they don't distinguish between sheep and American soldiers. No more cussing. Blanket. At mules. Order. Blanket. Says that animals are sensitive as blank cussing as a fine art is doomed in the army its foremost practitioners the mule skinners are shorn of their deadliest weapon of offence and defence by a recent order which directs them to use honeyed words when addressing their feathery eared charges instead of employing the plain direct united states to which the mules painfully obvious hearing organs have hitherto been attuned kindness the order says in effect will work wonders with the genus missouri nightingale or indiana canary if spoken to with a proper regard for his or her feelings a mule will oftentimes go so far as to place his or her hoof in a driver's lap when one is able with impunity to tickle a mule behind the ear either ear will do 
one is adjudged proficient in interpreting the aesthetic aspirations of the beast, and all mule-skinners are exhorted to apply the ear-tickling proposition, as a sort of acid test, both as to the tractability of their charges, and their own ability as mule-tamers. The application of this test, it is held, will keep the mule-skinners too fully occupied to be able to cuss, or to care a cuss about cussing. But men of the old army, particularly those who have trained with mountain batteries, think of what is passing, think of what the younger and more effete generation of mules is missing. No more beneath the starry flag will be heard such he language as this. Come on, Maud, ya blank, who's your blank? Get a wiggle on your blank, good for nothing carcass. Get out, Bill, ya long eared, flea bitten, hay demolishing, muddy flanked, rock ribbed blank. Blank, I said it, giddy up. Or, with the native product, Depeche vous, vous blank. Oh, hell, I'm out of French. Say, Jimmy, what's the word for blank? Never mind, all mules understand blank. Hey there, you blank, make tracks. Now all is changed, and such dulcet appeals to his mule ship as this are the order of the day. Get a gate on, Sephira, you blank. Oh, hell, I forgot. Oh, come on now, old girl, we ain't got the whole morning to waste. Be a sport, old lady. Forward, ho. Say, for blank, oh, hell, I mean, heaven. Damn it, I forgot again. You, Ananias, will you do me the esteemed favor to start the process? Will you condescend to lift at least one leg? Ananias puts one hoof forward in experimental manner, then stops. About this time, a brother mule skinner enters, mouthing a corncob pipe. Says he to the first mule skinner, What a matter, Jerry, don't they budge? Livin' up to orders, be ya? Ah, we, way to talk to him is third person, get me? Third person! None of this crude you and yez stuff. Same as talking to the skipper, you know? Jerry gets his mouth all fixed to say, Aw, oh, hell, recovers himself, and then begins, Will the off animal kindly step at least two paces to the front? The mule starts to comply. I thank the off mule. Now will the near mule kindly follow suit? It also starts to comply. Now will both the near mule and the off mule be so good as to repeat the process, both pulling together until requested to desist? Fine, off we go. Good God, good God. Singing on the Hike We do not sing by order in this man's army, but that is no reason why we should not sing, just because we are not ordered to do so. Singing can clip more kilos off a hike, take more lead out of a pack, drive more dampness out of the clothing than anything else. Also, it is good for the lungs. What is good for the lungs is good for the heart, and lungs and hearts in good condition are the best possible aids to the guts that will win this war. We do not need to sing highbrow stuff. We cannot imagine American troops going into battle as our Italian allies are said to, singing the national anthem, for the simple reason that we are not built that way, that's all. But we can sing something. Even all we do is wait for payday, or the famous ditty about the acrobatic grasshopper. And if we do, we are more than apt to find ourselves feeling a lot better for it. Moreover, it will help the fellow back in the line who, because of his cold, a badly slung pack, a tight pair of shoes, or perhaps bad news from home, is finding the going just a bit hard. It is the job of all of us who feel fit to do all we can to boost along the fellow who may not feel quite so fit. It's the team play that counts. So start her off. Pitch it low enough so everybody can reach it and keep it going. It is an unbeatable tonic for an unbeatable army. War Risk Insurance February 12th is the last day to take out war risk insurance. Do it now. End of Selections from the First Issue of the Stars and Stripes Read by Maria Casper Some Battle Stories, Chapter 5, Close Quarters, by Captain A. J. Dawson. 
this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org among those who were permitted to board a certain hospital ship when she berthed at southampton was lieutenant h an officer of the territorials whose battalion accomplished some fine work at Pozieres. this officer was sent home during the early part of the somme offensive slightly wounded and will by now have returned to duty he had not taken half a dozen steps on the vessel's deck before he was saluted by a private of his own battalion whose jacket was thickly coated with the grime of later fighting at Pozieres, and spattered over with blood as to its left shoulder in the powwow that followed one tried to get as accurate a record as possible of this man's own words this was about the way of it i found your glasses and sticks sir close to where the stretcher-bearers were hung up that time you remember sir that little dead end where there had been an old french dugout there was a big gas gong hanging there you may remember sir on the haft of a broken pick in the side of the trench i gave em to sergeant blank so they wouldn't be lost the platoon's in clover now sir they were coming out for rest when i was taken away it was after the posiere scrappin was over i got my second wound getting back down the new sap we made my first was nothing machine-gun bullet the platoon's to have two or three days rest i believe sir seems queer resting back there in what used to be the bosch lines you know sir they're ours now all right sir and some of the deep dugouts are first-rate came through the crumping all right they did that place the blanks raided you know sir in june it was when the prisoners started scrappin in the way back across no man's land you could see our chaps lying about there smokin and usin their tommy cookers now but we had a hot time all right after you left sir the way it was when you left it went on just the same not a minute's break for the rest of the night all day long and the next night before any ease up came but captain blank said the platoon had done real well sir what there was left of us you could see he was pleased and the commanding officer sir he said we was a credit to the regiment so i think you can feel all right about the platoon sir we were moved up to the right our company after you left and were next the australians and i must say they did fight like men sir but not any more than our boys there was a bit of racin like between us there you know sir and one of the anzac corporals told me we made it easy for them but that must have been his blarney sir because there wasn't nothin easy for anybody in such a hell as that posiere's was i thought at first bein dark would make it better for us but now i think the daylight best we got to that road at last you know sir it seemed we never could because of their machine-guns but we did and the boche he had it fair honeycombed with deep dugouts and trenches but we put the wind up him properly when we got there sir my word we did and those what was left was pretty glad to put their hands up after the cruel time they'd given us on the slope our boys did want a mix-up at the end but mr blank and captain blank they wouldn't have it sir they were runnin up and down our line tellin us about it and captain blank he was near chokin for want of breath but he shouted all he could and kept all on putting himself between the boches with their hands up and us and every one of they boches was taken prisoner and not a one hurt it's right too of course when they surrender when the order came for our platoon to hold on to that little ridge above where you was hit sir i must say i thought it couldn't be done we was all alone you know sir and when they tried to bring up another platoon they had to be recalled for the boche he had that ground so swept with his typewriters a swaller couldn't have flown there five separate times the hun came down on us and when he wasn't chargin he was crumpin and machine gunnin somethin chronic if you lifted your head to look just for a second you got it in the neck every time when we got the reinforcement up that night from number eight and number seven there was only one of us hadn't been hit that was little joey green in my section you know sir 
but we were able to keep the lewis gun going when they were charging i think that's what saved us really sir couldn't use it only when they was charging or it would have blown out of action in a second but we peppered em all right when their fire lifted to let em charge a good little gun sir though it did get red hot i tell you sir i felt like blessin the chaps who made it so's it could stick to the job and the chaps that fired it too when they had been pretty badly wounded you see sir we was all right with the bayonet so long as it was only maybe two boches for each of us when they charged we could manage that pretty comfortable but if it hadn't been for the lewis i think we'd have had half a dozen boches to each one of us every time he charged and i don't think we could have stood it i had a little parapet of three of em head to tail in front of me and i reckon that sheltered me quite a lot i've got their three caps and bayonet sheaths here that i tied on the back of me belt the fifth time the boche charged i stopped one with a bullet just before he could reach my bayonet and the one behind him threw down his rifle and shouted mercy with his hands over his head i wouldn't a hurt him didn't want to hurt the beggar you know sir though you'd be pretty sick to see one of our boys do the like of that but it seemed he couldn't help himself sir and he ran right on to my bayonet spitted himself he did i did my very best to patch up the last one but it was no go he snuffed it sir while i was fixing my field dressing on him i felt sorry for that bosh in a way seein i hadn't wanted to hurt him at all i suppose they can't help being different from our chaps mercy camarade and all that and here is another little story of a private soldier who did his bit on the left of Pozieres. a company quartermaster sergeant who was wounded by a stray bullet at a ration dump well behind the lines gave me a note for an officer now in hospital in london i found out what hospital he was in from the r a m c staff and wired asking permission for the publication of the note i was sending him his reply was anything you like that will do justice to as fine a lot of men as any officer ever had well i don't think this little note does them any injustice anyhow i am bringing you the wristlet watch that was on blank's wrist because the other batman told me it was yours and only lent to blank as i am told you are somewhere in london sir i dare say you may be seeing his family he was with the front line on the left of Pozieres with the rest of his platoon his mates tell me his rifle had been knocked out of his hand the shell holes there must have been hard to cross at the double in the dark with such a heavy fire on too but blank somehow managed to down his men all right when they found him he had a boche's bayonet and rifle in his right hand and his left was at the throat of the boche he'd killed he was lying right across the man and he had a bullet through his head we think a machine-gun bullet got him while he struggled with the boche on the ground after sticking him with his own bayonet so you see sir your batman died pretty game like the rest of our boys who went west but i am glad to say our casualties have been pretty light on the whole when you think of the masses of boche dead not to mention the prisoners i hear the brigadier is very pleased indeed with the battalion's work and that many in our company will be mentioned in dispatches the sergeant-major sent his best regards and hopes your wound is healing well we have been doing fine lately in the matter of boots and socks and the rations and bath arrangements have been going like clockwork since you had it out with blank sir End of chapter 5 Close Quarters of Some Battle Stories by Captain A. J. Dawson Read by David Wales In the Somme Battlefield from War Letters of a Public Schoolboy by Henry Paul Mannering Jones This LibriVox recording is in the public domain august twenty first nineteen sixteen i am delighted to tell you that i have been temporarily posted to a job of real interest and responsibility 
having been given the command of a working party composed of infantry artillery and asc men whose function it is to load and unload ammunition at an important railhead not far from the front we are about one hundred and fifty in all and a very happy family we live in tents and work under the orders of the railhead ordnance authorities there is a vast amount of work and it goes on continuously at present from four a m to nine p m daily and sometimes throughout the night as well it is a revelation to see the immense quantities of explosives etc that are sent up i have nothing further to report about the r f a transfer but my c o has assured me that if my application is not successful i shall be able to return shortly to the cavalry brigade in my old capacity as requisitioning officer this working ammunition party of which i am in command is located in a little town well in the swirl of war with the guns booming in the near distance most of the day and night the unit under my command to put it in official language lives in a field by the railhead we have a pair of first-rate sergeants r h a and infantry and various very sound a s c n c o s in charge everything goes merrily as a wedding bell a gunner officer looks after the administrative welfare pay etc of the artillery men but the discipline and command of the unit as a whole devolve on yours truly next door to us across the line there is a concentration camp of bosch prisoners they work on the railway all day shoveling stones in and out of trucks and lorries to the eternal credit of england the treatment the prisoners receive the food supplied to them and the conditions under which they live are all of the very best they have their being in tents within a barbed wire enclosure not too crowded and have excellent washing facilities hot baths once a week good food and conveniences for its preparation including huge camp kettles for cooking in short every comfort possible the work they do is hard but no harder than that many of our own fellows have to do in the normal course of events the considerate way in which our prisoners are treated is a great tribute to british chivalry an old french soldier watching them one day in their camp said to me vous les traitez trop bien ces salauds i replied oui mais c'est comme ça que l'angleterre fait la guerre avec les mains toujours propres i was grieved to hear of the death of lieutenant ivor rees of llanelli he was a great friend of arthur and tom it is awful there is no doubt about it the sacrifice of these lives cut short in their prime but they are not wasted of that i am convinced besides one crowded hour of glorious life is worth an age without a name lloyd george's eisteddfod speech was very stirring i like that phrase the blinds of britain are not drawn down i see the papers are discussing ministerial changes i hope whatever happens that lloyd george will remain at the war office it is the place where his personality is wanted i am reading two interesting french books emile faguet's short history of french literature and dumas vingt ans après i wish you would send me kant's critique of pure reason or one of hegel's books this evening i listened to beethoven's egmont overture what a glorious work it is keep your eye for me on any books dealing with beethoven or the immortal richard september sixteenth nineteen sixteen i am still in command of the ammunition working party and entailing as it does real work and responsibility am enjoying it hugely all our men seem very happy their rations and living conditions are excellent we have our own canteen which does a great trade it is a bad day if the canteen fails to take two hundred and fifty francs although it is open only from twelve till two and from six to eight as per regulations we get our stuff from the nearest branch of the expeditionary force canteens a military unit which does a colossal business at the back of the front it has depots almost as large as those of the a s c a sergeant major of the nearest branch of the e f c tells me that they calculate that at one depot they take more money in a day than harrod's stores do in a week the place is chock-a-block from morning to night and outside there is always waiting a string of lorries mess carts wagons limbers from all over the place the part played by the e f c in the war is by no means unimportant it is a regular military unit with officers n c o s and men in khaki of course run under the authority of the war office and subject to military law 
profits on sales go to the purchase of fresh stock and i believe in part to the military canteens fund at the war office the whole thing is run by the director of supply and transport at the w o and is commanded out here by an a s c major it is difficult not to make profits on canteens even in our comparatively small one we constantly find ourselves saddled with more money than is required and this although the prices charged to the men are the lowest possible one great merit of the canteens is that they prevent the men from being rooked by unscrupulous civilians who i regret to say are to be found in force in some of these french towns and villages the military canteen movement on its present huge scale has only been possible to us because of one the comparatively high rates of pay in the british army two the command of the sea making transport from england simple and easy three the inexhaustible reservoirs of supply and manufacture that exist within the british empire there can be no doubt about it that the path of the british soldier in this war has been made as easy as it is possible to make an incalculable advantage to a nation that has had to create a great voluntary army in a comparatively short space of time whatever faults the military authorities may have committed in other directions they have kept steadily in view the napoleonic maxim an army moves on its stomach the bosch prisoners round about here work energetically they must i fancy be amazed themselves at the manner in which they are treated the abundance of food the entire absence of rancour on our part and the general conditions under which they work and live actually they get their sunday afternoons off some of them have been given a little plot of land close to the internment camp where they are busy gardening in their leisure time in the camp they have all sorts of work tables and tools and you often see some of them doing carpentering after their day's work is done the prisoners stroll about the camp and its environs at will and the men on guard are continually chatting and joking with them the ration of the prisoners includes fresh meat and bread every day and a supply of tobacco and cigarettes once a week it is much to the credit of britain that her captives in war should be treated with so much generosity don't let the government abandon this policy of broad magnanimity because of the noisy clamour of armchair reprisalists at home by the way these bosch prisoners observe the rules of discipline even in their captivity and when british or french officers pass by they stand respectfully to attention most of the prisoners are big chaps if you have not read it let me recommend to you a book by john buchan called the thirty-nine steps to my mind it is the cleverest detective story i have read since the exploits of sherlock holmes it is in a way a sort of enlarged version of an earlier story by buchan that appeared in blackwood's magazine called the power house as in the power house the chief villain is merely hinted at he is only fully revealed in the last page throughout the rest of the story he is one of those genial cheery old men who are always puffing cigars and drinking whisky the incidents take place in england and are connected with a series of events that precipitated the present war i enjoyed the book and admired the ingenuity with which the plot is worked out the writing is vigorous and there is no sloppy sentimentality september sixth nineteen sixteen yesterday my working party had orders suddenly to shift its quarters to a spot farther up the line having struck camp we started off about two p m in motor charabancs and lorries after about two hours plunging about in roads that were like quagmires we arrived at our destination a newly formed railhead not far from the battle line it is situated on a sort of plateau the surrounding country is thick with guns in the past twelve hours there has been a terrific bombardment the guns booming incessantly even Luz, which wasn't so bad while it lasted pales into insignificance in comparison at night the sky reminds one of the crystal palace fireworks show in its palmiest days it is a fine place this from the point of view of health being high up and open to the fresh air and the sunshine i am feeling absolutely splendid in both health and spirits it is a treat to be up where things are happening september twelfth nineteen sixteen pursuant to orders from the division i marched my party up to join another working party that is engaged on duty whose scope extends as far as the most recently gained ground we are quartered along with a lot of cavalry at a point in the area captured and are just in front of our big guns the country all around is a veritable abomination of desolation its surface is intersected at innumerable points with ditches in which much splendid english blood has flowed 
here and there looking very forlorn are stark and blasted stumps that used to be woods above and around the ceaseless voice of the guns fills the air with its clamour steel helmets and gas helmets are the standing order for us when on duty whom do you think i met this morning to my great delight no less a person than pika now an officer of the k r r s he was just back from a certain spot in the line where his lot had gone over with good results the story of his experiences occasioned heart-burnings to myself as regards the part i've been playing in the war behind the battle line he had recently met cartwright g t k clark and the elder dawson all old alenians who have had the privilege of participating in the push on the advice of the divisional a a and q m g i am reluctantly leaving over the question of transfer to the r f a till things get more settled at present i am away from the division and it is difficult almost impossible in fact for me to arrange the interviews with the medical and artillery authorities that are necessary as a preliminary to transfer still as i am getting plenty of interesting work at my present job i don't mind waiting september fourteenth nineteen sixteen last night i was detailed to go up with a working party engaged in operations on the very site of the last great battle the whole business took place under cover of darkness after an hour and a half's trudging up hill and down dale we got to the allotted spot and began our work the night was alive with noises ear-splitting reports of big guns the shrieks and whistles of shells in transit and the rat-a-tat of machine guns now and again the darkness would be illuminated by the glare of star shells i think i mentioned to you before the mournful desolation of this war-scarred countryside land without grass without trees without houses nothing more now than a wilderness with yawning shell craters innumerable and here and there blackened and branchless stumps that used to be trees we were near the site of a village famous in the annals of british arms a single brick of that village would be worth its weight in gold as a souvenir as we worked in the darkness the air was polluted by a horrible stench and as soon as one's eyes got accustomed to the gloom there became visible silent twisted forms that used to be men but enough i dare not tell you of the ghastly scenes on that historic battlefield it would give you nightmare for weeks to come if i did out here one gets into a callous state in which these things while unpleasant are scarcely noticed in the whirl and confusion of events personally at the time in traversing this battlefield i was slightly horrified at first but chiefly conscious only of the frightful odour of mortality it is on thinking the thing over in retrospect and with cold blood that the real sense of horror begins to creep into one's soul such is the so-called ennobling influence of war as i went over this grim battlefield with all its tragic sights i reflected bitterly on the triumph of twentieth century civilization our work occupied us about five hours and we trekked for home before dawn throughout the night there was movement and activity ration parties walking wounded stretcher bearers reliefs all moving silently in the darkness like so many phantoms i have picked up a number of souvenirs from the old bosch trenches including a bosch steel helmet with a shrapnel hole in the side as big as a crown piece its wearer must have gone west instanter september twenty first nineteen sixteen in the last few days two other officers and myself have been in charge of working parties starting out at eight a m it is our habit to proceed on foot to places distant anything up to three or four miles returning in the late afternoon yesterday we got to our destination about nine a m and found the bosch crumping with fair regularity the vicinity of an apology for a road though little more than a muddy track and only recently captured by us this road is full of traffic most hours of the day the hun knows this and acts accordingly as we were marching gaily up about nine a m he began a strafe of the district with pretty heavy shells at intervals of a couple of minutes suddenly came a bang about thirty yards in front of us on the road and he put a beautiful shot almost under the wheels of a lorry digging a huge crater in the road into which the crumpled up chassis subsided with a crash fortunately the driver was not there or for him it would have been a case of kingdom come 
i was at the head of our lot along with my friend lieutenant gardner we considered what we should do whether to push straight through to our destination which was not two hundred yards away or to wait where we were or split up into small parties we arranged that he should lead on while i would wait to see all the column pass and hurry up stragglers gardner had not gone farther than fifty yards when a six-incher came plonk within a few yards of him luckily he and all his lot had time to prostrate themselves and there were no casualties i was gathering the remainder of the party when whew, crash and i felt a terrific detonation at my very elbow and for a moment was stunned and deafened a bosch shell had pitched not five yards behind me how i was not blown to smithereens will always be a marvel to me as i staggered about under the shock of the explosion i could feel bits of steel and earth pattering on my helmet like rain after the first momentary shock i was in full possession of my wits and i quickly realized that for the moment at least i had lost all sense of hearing in my right ear but this was a small price to pay for the escape such a miracle would surely never happen again a few hours later i had regained a good deal of hearing power but it is not right yet experts however tell me that this effect will pass off in time a fragment of the shell passed through the right sleeve of my heavy overcoat i am glad to say we had no casualties at all though the enemy kept on dropping heavy stuff round about us all day well cheero i am keeping as fit as a horse my appetite i regret to say gets bigger every day september twenty seventh nineteen sixteen our working party having finished its duties i have now been appointed requisitioning officer to the second cavalry brigade this is much better than that horrible job with the supply column the war news is splendid but some glorious men have gone west we are paying a big price for victory the death of raymond asquith is a great tragedy a brilliant life extinguished one that gave promise of great things i had a shock to-day on reading in the paper that my old friend h edkins who took a junior scholarship at dulwich in the same year i did is reported among the missing he was an able and gifted fellow do you remember how well he sang at the school concert in december nineteen fourteen with all my heart i hope he is all right i wish you would get for me professor moulton's book the analytic study of literature End of in the Somme Battlefield from War Letters of a Public Schoolboy by Henry Paul Mannering Jones Recording by Patrick Eaton Kenilworth, Warwickshire, United Kingdom January 2014
і лине далеко-далеко до моїх товаришів. І з тихим шелестом зітханням стелиться по землі і шукає їхньої могили. Бо їм ніхто навіть могили не висипав. Тяжкі спільні терпіння з'єднали нерозривно наші душі, зробили нас братами. І в моїм серці плаче жаль і туга за ними. І згадую незабутнього товариша Василя Романишина. Друже мій, і ти вже не живеш. Твої кости біліють далеко серед синіх степів України. Осінній вітер бє їх, холодний дощ умиває їх, Роса вранці сльозами паде на них. Ні, я не можу, я не смію мовчати. І коли я мав силу, бодай у мільйонній частині, Зобразити людським словом їхні страждання І здобути в душі людини одну теплу сльозу з почуття до них, то я сповнив супроти них обов'язок їхнього брата і свідка їхнього болю і смерти. І скинув із душі тяжкий камінь, який мене давив. Хай моє скромне оповідання покладеться жалібним вінком квітів на їхню нікому незнану, богом і людьми забуту могилу. Хай наші спільні муки падуть прокльоном на старий світ, який ще досі тоне в морі крови і некчемності. Хай ясна ідея, що у тім оповіданні промінням близька цвинтарища й хаосу стихій із безмежнього болю і божевілля людей розгориться полум'ям у душі молодого українського покоління – і веде його все вище і вище на соняшний шлях волі і щастя великого українського народу і до вселюдського братерства і любови. І коли наша боротьба за волю така важка і кривава, то не падаймо ні на хвилю у темряву розпуки, бо через сльози і терпіння шлях веде до просвітління. Хто боровся з кути тьмою, тому сонце мрія мрій. Відень у вересні 1920 року. Осип Турянський. Кінець поза межами болю, переднє слово. Осипа Турянського. Цей звукозапис знаходиться у Суспільному надбанні. Wounded, how it feels to be shot. From And They Thought We Wouldn't Fight by Floyd Gibbons. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Wounded, how it feels to be shot. From And They Thought We Wouldn't Fight by Floyd Gibbons, official correspondent of the Chicago Tribune. Just how does it feel to be shot on the field of battle? Just what is the exact sensation when a bullet burns its way through your flesh or crashes through your bones? I always wanted to know. As a police reporter, I covered scores of shooting cases. But I could never learn from the victims what the precise feeling was as the piece of lead struck. For long years I had cherished an inordinate curiosity to know that sensation, if possible, without experiencing it. I was curious and eager for enlightenment, just as I am still anxious to know how it is that some people willingly drink buttermilk when it isn't compulsory. I am still in the dark concerning the inexplicable taste for that sour clotted product of a sweet well-meaning cow and the buttery but I have found out how it feels to be shot. I know it now by experience. Three Germans' bullets that violated my person left me as many scars, and at the same time completely satisfied my curiosity. 
I think now, if I can ever muster up the courage to drink a glass of buttermilk, I shall have bereft myself of my last inquisitiveness. It happened on June 6th, just to the northwest of Chateau Thierry in the Bois de Belleau. On the morning of that day, I left Paris by motor for a rush to the front. The Germans were on that day within forty miles of the capital of France. On the night before, the citizens of Paris, in their homes and hotels, had heard the roll of the guns drawing ever nearer. Many had left the city. But American divisions were in the line between the enemy and their goal, and the operation of these divisions was my object in hustling to the front. On the broad paved highway from Paris to Meaux, my car passed miles and miles of loaded motor trucks bound frontward. Long lines of these carried thousands of Americans. Other long lines were loaded down with shells and cartridge boxes. On the right side of the road, bound for Paris and points back of the line, was an endless stream of ambulances and other motor trucks bringing back wounded. Dense clouds of dust hung like a pall over the length of the road. The day was hot, the dust was stifling. From Meaux we proceeded along the straight highway that borders the south banks of the Marne to La Ferte, at which place we crossed the river and turned north to Montreuil, which was the newly occupied headquarters of the 2nd United States Army Division, General Omar Bundy commanding. On the day before, two infantry brigades of that division, one composed of the 5th and 6th U.S. Marines, under the command of Brigadier General Harbord, the other, composed of the Ninth and 23rd U.S. Infantry, had just been thrown into the line, which was just four miles to the north and east. The fight had been hot during the morning. The Marines on the left flank of the divisional sector had been pushing their lines forward through Triangle Woods and the village of Lucie de Bocage. The information of their advances was given to me by the divisional intelligence officer, who occupied a large room in the rear of the building that was used as divisional headquarters. The building was the village Mary, which also included the village schoolhouse. Now the desks of the school children were being used by our staff officers, and the walls and blackboards were covered with maps. I was accompanied by Lieutenant Oscar Hartzell, formerly of the New York Times staff, we learned that orders from the French High Command called for a continuation of the Marine advance during the afternoon and evening, and this information made it possible for us to make our plans. Although the Germans were shelling roads immediately behind the front, Lieutenant Hartzell and I agreed to proceed by motor from Montreuil a mile or so to a place called La Voie du Châtel, which was the headquarters of Colonel Neville of the 5th Marines. Reaching that place around four o'clock, we turned a dispatch over to the driver of our staff car, with instructions that he proceed with all haste to Paris, and there submit it to the U.S. Press Bureau. Lieutenant Hartzell and I announced our intentions of proceeding at once to the front line to Colonel Neville. "'Go wherever you like,' said the regimental commander, looking up from the outspread maps on the kitchen table in the low-ceilinged stone farmhouse that he had adopted as headquarters. "'Go as far as you like, but I want to tell you it's damn hot up there.' An hour later found us in the woods to the west of the village of Lucie de Bocage, in which German shells were continually falling. To the west and north another nameless cluster of farm dwellings was in flames. Huge clouds of smoke rolled up like a smudge against the background of blue sky. The ground under the trees in the wood was covered with small bits of white paper. I could not account for their presence, until I examined several of them and found that these were the letters from American mothers and wives and sweethearts. Letters, whole packages of them which the tired, dog-weary marines had been forced to remove from their packs and destroy, in order to ease the straps that cut into aching grooves in their shoulders. Circumstances also forced the abandonment of much other material and equipment. Occasional shells were dropping in the woods, which were also within range from a long distance, 
indirect machine-gun fire from the enemy. Bits of lead, wobbling in their flight at the end of their long trajectory, sung through the air above our heads, and clipped leaves and twigs from the branches. On the edge of the woods we came upon a hastily dug out pit in which there were two American machine-guns and their crews. The field in front of the woods sloped gently down some two hundred yards to another cluster of trees. This cluster was almost as big as the one we were in. Part of it was occupied by the Germans. Our machine-gunners maintained a continual fire into that part held by the enemy. Five minutes before five o'clock, the order for the advance reached our pit. It was brought there by a second lieutenant, a platoon commander. "'What are you doing here?' he asked, looking at the green brassard and the red sea on my left arm. "'Looking for the big story,' I said. "'If I were you, I'd be about forty miles south of this place,' said the lieutenant. "'But if you want to see the fun, stick around. "'We are going forward in five minutes.' "'That was the last I saw of him, "'until days later, when both of us, wounded, met in the hospital. "'Of course, the first thing he said was, "'I told you so.' "'We hurriedly finished the contents of the can of cold corned willy, "'which one of the machine-gunners and I were eating. "'The machine-guns were taken down.' and the barrels, cradles, and tripods were handed over to the members of the crew whose duties it was to carry them. And then we went over. There are really no heroics about it. There is no bugle call, no sword-waving, no dramatic enunciation of catchy commands, no theatricalism. It's just plain get up and go over. And it is done just the same as one would walk across a peaceful wheat field out in Iowa. But with the appearance of our first line, as it stepped from the shelter of the woods into the open exposure of the flat field, the woods opposite began to cackle and rattle with the enemy machine-gun fire. Our men advanced in open order ten and twelve feet between men. Sometimes a squad would run forward fifty feet and drop, and as its members flattened on the ground for safety, another squad would rise from the ground and make another rush. They gained the woods. Then we could hear shouting. Then we knew that work was being done with the bayonet. The machine-gun fire continued in intensity, and then died down completely. The wood had been won. Our men consolidated the position by moving forward in groups ever on the watch-out for snipers in the trees. A number of these were brought down by our crack pistol shots. At different times during the advance, Runners had come through the woods inquiring for Major John Berry, the battalion commander. One of these runners attached himself to Lieutenant Hartzell and myself, and together the three of us located the Major coming through the woods. He granted permission for Lieutenant Hartzell and me to accompany him, and we started forward, in all a party of some fifteen, including ten runners attached to the battalion commander. Owing to the continual evidences of German snipers in the trees, every one of our party carried a revolver ready in his hand, with the exception of myself. Correspondents, you will remember, are non-combatants and must be unarmed. I carried a notebook, but it was loaded. We made our way down the slope of the wooded hillside. Midway down the slope the hill was bisected by a sunken road which turned forward on the left. Lying in the road were a number of French bodies and several of our men, who had been brought down but five minutes before. We crossed that road hurriedly, knowing that it was covered from the left by German machine-guns. At the bottom of the slope there was a V-shaped field. The apex of the V was on the left. From left to right the field was some two hundred yards in width. The point where we came out of the woods was about one hundred yards from the apex. At that point the field was about one hundred yards across. It was perfectly flat, and covered with a young crop of oats between ten and fifteen inches high. This V-shaped oat-field was bordered on all sides by dense clusters of trees. In the trees on the side opposite the side where we stood were German machine-guns. We could hear them. 
we could not see them but we knew that every leaf and piece of greenery there vibrated from their fire and the tops of the young oats waved and swayed with the streams of lead that swept across major berry gave orders for us to follow him at intervals of ten or fifteen yards then he started across the field alone at the head of the party i followed behind me came hartzell then the woods about us began to rattle fiercely it was unusually close range that lead traveled so fast that we could not hear it as it passed we soon had visual demonstration of the hot place we were in when we began to see the dust puffs that the bullets kicked up in the dirt around our feet major berry had advanced well beyond the center of the field when i saw him turn toward me and heard him shout get down everybody we all fell on our faces and then it began to come hot and fast perfectly withering volleys of lead swept the tops of the oats just over us for some reason it did not seem to be coming from the trees hardly a hundred yards in front of us it was coming from a new direction from the left i was busily engaged flattening myself onto the ground then i heard a shout in front of me it came from major berry i lifted my head cautiously and looked forward the major was making an effort to get to his feet with his right hand he was savagely grasping his left wrist my hand's gone he shouted one of the streams of lead from the left had found him a ball had entered his left arm at the elbow had traveled down the side of the bone tearing away the muscles and nerves of the forearm and lodging itself in the palm of his hand his pain was excruciating get down flatten out major i shouted and he dropped to the ground i did not know the extent of his injuries at that time but i did know that he was courting death every minute he stood up we've got to get out of here said the major we've got to get forward they'll start shelling this open field in a few minutes i lifted my head for another cautious look i judged that i was lying about thirty yards from the edge of the trees in front of us the major was about ten yards in front of me you are twenty yards from the trees i shouted to the major i am crawling over to you now wait until i get there and i'll help you then we'll get up and make a dash for it all right replied the major hurry along i started forward keeping as flat on the ground as it was possible to do so and at the same time move as far as was feasible i pushed forward by digging in with my toes and elbows extended in front of me it was my object to make as little movement in the oats as possible i was not mistaken about the intensity of fire that swept that field it was terrific and then it happened the lighted end of a cigarette touched me in the fleshy part of my upper left arm that was all it just felt like a sudden burn and nothing worse the burned part did not seem to be any larger in area than that part which could be burned by the lighted end of a cigarette at the time there was no feeling within the arm that is no feeling as to aches or pain there was nothing to indicate that the bullet as i learned several days later had gone through the bicep muscle of the upper arm and had come out on the other side the only sensation perceptible at the time was the burning touch at the spot where the bullet entered i glanced down at the sleeve of my uniform coat and could not even see the hole where the bullet had entered neither was there any sudden flow of blood at the time there was no stiffness or discomfort in the arm and i continued to use it to work my way forward then the second one hit it nicked the top of my left shoulder and again came the burning sensation only this time the area affected seemed larger hitting as it did in the meaty cap of the shoulder i feared that there would be no further use for the arm until it had received attention but again i was surprised when i found upon experiment that i could still use it the bone seemed to be affected in no way again there was no sudden flow of blood nor stiffness it seemed hard for me to believe at the time but i had been shot twice 
penetrated through by two bullets, and was experiencing not any more pain than I had experienced once when I dropped a lighted cigarette on the back of my hand. I am certain that the pain in no way approached that sensation which the dentist provides when he drills into a tooth with a live nerve in it. So I continued to move toward the major. Occasionally I would shout something to him, although at this time I am unable to remember what it was. I only wanted to let him know I was coming. I had fears, based on the one look I had obtained of his pain-distorted face, that he had been mortally shot in the body. And then the third one struck me. In order to keep as close to the ground as possible, I had swung my chin to the right, so that I was pushing forward with my left cheek flat against the ground, and in order to accommodate this position of the head, I had moved my steel helmet over so that it covered part of my face on the right. Then there came a crash. It sounded to me like someone had dropped a glass bottle into a porcelain bathtub. A barrel of whitewash tipped over, and it seemed that everything in the world turned white. That was the sensation. I did not recognize it, because I have often been led to believe, and have often heard it said, that when one receives a blow on the head, everything turns black. Maybe I am contrarily constructed, but in my case everything became pure white. I remember this distinctly, because my years of newspaper training had been in but one direction, to sense and remember. So it was that, even without knowing it, my mind was making mental notes on every impression that my senses registered. I did not know yet where I had been hit, or what the bullet had done. I knew that I was still knowing things. I did not know whether I was alive or dead, but I did know that my mind was still working. I was still mentally taking notes on every second. The first recess in that note-taking came when I asked myself the following question. Am I dead? I didn't laugh, or didn't even smile, when I asked myself the question, without putting it in words. I wanted to know, and wanting to know, I undertook to find out. I am not aware now that there was any appreciable passage of time during this mental process. I feel certain, however, that I never lost consciousness. How was I to find out if I was dead? The shock had lifted my head off the ground, but I had immediately replaced it as close to the soil as possible. My twice-punctured left arm was lying alongside my body. I decided to try and move my fingers on my left hand. I did so, and they moved. I next moved my left foot. Then I knew I was alive. Then I brought my right hand up towards my face and placed it to the left of my nose. My fingers rested on something soft and wet. I withdrew the hand and looked at it. It was covered with blood. As I looked at it, I was not aware that my entire vision was confined to my right eye, although there was considerable pain in the entire left side of my face. This was sufficient to send me on another mental investigation. I closed my right eye, and all was dark. My first thought, following this experiment, was that my left eye was closed. So I again counseled with myself, and tried to open my left eye, that is, tried to give the mental command that would cause the muscles of the left eye to open the lid and close it again. I did this but could not feel or verify in any way whether the eyelid responded or not. I only knew that it remained dark on that side. This brought me to another conclusion, and not a pessimistic one at that. I simply believed, in spite of the pain, that something had struck me in the eye and had closed it. I did not know then, as I know now, that a bullet, striking the ground immediately under my left cheekbone, had ricocheted upward, going completely through the left eye and then crashing out through my forehead, leaving the eyeball and upper eyelid completely halved, and the lower eyelid torn away, and a compound fracture of the skull. 
further progress toward the major was impossible. I must confess that I became so intensely interested in the weird sensations and subjective research that I even neglected to call out and tell the wounded officer that I would not be able to continue to his assistance. I held this view in spite of the fact that my original intentions were strong. Lying there with my left cheek flat on the ground, I was able to observe some minutes later the wounded major rise to his feet, and in a perfect hail of lead rush forward and out of my line of vision. It was several days later, in the hospital, that I learned that he reached the shelter of the woods beyond without being hit again, and in that place, although suffering intense pain, was able to shout back orders which resulted in the subsequent wiping out of the machine-gun nest that had been our undoing. For this supreme effort General Pershing decorated him with the Distinguished Service Cross. I began to make plans to get out of the exposed position in which I was lying. Whereas the field, when I started across it, had seemed perfectly flat, now it impressed me as being convex, and I was further impressed with the belief that I was lying on the very uppermost and most exposed curvature of it. There is no doubt that the continued stream of machine-gun lead that swept the field superinduced this belief. I got as close to the ground as a piece of paper on top of a table. I remember regretting sincerely that the war had reached the stage of open movement, and one consequence of which was that there wasn't a shell-hole anywhere to crawl into. This did not, however, eliminate the dangerous possibility of shelling. With the fatalism that one acquires along the fronts, I was ready to take my chances with the casual German shell that one might have expected, but I devoted much thought to a consideration of the French and American artillery some miles behind me. I considered the possibility of word having been sent back that our advancing waves at this point had been cut down by enemy machine-gunners, who were still in position, preventing all progress at this place. I knew that such information, if sent back, would immediately be forwarded to our guns, and then a devastating concentration of shells would be directed toward the location of the machine-gun nests. I knew that I was lying one hundred yards from one of those nests, and I knew that I was well within the fatal bursting radius of any shells our gunners might direct against that German target. My fear was that myself and other American wounded lying in that field would die by American guns. That is what would have happened if that information had reached our artillery, and it is what should have happened. The lives of the wounded in that field were as nothing compared with the importance of wiping out that machine-gun nest on the left which was holding up the entire advance. I wanted to see what time it was, and my watch was attached to my left wrist. In endeavouring to get a look at it, I found out that my left arm was stiff, and racked with pain. Hartzell, I knew, had a watch, but I did not know where he was lying, so I called out. He answered me from some distance away, but I could not tell how far or in what direction. I could see dimly, but only at the expense of great pain. When he answered, I shouted back to him, "'Are you hit?' "'No, are you?' he asked. "'Yes. What time is it?' I said. "'Are you hit badly?' he asked in reply. "'No, I don't think so,' I said. "'I think I'm all right.' "'Where are you hit?' he asked. "'In the head,' I said. "'I think something hit my eye.' "'In the head, you damn fool!' he shouted louder, with just a bit of anger and surprise in his voice. "'How the hell can you be all right if you're hit in the head? Are you bleeding much?' "'No,' I said. "'What time is it? Will you tell me?' "'I'm coming over to get you,' shouted Hartzell. "'Don't move, you damn fool. You want to kill both of us?' I hastened to shout back. "'If you start moving, don't move near me.' I think they think I'm dead. Well, you can't lie there and bleed to death, Hartzell replied. We've got to do something to get the hell out of here. What'll we do? Tell me what time it is, and how long it will be before it's dark, I asked. It's six o'clock now, Hartzell said. 
and it won't be dark till nine. This is June. Do you think you can stick it out? I told him that I thought I could, and we were silent for some time. Both of us had the feeling that other ears, ears working in conjunction with eyes trained along the barrels of those machine guns a hundred yards on our left, would be aroused to better marksmanship if we continued to talk. I began to take stock of my condition. During my year and more along the fronts, I had been through many hospitals, and from my observations in those institutions, I had cultivated a keen distaste for one thing, gas gangrene. I had learned from doctors its fatal and horrible results, and I had also learned from them that it was caused by germs which exist in large quantities in any ground that has been under artificial cultivation for a long period. Such was the character of the very field I was lying in, and I came to the realization that the wound in the left side of my face and head was resting flatly on the soil. With my right hand I drew up my British box respirator or gas mask and placed this under my head. Thus I rested with more confidence although the machine-gun lead continued to pass in sheets through the tops of the oats not two or three inches above my head. All of it was coming from the left, coming from the German nests located in the trees at the apex of the V-shaped field. Those guns were not a hundred yards away, and they seemed to have an inexhaustible supply of ammunition. Twenty feet away, on my left, a wounded marine was lying. Occasionally I would open my right eye for a painful look in his direction. He was wounded, and apparently unconscious. His pack, the khaki doll, was still strapped between his shoulders. Unconsciously he was doing that which all wounded men do, that is, to assume the position that is the most comfortable. He was trying to roll over on his back. But the pack was on his back and every time he would roll over on this it would elevate his body into a full view of the German gunners. Then a withering hail of lead would sweep the field. It so happened that I was lying immediately in line between those German guns and this unconscious moving target. As the Marine would roll over on top of the pack, his chest would be exposed to the fire. I could see the buttons fly from his tunic, and one of the shoulder straps of the backpack part as the sprays of lead struck him. He would limply roll off the pack over on his side. I found myself wishing that he would lie still, as every movement of his brought those streams of bullets closer and closer to my head. I even considered the thickness of the box respirator on which I had elevated my head off the ground. It was about two inches thick. I remembered my French gas mask hanging from my shoulder, and recalled immediately that it was much flatter, being hardly half an inch in thickness. I forthwith drew up the French mask to my head, extracted the British one, and rested my cheek closer to the ground on the French one. Thus I lowered my head about an inch and a half, an inch and a half that represented worlds of satisfaction and some optimism to me. Sometimes there were lulls in the firing. During those periods of comparative quiet, I could hear the occasional moan of other wounded on that field. Very few of them cried out, and it seemed to me that those who did were unconscious when they did it. One man in particular had a long, low groan. I could not see him, yet I felt he was lying somewhere close to me. In the quiet intervals, his unconscious expression of pain reminded me of the sound I had once heard made by a calf which had been tied by a short rope to a tree. The animal had strayed round and round the tree, until its entanglements in the rope left it a helpless prisoner. The groan of that unseen, unconscious, wounded American who lay near me on the field that evening sounded exactly like the pitiful ball of that calf. Those three hours were long in passing. With the successive volleys that swept the field, I sometimes lost hope that I could ever survive it. It seemed to me that if three German bullets had found me within the space of fifteen minutes, I could hardly expect to spend three hours without receiving the fatal one. 
With such thoughts on my mind, I reopened the conversation with Hartzell. "'How's it coming, old man?' I shouted. "'They're coming damn close,' he said. "'How is it with you? Are you losing much blood?' "'No, I'm all right as far as that goes,' I replied. "'But I want you to communicate with my wife, if it's west for me.' "'What's her address?' said Hartzell. "'It's a long one,' I said. "'Are you ready to take it?' "'Shoot,' said Hartzell. "'Mrs. Floyd Gibbons, number 12, B, Rue de la Chevalier de la Barre, Dijon, Côte d'Or, France,' I said slowly. "'My God,' said Hartzell, "'say it again.' Back and forth we repeated the address, correctly and incorrectly, some ten or twelve times, until Hartzell informed me that he knew it well enough to sing it. He also gave me his wife's address. Then, just to make conversation, he would shout over every fifteen minutes and tell me that there was just that much less time that we would have to lie there. I thought that hour between seven and eight o'clock dragged the most, but the one between eight and nine seemed interminable. The hours were so long, particularly when we considered that a German machine gun could fire three hundred shots a minute. Dusk approached slowly, and finally Hartzell called over. I don't think they can see us now, he said. Let's start to crawl back. "'Which way shall we crawl?' I asked. "'Into the woods,' said Hartzell. "'Which woods?' I asked. "'The woods we came out of, you damn fool,' he replied. "'Which direction are they in?' I said. "'I've been moving around, and I don't know which way I'm heading. "'Are you on my left or on my right?' "'I can't tell whether I'm on your left or your right,' he replied. "'How are you lying, on your face or on your back?' on my face, I said, and your voice sounds like it comes from in back of me and to the left. If that's the case, said Hartzell, your head is lying toward the wrong woods. Work around in a half circle and you'll be facing in the right direction. I did so, and then heard Hartzell's voice on my right. I started moving toward him. Against my better judgment and expressed wishes, he crawled out toward me and met me halfway. His voice, close in front of me, surprised me. "'Hold your head up a little,' he said. "'I want to see where it hit you.' "'I don't think it looks very nice,' I replied, lifting my head. I wanted to know how it looked myself. So I painfully opened the right eye and looked through the oats eighteen inches into Hartzell's face. I saw the look of horror on it as he looked into mine. Twenty minutes later, after crawling painfully through the interminable yards of young oats, we reached the edge of the woods in safety. That's how it feels to be shot. End of Wounded, How It Feels to be Shot From And They Thought We Wouldn't Fight by Floyd Gibbons Read by Maria Casper Hoofdstuk 1 van Oorlogstijd door meester M. W. F. Troip. Dit is een LibriVox-opname. Alle LibriVox-opnamen zijn vrij van auteursrechten. Voor meer informatie of om je aan te melden als vrijwilliger, ga naar LibriVox.org. Oorlogstijd van meester M. W. F. Troip, oud-minister van Landbouw, Nijverheid en Handel, oud-minister van Financiën. Hoofdstuk 1 Handhaving van Slands soevereiniteit en neutraliteit. Paragraaf 1. De mobilisatie en de staat van oorlog en van beleg. Onder de betrekkelijk weinige regeringsmaatregelen, welke geheel spontaan, zonder aandrang van buiten, werden genomen, neemt het mobilisatiebesluit zeker de eerste plaats in. Toen de onweerswolken aan de internationale politieke hemel in de laatste dagen van juli 1914 zo dreigend samenpakten dat een uitbarsting onvermijdelijk scheen, kwam de ministerraad dagelijks bijeen en werd ook dagelijks, hetzij bij monden van de tijdelijke voorzitter van die raad 
of van een der andere bij enig onderwerp meer in het bijzonder betrokken ministers overleg gepleegd met hare majesteit de koningin die toen gevaar dreigde terstond haar verblijf op het lo had onderbroken en naar den haag was gekomen maandag 27 juli des ochtends vroeg kwam de koningin in de residentie dezelfde dag werd voor het eerst ministerraad gehouden tot het beramen van maatregelen met het oog op het dreigend oorlogsgevaar het resultaat van die eerste oorlogsministerraad was het gebruik maken van de bevoegdheid door militie en landweerwet aan de kroon gegeven om bij oorlogsgevaar het ontslag van dienstplichtigen uit de dienst bij de militie en bij de landweer en de overgang van militieplichtigen tot de landweer te schorsen in afwachting van wettelijke regelingen in die geest waarvoor de ontwerpen tegelijk werden vastgesteld en naar de raad van state verzonden reeds dezelfde dag werden de voorstellen van de ministerraad tot die maatregelen door de koningin bekrachtigd en ondertekend en verschenen zij in het staatsblad dat was het eerste gelui die maatregelen hadden slechts een voorbereidend karakter financiële offers van betekenis brachten zij niet met zich en mochten zij overbodig gebleken zijn dan zouden zij ook geen persoonlijke offers van enig aanbelang geëist hebben ze wezen echter op het gespannen zijn van de toestand en op de waakzaamheid der regering voor de afweer van eventuele schending van grondgebied spoedig werden zij gevolgd door een tweede maatregel van wijdere strekking maar die toch nog van betrekkelijk weinig ingrijpende aard was tussen maandag 27 en donderdag 30 juli werd het oorlogsgevaar zoveel dreigender dat op laatstgenoemde dag door de ministerraad aan de koningin werd voorgesteld op grond van artikel 186 der grondwet te verklaren dat oorlogsgevaar in de zin waarin dat woord in slands wetten voorkomt aanwezig was en dat gebruik gemaakt werd van de bevoegdheid aan de kroon bij de landweer werd gegeven om in tijden van oorlog oorlogsgevaar of andere buitengewone omstandigheden de landweer in haar geheel of bepaalde landweerafdelingen of landweerkorpsen onder de wapenen te roepen krachtens die bevoegdheid werden bij koninklijk besluit van die dag de tot de landweer behorende die deel uitmaakten van de landweer grenswacht de landweer kustwacht en de landweer bewakingsdetachementen onder de wapenen geroepen de koninklijke verklaring dat oorlogsgevaar aanwezig was verscheen op 31 juli in de staatscourant het besluit tot oproeping der grenswacht was het resultaat van een uitvoerige beraadslaging in de ministerraad niet aan de wenselijkheid van de door de minister van oorlog voorgestelde maatregel betreffende de grensbewaking werd getwijfeld daarover bestond aanstonds eenstemmigheid men vroeg zich echter af of het niet nodig was reeds terstond de definitieve stap te doen en het gehele leger te mobiliseren na het voor en tegen te hebben gewikt en gewogen besloot men de loop van zaken althans nog één dag aan te zien daar behalve in servië en in oostenrijk hongarije nog in geen enkel land tot mobilisatie was overgegaan en nog met de mogelijkheid mocht worden gerekend dat op het laatste ogenblik de zaken een gunstige wending zouden nemen het mobilisatiebesluit zou al duurde het onder de wapenen zijn van alle dienstplichtigen nog zo kort zoals de minister van oorlog mededeelde te staan komen op een uitgaaf van omstreeks twaalf miljoen gulden zulk een uitgaaf achter de regering alleen bij dringende noodzakelijkheid verantwoord in dezelfde vergadering werden echter de ministers van oorlog en van marine gemachtigd behoudens koninklijke goedkeuring de nodige voorbereidende maatregelen te treffen en werd een verstrekkend besluit genomen waardoor de mobilisatie ook in ander opzicht werd ingeleid op grond van artikel 50 der spoorwegwet werd besloten aan de koningin te vragen dat de minister van oorlog zou worden gemachtigd het gebruik der spoorwegen voor schrijksdienst te vorderen die machtiging werd dezelfde dag verleend maar nog niet bekend gemaakt vrijdagochtend 31 juli waren de berichten zo onrustbarend dat na nieuw beraad besloten werd tot de mobilisatie het onder de wapenen roepen van alle militie en landweerplichtigen over te gaan en tot het nemen van de verschillende maatregelen welke met de mobilisatie in onafscheidelijk verband stonden daaronder het gebruik maken door de minister van oorlog van de machtiging tot vordering der spoorwegen hem de vorige dag door de kroon verleend het mobilisatiebesluit was het rechtstreeks gevolg van de telegrafische berichten omtrent de uiterst gespannen toestand tussen rusland en duitsland in de staatscourant van 31 juli verschenen de kennisgevingen van de ministers van oorlog en van marine dat bij koninklijk besluit van diezelfde dag ten eerste was bevolen de niet in werkelijke dienst zijn dienstplichtigen van het leger de landweer en de zeemacht 
van alle lichtingen, onverwijld onder de wapenen te roepen, waarvoor als datum van opkomst de 1. augustus was aangegeven. En ten tweede, de minister van oorlog gemachtigd was het gebruik van alle spoorwegen te vorderen, voor zoveel hem dat gebruik voor schrijksdienst in het belang van de verdediging van het land nodig voorkwam. Ik behoef wel niet te zeggen dat alle leden van de regering gevoelden welk een verantwoordelijkheid zij met die besluiten op zich namen, besluiten die niet alleen aan Schrijks schatkist op miljoenen te staan kwamen, maar die bovendien zeer diep ingrepen in het leven der dienstplichtigen en een schromelijke belemmering zouden teweeg brengen in het verkeer. Die verantwoordelijkheid was te groter, omdat op het ogenblik dat Nederland tot mobilisatie overging, met uitzondering van Servië en Oostenrijk-Hongarije, welke landen sedert 28 juli met elkander in oorlog waren, nog geen enkel land die maatregel officieel genomen had, ook al waren er, met name in Rusland en Duitsland, reeds grote troepenbewegingen gaande. Bij het nemen dezer zo gewichtige beslissing gaf de doorslag de overweging dat in die men talmde en de grens eens werd geschonden, voordat men tot afweer, voor zover de krachten reikten, gereed zou staan, de verantwoordelijkheid voor het niet doen nog veel groter zou zijn dan die voor een daad waarvan wel denkbaar, maar hoogst onwaarschijnlijk was dat zij overbodig zou blijken, doch die door het enkele feit dat zij plaats greep, zowel naar binnen als naar buiten, getuigenis aflegde van de ernstige wil der regering, met de kracht waarover men beschikte, elke schending van Nederlands grondgebied te weren. Het verdere verloop der omstandigheden heeft de maatregel maar al te zeer gewettigd. De mobilisatie kwam geen dag te vroeg, maar ook geen dag te laat. De wijze waarop zij van stapel liep, ligt nog vers in ieders geheugen. Zij was in één woord onberispelijk. Binnen drie à vier dagen was ze geheel voltooid en ze ging in haar werk alsof er een jaarlijkse generale repetitie aan was voorafgegaan. De prestatie welke daarmede door onze legerautoriteiten werd geleverd, maakte een onverdeeld gunstige indruk en zij heeft zeker niet nagelaten ook bij onze machtige naburen eerbied af te dwingen voor hetgeen hier met beperkte middelen werd bereikt en voor het zo volledig in orde zijn der voorbereiding en der organisatie van het onverwijld op voet van oorlog brengen van de gehele weermacht. Wat er ook aan onze legerorganisatie mogen ontbreken, het onderdeel daarvan dat de mobilisatie voorbereid en uitgewerkt had, bleek puik te zijn. Op dezelfde dag dat het mobilisatiebesluit in de staatscourant verscheen, werd de luitenant-generaal C. J. Snijders benoemd tot opperbevelhebber van land- en zeemacht. Ik herinner mij niet meer of de toekenning van de rang van generaal aanstonds bij het besluit tot benoeming van de opperbevelhebber plaatsvond of enige dagen later geschiedde. Dat is trouwens van ondergeschikte betekenis. Voordat tot die benoeming kon worden overgegaan, waren zaken van heel wat groter belang te regelen. Toen eenmaal vaststond dat een opperbevelhebber zou worden benoemd, was men het over de keuze van de persoon vrijwel terstond eens. De voordracht van de minister van oorlog daaromtrent gaf nauwelijks tot enige gedachtenwisseling aanleiding. Anders echter stond het met de regeling van de positie welke de opperbevelhebber tegenover de regering en in zonderheid ook tegenover de ministers van oorlog en van marine zou innemen. Het gold hier een even delicate als moeilijke kwestie. Wordt eenmaal een opperbevelhebber benoemd, dan moet het legerbestuur in engere zin geheel in zijn hand berusten en voor zijn verantwoordelijkheid zijn. Hij mag geen gevaar lopen dat hij bij de opstelling of de verplaatsing van troepen inmenging zal behoeven te dulden van het departement van oorlog. Ieder gevoelt de noodzakelijkheid dat, als er met het leger gehandeld, dat wil zeggen gestreden, moet worden, de leiding in één hand zij. Alleen bij zulk een regeling is er waarborg dat er snel en naar één leidende gedachte zal kunnen worden opgetreden. Alleen dan is ook mogelijk dat de verantwoordelijkheid voor het gebruik dat van het leger wordt gemaakt en voor de behandeling welke het daarbij ondergaat, niet wordt verdeeld en verwaterd. Maar aan de andere kant blijft ook in tijd van oorlog het voorschrift van de grondwet van kracht dat de koning onschendbaar is en de ministers, tegenover de Staten-Generaal, verantwoordelijk zijn. Het was dus niet mogelijk de instructie van de opperbevelhebber op te trekken op de grondslag dat hij een positie zou bekleden waardoor de ministeriële verantwoordelijkheid voor zijn handelingen zou worden uitgeschakeld. Aangezien de instructie van de opperbevelhebber geen publiek stuk is, mag ik niet mededelen op welke wijze het probleem dat hier op te lossen viel als resultaat van overleggingen met de koningin en met de heer Snijders en van besprekingen in de ministerraad een oplossing vond. 
ik moet er mij toe bepalen als mijn oordeel uit te spreken dat de oplossing die gevonden werd een gelukkige heten mag dit neemt niet weg dat het enkele feit van het bestaan van een opperbevelhebberschap voor een minister van oorlog moeilijkheden schept die niet door papieren regelingen kunnen worden overwonnen maar alleen door tact en wederzijds streven naar goede verstandhouding heel wat minder hoofdbreken dan de regeling der verhouding tussen de opperbevelhebber en de regering kostte de bepaling van zijn salaris er mocht mede worden gerekend en er werd mede gerekend dat de aanstelling tot opperbevelhebber voor de militair die daartoe werd uitverkoren een onderscheiding was van de allerhoogste orde maar het was niet te min duidelijk dat het opperbevelhebberschap niet als een zuiver ereambt mocht worden aangemerkt en behandeld indien ons land onverhoopt in de oorlog zou worden betrokken en men mocht in het begin van augustus 1914 nauwelijks verwachten dat die ramp aan ons land zou voorbijtrekken zou op de leider van leger en vloot een zo buitengemeen zware verantwoordelijkheid rusten zouden aan hem zo hoge eisen worden gesteld dat het grote vertrouwen in zijn kunde en krijgsbeleid ook in het bedrag zijner bezoldiging althans enigszins tot uitdrukking moest komen aan deze eis kon slechts in zeer beperkte mate worden voldaan daar de salarissen ook van de hoogste staatsambtenaren in nederland nu eenmaal niet in verhouding staan tot de eisen welke hun mogen en moeten worden gesteld nog tot de verantwoordelijkheid die zij hebben te dragen doch zelfs in het licht van deze overweging bezien was het bedrag waarop het salaris van de opperbevelhebber werd bepaald aan de bescheiden kant in het nauwste verband met de mobilisatie en de verschillende daaraan aansluitende maatregelen ter verdediging van het vaderland stonden de later bij de wet bekrachtigde koninklijke besluiten tot het in staat van oorlog of van beleg verklaren van enkele gedeelten des rijks het eerst werd bij koninklijk besluit van 5 augustus de staat van oorlog afgekondigd over het gebied behorende tot verschillende stellingen en tot de nieuwe hollandse waterlinen en over het grondgebied rondom enkele verdedigingswerken deze eerste verklaring in staat van oorlog geschiedde voornamelijk ten einde in de gedeelte van het rijk waarop zij betrekking had de artikelen 15 en 16 van de wet van 23 mei 1899 staatsblad nummer 128 houden de bepalingen ter uitvoering van artikel 187 der grondwet toepasselijk te maken die artikelen regelen de bevoegdheid van het militair gezag om in de in staat van oorlog verklaarde landsgedeelten tegen schadeloosstelling te doen wegruimen wat aan de behoorlijke verdediging in de weg staat en in gebruik te nemen wat voor de militaire dienst noodzakelijk is heel spoedig volgde in verband met de strijd die in belgië werd gestreden en met de daaruit voortspruitende noodzakelijkheid vooral in de zuidelijke provincies zich op alle mogelijke eventualiteiten voor te bereiden bij koninklijk besluit van 10 augustus de staat van oorlog voor de provincies limburg noord brabant en zeeland en voor het gedeelte van gelderland bezuiden de waal bij latere koninklijke besluiten die telkens in gevolge artikel 5 der zoeven genoemde wet werden bekrachtigd werd de staat van oorlog nog over enkele andere landsgedeelten uitgebreid de staat van beleg werd bij koninklijk besluit van 29 augustus afgekondigd voor een aantal grensgemeenten in zeeuws vlaanderen noord brabant en limburg spoedig daarna bij koninklijk besluit van 8 september werden de grensgemeenten langs de gehele land en zeegrens en daarmede ook de riviermondingen in staat van beleg verklaard later werd de grensstrook waar de staat van beleg geldt nog enigszins verbreed het verschil tussen de staat van beleg en de staat van oorlog bestaat hierin dat de staat van beleg een verscherpte staat van oorlog is bij de staat van oorlog gaat het gezag wel grotendeels van de burgerlijke overheid op de militaire autoriteit over maar moet toch door deze autoriteit met de burgerlijke overheid nog overleg worden gepleegd bij de staat van oorlog blijven ook het grondwettelijk recht van vereniging en vergadering evenals de vrijheid van drukpers en het geheim van post en telegraaf ongerept de staat van beleg gaat aanmerkelijk verder de burgerlijke besturen en de daarbij in dienst zijnde ambtenaren zijn in de in staat van beleg verklaarde landsgedeelten verplicht te gehoorzamen aan de bevelen van het militaire gezag openbare vergaderingen worden daar met uitzondering van openbare godsdienstoefeningen alleen gehouden met vergunning van de militaire overheid dit gezag kan in de in staat van beleg verklaarde landsgedeelten beperkende bepalingen vaststellen omtrent het drukken uitgeven verspreiden aanplakken of in de handel brengen van geschriften of tekeningen of dit geheel verbieden het krijgt er de beschikking over de posterij de telegraaf en de telefoondienst en is bevoegd alle stukken aan die diensten of aan enige andere instelling van vervoer toevertrouwd te openen 
het is bevoegd personen wier aanwezigheid voor de rust of de algemene veiligheid gevaarlijk wordt geacht uit het in staat van beleg verklaarde gebied te verwijderen en omgekeerd aan niet-militairen die voor de verdediging nuttig werkzaam kunnen zijn het verlaten van het in staat van beleg verklaarde grondgebied te verbieden het heeft nog andere bevoegdheden die ik niet alle behoeft op te sommen uit het medegedeelde blijkt wel dat het militaire gezag behoudens de door de kroon gegeven instructiën in landsgedeelten die in staat van beleg zijn verklaard oppermachtig is de bijna grenzenloze macht waarover het militaire gezag beschikt in de streken waar de staat van beleg geldt moest de regering er wel toe brengen de staat van beleg alleen daar af te kondigen waar dit ter handhaving van de verschillende in het belang der veiligheid van de staat gegeven voorschriften strikt noodzakelijk was aandrang tot verdere uitbreiding werd dan ook meer dan eenmaal door de ministerraad afgewezen het zou wel gewenst geweest zijn dat bijvoorbeeld enige kooplieden in onze handelsteden wat meer onder controle hadden gestaan dan onder normale omstandigheden het geval is maar een maatregel waardoor om dit te bereiken in steden als amsterdam en rotterdam het briefgeheim zowel als de vrijheid van vereniging en vergadering en de vrijheid van drukpers zouden zijn opgeheven zou toch buiten verhouding zijn geweest tot het kwaad dat hij moest keren die maatregel werd dan ook terecht niet genomen al is hij meer dan eenmaal ter sprake gekomen bij de vaststelling der landsgedeelte in welke in staat van oorlog of van beleg werden verklaard golden natuurlijk in de eerste plaats overwegingen van zuiver militaire aard die overwegingen werden echter ten aanzien van verschillende plaatsen door anderen aangevuld sommige gemeten werden in staat van beleg verklaard ter wille van het tegengaan van ontvluchting van geïnterneerden andere om wederzijdse bespionering van oorlogvoerenden door agenten van de vijand met beter gevolg te kunnen beletten bij het in staat van beleg verklaren van een zoom langs de grenzen sprak ook de noodzakelijkheid eener ernstige bestrijding van de smokkelhandel inzonderheid van de ontduiking der uitvoerverboden een krachtig woord mede het stond niet zo aanstonds vast dat de staat van oorlog en de staat van beleg mede tot dit doel mochten worden gebezigd daarover is dan ook in de ministerraad meer dan eenmaal van gedachten gewisseld voor mij is het niet twijfelachtig geweest dat deze middelen ter handhaving van de veiligheid wel degelijk ook gebezigd mochten worden om het illusoir maken van uitvoerverboden te voorkomen al ontken ik niet dat men bij de vaststelling van artikel 187 der grondwet en van de wet op de staat van oorlog en van beleg welke ter uitvoering van dat grondwetsartikel werd gemaakt meer in het bijzonder aan rechtstreeks gevaar door vijandelijke invallen heeft gedacht men moet er toch van uitgaan dat de uitvoerverboden ten doel hadden en hebben krijgsbenodigdheden levensmiddelen en grondstoffen binnenslands grenzen te houden voor zover ze geheel of ten dele voor de verdediging van het land of voor de voeding kleding of huisvesting van de bevolking in het land behoren te blijven of zonder gevaar van weder uitvoer moet kunnen worden ingevoerd over de uitvoerverboden zelven en de overwegingen welke bij het stellen daarvan hebben gegolden spreek ik in het volgende hoofdstuk wanneer echter vaststaat dat zij zoals de gelegener plaatsen nader zal worden aangetoond geen ander doel hebben dan zo even werd aangegeven is het toch wel duidelijk dat het overtreden daarvan niet alleen indirect maar ook rechtstreeks de veiligheid van de staat in gevaar kan brengen aan smokkelarij volledig de kop indrukken is onder zo abnormale toestanden als waaronder men sedert het uitbreken van de oorlog leeft minder dan ooit te denken de prijsverschillen aan deze en aan gene zijde van de grens waren en zijn ten aanzien van een aantal artikelen zo buitensporig groot dat de verleiding om daarvan te profiteren niet alleen in het klein voor een aantal grensbewoners maar ook in het groot voor helaas maar al te veel kooplieden te sterk is geweest indien nu de regering er niet voor zorgt dat kwaad binnen zo eng mogelijke grenzen te beperken krijgt het afmetingen welke gevaren van verschillende aard kunnen in het leven roepen wordt er gesmokkeld met het over de grenzen voeren van ten uitvoer verboden krijgsbenodigdheden of grondstoffen daarvoor dan ligt het gevaar dat dit voor de veiligheid hebben kan voor de hand maar ook het uitvoeren van levensmiddelen kan die veiligheid ernstig schaden men behoeft dit thans wel niet in de brede te betogen nu ondanks de uitvoer verboden de prijzen van sommige levensmiddelen tijdelijk zo zeer zijn gestegen dat zij voor bescheiden beurzen onbereikbaar zijn geworden betreft het uitvoerverbod goederen die hier niet worden voortgebracht en moeten worden ingevoerd en die van elders alleen kunnen worden verkregen indien aan een der belligerente partijen door de importeur gegarandeerd wordt dat hetgeen zij naar nederland doorlaat uitsluitend voor binnenlands verbruik is bestemd en zal worden gebezigd dan brengt de goede trouw mede dat de regering welke van zulke garanties niet onkundig is er naar vermogen toe medewerkt 
om te voorkomen dat zij worden geschonden en door de mogendheid aan welke zij werden gegeven als niet ernstig bedoeld zouden kunnen worden aangemerkt langs deze weg kan het ontduiken van uitvoerverboden wanneer het overschrijdt wat men het onvermijdelijk minimum zou kunnen noemen ook gevaarlijk worden voor slands neutraliteit afkondiging van de staat van oorlog of van beleg mede als middel om de smokkelarij binnen de perken van dat onvermijdelijk minimum te houden was dan ook naar mijn stellige overtuiging geheel in overeenstemming met het desbetreffende artikel van de grondwet en de ter uitvoering daarvan afgekondigde wet terloops merk ik op dat de officiële kennisgeving in een onbewaakt ogenblik door het legerbestuur gedaan als zou het ontduiken van uitvoerverboden wel verkeerd zijn maar met de handhaving der neutraliteit niet te maken hebben in elk opzicht beter achterwege waren gebleven de opvatting waarvan het legerbestuur in die kennisgeving blijk gaf was niet alleen niet zeer gelukkig de legerautoriteit begaf zich afgezien van de innerlijke waarde haar mening door daarvan openlijk kon te doen bovendien op een terrein dat niet des legerbestuurs is paragraaf 2 de neutraliteit ter zee de tot toch toe besproken maatregelen hadden in de eerste plaats de verdediging tegen gevaren welke van de landzijde konden dreigen op het oog het spreekt echter wel vanzelf dat ook aan de verdediging van de kust en aan het tegengaan van mogelijke gevaren die van de zeezijde zouden kunnen reizen terstond de nodige aandacht werd geschonken een der eerste maatregelen daartoe was het afsluiten van de doorgangen tussen de eilanden boven de zuiderzee door mijnversperringen het doven van de voor de verdediging aan de zeezijde ongewenste kustlichten en het leggen van oorlogsbetonning ook op de schelde bij dit laatste diende er rekening mede te worden gehouden dat volgens het traktaat van 1839 in verband met de akte van het wener congres van 1814 de vrije vaart op deze rivier voor handelsschepen open blijven moest er werd dan ook een vaargeul opengelaten aangezien uit de aard der zaak alleen nederlandse loodsen met de ligging der nederlandse mijnen werden bekendgemaakt had deze verdedigingsmaatregel ten gevolge dat de vaart op de schelde gedurende de oorlogstijd voor zover het nederlands gebied betreft niet langer met belgische loodsen mogelijk was de maatregel gaf spoedig aanleiding tot een betreurenswaardig ongeval de 7 augustus 1914 liep een noorschip in de schelde op een nederlandse mijn aangezien er een nederlandse loods aan boord was toen het ongeval geschiedde erkende onze regering terstond haar aansprakelijkheid en gaf zij aan noorwegen haar leedwezen over het gebeurde te kennen de toegebrachte schade werd aan de noorse rederij vergoed dit ongeval noopte de loodsen en schippers voortaan bij de vaart op de schelde met meer omzichtigheid te werk te gaan ze wisten nu dat de nederlandse mijnen zoals een onze marineofficieren het uitdrukte niet met stopverf waren gevuld een tweede maatregel op maritiem gebied waartoe op voorstel van de minister van marine reeds op 30 juli werd besloten was de wijziging van het koninklijk besluit van 30 oktober 1909 bepalende dat behoudens enkele met name genoemde uitzonderingen het aan oorlogsschepen van vreemde mogendheden toegestaan is zich vanuit zee in de nederlandse territoriale wateren en het daarbinnen gelegen nederlands watergebied te begeven mits zulks geschiedde om langs de kortste weg en met inachtneming van enige in het koninklijk besluit gestelde voorschriften de meest nabij de zee gelegen reden of haven te bereiken ten einde al daar te ankeren en mits hun aantal met inbegrip de reeds binnen het nederlands rechtsgebied onder dezelfde vlag aanwezige oorlogsschepen niet meer dan drie bedraagt de minister van marine zag in de handhaving deze voor vreemde oorlogsschepen vrijgevige bepaling een bron van allerlei moeilijkheden niet alleen zou zij indien er werkelijk gevaar van de zeezijde dreigde aan een oorlogvoerende mogendheid die ons land in de krijg wilde betrekken gelegenheid geven voor de oorlogsverklaring twee of drie vol bewapende oorlogsschepen over enkele onze havens te verdelen of in één haven te concentreren maar zij zou ook bij verblijf van oorlogsschepen van een der oorlogvoerende partijen binnen nederlands grondgebied zeer gemakkelijk aanleiding hebben kunnen geven tot conflict met de tegenpartij bij koninklijk besluit van 30 juli 1914 dus enige dagen voordat ook engeland besloten had aan de oorlog deel te nemen op een ogenblik waarop de krijg zelfs nog tussen oostenrijk hongarije en servië was beperkt werd het koninklijk besluit van 1909 tijdelijk buiten werking gesteld en in plaats daarvan bepaald dat het aan oorlogsschepen of daarmede gelijkgestelde vaartuigen van vreemde mogendheden niet geoorloofd is zich vanuit zee in de nederlandse territoriale wateren en het daarbinnen gelegen nederlandse watergebied te begeven of zich daaraan op te houden op deze regel werden slechts enkele uitzonderingen gesteld 
waarvan de belangrijkste is die voor oorlogsschepen van vreemde mogendheden in geval van nood, zeegevaar of averij. Deze regeling ten aanzien van vreemde oorlogsschepen en daarmede gelijkgestelde vaartuigen gedurende de oorlogstijd werd met enige aanvullingen opgenomen in een neutraliteitsverklaring van dezelfde dag in verband met de oorlog tussen Oostenrijk, Hongarije en Servië en later herhaald in de volgende neutraliteitsverklaringen in verband met de uitbreiding welke de oorlog onderging. Tot deze veiligheidsmaatregel was Nederland volkenrechtelijk ten volle bevoegd. Wel past het koninklijk besluit van 30 oktober 1909 bij artikel 15 van het verdrag van 18 oktober 1907 als resultaat van de Tweede Vredesconferentie gesloten, nopens de rechten en verplichtingen der onzijdige mogendheden in geval van zeeoorlog, maar dat verdragsartikel geldt, volgens zijn eigen bewoordingen, alleen bij gebreken van andere bijzondere bepalingen der wetgeving van de onzijdige mogendheid. De bijzondere bepaling welke Nederland veiligheidshalve ten aanzien van vreemde oorlogsschepen bij het koninklijk besluit van 30 juli 1914 maakte, heeft een uitstekende preventieve werking gehad. Zij kon echter alleen doel treffen als zij met gestrengheid werd gehandhaafd. Voor de oorlogvoerenden is zij bij enkele gelegenheden minder aangenaam geweest. Zo voor de Duitse duikboot die, om snel haar doel te bereiken, te dicht onder de kust voer en daardoor in onze territoriale wateren terecht kwam. Ze raakte binnen ons gebied bij ter schelling in de zandbanken verward en strandde op 4 november 1915. Op grond der genoemde bepaling werd zij met haar bemanning geïnterneerd, aangezien zij niet de gevolgen van bekomen averij onze territoriale wateren was binnengelopen, maar eerst na in ongeschonden toestand daar gekomen te zijn, in het ongereden was geraakt. Deze internering heeft tot een wisseling van nota's tussen de Duitse en de Nederlandse regering aanleiding gegeven, waarbij van onze zijde het goed recht daarvan werd staande gehouden, ondanks de daartegen aangevoerde bezwaren. Nederland bleef daarbij geheel binnen de perken van zijn recht en liet zich door de betogen van zijn machtige nabuur niet van zijn rechtsstandpunt afdringen. Het noodlot heeft trouwens gewild dat enige tijd na de Duitse een Engelse duikboot op overeenkomstige wijze onze neutraliteitsproclamatie schond en uit dien hoofde geïnterneerd werd. In januari 1916 strandde een Britse onderzeeboot binnen onze territoriale wateren in het Friese gat tussen Ameland en Schiermonnikoog. Daar het stranden van de boot hier evenmin als bij de Duitse onderzeer aan het bekomen van averij voor zij in die wateren was gekomen kon worden toegeschreven, werd zij op gelijke wijze als deze behandeld. Er deed zich hierbij nog een incident voor waarbij onze neutraliteitsbepalingen door een vaartuig van de Engelse marine ten tweede male werden geschonden. Toen de duikboot vastliep, bevonden zich Britse torpedojagers buiten de territoriale wateren kruisende in de nabijheid. Door een dier vaartuigen werd, toen het ongeval was opgemerkt, een motorsloep uitgezonden om de schipreukelingen te helpen. Die sloep nam tien der opvarenden van de duikboot mede. De overige twaalf, waaronder de commandant, werden door de reddingboot van Schiermonnik Oog aan land gebracht. Deze werden, evenals met hun Duitse lotgenoten was geschied, geïnterneerd. De boot zelf werd, nadat zij vlot was gebracht, opgelegd op dezelfde wijze als met de Duitse onderzeeër was geschied. Onze regering protesteerde bij de Britse tegen het feit dat de motorsloep van de Britse marine zich in de territoriale wateren had begeven en daar een deel der opvarende van de gestrande duikboot had afgehaald. Aangezien de reddingsboot van Schiermonnik Oog reeds ter plaatse was en de redding van de gehele bemanning verzekerd was, konden voor die handelwijze geen overwegingen van menselijkheid worden aangevoerd. De regering voegde aan haar protest toe dat slechts ten gevolge van de omstandigheid dat de reddingboot geen militaire autoriteiten aan boord had, de motorsloep weder met de door haar afgehaalde leden der bemanning van de duikboot het Nederlandse gebied had kunnen verlaten. De bepaling der neutraliteitsproclamatie, welke tot de internering der beide duikboten en haar bemanningen heeft geleid, gaf aanleiding tot een vraag waarover zowel met de Duitse als met de Britse regering notaats werden gewisseld dat die bepaling ook toepasselijk is op koopvaardijschepen die tijdelijk tot hulpkruisers zijn ingericht, was niet twijfelachtig. Zulke hulpkruisers zijn zeker met oorlogsschepen gelijk te stellen. Moeilijker echter was de beslissing ten aanzien van koopvaardijschepen die, zoals het heet, alleen ter verdediging, en wel speciaal tegen duikboten, een tweetal kanonnen op de achtersteven hebben. Engeland heeft zulke een defensieve bewapening zijner handelsschepen in overweging genomen en voor een deel in toepassing gebracht moesten zulke defensief bewapende handelsschepen een Nederlandse haven binnenlopend met oorlogsschepen worden gelijkgesteld en op die grond worden vastgehouden, tenzij hun binnenlopen gevolg was van bekomen averij. 
Het antwoord op deze vraag werd vooral door deze overweging beheerst, dat al staat een aldus bewapend handelsvaartuig niet met een hulpkruiser gelijk, het onderscheid tussen offensieve en defensieve bewapening wel op het papier, maar niet in werkelijkheid, is vol te houden. Het is toch meer dan waarschijnlijk dat zulk een defensief bewapend vaartuig, als het een vijandelijke duikboot in zijn nabijheid ziet, zich zal houden aan de regel La meilleure façon de se défendre, c'est d'attaquer. Het is intussen alleen tot een uitwisseling van nota's over deze soort vaartuigen gekomen, waarbij het door Nederland ingenomen standpunt tegenover de belligerenten in de eerste plaats tegenover Engeland werd uiteengezet en volgehouden. Vaartuigen als de hier bedoelde hebben Nederlandse havens niet aangedaan. Op het stuk van vreemde oorlogsschepen bevat de neutraliteitsproclamatie, die ook door het Nederlands-Indische gouvernement voor onze bezittingen al daar werd afgekondigd, enkele bepalingen welke in Indië met zijn uitgebreid territoriaal watergebied veel moeilijker te handhaven waren dan hier te landen, doch waaraan niet te minst streng de hand gehouden worden moest en streng de hand gehouden werd, zo dikwijls pogingen tot inbreuk daarop met reden konden worden vermoed. Ik doel hiermede in de eerste plaats op de bepaling dat het verboden is binnen het rechtsgebied van de staat, zonder voorafgaande machtiging der bevoegde autoriteiten ter plaatse, aan oorlogsschepen of daarmede gelijkgestelde vaartuigen van een oorlogvoerende mogendheid herstellingen aan te brengen en levensmiddelen of brandstoffen te verstrekken. Het Nederlands-Indische gouvernement heeft vooral in de eerste tijd van de oorlog, toen enkele Duitse kruisers hun beroemd geworden tochten over de oceaan deden, meer dan eenmaal maatregelen moeten nemen om te voorkomen dat aan zulke kruisers in Nederlands-Indische territoriale wateren kolen werden verstrekt. In verband met die dolende zeeridders moest ook, zowel in West- als in Oost-Indië, de hand worden gehouden aan de uitzonderingsbepaling van de neutraliteitsproclamatie ten gunste van oorlogsschepen of daarmede gelijkgestelde vaartuigen van een oorlogvoerende, welke binnen het rechtsgebied van de koloniën en bezittingen in andere werelddelen een haven of reden aandoen, uitsluitend met het doel om een voorraad levensmiddelen of brandstof aan te vullen. Praktisch was deze bepaling vooral van gewicht ten aanzien van het innemen van brandstof. Volgens de bepalingen der proclamatie, zich aansluitende bij het verdrag nopens de rechten en verplichtingen der onzijdige mogendheden in geval van zeeoorlog, mogen vreemde oorlogsschepen daartoe in geen geval langer dan 24 uren in de haven of op de reden blijven, en mogen hun niet meer brandstoffen worden verstrekt dan nodig is om, met inbegrip van de nog aan boord aanwezige voorraad, de naaste haven van hun eigen land te bereiken. Hoe groot die officieel toegestaande hoeveelheid wel was voor een in een Oost- of West-Indische haven binnenlopend schip als bijvoorbeeld de Leipzig of de Emden, viel niet zo heel gemakkelijk te bepalen. De oplossing van deze moeilijkheid moest echter uit de aard der zaak aan de autoriteiten ter plaatse worden overgelaten. Een tweede moeilijkheid deed zich hierbij nog voor, welke echter gelukkig van theoretische aard is gebleven. Volgens de neutraliteitsproclamatie mag eenzelfde vreemd oorlogsschip niet wederom van brandstof worden voorzien dan nadat tenminste drie maanden sedert een vorige aanvulling binnen het rechtsgebied van de staat zijn verstreken. De vraag deed zich nu voor wat zou moeten geschieden met een kruiser waarvoor bekend was dat hij in open zee strooptochten was blijven maken zonder naar het eigen land terug te keren indien hij na een tussenpoos van drie maanden opnieuw kolen zou willen laden. Naar de letter der proclamatie zou dit toegestaan zijn, naar de geest evenwel niet. Immers de hoofdbepaling omtrent het kolenladen houdt in dat niet meer brandstof zal worden verstrekt dan nodig is om de naaste haven van het eigen land te bereiken, door aan een schip dat niet naar huis terugkeert, doch in open zee kaapvaart blijft uitoefenen en zijn kolenvoorraad aanvult uit veroverde schepen of in havens van andere neutrale landen, om de drie maanden kolen te verstrekken, zou niet worden voldaan aan de bedoeling der uitzonderingsbepaling, ertoe strekkende een oorlogsschip uit menselijkheidsoverwegingen gelegenheid te geven naar huis terug te keren, maar zou de onwillekeurig aan een der strijdvoerenden tegen de bedoeling der kolenbepaling in handlangersdiensten worden bewezen. Zoals reeds werd opgemerkt, bleef ook deze kwestie intussen alleen van academische betekenis. Hier te landen moest al heel spoedig aan enkele onze eigen landgenoten worden ingescherpt dat ook zij zich aan de neutraliteitsbepalingen hadden te onderwerpen en het land niet door daarmede strijdige handelingen in oorlogsgevaar mochten brengen. Artikel 13 der neutraliteitsproclamatie verbiedt binnen het rechtsgebied van de staat ten behoeve van een oorlogvoerende natie vaartuigen voor militaire doeleinden bestemd uit te rusten, te bewapenen of te bemannen of zodanige vaartuigen aan een belligerent toe te voeren of te verschaffen. 
In de allereerste weken van de oorlog nu kwam aan de regering een poging ter oren die een vrij vergevorderde staat van uitvoering bleek te zijn, om ten behoeve van het Duitse Rijk een aantal stoomtrollers en sleepboten aan te kopen. Het was niet twijfelachtig dat, indien die koop was doorgegaan, de bedoelde schepen voor oorlogsdoeleinden zouden zijn gebezigd. Onverwijld werden de nodige maatregelen genomen om de Nederlandse tussenpersonen, die zich tot deze transactie hadden geleend, op het ongeoorloofde van hun medewerking te wijzen, dien ten gevolge kon worden belet dat de uitvoering der reeds begonnen poging werd voltooid. Als tegenhanger van dit geval vermeld ik hier dat ook tegen overtreding van een ander artikel der neutraliteitsproclamatie enige malen moest worden opgekomen. Het door mij bedoelde artikel behelst het verbod om binnen het rechtsgebied van de staat ten behoeve der oorlogvoerenden strijderskorpsen te vormen of aanwervingsbureau te openen. Deze bepaling werd van praktisch belang enige tijd nadat Antwerpen was gevallen en België zo goed als geheel in handen van Duitsland was gekomen. Niet alleen bleek toen dat verschillende hierheen gevluchte Belgische jonge mannen zich individueel en uit vrije beweging bij het in Noord-Frankrijk strijdende Belgische leger gingen vervoegen, wat geheel geoorloofd was, maar ook dat door meer of minder openlijk optredende wervingsbureau pogingen werden in het werk gesteld om hunne indienstreding te bevorderen en in groepsgewijze naar Engeland te vervoeren. Zo vaak van zulke pogingen iets bleek, werden zij, krachtens de neutraliteitsproclamatie, in haar geboorte gesmoord. De verovering van België en vooral de val van Antwerpen gaf ook praktische betekenis aan het artikel der neutraliteitsproclamatie dat het vervoer van konvooien van munitie of levensmiddelen over Nederlands territoire verbiedt. De vrije doorvoer van koopmansgoederen tussen België en Duitsland of omgekeerd over onze water- en landwegen, gelijk die voor de oorlog bestond, bleef natuurlijk ongehinderd voortduren. Echter ontstond in en door de nieuw geschapen toestand gevaar dat onze waterwegen zouden worden gebruikt om munitie en andere legerbenodigdheden van Duitsland naar Antwerpen te vervoeren, of dat door oorlogsdaden verkregen zaken van daaruit over ons land naar Duitsland zouden worden gebracht. Aan de Duitse regering werd uit dien hoofden medegedeeld dat, hoewel de door verschillende traktaten en in zonderheid door de Rijnvaartakte gewaarborgde vrije doorvoer door ons land tussen Duitsland en België ongerept zou blijven, deze ten aanzien van krijgsbuit of van oorlogsbenodigdheden niet kon worden toegestaan, aangezien dit ons in conflict zou brengen met onze onzijdigheidsplicht. De nodige maatregelen werden getroffen om, door samenwerking tussen daartoe aangewezen ambtenaren van buitenlandse zaken met de douaneambtenaren en de legerautoriteit aan de grens, ervoor te zorgen dat aan dit neutraliteitsverbod de hand zou worden gehouden. Voor zover ik mij herinner, behoefde geen enkele maal tegen een poging tot overtreding daarvan te worden opgekomen. Had deze zaak betrekking op de Rijnvaart, de waard op de Schelde gaf aanleiding tot de gedachtenwisseling reeds voordat Antwerpen in de macht van Duitsland was gekomen. Ze betrof een vijftigtal Duitse en Oostenrijkse handelsschepen die bij de aanvang van de oorlog in de haven van Antwerpen lagen en als gevolg van de strijd in de macht van de Belgische regering waren gekomen. In het begin van september 1914 werd mededeling ontvangen dat de Britse regering voornemens was die schepen met een niet-militaire bemanning over de Schelde naar Engeland te voeren. Zij beriep zich ter rechtvaardiging van dit voornemen op het traktaat van Londen van 19 april 1839, dat de vrije vaart over de Schelde waarborgt. Onze regering maakte daartegen bezwaar. Zij wees het beroep van Engeland op het verdrag van 1839 af, aangezien het hier schepen gold die door een oorlogsstaat in handen van de Belgische regering waren gekomen en die, als zij met een Britse bemanning over de Schelde zouden worden vervoerd, niet met een handelsoogmerk de Schelde zouden bevaren. Het traktaat van 1839 beperkt, in verband met artikel 109 van de akte van het Wener Congres van 9 juni 1815, de vrije vaart op de Westerschelde uitdrukkelijk tot de vaart met opzicht tot de koophandel en was dus op dit geval niet van toepassing. Het gold hier schepen waarvan de rechtstoestand onzeker was, maar waarvan vaststond dat zij zonder oorlogstaat niet ter beschikking van de Belgische nog van de Engelse regering zouden hebben gestaan. Hoewel het artikel der neutraliteitsproclamatie behelzende dat prijsgemaakte schepen, behalve wegens onzeewaardigheid, slechte gesteldheid der zee of gebrek aan brandstof of aan levensmiddelen niet in het rechtsgebied van de staat mogen worden binnengebracht, hier niet letterlijk van toepassing was, was het toch nodig ter handhaving onzer onzijdigheid in dit geval naar analogie van dat neutraliteitsvoorschrift te handelen. In die zin werd dan ook aan Engeland geantwoord. 
indien deze schepen de grenzen zouden overschrijden en op het Nederlands gedeelte van de Schelde zouden komen, zouden zij worden geïnterneerd tot aan het einde van de oorlog, en dan worden teruggegeven aan degene die als dan zou blijken daarop recht te hebben. Na deze verklaring van onze zijde heeft Engeland aan zijn voornemen te deze aanzien geen gevoel gegeven. De houding ten aanzien van die schepen tegenover Engeland aangenomen, bracht vanzelf mede dat toen Antwerpen was gevallen en in handen van Duitsland was gekomen, de bewuste schepen evenmin op de schelde konden worden toegelaten. Ze waren toch door een oorlogstaat weder onder andere oorlogvoerende heerschappij gekomen. Toen dan ook enkele dier schepen later niet te min in ons land kwamen, werden zij tot aan het eind van de oorlog in bewaring gesteld. Aan wie zij dan zullen worden afgegeven, is thans nog niet aan de orde. Paragraaf 3. Internering, luchtvaart. Onder de neutraliteitsbepalingen is er één welke toepassing op het publiek zeer grote indruk heeft gemaakt en die aan de militaire autoriteiten, vooral in de eerste weken van oktober 1914, de handen vol werk heeft gegeven. De bepaling namelijk dat troepen of militairen behorende tot of bestemd voor de oorlog voerende, komende binnen het gebied van de staat te land, onmiddellijk worden ontwapend en tot het einde van de oorlog worden geïnterneerd. Toen zij, eveneens als uitvloeisel van het algemeen erkende volkenrecht, traktaten van 1907 als gevolg van de Tweede Haagse Vredesconferentie, werd opgenomen, werd niet vermoed dat er op zo grote schaal van zou moeten worden gebruik gemaakt. De snelle verovering van Antwerpen deed een deel van het Belgische leger, als mede van de ter hulp gekomen Engelse troepen, de 10 oktober 1914 over onze grenzen in Staats-Vlaanderen de wijk nemen. Hun aantal steeg weldra tot omstreeks 30.000. Het spreekt vanzelf dat het ontwapenen en onder dak brengen van een zo groot aantal soldaten heel wat voeten in de aarde had, te meer omdat zowel de militaire als de burgerlijke autoriteiten in diezelfde dagen overstelpt waren met werk in verband met de stroom van Belgen die, wegens de belegering van Antwerpen, over onze grenzen een goed heenkomen zochten. Op die vluchtelingen kom ik hieronder in hoofdstuk 3 paragraaf 2 terug. De internering van de over onze grenzen gekomen Belgische en Engelse legerafdelingen gaf wel praktische, maar geen volkenrechtelijke moeilijkheden. Dat deze militairen geïnterneerd moesten worden, was niet aan de minste twijfel onderhevig. Niet altijd evenwel lag de zaak juridiek zo eenvoudig. Opdat onderdanen van een oorlogvoerende mogendheid bij het overschrijden der grenzen in de termen vallen van te worden ontwapend en geïnterneerd, moeten zij in de eerste plaats behoren tot of bestemd zijn voor de militaire dienst en in de tweede plaats binnen het gebied van de staat komen dat wil zeggen uit vrij wil de grenzen overschrijden en niet tegen hun wil of door omstandigheden onafhankelijk van hun wil binnen het rechtsgebied van de staat worden gebracht. De eerste deze voorwaarden voor de internering is niet aanwezig bij deserteurs, nog bij gevluchte krijgsgevangenen. Beide categorieën van personen hebben wel behoord tot de krijgsmacht van een oorlogvoerende mogendheid, maar behoren daartoe niet meer op het ogenblik dat ze de grenzen overschrijden. Het traktaat van 1907 betreffende de rechten en verplichtingen van onzijdige mogendheden en personen in geval van oorlog te land, bepaalt trouwens uitdrukkelijk dat ontvluchte krijgsgevangenen worden vrijgelaten. Het is intussen niet altijd even gemakkelijk na te gaan of over de grenzen komende militairen tot een van de beide genoemde categorieën behoren. Bij ontsnapte krijgsgevangenen zullen de omstandigheden in de regel wel van dien aard zijn dat zonder veel moeite is vast te stellen of men hun verklaringen vertrouwen kan, en zal dus de beslissing dat zij buiten de interneringsbepalingen vallen, wel zo goed als altijd vrij gemakkelijk zijn te nemen. Met deserteurs staat de zaak iets wat anders. Daar is grote voorzichtigheid geboden. Men kan niet zonder meer iedere militair van een der oorlogvoerenden die de grenzen overkomt onder het beweren dat hij deserteur is, vrij laten rondlopen. Dit zou volkenrechtelijk onjuist zijn en voor het land gevaarlijk kunnen worden. Men behoeft daarvoor slechts te denken aan de omvang die de spionagediensten der oorlogvoerenden in deze krijg hebben gekregen. De opvatting die in militaire kringen schijnt te heersen, dat zolang een militair zijn distinctieven als zodanig draagt, hij beschouwd moet worden nog tot de troep te behoren, en dus moet worden geïnterneerd als hij over de grenzen komt, acht ik even weinig houdbaar als het aanmerken en behandelen als deserteur van iedere vreemde militair die voorgeeft dit te zijn. Het is toch zeer wel mogelijk dat een vreemde soldaat, wie het inderdaad erom te doen is, desertie te plegen, aan dit voornemen alleen gevolg kan geven, indien hij er zich zorgvuldig van onthoudt zijn militaire distinctieve af te leggen, zolang hij de grenzen niet gepasseerd is. Bovendien ligt niet voor iedere deserteur een pakje burgerklederen aan de grens gereed. 
deze mij onhoudbaar toeschijnende opvatting heeft voorts een bedenkelijke kant ook voor het land zelf speciaal in verband met het steeds aanwezige spionagegevaar ze leidt er namelijk zo licht toe iedere vreemde militair die voor het overschrijden van de grens zijn militaire uniform voor een burgerpak heeft weten te verwisselen zonder meer als deserteur aan te merken dat zulke een conclusie aan militaire spionnen maar al te gelegen zou komen behoeft wel geen betoog er zit dan ook niets anders op dan elk geval op zichzelf te beoordelen en van een zo nauwkeurig mogelijk onderzoek te doen afhangen of men werkelijk met een geval van desertie heeft te maken bij twijfel blijven men aan de voorzichtige kant dat is hier de internering heel anders ligt de zaak als bij het einde van de oorlog de internering wordt opgeheven geïnterneerden mogen voor het einde van de oorlog het land niet verlaten dit brengt echter niet mede dat men verplicht zou zijn hen na de krijg tegen hun wil uit te leveren aan de mogendheid tot welke krijgsmacht zij behoorden dit zou ten aanzien van deserteurs of van militairen die vrezen dat zij in hun land teruggekeerd als deserteurs zullen worden aangemerkt onmenselijk zijn wie eenmaal geïnterneerd is blijft geïnterneerd tot aan het einde van de oorlog of hij gedurende zijn internering door de oorlogvoerende tot wiens leger hij behoort tot enige straf wordt veroordeeld of van de militaire stand wordt vervallen verklaard is voor de staat die hem interneerde onverschillig de regering van de internerende staat heeft met hem alleen te maken afgaande op de toestand waarin zij hem vond toen hij geïnterneerd werd het enige gevaar dat de internerende staat daarbij lopen kan is van financiële aard en zinkt als zodanig weg tegenover de andere financiële lasten die de oorlogstoestand oplegt de staat kan namelijk de verplegingskosten niet terugeisen van die militairen van wie door de oorlog voerende tot wiens leger zij hebben behoord wordt bewezen dat ze als deserteurs over de grenzen zijn gekomen houdt de oorlog op dan krijgt ieder oorlogvoerende zijn soldaten terug met dit voorbehoud dat ieder hunner die maar enigszins aannemelijk maakt dat hij gevaar loopt als deserteur te worden behandeld of dat hij zal worden gestraft voor een feit waarvoor geen uitlevering kan worden gevraagd indien hij dit verkiest hier kan blijven men zal in zulke gevallen ook de vreemdelingenwet die hier toch al niet met overgrote gestrengheid wordt toegepast uit menselijkheidsoverwegingen zeer mild moeten uitvoeren maar zolang de oorlog duurt, hecht het departement van oorlog aan beweringen van eenmaal geïnterneerden dat zij deserteur zijn, terecht niet al te veel. Het zou anders een te gemakkelijk middel zijn om zich aan de internering te onttrekken en zich weer bij het strijdende leger te voegen. Het tegen de wil of de omstandigheden buiten de wil van de betrokkenen binnen het gebied van de staat worden gebracht, heeft zich enige maanden ten aanzien van militairen behorende tot de oorlogvoerenden voorgedaan, en heeft in die gevallen er terecht toe geleid dat die militairen niet werden geïnterneerd. In het begin van de oorlog is dit gebeurd met Duitse en Belgische krijgers, die in de nabijheid van de Nederlands-Belgische grens gewond en bewusteloos op het slagveld werden gevonden, en door de zorgen van het Rode Kruis of van particuliere verplegers naar een Nederlands hospitaal in de nabijheid werden vervoerd. Zulke gewonde soldaten werden na hun herstel geheel vrijgelaten in hun beweging. Hetzelfde geschiedde met de matrozen van de eveneens in het begin van de oorlog getorpedeerde Engelse kruisers Aboukir, Cressy en Hoek, die door Nederlandse handelsvaartuigen in volle zee werden opgepikt en hier te lande werden gebracht. Ook zij werden terecht niet geïnterneerd. Het zeeoorlogsrecht geeft geen voorschrift omtrent hetgeen in het geval deze schipbreukelingen had te geschieden, maar de algemene beginselen der onzijdigheid wezen hier in de richting der vrijlating. Na de slag van het Skagerrak profiteerden enige Duitse matrozen van deze humane toepassing der interneringsregelen. Toch moesten hierover voor die tijd nog enige nota's met de Duitse regering worden gewisseld. Dat de staat behoort te zorgen niet alleen voor de behoorlijke verpleging, maar ook voor de behoorlijke bewaking der geïnterneerden, het laatste voor zover deze niet op parool vrijheid van beweging binnenslands grenzen is gegeven, spreekt evenzeer vanzelf als dat het schenden van het gegeven parool verregaand onbehoorlijk is en gestraft wordt met strenge bewaking als men de woordbrekers weer te pakken kan krijgen. In verband met de internering zijn ook vragen gerezen ten aanzien van luchtschepen en vliegeniers. Wat de luchtschepen betreft is de moeilijkheid tot nog toe van theoretische aard gebleven. Ten aanzien van de vliegeniers daarentegen heeft zij zich ook praktisch voorgedaan. De neutraliteitsproclamatie houdt daaromtrent niets in. De regering heeft echter bij koninklijk besluit van 3 augustus 1914 het overschrijden van de landsgrenzen aan vreemde luchtvaarders voor de duur van de oorlogstoestand verboden 
en terstond aan de oorlogvoerende doen weten dat zij het varen van vreemde luchtschepen en het vliegen van vreemde vliegeniers boven ons grondgebied als schending onze soevereiniteit en neutraliteit beschouwt. De volkenrechtelijke kwestie welke achter deze zaak verscholen ligt, laat ik rusten. Zij heeft, gegeven het principiële standpunt dat Nederland zonder protest van een der oorlogvoerenden ten aanzien der luchtschepen en vliegeniers van oorlogvoerenden heeft ingenomen, geen betekenis. Daarvan uitgaande zijn boven het Nederlands gebied varende vreemde luchtschepen of vliegende aeroplanen door onze militairen terecht beschoten. Heeft die beschieting, gelijk een enkele maal bij een vliegtuig is voorgekomen, het effect dat de vliegenier of het luchtschip genoodzaakt wordt binnen Nederlands gebied te landen, dan is er geen twijfel aan dat de inzittenden vallen onder de interneringsbepalingen. Zij behoren tot de militaire macht van een der oorlogvoerenden, ze zijn boven wat gegeven de principiële opvatting waarvan ik zo even sprak, gelijk staat met binnen, het gebied van de staat gekomen en ze zijn neergeschoten omdat dit het enige middel was om hen te ontwapenen en te interneren. Het standpunt onze regering in zaken de luchtvaart van belligerenten heeft nog aanleiding gegeven tot een wisseling van nota's met de Duitse regering ter zake van het Duitse luchtschip dat op 1 februari 1916 over ons grondgebied voer, door de kustwacht uit die hoofd werd beschoten en later met de gehele bemanning in de Noordzee verongelukte. De Duitse regering verweet ons naar aanleiding van dit voorval dat de Nederlandse militaire autoriteiten door blijkbaar zonder voorafgaande waarschuwing te vuren op een luchtschip dat geacht kon worden door overmacht boven het Nederlandse grondgebied te zijn gekomen, in strijd met het volkerrecht en de wetten der menselijkheid hadden gehandeld. Naar aanleiding van dat ongegronde verwijt schrijft de minister van Buitenlandse Zaken in het in juli 1916 verschenen Oranjeboek, citaat, Ondergetekende heeft dit schrijven met een nota verbalen, DD 18 maart, beantwoord, waarin nogmaals uitvoerig de zienswijze der regering te deze zaken werd uiteengezet. Overigens werd aangetoond dat het luchtschip, dat geen enkel teken had gegeven van averij te hebben of te willen landen, herhaaldelijk was gewaarschuwd zich boven neutraal gebied te bevinden, en dat de militaire autoriteiten de wetten der menselijkheid hadden in acht genomen, zover als dit met haar plicht, de onschendbaarheid van het territoire te doen eerbiedigen, slechts enigszins was overeen te brengen. Einde citaat. Enigszins moeilijker ligt de zaak wanneer het luchtschip of het vliegtuig niet wordt neergeschoten, maar door enigerlei averij gedwongen wordt binnen het gebied van de staat te landen. Men is dan aanvankelijk geneigd analogie te zoeken met de neutraliteitsbepaling betreffende oorlogsschepen, welke wegens averij een Nederlandse haven binnenlopen en die na herstel weder mogen vertrekken. Toch brengt enig nadenken spoedig tot het inzicht dat de zaak hier zo geheel anders ligt, dat van analogische toepassing dier bepaling geen sprake zijn kan. Het vreemde oorlogsschip, dat wegens averij een onze havens binnenloopt, schendt op geen enkel ogenblik onze neutraliteit. Het vreemde luchtschip, of vliegtuig daarentegen, kan alleen dan wegens averij gedwongen worden hier te dalen, als het in strijd met de Nederlandse soevereiniteit en neutraliteit, welke het had te eerbiedigen, reeds boven ons territoire voer of vloog. Het enkele feit dat het hier wegens averij landen moet, bewijst dus reeds dat het de Nederlandse soevereiniteit had geschonden, voor het averij kreeg en tot neerstrijken werd gedwongen. Mocht het weer voorkomen dat Duitse luchtschepen, gaande naar Engeland of daarvan terugkomende, over ons land varen, en mocht bij zulke gelegenheid een deze schepen wegens averij binnen onze grenzen moeten dalen, dan zou het buiten twijfel zijn dat het tot na de oorlog zou moeten worden opgeborgen en dat de inzittenden behoorden te worden geïnterneerd. Met luchtschepen heeft zich deze kwestie nog niet praktisch voorgedaan, daarentegen wel met een Duits watervliegtuig dat, ten gevolge van averij, ten noorden van Schiermonnikoog in zee was neergedaald en naar de kust van dit eiland was gedreven en daar geland. De bemanning daarvan werd geïnterneerd, ondanks protest van de Duitse regering. Naast de hier genoemde theoretische gronden voor de gedragslijn welke de regering zich in deze kwestie heeft gesteld, is er nog een bij uitnemendheid praktische militaire overweging welke in dezelfde richting wijst en die tevens het principiële standpunt steunt dat Nederland bij het koninklijk besluit van 3 augustus 1914 ten aanzien van de luchtvaart van oorlogvoerenden heeft ingenomen. Het enkele feit van het varen of vliegen boven het Nederlandse gebied stelt de luchtvaarder of de vliegenier in staat waarnemingen te doen omtrent en opnemingen te doen van Nederlandse verdedigingswerken en kan dus onze veiligheid in gevaar brengen. Deze laatste overweging schraagt ook het standpunt dat Nederland tegenover Duitsland heeft ingenomen ten aanzien van luchtschepen waarvan terecht 
of ten onrechte wordt beweerd dat zij bij vergissing ten gevolge van de weersgesteldheid boven ons land zijn terechtgekomen zodra de bestuurder van een oorlogvoerend luchtschip zulk een vergissing bemerkt is hij verplicht langs de kortste weg zich buiten het nederlandse rechtsgebied te begeven hij mag zich dan niet bevoegd achten langs de kortste weg naar zijn eigen land terug te keren wanneer die niet tevens de kortste is om buiten ons gebied te komen terecht heeft onze regering dit standpunt tegenover duitsland met beslistheid volgehouden elke afwijking daarvan zou de deur wagenwijd openzetten voor niet te controleren en niet te achterhalen schendingen van ons rechtsgebied door oorlogvoerende luchtvaarders in verband met de luchtvaart heeft de regering nog voor een moeilijkheid gestaan die wel niet rechtstreeks met het belang van nederland had te maken maar waarbij ze zich de vraag had voor te leggen of de voorschriften der onzijdigheid wel met de eisen der menselijkheid waren overeen te brengen de neutraliteit brengt mede dat het verspreiden van berichten over de waarneming van Nederlands grondgebied uit omtrent bewegingen van oorlogvoerende strijdkrachten zoveel mogelijk worden tegengegaan. Om aan deze eis der onzijdigheid te voldoen, worden berichten van nieuwsagenten omtrent bewegingen van belligerente oorlogsschepen gedurende zes uren opgehouden. Deze maatregel wordt ook toegepast ten aanzien van waargenomen bewegingen van vreemde vliegeniers en vreemde luchtschepen. Voor zover betreft Duitse luchtschepen die naar Engeland koersten, gaf dit in sommige kringen aanleiding tot ontstemming, voortspruitende uit de omstandigheid dat de Duitse lucht reeds, voor zover zij mensenlevens kosten, in hoofdzaak weerloze burgers treffen en dus tot de meest inhumane oorlogsverrichtingen behoren van de thans woedende krijg, waarin de vindingrijkheid op het gebied der verdelging van elkanders leven en gezondheid over het algemeen toch reeds een met alle menselijkheid spottende hoogte heeft bereikt. Toch kon en mocht men zonder schending van de neutraliteit ten aanzien van de Duitse luchtschepen van de gestelde regel niet afwijken. Het zou trouwens niet aangaan dat neutrale staten hun onzijdigheidsmaatregelen deden afhangen van de mate van weerzin welke door bepaalde oorlogshandelingen der belligerenten bij hen werd gewekt. Elk objectief kenmerk van beoordeling zou dan ontbreken en men zou door gevoelsoverwegingen al heel spoedig in zeer gevaarlijk vaarwater worden gevoerd. Natuurlijk stond de zaak geheel anders wanneer het een luchtschip betrof dat de onzijdigheid van het Nederlandse territoire niet had geëerbiedigd en zijn weg ten dele over ons gebied had genomen. In dat geval bleef bekendmaking daarvan aan de tegenstander langs telegrafische weg zonder de minste vertraging vrij. De neutraliteit werd dan niet geschonden door de berichtgeving, maar was geschonden door de luchtschipper omtrent wien bericht gegeven werd. Paragraaf 4. Gevaarlijke bakerpraatjes tot slot van dit hoofdstuk vermeld ik nog een tweetal bakerpraatjes waarvan vooral het eerst aan het land veel kwaad heeft gedaan en aan de regering veel last en onaangenaamheid bezorgd heeft. Toen het Duitse leger, om snel in Noord-Frankrijk te komen, de neutraliteit van België schond en zich een weg baande door het land van onze zuidelijke naburen, dook al heel spoedig het gerucht op dat Nederland zou hebben toegelaten dat bij die opmars Duitse troepen ook over Nederlands grondgebied trokken. Vooral in Frankrijk werd dit verhaal als waarheid aanvaard en werd het ondanks officiële tegenspraak met hardnekkigheid staande gehouden. In de Illustration verscheen zelfs een kaartje aanduidende hoe het Duitse leger door België was getrokken. De richtingen werden daarop door pijltjes aangegeven. Een dier pijltjes wees de weg van Duitsland naar België over het zuidelijk deel van Nederlands Limburg. Hoewel hierbij de regering genoegzaam bekend was dat het hele verhaal uit de lucht was gegrepen, en dat de Duitse legeraanvoerders niet slechts bevel hadden ontvangen de Nederlandse grens zorgvuldig te ontzien, maar dat bevel ook met de grootste nauwgezetheid hadden opgevolgd, wierp het praatje een zo vals en tegelijk zo gevaarlijk licht op ons land en zijn regering, dat het nodig was de onjuistheid daarvan zo voldongen vast te stellen, dat het niet alleen hier te lande, maar ook bij de geallieerden zou worden erkend voor wat het was, een kwaadaardig kletspraatje. Er had daartoe een speciaal onderzoek door de militaire overheid plaats, waaromtrent uitvoerige mededelingen zijn opgenomen in het Oranjeboek, dat in oktober 1915 door het ministerie van buitenlandse zaken werd uitgegeven zoals van tevoren vaststond bij ieder die op de hoogte was van de werkelijke toedracht bewees dat onderzoek op een wijze die zelfs voor de meest kwaaddenkende overtuigend zijn moest dat de nederlandse grens door het duitse leger op geen enkel punt was geschonden de rechtvaardiging van het ontstaan en van de verspreiding van het praatje als zou nederland handlangersdiensten aan het duitse leger hebben bewezen valt dan ook niets hoegenaamd aan te voeren het kan in tegendeel niet genoeg worden betreurd en gelaakt dat zulk een sprookje zonder enige grond ontstaan en verspreid worden kon 
en dat zij die zich daaraan schuldig maakten niet beseften welke ernstige gevolgen het wekken van een valse schijn bij een der oorlogvoerende partijen omtrent Nederlands houding ten aanzien van de vijand voor ons land had kunnen hebben en welke verantwoordelijkheid zij door een grondeloze en grenzeloze kwaaddenkendheid en lichtgelovigheid tegenover Nederland op zich namen voor zover er onder onze eigen landgenoten zijn die aan de verspreiding van het gerucht mede schuld hebben is hun bedrijf in zo hoge mate ergerlijk dat er geen woorden voor zijn te vinden om het naar waarde te brandmerken voor buitenlanders kon althans nog ter verontschuldiging dienen dat de duitse heerbaan op enkele punten zoals bij vaals en bij kerkraden zo rakelings langs de nederlandse grens loopt dat men van nederlands grondgebied uit aan militairen die op die weg voorbij trekken de hand kan reiken dat het nieuwe grijze uniform onze inventaristen zoveel gelijkenis vertoont met het duitse uniform voor dit wapen dat vergissing omtrent de nationaliteit van een voorbijtrekkende troep voor een buitenlander mogelijk is en last not least dat men in de oorlogvoerende landen vooral in het begin van de oorlog begrijpelijkerwijze tegelijk zo zenuwachtig en zo wantrouwend was dat elk praatje omtrent heulen met de tegenstander zodra het omtrent een neutrale staat eenmaal was gelanceerd er een bij uitstek gunstige voedings- en verspreidingsbodem vond. Voor Nederlanders die de verspreiding van het even valse als gevaarlijke en kwaadaardige gerucht mede op hun geweten hebben, is niet de minste verontschuldiging aan te voeren. Zelfs nadat zonneklaar en onomstotelijk was vastgesteld dat van schending van de Nederlandse grens door het Duitse leger op geen enkel punt en op geen enkel ogenblik sprake is geweest, heeft het praatje niet opgehouden aan Nederland schade te doen. De buitenlandse regeringen hebben het tenslotte wel op de juiste waarde, dat wil hier zeggen onwaarde geschat, en verdere verspreiding ervan naar vermogen tegengegaan. Maar daarmede was het kwaad niet gestuit. Zulke praatjes blijven nawerken onder allerlei kringen van de bevolking, en daarbij geldt helaas niet dat de waarheid de leugen wel achterhaalt. Wanneer Nederland en zijn regering bij het Franse volk sympathie hebben verspeeld, en zelfs bij maar al te velen onze Gallische broeders in een kwaad blaadje zijn gekomen, heeft het valse gerucht omtrent het oogluikend toelaten van schending onze grenzen door Duitse troepen daartoe meer dan iets anders bijgedragen. De Fransgezinden onder de Nederlanders, die aan de verspreiding daarvan mede schuld hebben, hebben eer van hun werk. Ze hebben meer bijgedragen tot het kweken van verwijdering tussen Fransen en Nederlanders dan alle pro-Duitse propagandisten bij elkaar. Van hetzelfde allooi, maar gelukkig van veel minder praktische betekenis, was het later uitgebroed sprookje dat er een geheim verdrag tussen Nederland en Duitsland in verband met de oorlog zou zijn gesloten. Dit verhaal is op zichzelf niet minder kwaadaardig en niet minder gevaarlijk. Men kan voor niemand enige verontschuldiging vinden die aan het ontstaan of de verspreiding ervan heeft meegedaan. Hoewel het zijn ronde begon op een ogenblik toen de gemoederen reeds wat waren gekalmeerd en niet meer zo ontvankelijk waren voor elk sensatiebericht, hoe onwaar en hoe onwaarschijnlijk het ook zijn mocht, heeft het toch nog zoveel stof opgeworpen dat het de eer kreeg in de vergaderingen van de beide Kamers der Staten-Generaal te worden besproken. Het kon daar met de meeste beslistheid van regeringswezen worden tegengesproken en het werd met de meeste beslistheid tegengesproken. Het eerst in een interruptie van de heer Kort van der Linden, zodra er in de Kamer van werd gerept. Zoals ik reeds opmerkte, is het in zijn gevolgen minder ernstig geweest dan dat van de beweerde toelating van schending onze grenzen door Duitse troepen. Maar dat zij, die aan het ontstaan en de verspreiding van de verdrag lende, schuldig zijn, daarmede minder kwaad brouwden dan met het andere sprookje werd gesticht, kan men niet eens ter hunner verontschuldiging aanvoeren. Het is te danken aan omstandigheden onafhankelijk van hun wil. Waar het ontstaan op een ogenblik van even grote algemene opgewondenheid als in augustus 1914 heerste, of waar het door de Franse pers even gretig opgenomen en verspreid als zijn leugenbroeder uit die dagen, dan zou het in zijn uitwerking aan deze niets hebben toegegeven. De duim waaruit het is gezogen, verdiende ten overstaan van Nederlands volk te worden verbrijzeld. Einde van hoofdstuk 1 van Oorlogstijd Geschreven door meester M.W.F. Troip. Gelezen door Anna Simon. Juni 2014. Young Girls Fighting on the Russian Front By the journal Current History A publication of the New York Times May 1916. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Young Girls Fighting on the Russian Front Stories are filtering in from the various belligerent countries telling of actual fighting in the ranks by women. There are numerous authenticated reports from Serbia of women who are doing the work of soldiers, and there is official confirmation of the promotion of Slavia Tomic, a young Serbian girl who enlisted in the regiment of Wojo Tankosic, and who is credited with being the instigator of the plot which resulted in the assassination of the Austrian Grand Duke. The girl fought through the Serbian campaigns, was twice wounded, and was promoted to the rank of sergeant. Martha Malko, the wife of a Russian sub-officer, fought beside her husband until he was killed, and she was taken prisoner by the Germans. She is now interred at Schulen. A correspondent of the Novo Vremya tells an interesting story of the experiences of twelve young Russian girls who fought in the ranks as soldiers of the line. The story, as related by one of their numbers, was also authenticated by the Petrograd correspondent of the London Times, who wrote as follows. She was called Zoya Smirnov. She came to our staff straight from the advanced positions where she had spent fourteen months wearing soldiers' clothes and fighting with the foe on even terms with the men. Zoya Smirnov was only sixteen years old. Closely cropped hair gave her the appearance of a boy, and only a thin girlish voice involuntarily betrayed her sex. At the beginning, Zoya was somewhat shy. She carefully chose her words and replied confusedly to our questions. But later she recovered and told us her entire history, which brought tears to the eyes of many a case-hardened veteran who heard it. She and her friends decided to go to the war on the eighth day of mobilization, that is, at the end of July, 1914, and early in August they succeeded in realizing their dream. Exactly twelve of them assembled and they were all nearly the same age and from the same high school. Almost all were natives of Moscow, belonging to the most diversified classes of society, but firmly united in the camaraderie of school life. We decided to run away to the war at all costs, said Zoya. It was impossible to run away from Moscow because we might have been stopped at the station. It was therefore necessary to hire his Voschiks, and ride out to some of the suburban stations through which the military eclans were continually passing. We left home early in the morning without saying a word to our parents and departed. It was a bit terrible at first. We were very sorry for our fathers and mothers, but the desire to see the war and ourselves kill the Germans overcame all other sentiments. And so they attained the desired object. The soldiers treated the little patriots quite paternally and properly, and having concealed them in the cars, took them off to the war. A military uniform was obtained for each. They donned these and, unobstructed, arrived at the Austrian frontier, where they had to detrain and on foot proceed to Lemberg. Here the regimental authorities found out what had happened, but not being able to persuade the young patriots to return home, allowed them to march with the regiment. The regiment traversed the whole of Galatia, scaled the Carpathians, incessantly participating in battle, and the girls never fell back from it a step, but shared with the men all the privations and horrors of the march and discharged the duties of ordinary privates since they were taught to shoot and were given rifles. Days and months passed. The girls almost forgot their past. They hardly responded to their feminine names, for each of them had received a masculine surname and completely mingled with the men. The soldiers themselves mutually guarded the girls and observed each other's conduct. The battles in which the regiment engaged were fierce and sanguinary, particularly in the spring when the Germans brought up the heavy artillery to the Carpathians and began to advance upon us with their celebrated phalanx. Our troops underwent a perfect hell, and the young volunteers endured it with them. Was it terrible, an officer asked Sawyer? Were you afraid? I should say so. Who wouldn't be afraid? When for the first time they began to fire with their heavy guns, Several of us couldn't stand it and began to cry out. What did you cry out? We began to cry Mama. Shura was the first and Lydia. They were both fourteen years old, and they remembered their mothers all the time. Besides, it seems that I also cried out as well. We all cried. Well, it was frightful, even for the men. During one of the Carpathian engagements at night, one of the twelve friends, the sixteen-year-old Zina Morozov, was killed outright by a shell. It struck immediately at her feet, and the entire small body of the girl was torn into fragments. 
Nevertheless, we managed to collect her remains, Zoya stated with a tender inflection in her voice. At dawn, the firing died down, and we, that is, all the remaining high school volunteers, assembled near the spot where Zena had perished, and somehow collected her bones and laid them in a hastily dug grave. In the same grave, we laid also all Zena's things, such as she had with her. The grave was then filled up, and upon the cross, which we erected above it, the following inscription was written. Volunteer of such and such regiment, Zena Morozov, 19 years old, killed in action on such and such date in such and such year. On the following day, we were already far away, and exactly where Zena's grave is, I don't remember well. I only know that it is in the Carpathians at the foot of a steep rocky incline. After the death of Zena, other of her friends were frequently wounded in turn. Nadia, Zena, and the 14-year-old Shura. Zoya herself was wounded twice, the first time in her leg and the second time in the side. Both wounds were so serious that Zoya was left unconscious on the battlefield, and the stretcher-bearers subsequently discovered her only by accident. After the second wound, she was obliged to lie at a base hospital for over a month. On being discharged, she again proceeded to the positions, endeavoring to find her regiment. But on reaching the familiar trenches, she could no longer find a single regimental comrade, nor a single fellow volunteer. They had all gone to another front, and in the trenches sat absolute strangers. The girl lost her presence of mind, and for the first time during the entire campaign began to weep, thus unexpectedly betraying her age and sex. Her unfamiliar fellow countrymen gazed with amazement upon the strange young non-commissioned officer with the cross of St. George and medal on her breast, who resembled a stripling and finally proved to be a girl. But the girl had with her all necessary documents, not accepting a certificate giving her the right to wear the St. George's cross received for a brave and dashing reconnaissance, and distrustful glances promptly gave place to others full of respect. Zoya was finally induced to abandon the trenches, at least for the time being, and to try to engage in nursing at one of the advanced hospitals. She is now working at the divisional hospital of the N Division in the village of K, ten versts from the Austrian town of Z. From her remaining friends, whom she left with the regiment, which went to another front, Zoya has no news whatever. What has befallen them? Do these amazing Russian girls continue their disinterested and heroic service to the country, or do graves already hold them, similar to that which was dug for the remnants of poor little Xenia, who perished so gloriously in the distant Carpathians? End of Young Girls Fighting on the Russian Front by Current History, May 1916 Read by TBB Finished with the War, A Soldier's Declaration by Siegfried Sassoon Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp Lieutenant Siegfried Sassoon, 3rd Battalion, Royal Welch Fusiliers, July 1917 I am making this statement as an act of willful defiance of military authority because I believe that the war is being deliberately prolonged by those who have the power to end it. I am a soldier, convinced that I am acting on behalf of soldiers. I believe that the war upon which I entered as a war of defense and liberation has now become a war of aggression and conquest. I believe that the purposes for which I and my fellow soldiers entered upon this war should have been so clearly stated as to have made it impossible to change them, and that had this been done, the objects which actuated us would now be attainable by negotiation. I have seen and endured the sufferings of the troops, and I can no longer be a party to prolong these sufferings for ends which I believe to be evil and unjust. I am not protesting against the conduct of the war, but against the political errors and insincerities for which the fighting men are being sacrificed. On behalf of those who are suffering now, I make this protest against the deception which is being practiced upon them. Also, 
I believe it may help to destroy the callous complacency with which the majority of those at home regard the continuance of agonies which they do not share and which they have not enough imagination to realize. End of Finished with the War, A Soldier's Declaration by Siegfried Sassoon This recording is in the public domain. Outside the Glass Doors From a Diary Without Dates by Enid Bagnold This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Diary Without Dates by Enid Bagnold Chapter 1. Outside the Glass Doors I like discipline. I like to be part of an institution. It gives one more liberty than is possible among three or four observant friends. It is always cool and wonderful, after the monotone of the dim hospital, its half-lit corridors stretching as far as one can see, to come out into the dazzling starlight and climb the hill up into the trees and shrubberies here. The wind was terrible to-night. I had to battle up, and the leaves were driven down the hill so fast that once I thought it was a motor-bicycle. Madeline's garden next door is all deserted now. They have gone up to London. The green asphalt tennis court is shining with rain. The blue pond brown with slime. The little statues and bowls are lying on their sides to keep the wind from putting them forcibly there and all over the house are white draperies and ghost chairs. When I walk in the garden, I feel like a ghost left over from the summer, too. I became aware to-night of one face detaching itself from the rest. It is not a more pleasing face than the others, but it is becoming conspicuous to me. Twice a week, when there is a concert in the big hall, the officers and the VADs are divided by some unspoken rule, the officers sitting at one side of the room, the VADs in a white row on the other. When my eyes rest for a moment on the motley of dressing gowns, mackintoshes, uniforms, I inevitably see in the line one face, set on a slant, one pair of eyes forsaking the stage and fixing on me in a steady, inoffensive beam. This irritates me. The very lack of offense irritates me but one grows to look for everything. Afterwards, in the dining-room, during mess, he will ask politely, What did you think of the concert, sister? Good show. How wonderful to be called sister! Every time the uncommon name is used towards me, I feel the glow of an implied relationship, something which links me to the speaker. My sister remarked, if it's only a matter of that, we can provide thrills for you here very easily. The name of my admirer is, after all, Pettit. The other nurse in the mess, who is very grand and insists on pronouncing his name in the French way, says he is of humble origin. He seems to have no relations and no visitors. Out in the corridor I meditate on love. Laying trays soothes the activity of the body, and the mind works softly. I meditate on love. I say to myself that Mr. Pettit is to be envied. I am still the wonder of the unknown to him. I exist, walk, talk, every day, beneath the beam of his eye, impenetrable. He fell down again yesterday, and his foot won't heal. He has time before him. But in a hospital one never has time. One is never sure. He has perhaps been here long enough to learn that, to feel the insecurity, the impermanency. At any moment he may be forced to disappear into the secondary stage of convalescent homes. Yes, the impermanency of life in a hospital. An everlasting dislocation of combinations. Like nuns, one must learn to do with no nearer friend than God. Bolts in the shape of sudden whimsical orders are flung by an Almighty whom one does not see. 
the sister who is over me the only sister who can laugh at things other than jokes is going in the first week of next month why where she doesn't know but only smiles at my impatience she knows life hospital life it unsettles me as i lay my spoons and forks sixty-five trays it takes an hour to do thirteen pieces on each tray thirteen times sixty-five eight hundred and forty-five things to collect lay square up symmetrically i make little absurd reflections and arrangements taking a dislike to the knives because they will not lie still on the polished metal of the tray but pivot on their shafts and swing out at angles after my fingers have left them i love the long the dim and lonely corridor the light centred in the gleam of the trays salt cellars yellow butters cylinders of glass impermanency i don't wonder the sisters grow so secret so uneager how often stifled how often torn apart it's heaven to me to be one of such a number of faces to see them pass into mess like ghosts gentlemen tinker and tailor each having shuffled home from death each having known his life rock on its base not talking much for what is there to say not laughing much for they have been here too long is a nightly pleasure to me creatures of habit all the colored dressing gowns range themselves round the two long tables this man in this seat that man by the gas fire this man with his wheelchair drawn up at the end that man at the corner where no one will jostle his arm curious how these officers leave the hospital so silently disappearances one face after another slips out of the picture the unknown heart behind the face fixed intently on some other center of life i went into a soldier's ward to-night to inquire about a man who has pneumonia round his bed there stood three red screens and the busy white-capped heads of two sisters bobbed above his rampart it suddenly shocked me what were they doing there why the screens why the look of strain in the eyes of the man in the next bed who could see behind the screens i went cold and stood rooted waiting till one of them could come out and speak to me soon they took away the screen nearest to me they had done with it the man i was to inquire for has no nostrils they were blown away and he breathes through two pieces of red rubber tubing it gave a more horrible look to his face than i have ever seen the sister came out and told me she thought he was not up to much i think she means he is dying i wonder if he thinks it is better to die but he was nearly well before he got pneumonia had begun to take up the little habits of living he had been out to tea inexplicable what he thinks of lying behind the screen Tonight I was laying my trays in the corridor, the dim corridor that I am likely often to mention, the occasional blue gas lamps hanging at intervals down the roof in a dwindling perspective. The only unshaded light in the corridor hangs above my head, making the cutlery gleam in my hands. The swish-swish of a lame foot approached down the stone tiling with the tapping, soft and dull, of a rubber-tipped walking-stick. He paused by the pillar, as I knew he would, and I busied myself with an added rush and hurry, an added irritating noise of spoons flung down. He waited patiently, shyly. I didn't look up, but I knew his face was half-smiling and suppliant. "'We shall miss you,' he said. "'But I shall be back in a week. "'We shall miss you, laying the trays out here.' everything passes i said gaily he whistled a little and balanced himself against his stick you are like me sister he said earnestly and i saw that he took me for a philosopher he shuffled on almost beyond the circle of light paused while my lips moved in a vague smile of response 
then moved on into the shadow. The low, deep quiet of the corridor resumed its hold on me. The patter of reflection in my brain proceeded undisturbed. You are like me. The deepest flattery one creature pays its fellow, the cry which is uttered when another enters our country. Far down the corridor a slim figure in white approaches, dwarfed by the smoky distance, her nun-like cap floating, her scarlet cape, the cape of pride, slipped round her narrow shoulders. How intent and silent they are! I watched this one pass with a look of half-reverence, half-envy. One should never aspire to know a sister intimately. They are disappointing people, without candor, without imagination. Yet what a look of personality hangs about them! Tonight, Mr. Pettit. Sister? Yes, Mr. Pettit? Do you ever go to theatres? Do you like them? At the risk of appearing unnatural, I said, not much. Oh, I thought, hmm, that's a pity. Don't you like reviews? Oh, yes. I thought you'd take me to a matinee one afternoon. Oh, charming. I can't get leave in the afternoons, though. You often have a day off. Yes, but it's too soon to ask for another. Well, how about Wednesday, then? Too soon. Think of the new sister and her opinion of me. That has yet to be won. Well, let me know, anyway. Staved off. The new sister is coming quite soon. She has a medal. Now that I know my sister must go, I don't talk to her much. I almost avoid her. That's true hospital philosophy. I must put down the beauty of the night and the woman's laugh in the shadowy hedge. I walked up from the hospital late tonight, half past eight and hungry, in the cold, brilliant moonlight. A fine moon, very low, throwing long, pointed shadows across the road from the trees and hedges. As one climbs up, there is a wood on the right, the remains of the old wooded hill, sparse trees very tall, and tonight a star between every branch, and a fierce moon beating down on the mud and grass. I had on my white cap and long blue coat, very visible. The moon swept the road from side to side. Lovers, acting as though it were night, were lit as though it was day. I turned into the wood to take a message to a house set back from the road, and the moonlight and the night vapor rising from the marshy ground were all tangled together, so that I could hardly see hedge from field or path. I saw a lit cigarette end, and a woman's laugh came across the field as naturally as if a sheep had bleated in the swampy grass. It struck me that the dark countryside was built to surround and hide a laugh like hers, the laugh of a lover, animal and protesting. I saw the glowing end of the cigarette dance in a curve and fall to the ground, and she laughed again, more faintly. Walking on in the middle of the moonlight, I reached the gate I was looking for, ran up the pebbly drive to the dining-room window, gave my message, and returned. I slipped my cap off my hair and pushed it into my pocket, keeping under the shadow of the hedge and into the quiet field. They were whispering, Do you? I do. Are you? I am. Crushed into the set branches of the hedge. The mess went vilely tonight. Sister adds up on her fingers, and that's fatal, so all the numbers were out and the chef sent in forty-five meats instead of fifty-one. I blushed with horror and responsibility, standing there watching six hungry men pretending to be philosophers. The sergeant wolfed the cheese, too. He got it out from under my very eyes while I was clearing the tables, and ate it, standing up to it in the pantry with his back to me when I went in to fetch a tray. Whenever I see that broad khaki back, the knickered legs astride, the flexed elbow tips, I know that his digestion is laying up more trouble for him. 
Banks, the mess orderly, overeats himself, too. He comes to the bunk and thrusts his little smile round the door. Sister, I got another of them sick headaches, very cheerfully, as though he has got something worth having. She actually retorted, Banks, you eat too much, one day. But he only swung on one leg and smiled more cheerfully than ever. The new sister has come. That should mean a lot. What about one's habits of life? The new sister has come, and at present she is absolutely without personality, beyond her medal. She appears to be deaf. I went along to-night to see and ask after the man who has his nose blown off. After the long walk down the corridor, in almost total darkness, the vapor of the rain floating through every open door and window, the sudden brilliancy of the ward was like a haven. The man lay on my right entering, the screen removed from him. Far up the ward, Sister was working by a bed. Ryan, the man with the nose gone, was lying high on five or six pillows, slung in his position by tapes and webbing, passed under his arms and attached to the bedposts. He lay with his profile to me. Only he has no profile, as we know a man's. Like an ape, he has only his bumpy forehead and his protruding lips. The nose, the left eye, gone. He was breathing heavily. They don't know yet whether he will live. When a man dies, they fetch him with a stretcher, just as he came in. Only he enters with a blanket over him, and a flag covers him as he goes out. When he came in, he was one of a convoy. But every man who can stand rises to his feet as he goes out. Then they play him to his funeral, to a grass mound at the back of the hospital. It takes all sorts to make a hospital. For instance, the visitors. There is a lady who comes in to tea, and wants to be introduced to everyone as though it was a school treat. She jokes about the cake, its scarcity or its quantity, and makes a lot of fun about two lumps of sugar. When she is at her best, the table assumes a perfect and listening silence. Not the silence of the critic, but the silence of the absorbed child treasuring every item of talk for future use. After she goes, the joy of her will last them all the evening. There is the lady who comes in to tea, and, sitting down at the only unlaid table, cries, Nurse, I have no knife or plate or cup, and I prefer a glass of boiling water to tea, and would you mind sewing this button on my glove? There is the lady who comes in and asks the table at large, I wonder if anyone knows General Biggins, I once met him. Or, You've been in Gallipoli? Did you run across my young cousin, a lieutenant in the, well, he was only there two days or so, I suppose, exactly as though she was talking about Cairo in the season. Today there was the limit. She sat two paces away from where I sit to pour out tea. Her face was kind, but inquisitive, with that brown liver look round the eyes, and a large rakish hat. She comes often. Having heard of him through the Padre to see a Canadian, whom she doesn't know, and who doesn't want to see her. From two places away I heard her voice piping up. Nurse, excuse my asking, but is your cap a regulation one like all the others? I looked up, and all the tea I was pouring poured over the edge. Mr. Pettit and Captain Matthew, between us, looked down at their plates. I put my hand to my cap. Is anything wrong? It ought to be like the others. She leant towards me, nodding and smiling with bonhomie, and said flatteringly, It's so prettily put on, I thought it was different. And then, horror, Don't you think nurse puts her cap on well? She asked Captain Matthew, who, looking harder than ever at his plate, and reddening to the ears, mumbled something which did not particularly commit him, since it couldn't be heard. The usual delighted silence began to creep round the table, and I tried wildly to divert her attention before our end became a stage and the rest of the table an audience. "'I think it's so nice to see you sitting down with them all,' she cooed, 
It's so cozy for them. Is your cup empty? I said furiously, and held out my hand for it. But it wasn't, of course. She couldn't even do that for me. She shook hands with me when she went away, and said she hoped to come again. And she will. There was a lady who asked me very loudly whether I saw many horrible sights, and did the V.A.D.s have to go to the funerals? And another who cried out with emotion when she saw the first officer limp into mess, And can some of them walk, then? Perhaps she thought they came in to tea on stretchers with field bandages on? She quivered all over, too, as she looked from one to the other, and I feel sure she went home and broke down, crying, What an experience! The actual wounds! Shuffle, shuffle, up the corridor to-night, as I was laying my trays. Captain Matthew appeared in the circle of light, his arm and hand bound up and his pipe in his mouth. He paused by me. "'Well,' he said companionably, and lolled against a pillar. "'You've done well at tea in the way of visitors,' I remarked. Six, wasn't it?' "'Yes,' he said, "'and now I've got rid of them all, except one.' "'Where's the one?' "'In there.' He pointed with his pipe to the empty mess-room. "'He's the father of a subaltern of mine who was killed.' "'He's come to talk to you about it?' Yes. But he seemed in no hurry to go in, waiting against the pillar, and staring at the moving cutlery. He waited almost three minutes. Then he sighed and went in. Biscuits to put out, cheese to put out. How wet this new cheese is! And fresh and good the little bits that fall off the edge. I never eat cheese at home, but here the breakings are like manna and pears, with the old shopman's trick, little bitten ones at the bottom, fine ones at the top. Soft sugar, lump sugar, coffee. As one stirs the coffee round in the tin, the whole room smells of it, that brown burnt smell. And then, to click the light on, let down the blind, stir the fire, close the door of the little bunk, and looking round it, think, what exhilaration of liberty I have here. Let them pile on the rules, invent and insist. Yet behind them, beneath them, I have that strong secret liberty of an institution that runs like a wind in me and lifts my mind like a leaf. So long as I conform absolutely, not a soul will glance at my thoughts, few at my face. I have only to be silent and conform, and I might be in so far a land that even the eye of God has lost me. I took the plate of biscuits, the two plates of cheese, one in each hand and one balanced with a new skill on my arm, and carried them into the dining room, where the tables were already laid, and only one light kept on as yet for economy's sake. Low voices. There in the dimmest corner sat Captain Matthew, his chin dug deep in his grey dressing-gown, and beside him a little elderly man, his hat on his knees, his anxious ordinary face turned toward the light. A citizen, a baker or a brewer, tinker, tailor, or candlestick-maker. There had been the buying of the uniform, the visits to the camp in England, the parcels to send out, always the parcels, week by week. And now, nothing. No more parcels. No more letters. Silence. Only the last hungry pickings from Captain Matthew's tired memory and nervous speech. I turned away with a great shrinking. In a very few minutes the citizen went past my bunk door, his hat in his hand, his black coat buttoned, taking back to his home and his family the last facts that he might ever learn. At the end of the passage he almost collided with a stretcher which bears a flag. Of the two the stretcher moved me least. My sister is afraid of death, she told me so, and not the less afraid, she said, after all she has seen of it. That is terrible. 
but the new sister is afraid of life. She is shorter sighted. The rain has been pouring all day. Tonight it has stopped, and all the hill is steam and drizzle, and black with the blackness that war has thrust upon the countryside. My sister has gone. Two nights ago I went up to a dinner at Madeline's and to stay the night. My sister said, Go and enjoy yourself. And I did. It is very amusing the change into rooms full of talk and light. I feel a glow of pleasure as I climb to the room Madeline calls mine, and find the reflection of the fire on the blue wallpaper. The evening wasn't remarkable, but I came back full of descriptions to the bunk and sister next day. I was running on, inventing this and that, making her laugh, when suddenly I looked up and she had tears in her eyes. I wavered and came to a stop. She got up suddenly and moved about the room, and then, with a muttered, wash my hands, disappeared into the corridor. I sat and thought, is it that she has her life settled, quietly continuous, and one breaks in? Does the wind from outside hurt? I regretted it all the evening. Yesterday I arrived at the hospital and couldn't find the store-covered keys then ran across to her room and tapped at the door. Her voice called, Come in, and I found her huddled in an armchair, unnerved and white. I asked her for the keys, and when she gave them to me, she held out her hand and said, I'm going away tomorrow. They're sending me home. They say I'm ill. I muttered something with a feeling of shock, and going back to my bunk I brooded. The new sister came in, and a new V.A.D., too, explaining that my former companion was now going into a ward. A sense of desolation was in the air, a ruthlessness on the part of someone unknown. Shuffle, shuffle, they shuffle us like cards. I rose and began to teach the new V.A.D. the subtle art of laying trays. She seemed stupid. I didn't want to share my trays with her. I love them. They are my recreation. I hung over them idly, hardly laying down the spoons I held in my hand, but standing with them chivied the new V.A.D. until her movements became flustered and her eye distraught. She was very ugly. I thought, in a day or two I shall get to like her, and then I shan't be able to chivy her. Out in the corridor came a tremendous tramping, boots and jingling metal. Two armed men with fixed bayonets arrived, headed by a sergeant. The sergeant paused and looked uncertainly this way and that, and then at me. I guessed their destination. In there, I nodded, pointing through a closed glass door, and the sergeant marched his men in and beyond the door. An officer had been brought back under arrest. I had seen him pass with his escort. The rumor at tea had been that he had extended his two days' leave into three weeks. The V.A.D. looked at me questioningly, but she didn't dare, and I couldn't bear, to start any elucidations on the subject. I couldn't think. She worried me. Her odds and ends of conversation pecked at me like a small bird. She told me a riddle, which filled me with nausea, and finally a limerick, which I had heard three times in the mess. I left her and went into the bunk. Here the new sister had installed herself, gentle and pink and full of quiet murmurs. The rain, half snow, half sleet, dabbled against the window pane, and I lifted the blind to watch the flakes stick and melt on the glass. The V.A.D., her trays finished, appeared in the doorway. The little room seemed full of people. There's a concert, I said, looking at the V.A.D. with distaste. She looked at me uncertainly. Aren't you coming? No, I said, I've a note to write. Forgetting that the new sister might not allow such infringements. She gave no sign. The V.A.D. gave in and disappeared concert words. 
the sister rose too and went out into the kitchen to consult with the chef i slipped out behind her and down the steps into the garden into the wet dark garden down the channels that were garden paths and felt my way over to the sister's quarters my sister hadn't moved there by the gas fire her thin hand to her face she sat as she had two hours before come in she offered and talked to me her collar which was open she tried to do up it made a painful impression on me of weakness and the effort to be normal i remembered that she had once told me she was so afraid of death and i guessed that she was suffering now from that terror but when the specialist is afraid what can ignorance say life in the bunk is wretched except that the new vad tells fortunes by hands the new sister is at the same time timid and dogged she looks at me with a sidelong look and gives me little flips with her hand as though a she thought i might break something and b that she might stave it off by playfulness pain to stand up straight on one's feet strong easy without the surging of any physical sensation by a bedside whose coverings are flung here and there by the quivering nerves beneath it there is a sort of shame in such strength what can i do for you my eyes cry dumbly into his clouded brown pupils i was told to carry trays from a ward where i had never been before just to carry trays orderly's work no more number twenty two was lying flat on his back his knees drawn up under him the sheets up to his chin his flat chalk white face tilted at the ceiling as i bent over to get his untouched tray his tortured brown eyes fell on me i'm in pain sister he said no one has ever said that to me before in that tone he gave me the look that a dog gives and his words had the character of an unformed cry he was quite alone at the end of the ward the sister was in her bunk my white cap attracted his desperate senses as he spoke his knees shot out from under him with his restless pain his right arm was stretched from the bed in a narrow iron frame reminding me of a hand laid along a harp to play the chords the fingers with their swollen green flesh extended across the strings but of this harp his fingers were the slave not the master shall i call your sister i whispered to him he shook his head she can't do anything i must just stick it out they're going to operate on the elbow but they must wait three days first his head turned from side to side but his eyes never left my face i stood by him helpless overwhelmed by his horrible loneliness then i carried his tray down the long ward and past the sister's bunk within by the fire she was laughing with the m o and drinking a cup of tea a harmless amusement the officer in number twenty two says he's in great pain i said doubtfully it wasn't my ward and sisters are funny i know she said quite decently but i can't do anything he must stick it out i looked through the ward door once or twice during the evening and still his knees at the far end of the room were moving up and down it must happen to the men in france that living so near the edge of death they are more aware of life than we are when they come back when the post-war days set in will they keep that vision letting it play on life or must it fade and some become so careless of life so careless of all the whims and personalities and desires that go to make up existence that one wrote to me the only real waste is the waste of metal the earth will be covered again and again with us the corn will grow again the bread and meat can be repeated but this metal that has lain in the earth for centuries the formation of the beginning that men have sweated and grubbed for 
that is the waste what carelessness of worldly success they should bring back with them orderlies come and go up and down the corridor often they carry stretchers now and then a stretcher with the empty folds of a flag hung across it then i pause from laying my trays and with a bunch of forks in my hand i stand still they take the stretcher into a ward and while i wait i know what they are doing behind the screens which stand round a bed against the wall i hear the shuffle of feet as the men stand to attention and the orderlies come out again and the folds of the flag have ballooned up to receive and embrace a man's body where is he going to the mortuary yes but where else perhaps there is nothing better than the ecstasy and unappeasement of life end of outside the glass doors from a diary without dates by enid bagnold read by maria casper Books in the War, The Romance of Library War Service by Theodore Wesley Coke. Chapter 10. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 10. The British War Library. The night after war was declared, Mrs. H. M. Gaskell, C.B.E., lay awake, wondering how she could best help in the coming struggle. Recalling how much a certain book she had read during a recent illness had meant to her, she realised the value of providing literature for the sick and wounded. A few days later she dined with some friends and talked over this opportunity for service. The result was that Lady Battersea decided to lend Surrey House Marble Arch for the work. Lord Haldane, who was War Minister at the time, approved the plan officially, and Sir Alfred Sloggett, then head of the Royal Army Medical Corps, gave his official sanction. The work was no sooner under way than the Admiralty asked whether the new organisation would be willing to supply the Navy, the sound men as well as the sick mrs gaskell's brother mr beresford melville entered into the work with enthusiasm and gave it financial support the call for books was the first appeal of the war and newspapers were glad to give their space and support free to the letters asking for reading matter for the sick and wounded to the surprise of the organisers not only parcels and boxes but van loads of books were delivered at surrey house hastily improvised bookcases rose quickly to the ceilings of the rooms on the ground floor then up the wide stairway filling three immense rooms and crowding the corridors it was impossible for the overworked volunteers to keep up with this unexpected volume of gifts dr c t hagberg wright of the london library was appealed to and when he came to surrey house and saw the multitude of books he decided to call upon his assistance with five of his staff he set to work it was necessary to hire empty wagons to stand at the door for the refuse of which there was a huge quantity for many people had seized this as an opportunity to clean out their rubbish piles and credit themselves with doing a charitable turn at the same time old parish magazines were sent in by tens of thousands only to be passed on to the waiting wagons there were however over a million well-selected books including rare editions of standard authors the latter were put to one side for sale and the money thus received was invested in the kind of books most needed while one set of helpers was unpacking another was sending off carefully selected boxes of books to small permanent libraries in the military and naval hospitals from lists furnished by the admiralty and war office the permanent hospitals were supplied with a library before the wounded arrived and as the war area expanded the war library followed with literature advertisements were inserted in american and canadian newspapers in response to which publishers sent most acceptable gifts from across the water 
later large consignments of literature came from south africa australia madeira the canary islands and new zealand english publishers were more than generous one publisher sent six hundred beautifully printed copies of six of the best novels in the english language bound in dark blue and red washable buckram the british and foreign bible society gave eighty thousand copies of little khaki covered gospels printed on thin paper with the red cross or the union jack decorating the cover in november nineteen fourteen the admiralty asked the war library organization to supply the sailors in the north sea fleet at the rate of a book a man not only was this done but boxes of books were sent to all the guards around the coasts of the british isles the shetland and orkney isles and the west coast of ireland when the camps library was organized by sir edward ward and the honourable mrs anstruther for the strong and healthy soldiers in camps and trenches the originators of the war library met with the promoters of the new scheme and discussed a division of labour the field of work was increasing to such an extent that it was agreed that the war library should look after the unfit in the army and navy while the new organization would take care of the fit this plan worked very well but alas as mrs gaskell reports quote, as the wide-flung battlefield extended the supply of books dwindled we were in despair the papers filled with other appeals could only insert ours by payment and money too had become very scarce meanwhile hospitals in france doubled sick in lemnos malta gallipoli egypt grew in numbers to an alarming extent books were asked for cabled for demanded implored our hearts were indeed heavy laden relief came through the action of mr herbert samuel then postmaster general who after paying a visit to the camps and seeing life in the trenches decided that the post office should help in the work by forwarding reading material for the men to the depots without charge then the red cross and order of st john was asked to affiliate the war library scheme with its organization in october nineteen fifteen it not only agreed to do this but became financially responsible for the undertaking the promoters of the latter promising in return to supply the literature that they and their hospitals required which meant considerably over two hundred thousand books and magazines a year when the beds at gallipoli were being rapidly filled with the sick and wounded a cable would come to surrey house quote, send twenty five thousand books at once light and good print end quote. perhaps the day before malta had cabled for ten thousand similar books the demand grew by leaps and bounds no hospital at home or abroad asked without receiving the full quota requested thousands of books and magazines were sent every month to east africa bombay mesopotamia egypt saloniki and malta fortnightly parcels went to the hospitals in france and to the cross channel hospital service toward the close of the war the war library was supplying approximately eighteen hundred and ten hospitals in great britain two hundred and sixty two in france fifty eight naval hospitals and seventy hospital ships the libraries on the transport hospital ships were replenished every voyage books were sent not only to hospitals but to various other places such as rest camps casualty clearing stations ambulance drivers units and nurses rest homes in nineteen eighteen a branch was started in genoa to supply reading matter to the medical units and hospitals serving with the british army in italy in all from the beginning of the war to the spring of nineteen nineteen the war library distributed over six million books and magazines a statement easy to remember but difficult to grasp of this number the records show that over two million seven hundred thousand as well as thirty six tons of weekly papers were acquired by purchase the remainder came from private donors from collecting centres established in all parts of the country 
and as a result of special book campaigns organized and carried through by members of the library committee in many large towns meetings were held addressed by such speakers as sir arthur stanley the right hon augustine birrell the poet laureate sir herbert warren mr edmund goss lord chilston mr putnam lady beecham the dean of worcester sir charles walston the headmaster of dulwich college dr hagberg wright and mrs gaskell men whom typhoid and dysentery had weakened were not able to hold books at all and needed pictures instead mr rudyard kipling had foreseen this need and asked those in charge to supply strong brown paper scrapbooks filled but not crowded with pictures his suggestion was immediately adopted these scrapbooks were made from sheets forty three by twenty seven inches folded three times forming a book of sixteen pages about fourteen by eleven inches tied together at the back with a bow of bright ribbon on the outside an attractive coloured picture was pasted the inside pages were filled with entertaining pictures both in black and white and in colour interspersed with little jokes anecdotes and very short stories from such weeklies as punch london opinion and answers short poems were found to be acceptable space fillers comic postcards were used but no christmas cards pictures were always placed straight before the eye so that the invalid would not have to turn the scrapbook around in order to see them for many a patient was too weak even to lift his hand and had to await the coming of a nurse in order to know what the next page had in store for him volunteer makers of these aids to cheer were urged to remember that they were for grown men not for children they were furnished in large numbers by a generous public and proved invaluable fresh scrapbooks were supplied to the hospital ships each voyage a young soldier just recovering from typhoid came to the war library on his return from egypt and was asked to look about and tell what he would have liked best during his convalescence i was too tired to read said he but i would have given a lot for one of those picture books this type of convalescent could use games to advantage and so the war library started a games department there was a never-ceasing demand for playing cards dominoes draughts and good jigsaw puzzles even with a few pieces missing anything that could be packed flat was acceptable the books asked for by the soldiers ranged all the way from penny novelettes to shakespeare and the hundred best poems exciting and absorbing stories the bulldog breed the red seal and the adventure series for instance were in great demand and all good detective stories were hailed with delight sevenpenny sixpenny and shilling editions were desirable because of their handy size and good print for the same reason single plays of shakespeare were more useful than complete works since a book too bulky or too sombre is as formidable to a reader as a long hill is to a cyclist the very sight of it tires him the favourite authors were nat gould jack london rudyard kipling william le Coeur, ridgewell cullum charles garvis guy boothby a conan doyle w w jacobs florence barclay ian hay cutcliffe hine q john oxenham h a vatchell edgar wallace ryder haggard dumas and robert louis stevenson books on handicrafts and trades were often asked for i received the book you have so kindly sent me on practical gas fitting and thank you very much for same wrote a man who had put in a special request it deals with everything you could wish to know on the subject i'm sure it will be a great help to me when the time comes for my discharge from the army mrs gaskell comments on the curiously different appetite for books shown by the overseas contingent remarking that the canadians have an insatiable desire for books of reference as evidenced by three requests from colonial hospitals asking for the encyclopaedia britannica in forty volumes all of which were duly granted maps such as the strand war map were most acceptable 
the wounded soldiers liked to follow the war from their beds, and apparently enjoyed maps as a traveller enjoys turning over the leaves of Bradshaw, with its constant reminders of journeyings and adventures. The officers asked for new six-shilling novels, and all kinds of lighter biographies, what Robert Louis Stevenson calls heroic gossip, Garibaldi and the Thousand, Trevelyan, Beatrice Deste, Miss Cartwright, and portraits and sketches, Edmund Gosse, were popular. Travel books of all sorts were acclaimed, so too were the light to hold editions of Thackeray, Dickens, E. A. Poe, Kipling, and Meredith. The reviews, especially Blackwood's, the English Review and the Cornhill, were much appreciated, both by the sick and the well. Footnote. Ian Hay pictures the mess after dinner, the day that a heavy and long overdue mail had been found waiting at Saint Grégoire. Quote, Letters had been devoured long ago. Now each member of the mess leaned back in his chair, straightened his weary legs under the table, and settled down, cigar in mouth, to the perusal of the spectator or the tattler, according to rank and literary taste. End quote. End footnote. In January 1917, a new books department was opened in connection with the War Library. To provide the necessary accommodations, the servants' quarters and stables of Surrey House were utilised. Each room was filled with a particular class of reading matter, as novels, books of travel, religious books, magazines. A recent report shows that in one month, 77,000 new books and 14,000 magazines were purchased. This important and difficult phase of the work was in charge of an American woman, Miss Knobloch, sister of Edward Knobloch, the playwright. The workers were encouraged to renewed effort by the countless letters they received from all over the war area. I don't know how we should live without your books, wrote one wounded soldier. I am just waiting until my pal has finished to get hold of his book, wrote another. We have no books, was the appeal of an isolated group of wounded in Egypt. All we have had to read here was a scrap of the advertisement page of a newspaper picked up on the desert, and on it we saw that you send books to sick and wounded. Please hurry up and send some. The flies are awful. End quote. An officer in charge of a casualty clearing hospital wrote of the great joy in camp when he distributed the contents of a parcel among the patients. Every man in the hospital had something to read, and for many hours the monotony of hospital life was greatly relieved. A popular paper-bound novel by Nat Gould seldom lasted a week. The men would hide it for fear of its being taken away. It was passed surreptitiously from bed to bed, or carried in pockets like a treasure trove. When it had been literally read to pieces, there was sure to be a request for another story by the same author, a writer probably unknown to American librarians, but of whose books, we are told by the publisher, over twelve million copies have been sold. According to the Athenaeum, he is the most popular of living writers, and among the great of the past, Dumas alone surpasses him in popularity. His publisher, Mr. John Long, says that no sooner did the first of the American troops take up their post in France than some Tommy whispered furtively, "'Hey, have you got a Nat Gould?' "'We don't smoke them in America,' the Yankee whispered back apologetically. "'I can let you have a Fatima.' Oh, go on! Nat Gold ain't a cigarette. He's the greatest living British author. Even in my small experience, wrote a hospital visitor, I have seen how much actual good can result from the interest given the wounded men by having something really good to read, and apart from the pleasure it gives them. Private K was very down on his luck for he has been badly wounded, and will never, I am afraid, be physically strong again. But since I wrote to him and sent him books, he has cheered up wonderfully, and says life is now quite different. Out of the generous supply you sent me for him, I have chosen Macaulay's Warren Hastings, 
fraser's siberia and that very nice little book on the french pioneers in the new world when he has read those i will send him some more End quote. a red cross worker who had just returned from a four months tour in the mediterranean zone including malta egypt macedonia and italy reported that he had visited nearly every hospital and convalescent home and had either voyaged in or inspected a large number of hospital ships and that everywhere he had been told and had seen for himself what magnificent work was being done by the war library Quote, i am sure it would delight you and your fellow workers he said to see ward after ward where the patients are kept interested and happy by the books and magazines which you send out with such splendid regularity i know the difficulties you have in keeping up the large supply that is required but i am sure that if the donors could see for themselves the happiness which their gifts bring they would readily continue their generous contributions End quote. when i took an armful of books over to the men i was greeted with books oh joy said another letter how can i attempt to thank you in words for this last parcel of books and magazines wrote a patient confined to his bed and making little improvement previous ones have given me pleasure but the contents of this one to hand are delightful ruskin's sesame and lilies with his essay on political economy of art and the eighth note in the addenda silk and purple what reading it makes in these days then froude's short studies homer's iliad caesar's commentaries emerson's essays and thoreau's walden what a gift for one to receive and how appropriate the last two volumes are coming as they did on practically the hundredth anniversary of thoreau's birth i had a manchester guardian sent in to me to-day and enclose a cutting which makes the two books all the more interesting to me especially as i have not read either of them if by these words i can convey to you my delight at the receipt of the books and the pleasure they will give me i am satisfied as i have said before my regret is that i am unable to repay you except by a letter of thanks which at the best leaves much unsaid i like to think that other recipients more deserving than me get the same enjoyment as i do and if so you do not labour in vain from the edith cavill home of rest for nurses came an appreciative letter it was a great delight unpacking the books for each one seemed just exactly the right thing and yet there was such variety that one wondered how it could all have been contrived the novels stories poems pictures the thoroughly modern and present-day touch combined with old-fashioned charm it was all delightful End quote. until your parcels arrived we had only four books between thirty patients in one ward another ward of forty patients had eight books and so on wrote the matron of a hospital in france you can thus imagine the joy when i went into the wards with my arms full telling them they had been sent from london the cheers were so loud and so long that i thought the roof of the wooden hut would collapse a private wrote from east africa it comes to my mind that when in france i had on certain occasions to spend several weeks living in a dugout in a very awkward part of the line being right under the nose so to speak of the german guns inside we found that some former thoughtful occupants had put up a bookshelf which was filled with a splendid assortment of books authors like jean stratton porter jack london e p oppenheim temple thurston and many others of front-rank fame being represented at that time i had no idea who had supplied these books but was content to just greedily devour them without seeking to know where they came from they wonderfully helped to preserve sanity now a very small incident has brought it to my notice that you were the donors and i wish to thank you heartily at the same time i make bold to ask if you could let me have any of george macdonald's books i have a great longing to read him also one of kipling's i shall be pleased to hand these over to the hospital library as i read them i want to thank the war library for the parcels of books that we have been getting from you wrote a lieutenant colonel in the ambulance service we have now received four the first arrived on the twentieth of march and is now in the hands of the germans i hope they appreciated it 
We then became embroiled with the owners of our first parcel for several weeks. Mails were bad, and nothing much arrived from the base. Then we retired to the spot where we now are, a tiny village with beautiful great barns for the men, but no estaminet of any sort or description, no kind of amusement after working hours, altogether a dreary outlook. Then, in quick succession, having been delayed at the base, came three more parcels of books, and now we have small circulating libraries in the officers' mess, in the sergeant's mess, and in a small hospital which we run for the sick of our brigade, and every man, as far as I can see, has one or more gems of literature, Ivanhoe or comic cuts, according to taste, concealed in his kit. You have saved us from boredom, suicide, or worse. Thank you very much indeed. End quote. Owing to the shortage of paper in England, the publishers could not supply all the orders sent in by the war library, and Mrs. Gaskell organised a house-to-house -house visitation in the various English towns. Great care was taken to make the parcels as varied and comprehensive as possible. Those sent to the British Red Cross hospitals in France, for instance, usually included twenty-five papers and magazines of the lighter sort, like the Strand, the Illustrated London News, and the Penny Pictorials, one or two of the heavier periodicals, ten serious or technical books, and from forty to fifty novels of several grades. The packages sent to the English hospitals contained more magazines and penny papers. Specific requests were always promptly filled. The work of selection was done by volunteers, who were kept informed as to the special needs of the places to which the books were to go. The organisation had to be well thought out to prevent the occurrence of mistakes, for a parcel intended for an officer's hospital on the Riviera must not be sent to a Tommy Atkins hospital in Mesopotamia. The selectors must have intellectual sympathies, says Mrs. Gaskell, and human sympathies. They must send a parcel to a general hospital that contains Maysfield prose selections and a large sprinkling of the bulldog breed series. Sometimes, as I touch the books and send them speeding on their way, I think of the strange company travelling to a still stranger fate. Boswell and Pepys, Nick Carter detective stories, The Bible, Nat Gould, Wordsworth's Prelude, Famous Boxers, The Koran, Miss Austin, Mark Twain, Murray Corelli, Macaulay, London Opinion, The Round Table, go side by side to be read. By whom? All we know is that those brave souls find their comfort and consolation in reading, for they tell us so and ask for more. Suffering, weariness, loneliness, depression, weakness, fear of death. Most of us have known one or the other, but these brave hearts know one and all. Still worse, the fear sometimes of inaction for life. Only books can make them forget for a few minutes, an hour perhaps. I cannot ask for books with thoughts in my heart like these. They ask, and surely they will not ask in vain. End quote. The armistice greatly increased the call for books. Patients and staff miss the excitement of the war, writes Mrs. Gaskell and it is difficult to keep pace with the craving for literature of all kinds. End quote. Technical books on professions and trades are particularly in demand. To meet the needs of the situation, the War Office has started an educational scheme in all army centres, appointing an educational officer in every hospital of over a thousand beds and supplying a small library for his use with the patients. I beg to inform you that I have received five splendid parcels of books, for which I am very grateful, wrote the commanding officer of a cavalry field ambulance from Cologne. These books are highly appreciated by the patients and personnel, and help to pass away many a weary hour of the Rhine watch. As in all probability my unit will remain here until the army of occupation is withdrawn, any further supplies would be very welcome. 
now that we are stationary, I am able to run a lending library, thus preserving the books for quite a long time, whereas hitherto we have been forced to send the bulk of each parcel to the nearest casualty clearing station, on account of being continuously on the move. The first parcel arrived at Heppeldorf in the middle of an influenza epidemic, and the books were invaluable to the convalescent patients. "'I don't know when I was so glad to see anything,' said the sister in charge of a casualty clearing station in acknowledging the receipt of a package of books. "'Each day the men were asking for something to read, and not a book in the place. Now that the war is over it is so difficult to get them, and really I think a sick man wants them even more badly than a wounded. I'm thankful indeed that you are still to the fore.' The senior medical officer at the Royal Naval War College, Devonport, wrote to say that he hoped the war library, which had done such valuable work during hostilities, was still carrying on. "'You will remember,' he continued, "'that you were good enough to supply me with several boxes of books when in the hospital ship Queen Alexandra. I am now appointed to this institution, which is a naval auxiliary hospital. We have a hundred and four beds, which are constantly filled, but the men are badly off both for recreation and literature. We are endeavouring to meet the needs as regards recreation, and my colleagues and I would much value it if you are able to send a box of books and magazines similar to the boxes that were so helpful to us in our work in the Queen Alexandra. This ship has been paid off, and I think it may interest you to know that the books remaining at the end of the commission were distributed to vessels engaged in mine-sweeping duties, and to men stationed at lonely lookouts and signal stations on the west coast of Ireland. Although it is no longer necessary to send books weekly to Saloniki, Egypt and Bombay, regular supplies are needed at Constantinople. In February 1919, over 30,000 volumes had already been sent to the North Russian expedition, whose appetite for literature seems insatiable. At the request of the War Library, the American Library Association selected and bought on the War Library's account 2,000 American books which were shipped to Siberia from San Francisco. The Red Cross, realising how great a need still exists, has continued its generous support in carrying on the work. The following extract from a letter written by a medical officer serving with the North Russian Expeditionary Force emphasises the importance of the service to the men in these distant regions. Quote, Six fine bales of books have just arrived from the war library. They have been eagerly welcomed, and I cannot tell you how highly they are appreciated. I have never seen books so eagerly sought for as these have been, and the way some late arrivals picked up a few stray covers of magazines was most pathetic. I am going to save two of the bales for a little advanced hospital I am getting under way, and the rest have been distributed to the sick men who are not near enough death to be sent away to the hospital. I have become such a shameless beggar that I am going to ask for more. I feel mean always saying, give, give, in this way, but the books are really of immense value up here in the long hours of darkness, and mails only arrive about once a month. End quote. It is the desire of all who have seen the success of the war library that the work carried on for soldiers and sailors during the war should be continued and extended to include civilian hospitals, that convalescence is accelerated if the mind of the patient can be kept interested and occupied no longer needs demonstration. We all know from our own experiences in illness, says Dr. Wright, that books are a kind of minor anaesthetic, and pain is not so keen if one can get something to read. End quote. Yet the fact remains that the ordinary hospital is inadequately supplied with reading matter, and the patients are condemned to long, empty hours. It has therefore been proposed that the Red Cross should maintain in London a permanent central library to supply literature to all the hospitals in Great Britain. What remains of the libraries of the demobilised hospitals would serve as the nucleus of the book collection, and the work heretofore carried on by the War Library would be transferred to the new institution. 
the war has revealed how much of our ordinary behaviour is founded on sound instinct said the poet laureate in an address at oxford on behalf of the war library all of us when we are harassed or distressed seek alleviation in mental distraction and our common panacea is a story-book the grave bishop butler tells us that our thoughts are never so idle as when we are reading he did not mean the reading of his sermons he meant i suppose that when we are truly thinking our thoughts are self-generated within us and this with our intense conscious scrutiny of them is a laborious process as is easily seen when we put it on strain for then it appears as the most exhausting of all our energies but when we are merely reading not studying the thoughts are supplied to us from without and the mind is undisturbed lying as it were as much at rest as the body may be on its bed or sofa now this form of mental distraction has been proved efficacious under the most severe trial even in the very shadow of death these light books then are an essential comfort to the soldier and necessary also to the wounded whose condition of constant pain and nervous weakness often calls as much for distraction as the anxiety perpetual peril and strain of the trenches and the books have to be provided in unlimited quantities nor need we distinguish much among them some are no doubt better some worse but their various artistic merits sort themselves out suitably to the various capacities of the readers while their moral significance counts for nothing it is as wholly disregarded as the moral of an exciting fairy tale is by a young child the other class is the more serious literature for which there is an increasing demand this demand is partly due to the later enrolments being from a different class from the earlier there are more students in the hospitals or men to whom the war came as an interruption of intellectual life and such men when their physical condition does not forbid are eager to return to their old interests and make use of their enforced leisure to pursue their studies also the men from overseas are more inquiring and practical than our home folk and are demanding textbooks books of reference handbooks of science and so on any enforced cessation of life's routine such as a long convalescence after severe illness is apt to produce an unusual activity of mind the condition seems to create a fertile soil for new and enduring impressions it is the best seed time that an adult mind can have and the serious books that we may send will be seed corn for prepared fields we should be able to supply them well but since there is no one here who if he were in personal contact with one wounded man a man lying in hospital with a shattered limb and needing a book to comfort him since there is no man who if he were in personal contact with such a man would not give him willingly any book that he might possess what need to say more and how many of my own books are idle possessions books that i have bought because i knew that i ought to read them and should not read unless i possessed them and which yet i have never read if these books are wanted they must go not only is the occasion whether of charity or duty inexpressibly beyond all our imagination for there has never been an occasion to compare with it but it may be reckoned of national significance and importance charles darwin used to read the scientific periodical called nature through from end to end every week including the proceedings of the learned societies and the mathematics which he could not understand because as he said he thought it a useful discipline to keep himself conscious of his limitations and these men need initiation into this knowledge of their ignorance to perceive how vast the field of knowledge is how old and difficult the problems that seem to them so new and simple if they are earnest and willing learners as many of them are they will advance on that path for when once the appetite for wisdom is excited it is not lightly quenched End quote. 
End of the British War Library, Chapter 10 of Books in the War, The Romance of Library War Service by Theodore Wesley Coke. Recording by Ruth Golding. Extract from The Journal of a Disappointed Man by W. N. P. Barbellion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. My pink form, just received, amazes me. To be a soldier, c'est incroyable ma foi. The possibility even is distracting. To send me a notice requesting me to prepare myself for killing men, why, I should feel no more astonished to receive a War Office injunction under dire penalties to perform miracles, to move mountains, to raise from the dead. My reply would be, I cannot. I should sit still and watch the whole universe pass to its destruction, rather than raise a hand to knife a fellow. This may be poor, anemic, but there it is, a positive fact. There are moments when I have awful misgivings. Is this blessed journal worth while? I really don't know, and that's the harassing fact of the matter. If only I were sure of myself, if only I were capable of an impartial view. But I am too fond of myself to be able to see myself objectively. I wish I knew for certain what I am and how much I am worth. There are such possibilities about the situation. It may turn out tremendously, or else explode in a soap bubble. It is the torture of Tantalus to be so uncertain. I should be relieved to know even the worst. I would almost gladly burn my manuscripts, in the pleasure of having my curiosity satisfied. I go from the nadir of disappointment to the zenith of hope and back several times a week, and all the time I am additionally harassed by the perfect consciousness that it is all petty and pusillanimous to desire to be known and appreciated that my ambition is a morbid diathesis of the mind. I am not such a fool either as not to see that there is but little satisfaction in posthumous fame, and I am not such a fool as not to realise that all fame is fleeting, and that the whole world itself is passing away. I smile with sardonic amusement when I reflect how the war has changed my status. Before the war I was an interesting invalid, now I am a lucky dog. Then I was a star turn in tragedy. Now I am drowned and ignored in an overcrowded chorus. No valetudinarian was ever more unpleasantly jostled out of his self-compassion. It is difficult to accustom myself to the new role all at once. I had begun to lose the faculty for sympathising in others' griefs. It is hard to have to realise that in all this slaughter my own superfluous life has become negligible, and scarcely anyone's concern but my own. In this colossal sauve which is developing, who can stay to consider a useless mouth? Am I not a comfortable parasite, and God forgive me an egotist to boot? The war is searching out everyone, concentrating a beam of inquisitive light upon everyone's mind and character and publishing it for all the world to see. And the consequence, to many honest folk, has been a keen personal disappointment. We ignoble persons had thought we were better than we really are. We scarcely anticipated that the war was going to discover for us our emotions so despicably small by comparison, or our hearts so riddled with selfish motives. In the wild race for security during these dangerous times, Men and women have all been sailing so close-hauled to the wind that their eyes have been glued to their own forepeaks, with never a thought for others. Fathers have vied with one another in procuring safe jobs for their sons. Wives have been bitter and recriminating at the security of other wives' husbands. The men themselves plot constantly for staff appointments, and everyone is pulling strings who can. Bereavement has brought bitterness and immunity, indifference. And how pathetically, 
some of us cling still to fragments of the old regime that has already passed, like shipwrecked mariners to floating wreckage, to the manner of the conservatoire amid the thunder of all Europe being broken up, to our newspaper gossip and parish teas, to our cherished aims, wealth, fame, success, in spite of all Ruat Celum, Mr. A. C. Benson and his trickling comfortable essays, Mr. Shaw and his scintillations, they are all there as before, revolving like haggard windmills in a devastated landscape. A little while ago I read in the local newspaper, which I get up from the country, two columns concerning the accidental death of an old woman, while two lines were used to record the death of a townsman at the front from an aerial dart. Behold this poor rag, staggering along under the burden of the war in a passionate endeavour to preserve the old-time interest in an old woman's decease. Yet, more or less, we're all in the same case. I still write my journal and play patience of an evening, and an old lady I know still reads as before the short items of gossip in the papers, neglecting articles and leaders. We are like a nest of frightened ants when someone lifts the stone. That is the world just now. End of Extract from The Journal of a Disappointed Man by W. N. P. Barbellion Read by Patrick Wallace Chapter 18 A War Wedding From Rilla of Ingleside by Lucy Maud Montgomery This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. I can tell you this, Dr. Dear, said Susan, pale with wrath, that Germany is getting to be perfectly ridiculous. They were all in the big Ingleside kitchen. Susan was mixing biscuits for supper, Mrs. Blythe was making shortbread for Jem, and Rilla was compounding candy for Ken and Walter. It had once been Walter and Ken in her thoughts, but somehow, quite unconsciously, this had changed until Ken's name came naturally first. Cousin Sophia was also there, knitting. All the boys were going to be killed in the long run, so Cousin Sophia felt in her bones, but they might better die with warm feet than cold ones. So Cousin Sophia knitted faithfully and gloomily. Into this peaceful scene erupted the doctor, wrathful and excited, over the burning of the Parliament buildings in Ottawa. And Susan became automatically quite as wrathful and excited. "'What will those Huns do next?' she demanded coming over here and burning our parliament building. Did anyone ever hear such outrage? We don't know that the Germans are responsible for this, said the doctor, much as if he felt quite sure they were. Fires do start without their agency sometimes, and Uncle Mark McAllister's barn was burnt last week. You can hardly accuse the Germans of that, Susan. Indeed, doctor dear, I do not know. Susan nodded slowly and portentously, Whiskers on the moon was there that very day. The fire broke out half an hour after he was gone. So much is a fact, but I shall not accuse a Presbyterian elder of burning anybody's barn until I have proof. However, everybody knows, Dr. Dear, that both Uncle Mark's boys have enlisted, and that Uncle Mark himself makes speeches at all the recruiting meetings, so no doubt Germany is anxious to get square with him. I could never speak at a recruiting meeting, said Cousin Sophia solemnly. I could never reconcile it to my conscience to ask another woman's son to go, to murder and be murdered. Could you not, said Susan. Well, Sophia Crawford, I felt as if I could ask anyone to go. When I read last night that there no were no children under eight years of age left alive in Poland. Think of that, Sophia Crawford. Susan shook a flowery finger at Sophia. Not one child under eight years of age. I suppose the Germans has et em all, sighed Cousin Sophia. Well, no, said Susan reluctantly, as if she hated to admit that there was any crime the Huns couldn't be accused of. The Germans have not turned cannibal yet, as far as I know. They have died of starvation and exposure, the poor little creatures. There is murdering for you, Cousin Sophia Crawford. The thought of it poisons every bite and sup I take. I see that Fred Carson of Lowbridge has been awarded a Distinguished Conduct Medal, remarked the doctor over his local paper. 
"'I heard that last week,' said Susan. "'He is a battalion runner, and he did something extra brave and daring. "'His letter, telling his folks about it, came when his old grandmother Carson was on her dying bed. "'She had only a few minutes more to live, and the Episcopal minister, who was there, "'asked her if she would not like him to pray. "'Oh, yes, yes, you, you can pray,' she said impatient-like. "'She was a dean, Dr. dear, and the deans were always high-spirited.' "'You can pray, but for pity's sake pray low and don't disturb me. "'I want to think over this splendid news, and I have not much time left to do it.' "'That was Elmira Carson all over. "'Fred was the apple of her eye. "'She was seventy-five years of age, and not a grey hair in her head, they tell me. "'By the way, that reminds me. "'I found a grey hair this morning, my very first, said Mrs. Blythe. "'I have noticed that grey hair for some time, Mrs. Dr. dear, "'but I did not speak of it. "'Thought I to myself.' she has enough to bear but now that you have discovered it let me remind you that grey hairs are honourable i must be getting old gilbert mrs blythe laughed a trifle ruefully people are beginning to tell me i look so young they never tell you that when you are young but i shall not worry over my silver thread i never liked red hair gilbert did i ever tell you of that time years ago at green gables when i dyed my hair nobody but marilla and i knew about it was that the reason you came out once with your hair shingled to the bone? Yes. I bought a bottle of dye from a German Jew peddler. I fondly expected it would turn my hair black, and it turned green, so it had to be cut off. You had a narrow escape, Mrs. Dr. dear, exclaimed Susan. Of course you were too young then to know what a German was. It was a special mercy of Providence that it was only green dye and not poison. It seems hundreds of years since those Green Gables days, sighed Mrs. Blythe. They belonged to another world altogether. Life has been cut in two by the chasm of war. What is ahead I don't know, but it can't be a bit like the past. I wonder if those of us who have lived half our lives in the old world will ever feel wholly at home in the new. Have you noticed, asked Miss Oliver, glancing up from her book, how everything written before the war seems so far away now, too? One feels as if one was reading something as ancient as the Iliad. This poem of Wordsworth, the senior class have it in their entrance work. I've been glancing over it. It's classic calm and repose, and the beauty of the lines seem to belong to another planet, and to have as little to do with the present world, Walter, as the evening star. The only thing that I find much comfort in reading nowadays is the Bible, remarked Susan, whisking her biscuits into the oven. There are so many passages in it that seem to me exactly descriptive of the Huns. Old Highland Sandy declares that there is no doubt that the Kaiser is the Antichrist spoken of in Revelations, but I do not go as far as that. It would, in my humble opinion, Mrs. Dr. dear, be too great an honor for him. Early one morning, several days later, Miranda Pryor slipped up to Ingleside, ostensibly to get some Red Cross sewing, but in reality to talk over with sympathetic Rilla troubles that were past bearing alone. She brought her dog with her, an overfed, bandy-legged little animal, very dear to her heart, because Joe Milgrave had given it to her when he was a puppy. Mr. Pryor regarded all dogs with disfavor, but in those days he had looked kindly upon Joe as a suitor for Miranda's hand, and so he had allowed her to keep the puppy. Miranda was so grateful that she endeavored to please her father by naming her dog after his political idol, the great liberal chieftain, Sir Wilfrid Laurier though his title was soon abbreviated to Wilfie. Sir Wilfrid grew and flourished and waxed fat, but Miranda spoiled him absurdly, and nobody else liked him. Rilla especially hated him because of his detestable trick of lying flat on his back and entreating you with waving paws to tickle his sleek stomach. When she saw that Miranda's pale eyes bore unmistakable testimony of her having cried all night, Rilla asked her to come up to her room, knowing Miranda had a tale of woe to tell, but she ordered Sir Wilfrid to remain below. "'Oh, can't he come too?' said Miranda wistfully. "'Poor Wilfie won't be any bother, and I wiped his paws so carefully before I brought him in. He's always so lonesome in a strange place without me, and very soon he'll be all I have left to remind me of Joe.' Rilla yielded, and Sir Wilfrid, with his tail curled at a saucy angle over his brindled back, trotted triumphantly up the stairs before them. "'Oh, Rilla,' sobbed Miranda when they had reached sanctuary, "'I'm so unhappy. 
I can't begin to tell you how unhappy I am. Truly, my heart is breaking. Rilla sat down on the lounge beside her. Sir Wilfrid squatted on his haunches before them, with his impertinent pink tongue stuck out, and listened. What is the trouble, Miranda? Joe is coming home tonight on his last leave. I had a letter from him on Saturday. He sends my letters in care of Bob Crawford, you know, because of father and oh, Rilla. He will have only four days. He has to go away Friday morning, and then we never see him again. Does he still want you to marry him? asked Rilla. Oh, yes, he implored me in his letter to run away and be married. But I cannot do that, Rilla, not even for Joe. My only comfort is that I will be able to see him for a little while tomorrow afternoon. Father has to go to Charlottetown on business. At least we will have one good farewell talk. But, oh, afterwards, why, Rilla? I know Father won't even let me go to the station Friday morning to see Joe off. Why in the world don't you and Joe get married tomorrow afternoon at home, demanded Rilla. Miranda swallowed a sob in such amazement that she almost choked. Why, why, that is impossible, Rilla. Why, briefly demanded the organizer of the Junior Red Cross and the transporter of babies in soup tureens. Why, why, we never thought of such a thing. Joe hasn't a license. I have no dress. I couldn't be married in black. I, I, we, you, you. Miranda lost herself altogether, and Sir Wilfrid, seeing that she was in dire distress, threw back his head and emitted a melancholy yelp. Rilla Blythe thought hard and rapidly for a few minutes. Then she said, Miranda, if you will put yourself into my hands, I'll have you married to Joe before four o'clock tomorrow afternoon. Oh, you couldn't. I can and I will, but you'll have to do exactly as I tell you. Oh, I don't think, oh, father will kill me. Nonsense. He'll be very angry, I suppose. But are you more afraid of your father's danger than you are of Joe's never coming back to you? No, said Miranda with sudden firmness. I'm not. Will you do as I tell you, then? Yes, I will. Then get Joe on the long distance at once and tell him to bring out a license and ring tonight. Oh, I couldn't, wailed the aghast Miranda. It, it would be so, so indelicate. Rilla shut her little white teeth together with a snap. Heaven grant me patience, she said under her breath. I'll do it then, she said aloud. And meanwhile, you go home and make what preparations you can. When I phone down to you to come up and help me sew, come at once. As soon as Miranda, pallid, scared, but desperately resolved, had gone, Rilla flew to the telephone and put in a long-distance call for Charlottetown. She got through with such surprising quickness that she was convinced Providence approved of her undertaking, but it was a good hour before she could get in touch with Joe Milgrave at his camp. Meanwhile, she paced impatiently about, and prayed that when she did get Joe there would be no listeners on the line to carry the news to Whiskers on the Moon. Is that you, Joe? Rilla Blythe is speaking. Rilla, Rilla, oh, never mind. Listen to this. Before you come home tonight, get a marriage license. A marriage license. Yes, a marriage license. And a wedding ring. Did you get that? And will you do it? Very well, be sure you do it. It is your only chance. Flushed with triumph, for her only fear was that she might not be able to locate Joe in time, Rilla rang the prior ring. This time she had not such good luck, for she drew whiskers on the moon. Is that Miranda? Oh, Mr. Pryor! Well, Mr. Pryor, will you kindly ask Miranda if she can come up this afternoon and help me with some sewing? It is very important, or I would not trouble her. Oh, thank you. Mr. Pryor had consented somewhat grumpily, but he had consented. He did not want to offend Dr. Blythe, and he knew that if he refused to allow Miranda to do any Red Cross work, public opinion would make the glen too hot for comfort. Rilla went out to the kitchen, shut all the doors with a mysterious expression which alarmed Susan, and then said solemnly, Susan, can you make a wedding cake this afternoon? A wedding cake? Susan stared. Rilla had, without any warning, brought her a war baby once upon a time. Was she now, with equal suddenness, going to produce a husband? Yes, a wedding cake, a scrumptious wedding cake. Susan, a beautiful, plummy, eggy, citron peely wedding cake. And we must make other things, too. I'll help you in the morning. But I can't help you in the afternoon, for I have to make a wedding dress. And time is the essence of the contract, Susan. Susan felt that she was really too old to be subjected to such shocks. Who are you going to marry, Rilla? she asked feebly. Susan, darling, I am not the happy bride. Miranda Pryor is going to marry Joe Milgrave tomorrow afternoon while her father is away in town. 
a war wedding, Susan. Isn't that thrilling and romantic? I never was so excited in my life. The excitement soon spread over Ingleside, infecting even Mrs. Blythe and Susan. I'll go to work on that cake at once, vowed Susan with a glance at the clock. Mrs. Dr. Dear, will you pick over the fruit and beat up the eggs? If you will, I can have that cake ready for the oven by the evening. Tomorrow morning we can make salads and other things. I will work all night if necessary to get the better of whiskers on the moon. Miranda arrived, tearful and breathless. We must fix over my white dress for you to wear, said Rilla. It will fit you very nicely with a little alteration. To work went the two girls, ripping, fitting, basting, sewing for dear life. By dint of unceasing effort, they got the dress done by seven o'clock, and Miranda tried it on in Rilla's room. It's very pretty, but oh, if I could just have a veil, sighed Miranda. I've always dreamed of being married in a lovely white veil. Some good fairy evidently waits on the wishes of war brides. The door opened, and Mrs. Blythe came in, her arms full of a filmy burden. Miranda, dear, she said, I want you to wear my wedding veil tomorrow. It is twenty-four years since I was a bride at Old Green Gables, the happiest bride that ever was. And the wedding veil of a happy bride brings good luck, they say. Oh, how sweet of you, Mrs. Blythe, said Miranda, the ruddy tears starting to her eyes. The veil was tried on and draped. Susan dropped into a prove, but dared not linger. I've got that cake in the oven, she said, and I am pursuing a policy of watchful waiting. The evening news is that the Grand Duke has captured Erzurum. That is a pill for the Turks. I wish I had a chance to tell the Tsar just what a mistake he made when he turned Nicholas down. Susan disappeared downstairs to the kitchen, whence a dreadful thud and a piercing shriek presently sounded. Everybody rushed to the kitchen, the doctor and Miss Oliver, Mrs. Blythe, Rilla, Miranda in her wedding veil. Susan was sitting flatly in the middle of the kitchen floor, with a dazed, bewildered look on her face, while Doc, evidently in his Hyde incarnation, was standing on the dresser with his back up, his eyes blazing and his tail the size of three tails. "'Susan, what has happened?' cried Mrs. Blythe in alarm. "'Did you fall? Are you hurt?' Susan picked herself up. "'No,' she said grimly. "'I am not hurt, though I am jarred all over. "'Do not be alarmed. "'As for what has happened, I tried to kick that darned cat with both feet. "'That is what happened.' "'Everybody shrieked with laughter. "'The doctor was quite helpless. "'Oh, Susan, Susan,' he gasped, "'that I should live to hear you swear.' "'I am sorry,' said Susan, in real distress, "'that I used such an expression before two young girls. "'But I said that beast was darned and darned it is. "'It belongs to the old Nick. "'Do you expect it will vanish some of these days "'with a bang in the odor of brimstone, Susan?' "'It will go to its own place in due time, "'and that you may tie to,' said Susan dourly, "'shaking out her rattled bones and going to her oven. "'I suppose my plunking down like this has shaken my cake "'so that it will be as heavy as lead. "'But the cake was not heavy.' It was all a bride's cake should be, and Susan iced it beautifully. Next day she and Rilla worked all the forenoon, making delicacies for the wedding feast, and as soon as Miranda phoned up that her father was safely off, everything was packed in a big hamper and taken down to the prior house. Joe soon arrived in his uniform and a state of violent excitement, accompanied by his best man, Sergeant Malcolm Crawford. There were quite a few guests for all the Mance and Ingleside folk were there, and a dozen or so of Joe's relatives, including his mother, Mrs. Dead Angus Milgrave, so called, cheerfully, to distinguish her from another lady whose Angus was living. Mrs. Dead Angus wore a rather disapproving expression, not caring over much for this alliance with the house of Whiskers on the Moon. So Miranda Pryor was married to Private Joseph Milgrave on his last leave. It should have been a romantic wedding, but it was not. There were too many factors working against romance, as even Rilla had to admit. In the first place, Miranda, in spite of her dress and veil, was such a flat-faced, commonplace, uninteresting little bride. In the second place, Joe cried bitterly all through the ceremony, and this vexed Miranda unreasonably. Long afterwards, she told Rilla, I just felt like saying to him, then and there, if you feel so bad over having to marry me, you don't have to but it was just because he was thinking all the time of how soon he would have to leave me. In the third place, Jims, who was usually so well behaved in public, took a fit of shyness and contrariness combined, and began to cry at the top of his voice for Willa. Nobody wanted to take him out, because everybody wanted to see the marriage, so Rilla, who was bridesmaid, had to take him and hold him during the ceremony. 
In the fourth place, Sir Wilfrid Laurier took a fit. Sir Wilfrid was entrenched in a corner of the room behind Miranda's piano. During his seizure, he made the weirdest, most unearthly noises. He would begin with a series of choking, spasmodic sounds, continuing into a gruesome gurgle and ending up with a strangled howl. Nobody could hear a word Mr. Meredith was saying, except now and then, when Sir Wilfrid stopped for breath. Nobody looked at the bride except Susan, who never dragged her fascinated eyes from Miranda's face. All the others were gazing at the dog. Miranda had been trembling with nervousness, but as soon as Sir Wilfrid began his performance, she forgot it. All that she could think of was that her dear dog was dying and she could not go to him. She never remembered a word of the ceremony. Rilla, who, in spite of Jim's, had been trying her best to look rapt and romantic, as beseemed a war bridesmaid, gave up the hopeless attempt and devoted her energies to choking down untimely merriment. She dared not look at anybody in the room, especially Mrs. Dead Angus, for fear all her suppressed mirth should suddenly explode in a most unyoung ladylike yell of laughter. But married they were, and then they had a wedding supper in the dining room, which was so lavish and bountiful that you would have thought it was the product of a month's labor. Everybody had brought something. Mrs. Dead Angus had brought a large apple pie, which she placed on a chair in the dining room, and then absently sat down on it. Neither her temper nor her black silk wedding garment was improved thereby, but the pie was never missed at the gay bridal feast. Mrs. Dead Angus eventually took it home with her again. Whiskers on the moon's pacifist pig should not get it anyhow. That evening Mr. and Mrs. Joe, accompanied by the recovered Sir Wilfred, departed for the Four Winds Lighthouse, which was kept by Joe's uncle, and in which they meant to spend their brief honeymoon. Una Meredith and Rilla and Susan washed the dishes, tidied up, left a cold supper, and Miranda's pitiful note on the table for Mr. Pryor, and walked home while the mystic veil of dreamy, haunted winter twilight wrapped itself over the glen. "'I really would not have minded being a war bride myself,' remarked Susan sentimentally. But Rilla felt rather flat, perhaps as a reaction to all the excitement and rush of the past thirty-six hours. She was disappointed somehow. The whole affair had been so ludicrous, and Miranda and Joe so lachrymose and commonplace. If Miranda hadn't given that wretched dog such an enormous dinner, he wouldn't have had that fit, she said crossly. I warned her, but she said she couldn't starve the poor dog. He would soon be all she had left, etc. I could have shaken her. The best man was more excited than Joe was, said Susan. He wished Miranda many happy returns of the day. She did not look very happy, but perhaps you could not expect that under the circumstances. Anyhow, thought Rilla, I can write a perfectly killing account of it to all the boys. How Jem will howl over Sir Wilfrid's part in it. But if Rilla was rather disappointed in the war wedding, she found nothing lacking on Friday morning, when Miranda said good-bye to her bridegroom at the Glen Station. The dawn was as white as a pearl, clear as a diamond. Behind the station the balsamy copse of young firs was frost-misted. The cold moon of dawn hung over the westering snowfields, but the golden fleeces of sunrise shone above the maples up at Ingleside. Joe took his pale little bride in his arms, and she lifted her face to his. Rilla choked suddenly. It did not matter that Miranda was insignificant and commonplace and flat-featured. It did not matter that she was the daughter of Whiskers on the Moon. All that mattered was that rapt, sacrificial look in her eyes, that ever-burning sacred fire of devotion and loyalty and fine courage that she was mutely promising Joe she and thousands of other women would keep alive at home while their men held the western front. Rilla walked away, realizing that she must not spy on such a moment. She went down to the end of the platform, where Sir Wilfrid and Dog Monday were sitting, looking at each other. Sir Wilfrid remarked condescendingly, "'Why do you haunt this old shed when you might lie on the hearthrug at Ingleside and live on the fat of the land? Is it a pose, or a fixed idea?' Where at Dog Monday, laconically, I have a trice to keep. When the train had gone, Rilla rejoined the little trembling Miranda. Well, he's gone, said Miranda, and he may never come back, but I'm his wife, and I'm going to be worthy of him. I'm going home. Don't you think you had better come with me now? asked Rilla doubtfully. Nobody knew yet how Mr. Pryor had taken the matter. No, if Joe can face the Huns, I guess I can face father, said Miranda daringly. 
a soldier's wife can't be a coward come on wilfie i'll go straight home and meet the worst there was nothing very dreadful to face however perhaps mr pryor had reflected that housekeepers were hard to get and that there were many milgrave homes open to miranda also that there was such a thing as a separation allowance at all events though he told her grumpily that she had made a nice fool of herself and would live to regret it he said nothing worse and mrs joe put on her apron and went to work as usual while sir wilfrid laurier who had a poor opinion of lighthouses for winter residences went to sleep in his pet nook behind the wood box a thankful dog that he was done with war weddings End of chapter 18 A War Wedding from Rilla of Ingleside by Lucy Maud Montgomery Read by Sweet Pea Scouting from the Skies From Aeroplanes and Dirigibles of War by Frederick A. Talbot This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Aeroplanes and Dirigibles of War by Frederick A. Talbot Chapter 8 Scouting from the Skies From the moment when human flight was lifted from the rut of experiment to the field of practical application, many theories, interesting and illuminating, concerning the utility of the fourth arm as a military unit were advanced the general consensus of expert opinion was that the flying machine would be useful to glean information concerning the movements of an enemy rather than as a weapon of offence the war is substantiating this argument very completely although bomb dropping is practised somewhat extensively the results achieved are rather moral than material in their effects here and there startling successes have been recorded especially upon the british side but these triumphs are outnumbered by the failures in this direction and merely serve to emphasize the views of the theorists the argument was also advanced that in this particular work the aeroplane would prove more valuable than the dirigible but actual campaigning has proved conclusively that the dirigible and the heavier-than-air machines have their respective fields of utility in the capacity of scouts. In fact, in the very earliest days of the war, the British airships, though small and slow in movement, proved more serviceable for this duty than their dynamic consorts. This result was probably due to the fact that military strategy and tactics were somewhat nonplussed by the appearance of this new factor. At the time it was an entirely unknown quantity. It is true that aircraft had been employed in the Balkan and the Italo-Ottoman campaigns, but upon such a limited scale as to afford no comprehensive idea of their military value and possibilities. The belligerents, therefore, were caught somewhat at a disadvantage, and an appreciable period of time elapsed before the significance of the aerial force could be appreciated, while means of counteracting or nullifying its influences had to be evolved simultaneously, and according to the exigencies of the moment. At all events, the protagonists were somewhat loath to utilize the dirigible upon an elaborate scale or in an aggressive manner. It was employed more after the fashion of a captive balloon, being sent aloft from a point well behind the front lines of the force to which it was attached, and well out of the range of hostile guns. Its maneuvers were somewhat circumscribed, and were carried out at a safe distance from the enemy, dependence being placed upon the advantages of an elevated position for the gathering of information. But as the campaign progressed, the airships became more daring, their ability to soar to a great height offered them complete protection against gunfire, and accordingly sallies over hostile lines were carried out. But even here a certain hesitancy became manifest. This was perfectly excusable, for the simple reason that the dirigible, after all, is a fair-weather craft, and disasters which had overtaken these vessels time after time rendered prudence imperative moreover but little was known of the range and destructiveness of anti-aircraft guns 
in the duty of reconnoitering the dirigible possesses one great advantage over its heavier-than-air rival it can remain virtually stationary in the air the propellers revolving at just sufficient speed to offset the wind and tendencies to drift in other words it has the power of hovering over a position thereby enabling the observers to complete their task carefully and with deliberation on the other hand the means of enabling an aeroplane to hover still remain to be discovered it must travel at a certain speed through the air to maintain its dynamic equilibrium and this speed is often too high to enable the airman to complete his reconnaissance with sufficient accuracy to be of value to the forces below all that the aeroplane can do is to circle above a certain position until the observer is satisfied with the data he has collected but hovering on the part of the dirigible is not without conspicuous drawbacks the work of observation cannot be conducted with any degree of accuracy at an excessive altitude experience has proved that the range of the latest types of anti-aircraft weapons is in excess of anticipations the result is that the airship is useless when hovering beyond the zone of fire the atmospheric haze even in the clearest weather obstructs the observer's vision the caprices of this obstacle are extraordinary as any one who has indulged in ballooning knows fully well on a clear summer's day i have been able to see the ground beneath with perfect distinctness from a height of forty five hundred feet yet when the craft had ascended a further two or three hundred feet the panorama was blurred a film of haze lies between the balloon and the ground beneath and the character of this haze is continually changing so that the aerial observer's task is rendered additionally difficult its effects are particularly noticeable when one attempts to photograph the view unfolded below plate after plate may be exposed and nothing will be revealed yet at a slightly lower altitude the plates may be exposed and perfectly sharp and well-defined images will be obtained seeing that the photographic eye is keener and more searching than the human organ of sight it is obvious that this haze constitutes a very formidable obstacle german military observers who have accompanied the zeppelins and parsevals on numerous aerial journeys under varying conditions of weather have repeatedly drawn attention to this factor and its caprices and have not hesitated to venture the opinion that it would interfere seriously with military aerial reconnaissances and also that it would tend to render such work extremely hazardous at times when these conditions prevail the dirigible must carry out its work upon the broad lines of the aeroplane it must descend to the level where a clear view of the ground may be obtained and in the interests of safety it has to keep on the move to attempt to hover within four thousand feet of the ground is to court certain disaster inasmuch as the vessel offers a magnificent and steady target which the average gunner equipped with the latest sighting devices and the most recent types of guns could scarcely fail to hit but the airman in the aeroplane is able to descend to a comparatively low level in safety the speed and mobility of his machine constitute his protection he can vary his altitude perhaps only thirty or forty feet with ease and rapidity and this erratic movement is more than sufficient to perplex the marksman below although the airman is endangered if a rafale is fired in such a manner as to cover a wide zone although the aeroplane may travel rapidly it is not too fleet for a keen observer who is skilled in his peculiar task he may only gather a rough idea of the disposition of troops their movements the lines of communication and other details which are indispensable to his commander but in the main the intelligence will be fairly accurate undulating flight enables him to determine speedily the altitude at which he is able to obtain the clearest views of the country beneath moreover owing to his speed he is able to complete his task in far less time than his colleague operating in the dirigible the result being that the information placed at the disposal of his superior officers is more to the moment and accordingly of greater value reconnoitering by airplane may be divided into two broad categories which though correlated to a certain degree are distinctive 
because each constitutes a specific phase in military operations. They are known, respectively, as tactical and strategical movements. The first is somewhat limited in its scope as compared with the latter, and has invariably to be carried out rapidly, whereas the strategical reconnaissance may occupy several hours. The tactical reconnaissance concerns the corps or divisional commander to which the warplane is attached, and consequently its task is confined to the observation of the line immediately facing that particular corps or division. The aviator does not necessarily penetrate beyond the lines of the enemy, but as a rule limits his flight to some distance from his outermost defenses. The airman must possess a quick eye, because his especial duty is to note the disposition of the troops immediately facing him, the placing of the artillery, and any local movements of the forces that may be in progress. Consequently, the aviator engaged on this service may be absent from his lines for only a few minutes, comparatively speaking. The intelligence he acquires must be speedily communicated to the force to which he is attached, because it may influence a local movement. The strategical reconnaissance, on the other hand, affects the whole plan of campaign. The aviators told off for this duty are attached to the staff of the commander-in-chief, and the work has to be carried out upon a far more comprehensive and elaborate scale, while the airmen are called upon to penetrate well into the hostile territory, to a point thirty, forty, or more miles beyond the outposts. The procedure is to instruct the flyer either to carry out his observations of the territory generally, or to report at length upon a specified stretch of country. In the latter event he may fly to and fro over the area in question until he has acquired all the data it is possible to collect. His work not only comprises the general disposition of troops, defenses, placing of artillery, points where reserves are being held, high roads, railroads, base camps, and so forth, but he is also instructed to bring back as correct an idea as possible of what the enemy proposes to do, so that his commander-in-chief may adjust his moves accordingly. In order to perform this task with the requisite degree of thoroughness, it is often necessary for the airman to remain in the air for several hours continuously, not returning, in fact, until he has completed the allotted duty. The airman engaged in strategical aerial reconnaissance must possess above all things what is known as a military eye concerning the country he traverses. He must form tolerably correct estimates of the forces beneath and their character. He must possess the ability to read a map rapidly as he moves through the air, and to note upon it all information which is likely to be of service to the general staff the ability to prepare military sketches rapidly and intelligibly is a valuable attribute, and skill in aerial photography is a decidedly useful acquisition. Such men must be of considerable stamina, inasmuch as great demands are made upon their powers of endurance. Being aloft for several hours imposes a severe tax upon the nervous system, while it must also be borne in mind that all sorts and conditions of weather are likely to be encountered, more particularly during the winter. Hail, rain, and blizzards may be experienced in turn, while the extreme cold which often prevails in the higher altitudes during the winter season is a fearful enemy to combat. Often an airman upon his return from such a reconnaissance has been discovered to be so numbed and dazed as a result of the prolonged exposure that considerable time has elapsed before he has been sufficiently restored to set forth the results of his observations in a coherent, intelligible manner for the benefit of the general staff. Under these circumstances it is not surprising that the most skillful and experienced aviators are generally reserved for this particular work. In addition to the natural accidents to which the strategical aerial observer is exposed, the dangers arising from hostile gunfire must not be overlooked. He is maneuvering the whole time over the enemy's firing zone, where anti-aircraft weapons are disposed strategically, and where every effort is made by artillery to bring him down, or compel him to repair to such a height as to render observation with any degree of accuracy well-nigh impossible. 
the methods practiced by the german aerial scout vary widely and are governed in no small measure by the intrepidity and skill of the airman himself one practice is to proceed alone upon long flights over the enemy's lines penetrating just as far into hostile territory as the pilot considers advisable and keeping of course within the limits of the radius of action of the machine as represented by the fuel supply the while carefully taking mental stock of all that he observes below it is a kind of roving commission without any definite aim in view beyond the collection of general intelligence this work while productive and valuable to a certain degree is attended with grave danger as the german airmen have repeatedly found to their cost success is influenced very materially by the accuracy of the airmen's judgment a slight miscalculation of the velocity and direction of the wind or failure to detect any variations in climatic conditions is sufficient to prove his undoing german airmen who essayed journeys of discovery in this manner often failed to regain their lines because they ventured too far misjudged the speed of the wind which was following them on the outward run and ultimately were forced to earth owing to the exhaustion of the fuel supply during the homeward trip the increased task imposed upon the motor which had to battle hard to make headway caused the fuel consumption per mile to exceed calculation then the venturesome airman cannot neglect another factor which is adverse to his success hostile airmen lie in wait and a fleet of aeroplanes is kept ready for instant service they permit the invader to penetrate well into their territory and then ascend behind him to cut off his retreat true the invader has the advantage of being on the wing while the ether is wide and deep without any defined channels of communication but nine times out of ten the adventurous scout is trapped his chances of escape are slender because his antagonists dispose themselves strategically in the air the invader outpaces one but in so doing comes within range of another he is so harassed that he either has to give fight or finding his retreat hopelessly cut off he makes a determined dash trusting to his high speed to carry him to safety in these driving tactics the french and british airmen have proved themselves adepts more particularly the latter as the chase appeals to their sporting instincts there is nothing so exhilarating as a quarry who displays a determination to run the gauntlet the roving teuton scout was considerably in evidence in the early days of the war but two or three weeks experience emphasized the sad fact that in aerial strategy he was hopelessly outmatched by his opponents his advantage of speed was nullified by the superior tactical and strategical acumen of his antagonists the result being that the german airman who has merely been trained along certain lines who is in many cases nothing more than a cogwheel in a machine and who is proverbially slow-witted has concluded that he is no match for the airmen of the allies he found from bitter experience that nothing afforded the anglo-french military aviators such keen delight as to lie in wait for a rover and then to swoop into the air to round him up the proportion of these individual scouts who were either brought down or only just succeeded in reaching safety within their own lines and who were able to exhibit serious wounds as evidence of the severity of the aerial tussle or the narrowness of the escape has unnerved the teuton airmen as a body to a very considerable extent often even when an aeroplane descended within the german lines it was found that the roving airman had paid the penalty for his rashness with his life so that his journey had proved in vain because all the intelligence he had gained had died with him or if committed to paper was so unintelligible as to prove useless it was the success of the british airmen in this particular field of duty which was responsible for the momentous declaration in field marshal sir john french's famous despatch the british flying corps has succeeded in establishing an individual ascendancy which is as serviceable to us as it is damaging to the enemy the enemy have been less enterprising in their flights something in the direction of the mastery of the air has already been gained 
the methods of the british airmen are in vivid contrast to the practice of the venturesome teuton aerial rovers described above while individual flights are undertaken they are not of unknown duration or mileage the man is given a definite duty to perform and he ascends merely to fulfil it returning with the information at the earliest possible moment it is aerial scouting with a method the intelligence is required and obtained for a specific purpose to govern a contemplated move in the grim game of war even then the flight is often undertaken by two or more airmen for the purpose of checking and counterchecking the information gained or to ensure such data being brought back to headquarters since it is quite possible that one of the party may fall a victim to hostile fire by operating upon these lines there is very little likelihood of the mission proving a complete failure even when raids upon certain places such as dusseldorf friedrichshaven or cuxhaven are planned complete dependence is not placed on one individual the machine is accompanied so that the possibility of the appointed task being consummated is transformed almost into a certainty the french flying men work upon broadly similar lines their fleet is divided into small squadrons each numbering four six or more machines according to the nature of the contemplated task each airman is given an area of territory which is to be reconnoitred thoroughly in this way perhaps one hundred or more miles of the enemy's front are searched for information at one and the same time the units of the squadron start out each taking the appointed direction according to the preconceived plan and each steering by the aid of compass and map they are urged to complete the work with all speed and to return to a secret rendezvous later the air is alive with the whirring of motors the machines are coming back and all converging to one point they volplane to earth and gracefully settle down within a short distance of each other at the rendezvous the pilots collect and each relates the intelligence he has gained the data are collated and in this manner the general staff is able to learn exactly what is transpiring over a long stretch of the hostile lines and a considerable distance to the rear of his advance works possibly five hundred square miles have been reconnoitred in this manner troops have been massed here lines of communication extend somewhere else while convoys are moving at a third place but all has been observed and the commanding officer is in a position to rearrange his forces accordingly it is a remarkable example of method in military tactics and strategy and conveys a striking idea of the degree to which aerial operations have been organized after due deliberation it is decided that the convoys shall be raided or that mass troops shall be thrown into confusion if not dispersed the squadron is ordered to prepare for another aerial journey the roads along which the convoys are moving are indicated upon the map or the position of the mass troops in bivouac is similarly shown the airmen load their machines with a full charge of bombs when all is ready the leader ascends followed in rapid succession by the other units and they whir through the air in single file it now becomes a grim game of follow my leader the leader detects the convoy swoops down suddenly launches his missiles and reascends he does not deviate a foot from his path to observe the effects of his discharge as the succeeding aeroplane is close behind him if the leader has missed then the next airman may correct his error one after another the machines repeat the maneuver in precisely the same manner as the units of a battleship squadron emulate the leading vessel when attacking the foe the tactical evolutions have been laid down and there is rigid adherence thereto because only thereby may success be achieved when the last warplane has completed its work the leader swings round and repeats the dash upon the foe a hail of bullets may scream around the men in the air but one and all follow faithfully in their leader's trail one or more machines may fail in the attack and may even meet with disaster but nothing interferes with the movements of the squadron as a whole it is the homogeneity of the attacking fleet which tells and which undermines the morale of the enemy even if it does not wreak decisive material devastation the work accomplished to the best of their ability the airmen speed back to their lines in the same formation 
At first sight, reconnoitering from aloft may appear a simple operation, but a little reflection will reveal the difficulties and arduousness of the work. The observer, whether he be specially deputed or whether the work be placed in the hand of the pilot himself, in this event the operation is rendered additionally trying, as he has also to attend to his machine, must keep his eyes glued to the ground beneath, and at the same time be able to read the configuration of the panorama revealed to him. He must also keep in touch with his map and compass, so as to be positive of his position and direction. He must be a first-class judge of distances and heights. When flying rapidly at a height of 4,000 feet or more, the country below appears as a perfect plain or flat stretch, although as a matter of fact it may be extremely undulating. Consequently, it is by no means a simple matter to distinguish eminences and depressions, or to determine the respective and relative heights of hills. If a rough sketch is required, the observer must be rapid in thought, quick in determination, and facile with his pencil, as the machine, no matter how it may be slowed down, is moving at a relatively high speed. He must consult his map and compass frequently, since an airman who loses his bearings is useless to his commander-in-chief. He must have an eagle eye, so as to be able to search the country unfolded below, in order to gather all the information which is likely to be of value to his superior officers. He must be able to judge accurately the numbers of troops arrayed beneath him, the lines of the defensive works, to distinguish the defended from the dummy lines which are thrown up to baffle him, and to detect instantly the movement of the troops and the direction, as well as the roads along which they are proceeding. Reserves and their complement, artillery, Railway lines, roads and bridges, if any, over streams and railways, must be noted. In short, he must obtain an eye photograph of the country he observes, and grasp exactly what is happening there. In winter, with the thermometer well down, wreaths of clouds drifting below and obscuring vision for minutes at a time, the rain possibly pelting down as if presaging a second deluge, the plight of the vigilant human eye aloft is far from enviable. Upon the return of the machine to its base, the report must be prepared without delay. The picture recorded by the eye has to be set down clearly and intelligibly with the utmost speed. The requisite indications must be made accurately upon the map. Nothing of importance must be omitted. The most trivial detail is often of vital importance. A facile pencil is of inestimable value in such operations, while aloft the observer does not trust to his memory or his eye-picture, but commits the essential factors to paper in the form of a code, or what may perhaps be described more accurately as a shorthand pictorial interpretation of the things he has witnessed. To the man in the street such a record would be unintelligible, but it is pregnant with meaning, and when worked out for the guidance of the superior officers is a mass of invaluable detail. At times it so happens that the airman has not been able to complete his duty within the time anticipated by those below, but he has gathered certain information which he wishes to communicate without coming to earth. Such data may be dropped from the clouds in the form of maps or messages. Although wireless telegraphy is available for this purpose, it suffers from certain drawbacks. If the enemy possesses an equipment which is within range of that of the aircraft and the force to which it belongs, communications may be nullified by the enemy throwing out a continuous stream of useless signals which jam the intelligence of their opponents. If a message written in code or a map is to be dropped from aloft, it is enclosed within a special metallic cylinder fitted with a vane tail to ensure direction of flight when launched, and with a detonating head. This is dropped overboard. When it strikes the ground, the detonator fires a charge which emits a report without damaging the message container, and at the same time fires a combustible charge emitting considerable smoke. The noise attracts anyone in the vicinity of the spot where the message has fallen, while at the same time the clouds of smoke guide one to the point and enable the cylinder to be recovered. This device is extensively used by the German aviators, and has proved highly serviceable. A similar contrivance is adopted by French airmen. 
there is one phase of aerial activity which remains to be demonstrated this is the utilization of aerial craft by the defenders of a besieged position such as a ring of fortifications or a fortified city the utility of the fourth arm in this province has been the subject of considerable speculation expert opinion maintains that the advantage in this particular connection would rest with the besiegers the latter would be able to ascertain the character of the defences and the defending gun force by means of their aerial scout who would prove of inestimable value in directing the fire of the besieging forces on the other hand it is maintained that an aerial fleet would be useless to the beleaguered in the first place the latter would experience grave difficulties in ascertaining the positions of the attacking and fortress reducing artillery inasmuch as this could be masked effectively and it is thought that the aerial force of the besieged would be speedily reduced to impotence since it would be subjected to an effective concentrated fire from the ring of besieging anti-aircraft guns and other weapons in other words the theory prevails that an aerial fleet no matter how efficient would be rendered ineffective for the simple reason that it would be the initial object of the besiegers attack possibly the stem test of experience will reveal the fallacy of these contentions as emphatically as it has disproved others but there is one point upon which authorities are unanimous if the artillery of the investing forces is exposed and readily distinguishable the aerial forces of the beleaguered will bring about its speedy annihilation as the defensive artillery will be concentrated upon that of the besiegers End of scouting from the skies from aeroplanes and dirigibles of war by frederick a talbot read by maria casper Het vluchtoord de bergen op zoom. Dit is een LibriVox opname. Alle LibriVox opnamen zijn vrij van natuursrechten. Voor meer informatie of om je aan te melden als vrijwilliger, ga naar LibriVox.org. Het vluchtoord de bergen op zoom. Uit Op de hoogte, geïllustreerd maandschrift, april 1915. We hadden al zoveel gehoord van het grote kamp de bergen op zoom waar enige duizenden uit hun land gevluchte Belgen een toevluchtsoord hadden gevonden, dat we met genoegen de uitnodiging van de heer C. W. de Jong, gemeenteopzichter te Bloemendaal, om onder zijn leiding dit vluchtoord eens te bezichtigen, aanvaarden. We konden ons trouwens ook moeilijk een betere leidsman denken, omdat deze heer in der tijd, toen de Belgen ons land binnenvielen, als tijdelijk reserve eerste luitenant daar ter plaatse in garnizoen lag, en al de eerste misère van die overstelpende toevloed van vluchtelingen heeft meegemaakt. En al dus kwamen wij op een goede morgen in februari in het historische stadje aan. De nogal lange rit was ons niet slecht bekomen, zodat we fris en in goede conditie in het vluchtoord arriveerden. Reeds van verre springt het met zijn warreling van houten en linnen tenten en vele woonwagens in het oog. Opgeslagen op plein 13, zoals het stuk grond genoemd wordt, neemt het vluchtoord niet minder dan 8400 vierkante meter in beslag. Het hierop vertimmerde hout aan loodsen en binnenwerk kan, terloops gezegd, veilig geschat worden op ruim 70.000 gulden. De ontvangst in de commandotent was zeer hartelijk en met een krachtige handdruk werden de vriendschappelijke verhoudingen van de heren officieren opnieuw bezegeld. Het was merkbaar dat luitenant de Jong, die we in dit artikel deze titel maar zullen geven, al heeft hij zijn opzichterschap in Bloemendaal sinds enige weken weder aanvaard, een graag geziene persoonlijkheid was. Diezelfde indruk ontvingen we later in het kamp onder de dames en heren comitéleden, en niet minder van de Belgen zelf. Telkens weer klonk het opgewekt en met het verheugen van het wederzien, Hé, hey, daar is de luitenant. Hoe gaat het, luitenant? Is u ons nog niet vergeten? Enzovoort, enzovoort. De heer J. Kwadekker, eerste luitenant der veldartillerie, had wel willen toestemming verleend het vluchtoord desnoods tot in alle hoekjes en gaatjes te bezichtigen. Toen de verwelkomingen dan ook waren afgelopen en enige foto's waren genomen, trokken wij het grote dorp van de vluchtelingen binnen, nieuwsgierig door oud en jong aangestaard. We gaan het eerst naar de melktent, zei de luitenant, 
en met de dames kennis maken. Al daar troffen we aan mevrouw Hartog Haas, mevrouw van der Rovaart Grauwenkamp, mejuffrouw Ovink en mejuffrouw Wittemans, welke dames het zeer verdienstelijke werk van de leiding van deze veelomvattende tent op zich hadden genomen en met niet genoeg te prijzen nauwgezetheid blijven vervullen. Ook hier de vreugde van het weerzien. En terwijl de gebruikelijke vragen en antwoorden elkaar kruisten, kwam een heer binnen wiens naam in dit artikel niet zou mogen ontbreken, omdat in hem een organiserend gehalte van deze tijdelijke bevolking erkend moet worden, en aan wiens werkkracht honderden Belgen uit dit vluchtoord dank schuldig zijn. Het was de heer A. van der Rovaart, agent in het district Bergen op Zoom van de Rijksverzekeringsbank, bovendien in de wetenschappelijke wereld als technicus wel bekend, die zich onder meer verdienstelijk heeft gemaakt met de uitvinding van een zoeklicht, werkende met waterstof en vuurstof, ruim 1 miljoen kaarsen sterk, waarmee in november van het vorige jaar zulke goed geslaagde proeven te halfweg waren genomen, dat onze regering zijn systeem de voorkeur gaf boven het Duitse en derhalve de uitvinding aanvaarde. De heer van der Rovaart dus kwam binnen en we maakten kennis. In de melktent heerste een hele bedrijvigheid, want alles was in volle werking. Grote pannen met melk stonden op het vuur, er werd pap gekookt en kinderpap toebereid, en de lucht was gevuld met de zoete geuren van dit appetijtelijk gedoe. Twee glundere deerns, bloeiend als weleer haar schoon Vlaanderenland, waren druk lachend en klappend helpende. Mevrouw Hartog vertelde. In eenvoudige, onopgesmukte bewoordingen gaf ze enige gegevens over de inrichting van dit zeer belangrijk onderdeel van het vluchtoord. Wij noemen de belangrijkste hiervan. Dagelijks worden aan de zuigelingen 300 liter zoete melk uitgedeeld, 18 liter karnemelk, 12 liter molenaars kindermeelpap, 24 busjes gecondenseerde melk, 60 beschuiten en 150 tot 200 liter pap. Voor hen van wie de magen niet tegen het gebruik van bruin brood bestand zijn, worden per dag 80 witte broden van 1 kilogram beschikbaar gesteld. Zij die gekarnde melk moeten drinken, krijgen die van de melkinrichting de hoop uit Breda. Alles geschiet natuurlijk op kosten van het Rijk. De dames die dag in dag uit nu al sinds vele maanden zich van deze vrijwillig op de schouder genomen taak kwijten, doen zulks met de grootste nauwgezetheid. En zo de Belgen later in de gelegenheid mogen komen aan hun gevoelens van dankbaarheid zichtbare vormen te geven, laten zij zich dan deze vrouwen gedenken, die zo krachtdadig hebben meegewerkt aan de lichamelijke versterking van een komend geslacht. Op de dag van ons bezoek werden er aan ongeveer 450 moeders, zieken en kinderen, melk, pap, beschuiten enzovoort uitgereikt. Zoveel mogelijk wordt gezorgd dat de zuigelingen aan de borst blijven. De moeders krijgen daartoe volop van alles wat zij nodig hebben, zodat de gezondheidstoestand onder de kinderen niets te wensen laat. De kinderverzorging mag dan ook buitengewoon goed genoemd worden, waaronder behoren de uitmuntende gelegenheid tot baden, het verstrekken van ondergoed en alles wat verder gedaan moet worden om de kleinen flink uit de kluiten te doen wassen. Voorts staan de kinderen natuurlijk onder geregeld geneeskundig toezicht. De tent, eenvoudig toch praktisch, is inwendig ingericht onder toezicht van de heer van de Rovaart. Het ruwe werk in de tent geschiet door twee mannen en drie vrouwen die uit de vluchtelingen gerecruiteerd zijn. In het geheel zijn reeds over de duizend kinderen geholpen. Wel toevallig was het hoe wij juist getuigen moesten zijn dat het duizende papklantje zich kwam aanmelden, welk feit door het nemen van bovenstaand kiekje werd herdacht. Nu de melktent bezichtigd was, brachten we een bezoek aan de dokterstent. Het was juist spreekuur en derhalve troffen wij het. Achtereenvolgens stelde luitenant de Jong aan ons voor, dokter A. Keus, arts, J. Wijnbrands en J. de Hullu, semi-artsen, L. de Wolf, kandidaatarts, belast met de hygiëne van het kamp, zuster Bijnen, die in ons land, mogen we wel zeggen, beroemd is geworden door haar heldhaftig gedrag in de Transvaalse Balkanoorlogen, en tenslotte zuster van Moorsel. Dokter Keus deelde mede dat betrekkelijk weinig zieken op het rapport voorkomen, behalve de zieken die in de tenten en loodsen worden bezocht. De roodvonkpatiënten gaan, te zaakjes gezegd, naar het gasthuis in de stad. Deze ziekte was echter van een goedaardig karakter. Het behoeft nu geen betoog meer dat de geneeskundige dienst uitstekend is ingericht. Deze laat dan ook niets te wensen. Alleen, en dit is wel eigenaardig, werkten de vluchtelingen zelf zo weinig mee. Over het algemeen bestaat onder hen een onbegrijpelijke tegenzin in het gasthuis 
en meermalen is het gebeurd dat de kinderen die ziekteverschijnselen vertonen verstopt werden zelfs onder matrassen uit vrees voor het gasthuis menig geval zou al dus vertelde dokter keus een gunstiger verloop hebben gehad wanneer wij er eerder bij waren geroepen hebben ze het dan in het gasthuis niet goed was onze vraag o zo best als men het maar wensen kan maar of men er lang over praat of kort de mensen hebben er nu eenmaal een erge hekel aan thans begonnen wij aan de grote wandeling door de loodsen langs de tenten door het woonwagenpark en kwamen ook in de grote wasloods en in de keuken hier is alles model ingericht twee rijen van grote dampende ketels waar dagelijks eten bereid wordt voor ruim 2000 mensen omdat de anderen voor zichzelf per gezin koken zijn hier opgesteld in de wasloods is altijd ruim voldoende warm en koud water aanwezig ook voor het nemen van baden en kunnen de vrouwen in tobben en op lange tafels haar hart aan wassen en plassen ophalen zoveel ze willen toch is de keuken alweer te klein gebleken zodat besloten is twee keukens bij te bouwen behalve in de lange goed verwarmde houten loodsen leeft nog steeds een gedeelte van de bevolking in de zestien mans militaire tenten hoewel de mensen naar de loodsen konden verhuizen gaven velen toch niet tegenstaande de koude de voorkeur aan het verblijf in een tent omdat ze zich daarin vrijer en huiselijker voelen en ondanks alle ongemakken aan het verblijf in die betrekkelijk enge ruimte verbonden waarin gekookt gegeten en geslapen wordt blijft de gezondheidstoestand van de bewoners toch bevredigend velen hebben om de tenten miniatuur tuintjes aangelegd met schelpenranden omzet wat een niet onaardig gezicht oplevert in de loodsen leven de families zoveel mogelijk bij elkaar in met schotten afgeschermde vertrekken waarin een kacheltje staat en enig huisraad niet ontbreekt aan de wanden zijn in elke kamer zes opklapbedden aangebracht die overdag omhoog staan en s avonds worden neergelaten het beddengoed verkeert in bruikbare staat elke groep maakt het zich thuis dus maar zo comfortabel mogelijk en aan tevreden gezichten ontbrak het dan ook niet de mannen die willen werken en hun ambacht kunnen uitoefenen worden hiertoe zoveel mogelijk in staat gesteld zo zagen we onder andere twee beeldhouwers die versieringen maakten voor een salon ameublement de spiegelkuif en andere kopstukken waren kunstig gesneden rustig werkten de mannen in hun primitieve werkplaatsen voort de vrouwen houden zich bezig met het verstellen van kleren en de was doen ze schillen hun aardappels zelf en trachten zich in het algemeen verdienstelijk te maken de kinderen die hiervoor in aanmerking komen gaan in de stad naar school echter was men druk bezig aan het bouwen van een enorm grote loods waarin de school gevestigd zal worden en waar ook de godsdienstoefeningen zullen plaats hebben verder komt er een naaischool met zeven geestelijke zusters als medezuster bijnen voor de gewone school zullen vier onderwijzers worden aangesteld het naar de kerk gaan geschiet in de stad tegen de onzedelijkheid wordt uiterst streng gewaakt op de meisjes wordt zorgvuldig het oog gehouden door speciaal daartoe aangestelde gehuwde lieden die zich nauwgezet van hun taak kwijten de kinderen van wie de ouders elders verblijven en waarvan de woonplaats voorlopig niet opgespoord kan worden of die voor het ogenblik onbereikbaar zijn leven tezamen in een zogenaamd weeshuis waarover een vriendelijke vader en moeder het beheer voeren het vluchtoord heeft eigen elektrisch licht voor bestrijding van brandgevaar zijn doeltreffende maatregelen genomen ook is een praktische riolering aangelegd en een goed werkende vuilnisophaaldienst ingesteld verder zijn de magazijnen voor brandstoffen kleding beddengoed enzovoort systematisch ingericht en onder afzonderlijke controle gesteld voor hen die willen wordt voor zover het mogelijk is dagelijks toegestaan zich van s morgens negen tot s avonds negen uur buiten het vluchtoord te begeven elke loods heeft een burgemeester gekozen uit de vluchtelingen die belast met het toezicht op zijn afdeling voor de goede gang van zaken aansprakelijk is zoals reeds gezegd is alles behoorlijk geregeld op een beschildigd dienstbord is aangegeven op welke uren commandant en dokters te spreken zijn de uren van eten of koffiedrinken kookshalen en baden en het appel waarop alle burgemeesters zich moeten melden bij de commandant om bijzonderheden op te geven omtrent de aan hun zorg toevertrouwden gedurende de laatste 24 uren naast de bekendmaking van de drie tijdstippen waarop moeders en zieken wittebrood melk en pap kunnen halen op vertoon van hun bon aan de melktent dit alles vinden de belanghebbenden op duidelijke wijze vermeld zo is aan de lichamelijke en geestelijke verzorging gedaan wat slechts in het bereik lag 
waardoor dit vluchtoord als een goede inrichting mag geworden geroemd en als zodanig door de regering ook is erkend. Of alle bewoners er volkomen tevreden zijn? We denken het niet. Maar wie is het gegeven bij een bevolking van een kleine 3000 zielen, waaronder zoveel heterogene elementen als daar aanwezig zijn, het allen naar de zin te maken? Een afzonderlijk gedeelte van het vluchtoord is het woonwagenkamp, grenzende aan een van de buitenste loodsen. Daar staan in regelmatige rijen ongeveer een honderdtal van de bekende wagens, waarin voor het merendeel kermisklanten verblijf houden. Ze zijn alle uit België gekomen en bestaan uit goochelaars, vuurvreters, slangenbezweerders, ketelappers, enzovoort, enzovoort. Een militaire bewaking houdt de rust erin, hoewel erkend moet worden dat deze mensen werkelijk veel minder lastig zijn dan men allicht zou denken. De mannen roken, praten en vervelen zich. De vrouwen verrichten huishoudelijk werk en de kinderen spelen. Opmerkelijk was het dat de paarden ontbraken. Waar zijn die? vroeg ik. Ik weet het niet, antwoordde luitenant de Jong. Waarschijnlijk verkocht. Het geheel staat onder militair toezicht. Het commando berust in handen van de heer I. Kwadekker, bovengenoemd, en de heer A. de Klerk, reserve eerste luitenant der infanterie. Een halve sectie infanteristen is voor de dienst beschikbaar en meer dan voldoende. De commandant heeft voor het vluchtoord een burgerlijke stand ingericht volgens een kaartsysteem waaraan hij, naar hij ons meedeelde, reusachtig veel werk heeft gehad. Nu, dit is begrijpelijk. Het lastige vraagstuk op welke wijze de mannelijke bevolking het best aan de ontzenuwende invloeden van het gedwongen niets doen kan worden onttrokken, is nog in geen enkel vluchtoord opgelost. Zowel de Nunspeet, Ede, Uden en Bergen-op-Zoom tobben de directies ermee. Ook kolonel Mingels, die te Ede, waar het grootste vluchtoord is, zo goed de geestelijke en materiële belangen van de vluchtelingen heeft verzorgd en die in de gelukkige omstandigheid verkeerde bij de inrichting van zijn kleine maatschappij zich aan anderen te kunnen spiegelen, wist er geen raad mee. En nu beschikt het vluchtoord te Ede nogal over een prachtige recreatiezaal, waar een biljart, een piano, een orkestrion en zelfs een klein toneel voor de mannen uitstekende middelen vormen om de verveling te verdrijven. In Bergen op Zoom ontbreekt zo'n recreatiezaal vooralsnog. Wellicht geeft dit goede voorbeeld uit Ede aanleiding tot navolging. Thans worden de mannen al daar zoveel mogelijk aan het werk gezet. In de keukens, in de magazijnen, aan de dagelijks terugkerende reinigingsbezigheden. Overal waar iets te doen valt, vinden de burgemeesters gelegenheid hun gemeentenaren arbeid te laten verrichten. Als er wat te verplaatsen of te versjouwen valt, geschiet dit door meer personen dan nodig is. Alles wordt dus met zorg in het werk gesteld om de handen bezig te houden, maar waar in een beperkte ruimte zoveel lange, lieve dag te samen zijn, geeft dit zijn eigenaardige moeilijkheden. Er blijft dan ook nog te veel ledige tijd over. Verder moet de lectuur, muziek en voordracht verstrooiing verschaffen. Vooral aan het eerste is behoefte, ook omdat niet alle lectuur voor deze mensen geschikt is. Met de vrouwen heeft men uiteraard minder hoofdbrekens, zij kunnen aan veel en verschillend werk worden gezet. De behandeling van de was, het verstellen van kleren en het bijhouden van de linnenvoorraden, het schoonmaken van groenten, aardappelen schillen, aan dat alles is en blijft veel te doen. Bovendien vinden de gehuwde vrouwen afleiding met de kinderen, de beste troost voor moeders. En hiermee kunnen we eindigen. We hebben onze ervaringen vluchtig meegedeeld en hoeven thans niet meer te herhalen dat onze indrukken gunstiger waren. Ongetwijfeld past hier aan de heren kapitein Jenting van het O.I. Leger, de reserve eerste luitenant Steinweg en luitenant de Jong, ten slotte een woord van waardering voor de correcte, energieke wijze waarop zij in het begin orde in de geweldige chaos hebben weten te brengen, toen geheel bergen op zoom met vluchtelingen overstroomd was en de grote markt als keuken was ingericht. Toen alles in wilde, onbeteugelde vlucht ordeloos door elkaar heen krioelde en het uitschot van Antwerpen de baas wilde spelen op een manier die alleen door een streng militair optreden te bedwingen viel. Dat dit door toonaangevende inwoners van Bergen op Zoom op prijs is gesteld, hebben genoemde officieren in woord en daad ondervonden. Einde van het vluchtoord te Bergen op Zoom Gelezen door Anna Simon The Air Raids by Arthur J. Crowhurst from Folkestone During the War. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The most vivid phase of the war so far as Folkestone was affected was the air raids phase. It surpassed all other experiences of those crowded hours of 1914-19 in its effect and influence upon the life and activities of the local community. It was not until May 25, 1917, that a raid on the town actually occurred, but that ordeal was horrific, never to be effaced from the memory. For ten minutes or so death literally rained from the sky a sky of azure blue, causing the streets in some parts of the town to run with blood, and carrying bleak desolation into scores of homes. No warning of the imminence of the deadly peril was received by the town authorities, although it is said that something of the approaching danger was known of and spoken about by some workers on the harbour, and the visitation was wholly unexpected. Folkestone had somehow allowed itself to be lulled into a soothing sense of security. It regarded the war almost with complacency so far as actual danger went. Perhaps it was too complacent. It was familiar with the happenings and the panoply of war in various aspects. There had been alarums and excursions. Even before England had thrown down the gauge to Germany, we had watched our mighty battleships swiftly surging their way through the waters of the Channel en route to their stations in the North Sea. Some of us had seen or heard the troops silently marching in the dead of night from Shorncliffe to the railway station. We had seen a great deal of the aftermath of war. Quite early the Belgian refugees had landed in their thousands, and we soon became accustomed to the sight of wounded soldiers likewise to the distant thunder of the guns in Flanders and Picardy. Thousands of troops embarked and disembarked at the harbour, and many of the best houses in the town had been taken over by the military for use as rest camps, enclosed with hideous corrugated iron fencing, with entrances diligently guarded by sentries who challenged all and sundry if there were a doubt as to their having any business there. There were these and many other things to remind us that we were at war, at war with an implacable, unscrupulous and barbaric foe. The husbands and sons of many citizens had fallen in the fighting, but wives and parents carried on with little outward sign of their grief. There had been enemy aircraft raids east and west of Folkestone, with loss of life on each side, not so many miles away. We were conscious of the fact that we were well within the war zone, and there was no sound reason to think that the Hun would spare us. On the contrary, the main line of communications with the vast battle plains on the Western Front ran plumb through the heart of Folkestone, and the town and district were an armed camp of vital military, if not strategic, importance. In the minds of a few people there was one fact which they felt might cause the enemy to exclude the town from his sinister attentions from air and sea, and that was that in the cemetery there reposed the remains of a number of German sailors, men who lost their lives on the occasion of the foundering of the Grosser Kurfürst on May the 31st, 1878, and some of whose comrades were gallantly rescued by Folkestone fishermen. Greatly daring, the Mayor of Hythe, Mr. William R. Kobe, had written to a prominent London newspaper pointing out this fact, and suggesting that, in consequence, the district might hope to remain immune from bombardment. How anybody acquainted with the mentality of the Hun could found any hope upon such a reason it is difficult to understand. At any rate, whatever may have been the cause, Folkestone went scatheless for nearly three years. Prior to May the 25th, 1917, all our suffering had been vicarious, and we went about our lawful business with scarcely a tremor. The Great War might rage elsewhere. Vast areas of Europe might be a welter of blood. German submarines might lurk beneath the waters of the earth and blow sailors, soldiers and others to kingdom come. Nations might go up in flames and millions be put to death. But there was little or nothing to disturb the even round of our daily life in Folkestone, 
such as we had known it since those seemingly far-off pre-war days the gigantic conflict was being waged with all the resources of art and science but others were in it not we in the war zone as we were we yet viewed the war with a more or less strong sense of detachment the majority perhaps vainly imagining that this happy state of things would continue until the end of the chapter such was the local atmosphere of serenity and security which was blasted into oblivion by the high explosive bombs hurled upon the town of folkestone on the evening of may the twenty fifth nineteen seventeen truly it was a terrific awakening horrifying for a brief interval almost stupefying if the town staggered and reeled under the blow a blow so utterly unexpected perhaps it may be forgiven for the raid was up to that time the biggest and most deadly raid of the war in the introduction to this section an attempt has been made to give an idea of the local circumstances and attitude at the date of the great raid but events under this heading of local cognizance if not of actual local incidents should be dealt with in chronological sequence before that dire disaster is described in detail dover was the locale of the first aircraft raid on this country a solitary german aeroplane appearing over that town on december the twenty fourth nineteen fourteen and dropping a few bombs but without inflicting any loss of life and damaging property to a small extent only dover is separated from folkestone by only six miles which is a mere nothing in this distance annihilating era of the aeroplane but folkestone took no more than a casual interest in the episode it may be worth mentioning that january the nineteenth to twentieth nineteen fifteen was the date of the first zeppelin raid on england on that occasion four civilians were killed and fifteen civilians and one soldier were injured in norfolk on may the third nineteen fifteen in the morning some excitement was caused in folkestone by the report that a german aeroplane had crossed to dover and was on its way to our town there was a sound of gunfire away to the eastward in which direction many people leaving their occupation and going into the streets strained their eyes whilst not a little commotion was created by a military lorry on which an anti-aircraft gun was mounted careering through the town by a devious route to the dover road to take a part in the prospective affray some distant object apparently an aeroplane was seen away up over the downs and it was reported later that pieces of a shell from an anti-aircraft gun had fallen in a field a little distance from the valiant sailor it was not however a german aeroplane which was fired at but one of our own what had happened was this there was in existence an order that every british aeroplane crossing from france to england should previously send intimation of its coming in default of which it would be fired at on this day an airman had omitted to do this and consequently his machine was mistaken for a hostile craft on august the ninth nineteen fifteen many inhabitants were aroused just before midnight by the reverberations of terrific explosions and these who looked out eastwards saw vivid flashes a zeppelin was making a raid on dover the din must have been deafening at the actual locale of the raid but it was again a case of much cry and little wool the casualties being limited to three sailors injured this was the only instance of a zeppelin dropping bombs on dover although on two other occasions enemy airships were in the neighbourhood of the town one being so seriously damaged by gunfire that it descended in the channel and was destroyed by allied airmen from dunkirk dover was however bombed by aeroplanes on quite a number of occasions on october the thirteenth nineteen fifteen at a comparatively early hour of the night a zeppelin discharged bombs on the canadian camp at otterpool near lim and at stanford in the neighbourhood of westernhanger station which is only about eight miles from folkestone where the sound of the explosions was heard by many people flashes being seen from the lees no civilians were killed or injured 
although some houses were missed by a very narrow margin and there was some damage to property but our friends from the land of the maple leaf did not come off so well a score or more were killed or injured the official return published since the signing of the armistice gives the number of killed under the heading of sailors and soldiers as seventeen and the number of injured as twenty-one these figures may have included casualties in other areas which were bombed that night but undoubtedly the majority related to canadians stationed at otterpool associated with this raid at otterpool camp was a remarkable instance of the futility of the censorship on that occasion the british press at this period was hedged about with all sorts of restrictions in regard to air raids in the case of nocturnal visitations the precise localities bombed were not to be stated such mention had been made in the case of some of the earlier raids but definite instructions had been sent to the newspapers that the names of towns and places were not to be included in such limited reports as were permissible consequently in the reports in the english press there was no indication that the canadian camp at otterpool had been bombed but the whole story was told in the evening news published at new glasgow nova scotia on october the sixteenth nineteen fifteen only three days after the raid on the front and principal news page there appeared the following article headed in big type canadians were killed in zeppelin raids eleven artillerymen fall victims to hun canadian press dispatch ottawa ontario october sixteenth the zeppelin raids on england have now come home to canada from the latest casualty list and from information obtained from local militia sources it would appear that there were eleven canadian artillerymen who lost their lives in the last raid that of the thirteenth the total military casualties reported in the official statement by the british authorities were fourteen killed and thirteen wounded so it would appear the canadians were the chief sufferers besides the eleven men who lost their lives three are reported as missing and three wounded all these cases took place at Otterpool Camp, Kent, England. The casualties took place among the 5th Brigade of the Canadian 2nd Division Artillery. As far as is known, these are the first Canadians to meet death as a result of a Zeppelin raid. Last night's casualties of this type are all Western men, except one, whose next of kin is given as residing in St. Catharines, one who is a member of the 29th Battery. As the foregoing was published only three days after the raid occurred, the information could not have been sent in a letter under cover, but must have gone through by cable. Even if it were nobody's business to censor the cablegram, it might have been thought that it would be somebody's business to prevent the details being blazoned forth in a Nova Scotian newspaper. Obviously it would be absurd to allow such a report to be printed in a Canadian paper if it were deemed desirable to forbid English papers to insert it. Nearly a year passed without anything happening in the air in the immediate vicinity of Folkestone. Dover and other parts of Kent were raided, and at times there was a little mild excitement in our own town caused by the sound of gunfire at a distance or distant flashes seen at night. Shortly after two on the morning of August the 25th, 1916, a zeppelin passed over, or very nearly over, the town. Actually, the course which it took lay over the inner harbour, and it was travelling at a height of 12,000 feet. It was picked up by the searchlight on the hills between Folkestone and Dover at 2.15 a.m., according to an entry in the records of the local fire brigade and was subjected to a brisk cannonading by the anti-aircraft guns, the din arousing many from their slumbers. Those who looked out from their windows saw a cigar-shaped object travelling eastwards. Soon it altered its course a point or two to the south. Its crew were probably endeavouring to baffle the gunners on the hills, and eventually disappeared from view. It dropped no bombs in this district, but later in the day an official report sent out from berlin contained the following quote, during the night of august twenty fourth twenty fifth several naval dirigibles attacked the southern portion of the east coast of england 
they dropped numerous bombs on the city and the southeastern district of london and the batteries at the naval stations at harwich and folkestone and numerous vessels moored in dover harbour everywhere very good results were observed End quote. just before midnight on the second of september nineteen sixteen a zeppelin was heard over the sea apparently steering west it was subsequently reported that it turned northwards after passing Dimchurch, crossing the coastline between that place and Lyd. Up to this date, the arrangements in the immediate locality for defence against aerial attacks were not organised on any elaborate scale. Apart from the small weapons on lorries, the only anti-aircraft guns were those stationed on the hills between Folkestone and Dover. Whether the military mind was at one with the civilian mind in imagining that the district would continue to enjoy immunity from attack, or whether the weakness of the defences was due to the fact that the War Department had not enough guns to be able to spare more for this neighbourhood, is a matter which must be left to conjecture. Some more guns, however, were placed in position at the top of the hill, a quarter of a mile or so from the valiant sailor, towards the end of the summer of 1916 about or after the time when the zeppelin passed over folkestone harbour on the night of march sixteenth to seventeenth nineteen seventeen one or more zeppelins were cruising about in the vicinity four explosive bombs being dropped at swingfield four incendiary bombs at hoffham two explosive and seven incendiary bombs at newchurch three explosive and seven incendiary bombs at appledore farm and one explosive bomb at Ivy Church. The results were restricted to the killing of four sheep at Ivy Church, slight damage to a few ceilings and a few broken windows. So, without anything more momentous occurring, we passed on to the fateful 25th of May, 1917. Picture to the mind an exquisite evening in late spring the sun still comparatively high in the heavens and radiating a genial warmth upon the earth a quiet calm evening when all nature appeared to be at rest a few minutes after six folkestone in the full glory of its springtime garb resembled a veritable paradise of peace an aeroplane cruised about over the town rather low down but we had become so familiar with the spectacle of flying machines that one hardly even associated it with the war, and certainly nobody would regard it as an ominous sign. Complete tranquillity was the predominant note of the closing day, and there was nothing to warn us of the tragedy that was about to burst upon us. Yet only a few minutes' journey away, nearly a score of german aeroplanes of the most recent design and construction were racing towards folkestone at top speed laden with bombs ready to be hurled amongst the hapless populace the first indication of the approach of the huns was the sound of distant explosions two three possibly four minutes before the full blast of the attack but accustomed as we were then to the sound of gun practice at first we were disinclined to pay any heed to the sounds probably it was only in the quieter parts of the borough that the distant detonations were heard at all in point of fact as we were soon to learn they were the reports of bombs dropped a few miles to the west of the town the sounds gradually came nearer and in a few minutes there was a perfect furore of explosions. We were in the midst of the first great daylight raid. At first some of the inhabitants laboured under the impression that the town was being bombarded from the sea, but the unmistakable whir of powerful aeroplanes heard between the explosions as the machines were passing directly overhead informed them that the attack came from the air. It was a racking, nerve-testing experience. In the principal zones of devastation, the horror of it all was enhanced by the cries and moans of the wounded, the noise of falling masonry, and the crash of broken glass as windows were rent into a million atoms. Sixty or more were killed instantaneously, before they had time to realise what was happening. Others, less fortunate in a way, were injured beyond recovery 
and many others maimed for life. A ghastly horrible business of death and mutilation, truly. The sights which met the gaze of those who hastened to the grim task of removing the bodies and remains and succouring the wounded baffled description. Human trunks were cleft in two or more pieces, heads were blown from bodies, and there were fragments of bodies and limbs in whose case identification was more a matter of surmise than anything else. Yet in spite of this heart-rending holocaust, the military value of the raid was practically nil. One bomb hit the railway, this fell between the up-and-down lines at the central station, but it did not explode, and the damage was quickly repaired. Obviously the object of the German aviators was to wreck the railway and the harbour, but in this they signally failed, although it must be admitted that their aim was far from being discreditable, bearing in mind the great height at which they flew. Many civilians were killed and a greater number injured, but from a military point of view the achievement was of insignificant, if any, value. The enemy aircraft had approached the town from the west in well-observed formation, the leader of the fleet being somewhat in advance by himself. Not a few people who happened to be out of doors gazed at the oncoming gorters with keen undisturbed interest, mentally remarking, what a fine spectacle, and failing to realise that they were enemy raiders until bombs dropped in the heart of the town startled them into an accurate appreciation of the deadly character of the aerial visitation. As the aeroplanes neared Folkestone, they broke from their formation and spread out fanwise, some deviating so that their course lay over the golf links, their objective being probably the military encampment at the foot of Castle Hill, Caesar's camp, others taking a line over the railway, and some diverging seawards, evidently in the hope that their bombs would strike the harbour and perhaps sink some of the transports there. But the German crews, being at the great height of 14,000 feet or so, failed, with the slight exception already recorded, to hit their targets. The total number of bombs dropped in the borough, including those which fell into the sea not far from the beach, was 51. Of these, 31 exploded or partially exploded, 14 which fell on land did not explode at all, and 6 dropped into the sea, some a short distance from the Victoria Pier. Others were dropped at Shorncliffe and Hythe, and yet others near the railway further up the line. A fast train from London was on its way to Folkestone at the time, but the driver, sagaciously apprehending the danger of the situation, slowed down with the object of letting the aeroplanes get well in front. With regard to the bombs which were discharged in Folkestone and the immediate district, a military expert in explosives who visited the town stated that only a few fully exploded, including that which fell in Tontine Street and one which fell at Shorncliffe Camp, but some of the others exploded sufficiently to cause enough damage to life and property. One hardly likes to imagine what the total extent of the disaster would have been had all the bombs completely exploded. From an examination of some of the missiles which did not explode at all, it was obvious that the failure was due to bad workmanship. An interesting instance can be given. The construction of a bomb includes a contrivance which may be termed a safety device, which enables it to be handled without danger. At the tail end are fans which cause the bomb to revolve as it passes through the air such revolutions setting up a centrifugal force which opens, or should open, the safety device, whereby the percussion cap is brought into effective action. But in the case of at least one bomb, this safety device did not open, because an obstruction was caused by the head of a screw which had not been turned right home, and thus projected slightly above the surface. Time was when we heard a great deal of the splendid quality of German workmanship, but after seeing such an instance of scamping, one is inclined to think that a great deal of the laudation was unmerited. 
no doubt negligence in like or other details was the cause of other bombs not exploding or only partly exploding with reference to the topographical incidence of the bombs it is perhaps remarkable that it was not where the greater number fell that the greatest loss of life occurred the area which received most attention was what may be called the central station area within a radius of three hundred yards or four hundred yards nearly twenty bombs were dropped almost half of the total number which fell on land but it was in tontine street where the toll of human life was greatest only one bomb fell there but sixty-one men women and children lost their lives and many others were more or less seriously injured the other principal death zone was the lower part of bouverie road east dealing in detail first with the central station area only one human life was lost in immediate proximity thereto this victim was mr edward horne butler to sir thomas de witt of radnor cliff who was in the approach road on the downside when two cab horses affrighted by explosions started to run away down the declivity mr horne gallantly endeavoured to stop one when a bomb fell close to him killing him and both horses as already stated one bomb fell on the railway track but did not explode three fell in gardens at the rear of numbers fourteen sixteen and nineteen king's north gardens close to the railway embankment but each one of these was a dud one of them penetrated the ground to a depth of sixteen feet travelled in a lateral direction another sixteen feet and rose towards the surface a distance of ten feet before coming to a standstill a bomb which exploded fell in a garden at the back of a house in cheriton road at a point opposite the south end of julian road and three others came to earth close by but failed to explode on the other side of the railway three missiles fell in open ground some distance east of martin road one of these exploded causing two deaths a bomb fell at the top end of joynton road just outside the entrance gates of kimberley the residence of dr w j tyson the explosion killing a pedestrian a woman one which fell in the lawn tennis ground of the pleasure gardens and another which found impact in earls avenue did not explode a bomb which came down in the grounds in front of grimston gardens exploded but that can hardly be regarded as being in the central station area there was no loss of life in this instance but windows were shattered on a wholesale scale as indeed was the case in all neighbourhoods where bombs fell as coming within the station area may be mentioned those dropped one near the top end of radnor park west another in the park itself close to the road others in wilty gardens numbers two and four radnor park crescent north end west side bournemouth gardens east side wrecking the front of mr f e crosswell's house number two boscombe road number eighteen and st john's church road number three all these exploded or partially exploded as also did one which fell on a piece of vacant land behind a hoarding at the corner of radnor park road and blackball road the casualties including one fatality three others narrowly missed the railway embankment south side between the viaduct and the junction station one partly demolished number twenty eight st john street but inflicted no loss of life and two fell in the meadow at the back of grove road one killing a horse belonging to mr f w pepper some missile burst over or near the good shed at the junction station causing much damage to glass and ceilings in the locality but there was some doubt as to whether this was not a shell from an anti-aircraft gun in the dover district in the bouvery road east area in addition to a bomb which hit the pavement in front of number twenty one killing the occupier mr j burke and other people one fell in the grounds of the county school for girls another in a garden of number one south side millfield and another in the garden of number nineteen north side bouvery square all there exploding a bomb also came down in bouvery road east opposite christchurch schools but happily this did not explode 
similar failure attended one which fell on a furniture store at the rear of premises in the lower part of rendezvous street east side one bomb wrecked number twenty one manor road killing a cook who was in the basement not many yards away a bomb fell in the back garden of number twenty two the residence of dr percy lewis on the other side of manor road at any rate in more than one official record this missile is described as a bomb but another account is that it was an anti-aircraft shell which burst on the roof of a back wing and crashed into the room beneath smashing all the windows and lamps and severely damaging a piano and carved chest a chair which had only just been vacated by mrs percy lewis was completely destroyed but a large billiard table in the middle of the room was untouched eventually the shell was found in a room below the windows and furniture of which room were also badly smashed a bomb in the same district fell through the roof of the osborne hotel at the corner of christchurch road and bouverie road west penetrating to the lower part of the building where it exploded wrecking the greater part of the interior but causing no loss of life most of the occupants had previously run outside straggling bombs fell one just inside the municipal boundary in the grounds of enbrook at the corner of military road and high street sandgate one in the grounds of a school on the west side of coolidge lane one in turkettle road on the west cliff estate two on the golf links one in a field near the links but on the west side of hill road another in open ground southeast of the sanatorium on the east cliff and yet another near the western end of the warren as already stated tontine street was the scene of the greatest loss of life the result of a single bomb falling on the pavement in front of the spacious green grocery stores of messrs stokes brothers numbers fifty one a fifty one b fifty one c in an instant a spectacle of life and bustle was changed into an appalling scene of carnage and destruction in this part of the town the early part of friday evening is a favourite time for shopping to many inhabitants it is a convenient opportunity for replenishing the household larder for the ensuing week as likewise it is to some people in the adjoining country districts consequently when the gorters passed over the borough this thoroughfare especially at this point was thronged with people mainly women and children amongst whom was hurled from the skies this death-laden missile the bomb exploded with tremendous force killing nearly sixty people instantaneously injuring others so grievously that they died the same night or the next day and wounding more or less seriously nearly a hundred more in a moment the street was filled with dead and dying some torn limb from limb intermingled with human bodies being the lifeless and mangled carcasses of horses which added to the horror and ghastliness of the scene near the centre of this zone of slaughter was police constable whittaker who wonderful to relate was left standing unhurt with the dead and maimed strewn all around him at the inquest in describing the spectacle which he saw on visiting tontine street immediately after the raid mr harry reeve the chief constable said it was an appalling sight which he would never forget to his dying day the premises of messrs stokes brothers were completely wrecked the materials of which the structure was composed fittings and stock being reduced to a state of chaos difficult to imagine mr w h stokes one of the partners was killed dying just as the rescuing party reached him most of the staff of women and girls meeting with a similar fate william edmund stokes the fourteen-year-old son of mr w h stokes was amongst those fatally injured the shop front of mr j a wait confectioner of number fifty one was destroyed mr wait himself sustaining a rather severe wound in the head which was struck by some flying fragment and the brewery tap number fifty three kept by mr albert taylor was also extensively damaged number fifty three was not badly damaged but the proprietor councillor john jones was injured in the leg 
great havoc was also wrought on the opposite side of the road, the drapery emporium of Messrs. Gosnold Brothers at numbers 56, 58 and 60 Tontine Street bearing the brunt. The front of the premises was destroyed, and some people sheltering there were killed. None of the employees was killed, but Mr. George Gosnold was injured. Mr. William Henry Hall, pork butcher of number 68, was badly injured and died on the following Sunday. His premises suffered severely, as also did those of Mr. W. J. Franks, decorator and plumber, number 62, the Premium Trading Stamp Company, number 64, Mr. H. R. Springett, newsagent, number 66, and Mr. John P. Marsh, draper, numbers 70 and 72. Various other shops suffered in a lesser degree, the area of the damage in Tontine Street extending approximately from number 35, Mr. Henry Warren's fruit shop, to the Congregational Church. An eighteen-inch gas main under the pavement in front of Messrs. Stokes's establishment was broken, and the gas ignited by the flame from the explosion. Some of the woodwork of the wrecked premises caught a light, but the fire brigade, which was quickly in attendance, soon put out the fire. Mr. H. O. Jones, the chief officer of the brigade, left the jet from the main burning for a time, there being a more urgent call for the services of himself and his men in succouring wounded and removing the dead. Subsequently the gas flame was put out by smothering it with a load of sand. This was the only outbreak of fire during the raid. The lower part of Bouverie Road East, where it runs past Alexandra Gardens, was also a scene of havoc, although the toll of life was small compared with that in Tontine Street. A bomb fell on the pavement in front of No. 21 Bouverie Road East, a shop tenanted by Mr. John Burke, a boot and shoe repairer. The shop and the adjoining premises, No. 19, used as a cafe, were wiped out. Mr. Burke was in his little establishment at the time. The force of the explosion literally picked him up and flung him across the road against the railings of the county school for girls, killing him instantly. The adjacent building at the corner of Alexandra Gardens, one of several stories let out in flats, was almost completely wrecked. Some of the pavement was blown into the basement, and floors and dividing walls collapsed into a mass of ruin in which furniture, masonry and woodwork were jumbled pell-mell together in chaotic and indescribable fashion. It was not recorded that any fatality occurred in this building, but Kathleen Chapman, a girl employed as housemaid at Bates Hotel, Sangate Road, who was walking along Alexandra Gardens to fetch a pair of shoes belonging to a friend from Mr. Burke's shop, was struck by some substance when about fifty yards from Bouvery Road East, and mortally wounded. Two soldiers who were with her, George Henry Bloodworth and another, were also killed. Another bomb fell in the road a little further down, in front of the premises, number 11, of Messrs. Durban Brothers Butchers. Mr. Wilfred Durban and several others were in the shop, but although the front of the premises was shattered, those inside escaped with injuries or shock. Mr. Durbin himself was thrown behind his safe. The County School for Girls, Christchurch Schools, the building at the corner, east side, of Alexandra Gardens, then used as a Belgian school, and other premises in the neighbourhood, including some in Alexandra Gardens and Cheriton Road, also sustained damage. At the time of the raid, the only people indoors at West Lodge, No. 21 Manor Road, the residence of Mrs. Callaghan, were Jane Marchmont, a cook, and another servant. The latter ran out of the house just before it was struck by the bomb and in greater part collapsed. As already stated, the cook, who was in the basement, was killed. Her body was not recovered until nearly twenty-four hours later. Men of the fire brigade and others worked for three hours on Friday night in the search, at the end of which time it was felt that no living soul could be amongst the wreckage. On the following day the search was resumed and continued until five, when the body was found beneath the ruins of the staircase and other parts of the house. Her feet had been cut clean off. 
Apparently she had been endeavouring to make her exit from the house when she was overwhelmed by an avalanche of debris. To continue the narrative of the incidents of the bombs so far as they were accompanied by fatal effects, mention should be made of the deaths of Mrs. Maggie Gray Bartleet, the wife of Sergeant Major J. J. Bartleet, R.A.M.C., who was killed in Joynton Road, of Mr. Albert Edward Castle, a naval pensioner and gardener, who was hit whilst in the grounds of the Grange School, Shorncliffe Road, of Doris Eileen Spencer Walton, a pupil at the Mount Julian Road, who was playing tennis on a lawn at Athelstan Ladies' School, Shorncliffe Road, when she was struck by a fragment which was hurled through the air by the explosion of a bomb which fell some distance away, and of Mr. George Edward Butcher, a coal carter, who succumbed on June the 6th to injuries received while standing near the Castle Inn, Ford Road. Reference has already been made to the fatality at the central station. It is impossible to chronicle all the remarkable incidents and narrow escapes during the raid, but mention must be made of the extraordinary occurrence at number 28 St. John Street, the residence of Mr. Stephen Chittenden, a member of the Folkestone Fire Brigade. At the time he was on duty at the head station in Dover Road, which is close to St. John Street. When the bombs commenced to fall on the town, Mr. H. O. Jones, the chief officer of the brigade, was in Sandgate Road. He at once proceeded to the nearest available telephone, rang up the head fire station, and asked if there were any calls to fires. Fireman Stephen Chittenden replied that there was only one, from Tontine Street. Just then there was another explosion, and the fireman exclaimed, "'My God, I believe that is at my house!' And it was. The bomb exploded on the roof of 28 St. John Street, the top floor being blown away. In a room on the floor immediately underneath were two women and a child, an elderly woman, bedridden, her daughter-in-law and a granddaughter. Their escape from death was almost miraculous. One part of the ceiling and floor above them fell into their room, but it swung down slantwise as it might have done had the other side been fixed on hinges. Consequently, the other part remained suspended above them. The old lady had a leg broken, and the child sustained an injury to the hip. The occupants were rescued from the wrecked premises by the fire brigade. Very remarkable, too, was the case of the Osborne Hotel in Bouvery Road West. The bomb fell through all the floors to the basement, where it exploded. The roof of the building was broken in, all the floors suffered, and the basement rooms became an entanglement of debris and broken furniture, yet nobody was seriously injured. The dials of the clocks of Tontine Street Congregational Church and Radnor Park Congregational Church were both broken, and the works themselves put out of action. Christchurch was also damaged. The manner in which the shock from explosions found its way over housetops and other obstructions, passed round corners and shattered windows and caused other damage, was not a little extraordinary. Tons of broken glass lay on the pavement in various parts of the town after the gorters had passed over the borough. The effects of high explosives, fantastic as well as fatal, were a revelation. Connected with the raid were two things which perhaps should be recorded. One was the suggestion emanating from some imaginative mind that the aeroplane circling about the town rather low down just before the Hun machines arrived was in reality a spy machine acting as a guide to the enemy. Once this brilliant idea was mooted, it spread with amazing rapidity, not a few giving credence to it. As a matter of fact, it was a training bus of the Royal Flying Corps. Another impression was that the Hun aircraft included a Zeppelin. Many people emphatically asserted that they saw a Zeppelin, and remained unconvinced that they were wrong, even after the announcement in the official report that the raiding craft were aeroplanes. The erroneous notion was due probably to the expansive wing spread of the machines, and the effect of the sun shining on them. 
it is impossible to place on record here all the examples of courage and self-control, but brief mention may be made of one. At Kent College in Grimston Avenue, a girl guide service was being conducted by the Reverend J. Edward Harlow when a terrific explosion took place, followed by others. The service, however, was completed as arranged. Subsequently, Mr. Harlow wrote to the Times a letter in which he stated that as long as life lasted, he would remember with admiration and pride the perfect self-control and cheerfulness of those eighty daughters of England, some of whose homes were far away. Their behaviour was superb. This communication drew from General Sir Robert Baden-Powell an appreciative letter addressed to Mr. Harlow, and another of congratulation to the Folkestone Girl Guides. Before the tense period of the raid was at an end, the members of the various organisations charged with the duty of dealing with such an emergency were hurrying to the various scenes of carnage and destruction. In addition to the local ambulance corps and the fire brigade, the Red Cross contingents, the Canadian Army Medical Corps, the regular police and the special constables were swiftly in attendance to take part in the work of removing the dead and conveying the injured to hospitals. It was a grim and melancholy task, but it was efficiently and expeditiously carried out. The lifeless bodies and remains were conveyed to the cemetery mortuary and the Royal Victoria Hospital mortuary. The injured were taken to the Royal Victoria Hospital and to the West Cliff Hospital until the accommodation became overtaxed, and then recourse was had to the hospitals at Shorncliffe. Medical and nursing staffs worked devotedly throughout the night in dressing the wounds of the injured and tending to their various needs. But perhaps the saddest and most distressing scenes were those witnessed at the mortuaries in the process of identification of the bodies by bereaved relatives. In some cases there were only detached and mangled remains to identify. Many relatives had only become aware of their losses by the non-return of some of their household. No attempt can be made to describe the mingled feelings of fear and hope with which they viewed the array of corpses. In one or two instances, the raid had reduced a family of three or four to a single survivor. In the work of laying out the bodies and remnants, the coroner's officer, Mr. E. J. Chadwick, worked assiduously and untiringly and tactfully rendered much assistance to the bereaved ones. The total number of people killed in Folkestone, including three whose deaths occurred in the course of the next week or two, was seventy-one, sixteen men, twenty-eight women, and twenty-seven children. No fewer than sixty-one of these resulted from the explosion of the bomb which fell in Tontine Street. A list of those injured, compiled at the time by the authorities, contained ninety-six names, thirty-four men, fifty women, six boys and six girls, but there were others who did not report their cases to the authorities. If there be added to the number killed in Folkestone the three fatalities at Cheriton and two at Hythe, the total for the district is seventy-six, this being exclusive of the soldiers killed at Shorncliffe. Nineteen bombs were dropped at Lim, where there is an aerodrome, nineteen at Hythe, two at Sandgate, sixteen at Cheriton, and eighteen on St. Martin's Plain and Dibgate, Shorncliffe. On St. Martin's Plain, four soldiers were pitching a tent, a bomb made a direct hit, and the remains of the men had subsequently to be gathered up in bags. Two huts were demolished, the inmates being killed. One bomb fell near the Shorncliffe Military Hospital, but failed to explode. A lady stenographer in the open was killed. The casualties amongst the soldiers at Shorncliffe were eighteen killed, sixteen of these being Canadians, and ninety wounded, eighty-six being Canadians. As previously remarked, it was the worst air raid on this country up to this stage of the war, so far as the number killed was concerned. None of the Zeppelin raids had caused so many deaths. 
in the official return published after the signing of the armistice it was set forth that in the raid on may the twenty fifth nineteen seventeen on kent and folkestone seventy seven civilians were killed and ninety four injured whilst eighteen soldiers were killed and ninety eight injured these latter figures nearly all relating to casualties at shorncliffe during the whole war there was only one other raid in which the casualty list was heavier than in that which plunged folkestone into mourning on may the twenty fifth nineteen seventeen the other raid referred to was that of june the thirteenth nineteen seventeen when german aeroplanes dropped bombs on margate essex and london the casualties numbering civilians killed one hundred and fifty eight injured four hundred and twenty five sailors and soldiers killed forty two injured seven several other towns on the coast of kent suffered from aerial invasion on numerous occasions but in the case of none of them were the casualties so many even all told as at folkestone on may the twenty fifth nineteen seventeen to take the experience of dover that town was bombarded from the air on eighteen occasions yet the total loss of life was only thirteen men seven women and two children the numbers injured being thirty-five men twenty-two women and nine children the number of bombs which fell on dover was one hundred and eighty-five mr daniel stringer lith verger at hythe parish church was one of the victims the circumstances were recounted in the folkestone coroner's court mr lith having died in hospital in folkestone the vicar the rev h d dale and his wife had been engaged with the verger in the vestry hearing explosions they went out into the churchyard where a bomb fell breaking tombstones and scattering shrapnel and debris in all directions mr lith was hit on the leg by shrapnel sustaining a mortal wound mrs dale was slightly injured in the face the vicar himself had a remarkable escape. He was struck on the side, and on putting his hand in his coat pocket, he found there a piece of shrapnel which had lodged against a tin box that he was carrying. The following communique was issued by the Field Marshal Commanding in Chief Home Forces at 12.45 p.m. on Saturday, May the 26th. A large squadron of enemy aircraft, about sixteen in number, attacked the southeast of England between 5.15 and 6.30 p.m. last night. Bombs were dropped at a number of places, but nearly all the damage occurred in one town, where some of the bombs fell into the streets, causing considerable casualties among the civil population. Some shops and houses were also seriously damaged. The total casualties reported by the police from all districts are killed, 76, injured, 174. Of the killed, 27 were women and 23 children, while 43 women and 19 children were injured. Aeroplanes of the Royal Flying Corps went up in pursuit, and the raiding aircraft were engaged by fighting squadrons of the RNAS from Dunkirk on their return journey. The Admiralty reports that three of the enemy aeroplanes were shot down by the latter. The following announcement by the Secretary of the Admiralty was issued at 1.10 p.m. on Saturday, May the 26th. Naval aeroplanes carried out an attack on the aerodrome at Saint-Denis-Westrem, near Bruges, yesterday morning. Many bombs were dropped. In the evening, several enemy aircraft returning from a raid on England were engaged over sea by RNAS machines. An encounter took place between one British and three hostile aeroplanes in mid-channel, and one of the latter was destroyed. Several encounters also took place off the Belgian coast, in which two large twin-engined hostile machines were shot down. All our machines returned safely. The report of German main headquarters, issued in Berlin on Saturday, May the 26th, contained the following. During the course of a successful raid, one of our air squadrons dropped bombs on Dover and Folkestone on the south coast of England. Long-distance flights in land also gave good results. It will be seen from the foregoing official reports 
that it was the germans who first mentioned the name of folkestone for three days the authorities in london refused to allow the english papers to specify the exact town the censorship being relaxed in time for the dailies published on tuesday morning to announce that it was at folkestone where the loss of life had been so great End of part one of the air raids by a j crowhurst from folkestone during the war Part two of the air raids from Folkestone during the war. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. So far, this narrative has dealt only with the attack. The reason is the all sufficient one that there was nothing else to record until the actual raid was almost at an end. The explosions of the bombs had almost, if not entirely, ceased before the anti-aircraft guns upon the hills on the east side of the town came into action. Possibly until then the enemy planes could not be seen by or were out of range of the batteries. In any case, no hits were registered by the Archies, and the aerial invaders passed from our shores scatheless although they were subsequently engaged over the sea by english fighting machines which went up from dunkirk and the neighbourhood to intercept them and which brought down three of their number but how was it that the huns had not been attacked by british aviators when they were travelling towards folkestone it was an amazing thing the enemy did not approach folkestone from the sea but from inland it subsequently transpired that the hun machines had passed over north kent into mid kent they were heard but not seen at maidstone until apparently they reached the main railway line from london to folkestone which latter town they passed over without let or hindrance the inhabitants who watched their flight over folkestone looked in vain for english aeroplanes hastening to the attack why was it had some one blundered naturally enough questions were raised at the inquests following the raid there was the same note of interrogation at the special meeting of the town council held on the following day and later the matter was the subject of queries in parliament certain explanations and statements followed and possibly there were official inquiries behind closed doors but the matter was never wholly cleared up or if it were the authorities did not see fit to take the public into their confidence a high official was reported by a london newspaper to have stated that quote, it was known that the fleet of aeroplanes was about they were reported at various places but as it happened they came over that town folkestone at a great height above a screen of clouds the moment they reached the edge of the clouds they had folkestone directly under them that accounts for the populace being so tragically taken unawares it is certain that hereafter an entirely new and thorough system of notification will be introduced end quote. which is tantamount to saying that there was something lacking or unsatisfactory about the system in existence up to that time the inquests were opened by the borough coroner mr g w haynes on the evening following the raid before the jurors viewed the bodies the coroner said it was a task that would try the nerves of the strongest of them but it was a painful duty that was cast upon them after the visit to the mortuaries the inquest was adjourned till the following tuesday mr arden blake was foreman of the jury the first inquest was upon the body of mrs florence louise norris wife of alfred norris of thirty blackball road who also lost his daughter, aged two years, and his baby son, ten months, only the father of the family circle of four remaining. The verdict was death by bombs from hostile aircraft, Great Britain being in a state of war, and deceased at the time being a non-combatant. The jury adding a rider to the effect that they regretted that the competent authorities did not give notice of the approach of the aircraft, 
and that they were strongly of opinion that in future the town should be warned by a siren or other such device the chief constable mr h reeve had stated during the hearing that as a rule he received a warning from the military authorities when there was an air raid but on this occasion he received no warning at all and knew nothing about it until the enemy aircraft were over the town a similar verdict was returned in other cases the court eventually being adjourned till thursday when the remaining cases were taken at the close the jury proposed to add two riders as follows a the jury condemn in the strongest possible manner the negligence of the local and military authorities in not having made arrangements whereby the public could have been warned b the jury are agreed as to the necessity of removing from our midst all enemy aliens of both sexes and call upon the local authorities to do all they can to have them removed at once the coroner asked to whom the first rider should be sent remarking that it was no use blaming the local authorities at any rate as however many warning signals they might have had in the town they would have been of no use on the previous friday when no warning was received in the town till the aeroplanes were overhead the second rider was withdrawn the coroner observing that there was no evidence to connect any alien in the neighbourhood with that inquiry at the special meeting of the town council following the raid the aliens question was alluded to and it was proposed by councillor r forsyth and seconded by councillor w j king turner that a deputation should wait upon the home secretary and ask that in the interests of the town all aliens of enemy origin should be removed from the district and their businesses closed down it was moved however as an amendment by councillor c edward mumford that the home office be asked to strengthen the secret service in the town this being seconded by alderman e j bishop and carried by nine votes to seven councillor r g wood proposed a motion expressing the council's profound disappointment that the town and district were not efficiently defended from the german aerial attack and the hope that every effort would be made by the military authorities to give the town better protection this was seconded by councillor w j harrison and carried and on the following wednesday a deputation from folkestone and district had an interview with field marshal lord french commander-in-chief of the home forces on the subject of defence against attacks from the air lord french in reply said that such experience as they had showed that it was not possible absolutely to prevent attacks by aeroplane but that the scheme of defence had been very carefully considered in the past and had been reconsidered in the light of the experience gained in the recent raid even if it were not possible to prevent their coming he hoped that the measures which had been taken would make any future raid a very risky operation and would ensure heavy loss to the enemy following the raid special services were held at the various local churches chief amongst them being a very impressive and solemn memorial service at the parish church on saturday june the second at which the marquis camden lord lieutenant of kent was present as the representative of the king the mayor and corporation attended being accompanied by the borough member sir philip sassoon the recorder mr j c lewis coward and many representative men including nearly all the local free church ministers the archbishop of canterbury dr randall davidson gave an address and in addition to the vicar canon p f tyndall the former vicar canon erskine w knowles the rev l g gray vicar of christchurch canon c evelyn gardner vicar of holy trinity and the rev c h griffith vicar of st michael's assisted in the service eminently suited to the occasion was the address of the primate in the course of an inspiring oration he remarked quote, we are in yes in the great war we are absolutely persuaded of the rightness the inevitableness for men and women of honour of what we did nearly three years ago when duty and loyalty to truth compelled us to enter in it 
well of course we are not going to be simply flustered or frightened because in carrying our great cause through through to victory we are ourselves among those who personally suffer we in this corner of england on this kentish coast have the trust would it be exaggeration to say the solemn privilege of being the bit of england nearest to the enemy we are proud of our sons and brothers who held the foremost trench in action on the somme or in defence of ypres or were the first over the parapet some one or rather some set of people must be in the forefront so far as english soil is concerned the people to whom that special trust is given are we ourselves we living here in folkestone and dover and deal and ramsgate and canterbury we mean to be worthy of it and please god we will of course we want to secure every reasonable protection that we can for those in our homes who cannot be combatants but war brings peril involves peril and we are prepared to face the peril bravely and with quietness and thus by god's grace to give a wholesome lead to all who anywhere are apt to be nervous or excited or afraid all who forget the assurance given at patmos in a world of tempestuous strife he laid his right hand upon me saying fear not i am the first and the last i am he that liveth and was dead and behold i am alive for evermore amen and i have the keys of death and of hades End of quote. church and nonconformist pastors united in a service held in radnor park on sunday afternoon june the third there was a vast congregation numbering several thousand people an appropriate address was delivered by the rev j c carlyle in the days immediately following the raid the mayor received many messages of sympathy including telegrams from the king and queen a relief fund for the sufferers was opened and speedily assumed substantial proportions folkestone quickly settled down to its usual diurnal routine early in the morning after the raid there were workmen engaged on the task of reconstructing messrs stokes greengrocery emporium and the whole town carried on but there was a change in the local atmosphere Quote, comfort content delight the ages slow-bought gain they shrivelled in a night End quote. gone was our complacency gone was that feeling of security and immunity with which we had previously pursued the even tenor of our way the war had been brought home to us with fierce intensity there was no actual panic but the populace was braced up to a tension which it had not known before and it was only natural that there should be a desire that every reasonable precaution should be taken to prevent a repetition of the calamity with a view to bringing pressure to bear upon the government and the military authorities meetings were held at the hippodrome then existing in linden crescent local opinion was divided as to the desirability of this agitation but i simply record the fact and have no intention of entering here into a discussion of the pros and cons anyway before long more anti-aircraft guns and searchlights made their appearance in the neighbourhood some being stationed in cherry garden avenue whilst later a machine gun was mounted on the roof of avenue mansions earls avenue fresh arches were also installed at westernhanger moreover when later in the summer the sirens were sounded in the daytime the inhabitants were gladdened a few minutes after the signal by the spectacle of english fighting machines high up in the sky ready to give battle to any invaders it should be placed on record in reference to the question of defence against aerial attack that before the agitation in folkestone on the day after the raid in fact earl radnor himself called at the war office and obtained the assurance that more guns would be provided in the folkestone district as soon as they were available the question of installing the sirens alluded to received the attention of the local authorities without delay and it was decided that there should be electric sirens at the town hall and the head fire station in dover road 
and steam sirens at the public baths ford road and the electricity works at moor hall there was some divergence of view as to whether the alarm should be sounded during the day only or during the night as well some people held the opinion that if a raid occurred after most folk had retired to bed it would be better not to arouse them especially as in all probability they would be just as safe in bed as they would be anywhere else it was however strongly argued that the siren should be sounded at whatever hour of the day or night the authorities received a warning and finally that view prevailed the provision of dugouts or shelters was another subject which engaged the attention of the council and eventually refuges were specially constructed at the top of marshall street the rear of mead road the sand pit north of radnor park the basement of unfinished houses in cheriton road moor hall mr scrivener's coal stores under radnor bridge arch darlington arch the old lime kiln at killick's corner and a dugout in the chalk hill on the north side of dover hill at killick's corner the basement of the town hall the technical school sydney street schools the grammar school in cheriton road the store under mr reason's house there being a concrete floor and the new garage on the bale used at that time as a military guardroom it having a concrete roof were also open to the public after an alarm had been received the martello tunnel near the junction station was also used as a shelter the railway company running a train into it for the accommodation of those wishing to take cover there at the time there were no trains running to or from dover owing to the line having been wrecked by the landslip at the end of nineteen fifteen the shelter under the lees parade near the lift was also available as a refuge later in the year the very existence of these so-called shelters caused the authorities a good deal of anxiety when the air raids were in full blast the basement and police court at the town hall for instance were full night after night many people would wait near the town hall for the first note of the siren but even those who were not experts in such matters thought that the town hall like most other buildings used as shelters was not bomb-proof and that a direct hit on the building would result in a catastrophe involving terrible loss of life ultimately a military expert was consulted and his opinion was a sweeping condemnation of the shelters his view was that there was only one which was bomb-proof viz the dugout in the chalk hill at killick's corner the great raid on folkestone and the increasing frequency of raids on south-east england by aeroplanes had a serious effect upon the material prosperity of the town many residents who had no local business ties left the district for safer parts of the country as likewise did nearly every private school in the town there was also a decrease in the number of visitors everybody was by this time fully convinced that there was a war on still folkestone was never reduced to the straits experienced by the east coast resorts the raid of may the twenty fifth proved to be the only daylight raid on our town other parts of kent london essex and suffolk were attacked by hun aviators in the daytime during the summer but not folkestone and the inhabitants or the majority at any rate became less concerned as to the possibility of another daylight raid the moonlight raids did not commence till the end of the summer on one occasion on the morning of august the twenty second a great sensation was created in the town by the spectacle of an aerial battle three or four miles to the east of folkestone the germans were bombing dover and at one time there was a prospect that we should also be visited but the gunners on the hill were putting up a barrage and british airmen were engaging the invaders a thrilling sight was presented by the manoeuvres of thirty or more aeroplanes far up in the sky and the conflict was watched with keen interest if not with some feeling of apprehension by thousands of residents and visitors who eventually had the satisfaction of seeing the german aeroplanes wheel about and turn tail followed by their british antagonists the invaders had been driven off an official record states that twenty-one hostile aeroplanes passed over capel aerodrome on the day on which this raid occurred the funeral of councillor s w joseph who had been killed in the tramway smash at dover took place 
at the time the battle in the air was in progress the mayor of folkestone and a number of his colleagues were journeying to dover by motors to attend the last sad rites they almost ran into the raid and arrived at dover as the dead and wounded were being removed during the summer of nineteen seventeen a score or more of alarms were received but nothing eventful happened at folkestone as the summer waned however there were indications that the germans would rely more upon nocturnal visitations and the latter part of september found us in the full experience of the moonlight series there were periods when the sirens gave forth their shrill notes several nights in succession and sometimes twice in a night the warning was proclaimed by ten short blasts and the all clear by one long blast all traffic in the streets was stopped as soon as a warning was received and those who happened to be some distance from their homes sometimes found themselves obliged to undertake a long walk as already stated there were various so-called shelters but the authorities eventually appealed to the townspeople to remain in their homes some listened to and acted upon this sound advice but others did not and many children were taken to the refuges night after night with the result that on the following day they were so drowsy during school hours that they were unable to attend to their lessons fires and seats were provided at some of the shelters and in some cases refreshments happily folkestone was only bombed again once and then the missiles fell right outside the town this was on september the twenty fifth when the warning was sounded at seven eleven p m and the all clear at ten thirty p m during the period between those times there was a great deal of firing from the anti-aircraft batteries and between the shrieks of the shells heavier explosions were heard these proceeded from bombs which were dropped two on castle hill commonly known as caesar's camp and three in the grounds of the waterworks adjoining no real damage being done one fell into the reservoir killing some small fish on the following day mr james waite the secretary of the waterworks company took the precaution of having a sample of the water analysed but no trace of anything deleterious was found a few bombs were dropped at swingfield on this occasion but there were no casualties but if save for the instance just recorded we were not bombed there was liveliness enough and to spare the reports of the guns in addition to those stationed on land there were those on the patrol boats in the channel which put up a tremendous barrage calculated to command the respect of the bravest of the hun airmen the shriek of the shells the explosion of the same at the end of their journey through space the glare of the searchlights the very lights with sometimes the staccato of machine-gun fire combined to make the nights lurid enough in all conscience they were indeed nights of stress and tension the pale-faced moon looked bloody on the earth some of the anti-aircraft guns were brought into the heart of the town on motors and fired from the streets as opportunity offered the reason generally of all this commotion was that many of the gorters after discharging their cargo of bombs on london or some other place returned over folkestone apparently they picked up the main railway line and followed its course till they neared or reached folkestone when they turned out to sea where the lightships then stationed not far from the harbour helped them in shaping their course a hostile aircraft passed over the town on september twenty ninth thirtieth nineteen seventeen one believed to have been hit september the thirtieth one believed to have been hit october the nineteenth one or more zeppelins this was the occasion on which several zeppelins were blown or forced out of their proper course and came down in france october the thirty first to november the first one machine thought to have been winged was very low down so that it could clearly be seen december the sixth three hostile aircraft passed over to the north of the town from west to east between five a m and six fifteen a m december the eighteenth on the last named date several enemy machines returned via folkestone between eight p m and nine fifteen p m one gorter was hit in the petrol tank by the guns at westernhanger its commander decided to make a dash for the other side but found it impossible to cross the channel 
the machine came down into the sea about three miles from the harbour pier five white very lights and one green light being sent up in response to which signals h m a t highlander hastened to the rescue the crew of the aeroplane were three in number an oberleutnant and a first-class air mechanic were taken on board the trawler but the other man the pilot was entangled in the gear of the machine and died or was drowned the gorter itself was destroyed by a time-fused bomb this must have been ignited by one of the germans who had sent up signals of distress which exploded just as the crew of the trawler were preparing to bring it aboard the mate of the vessel mr frank william henry g aged forty seven was so seriously injured that he died on the following night the two prisoners were landed at folkestone harbour and on the following morning were sent to london under escort en route the oberleutnant told the corporal of the guard that it was his third journey over to england and that he came from belgium subsequently various articles which the crew of the highlander took into port were returned to one of the germans the original owner it being stated in the official correspondence on the subject that quote, the articles were not a free gift but given by one of the prisoners to the crew to propitiate them the prisoners imagining that they would be badly treated end quote. It should be added that the explosion by which the aeroplane was blown to pieces caused much speculation and some consternation in the town, coming as it did after the all-clear had been sounded. According to an official communication, reports from reliable sources indicated that the Gorter was hit by the guns at Westernhanger, but the gunners at Cherry Garden Avenue also claimed a hit. Coming to 1918, in this year twenty warnings were received the last being on august the twenty fourth at eleven thirty five p m enemy aircraft passed over the town on january the twenty ninth february the sixteenth one apparently hit february the seventeenth to eighteenth and may the nineteenth to twentieth whit sunday this being the last occasion on which enemy aeroplanes travelled over folkestone in the early part of nineteen eighteen the two guns which had been stationed at cherry garden avenue mounted on lorries were replaced by one heavier gun fixed in position on the ground the first time it was in action it scored a hit but before it fired its twentieth shot it was disabled owing to the recoil spring breaking according to the records of the fire brigade the number of air raid alarms received were nineteen fifteen one 1916 29 1917 52 1918 20 total 102 in many instances there were no local developments following the siren's warning note and the community would have been spared much unnecessary anxiety had no alarm been issued to the public as was the case prior to may the 25th 1917 in some cases there were raids on more or less distant parts of england but often there was no official report to tell us what if anything had happened and frequently it was some town on the french coast which was the objective of the huns on some occasions we in folkestone heard the anti-aircraft guns at dover and on the hills almost as soon as the shrill notes of the sirens had died away on others there would be utter silence for a couple of hours then one or more german aeroplanes would approach from inland on the return journey to belgium or northwestern france two alarms in one day were not a rare occurrence for instance on september the twenty ninth nineteen seventeen there was a raid alarm period from six five p m to six forty five p m and another from seven forty five p m to one a m sometimes we had to stay up nearly all night if we preferred not to retire till the all-clear was sounded for example on october the thirty first nineteen seventeen the alarm was sounded at ten forty p m and the all-clear did not go till three fifteen a m before long the truth of the old saying familiarity breeds contempt began to assert itself the inhabitants or many of them ceased to resort to dugouts and shelters even disdaining to descend to the basements of their houses if they were in bed they remained there being by this time convinced that they were as safe there as anywhere else 
throughout the air raid period the fire brigade held itself in special readiness to deal with any outbreaks of fire there being four posts viz the head fire station in dover road the west end substation adjoining the pleasure gardens theatre the public baths and moor hall substation end of the air raids by arthur j crowhurst from folkestone during the war edited by the rev j c carlyle Recording by Ruth Golding The Battle of Jutland by John Buchan This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Algie Pug the Battle of Jutland Preliminaries From the opening of the war, the British Navy had been sustained by the hope that some day and somewhere they would meet the German high sea fleet in a battle in the open sea. It had been their hope since the hot August day when the great battleships disappeared from the eyes of watchers on the English shores. It had comforted them in the long months of waiting amid the winds and snows of the northern seas. Since the beginning of the year 1916, this hope had become a confident belief. There was no special ground for it, except the general one that, as the case of Germany became more desperate, she would be forced to use every asset in the struggle. As the onslaught on Verdun grew more costly and fruitless, and as the armies of Russia began to stir with the approach of summer, it seemed that the hour for the gambler's throw might soon arrive. The long vigil was trying to the nerve and temper of every sailor, and in especial to the battle cruiser fleet, which represented the first line of British sea strength. It was a business of the battle cruisers to make periodical sweeps through the North Sea, and to be first upon the scene should the enemy appear. They were the advance guard, the corps de choc of the grand fleet. They were the hounds which must close with the quarry and hold it till the hunters of the battle fleet arrived. Hence the task of their commander was one of peculiar anxiety and strain. At any moment the chance might come, so he must be sleeplessly watchful. He would have to make sudden and grave decisions, for it was certain that the longed-for opportunity would have to be forced before it matured. To bring the enemy to action, risks must be run, and the strength of a fleet is a more brittle and less replaceable thing than the strength of an army. New levies can be called for on land, and tolerable infantry turned out in a few months. But it takes six years to make a junior naval officer, it takes two years to build a cruiser, and three years to replace a battleship. The German hope was, by attrition, or some happy accident, to wear down the superior British strength to an equality with their own. A rash act on the part of a British admiral might fulfil that hope. But, on the other hand, without boldness, even rashness, Britain could not get to grips with her evasive foe. So far, Sir David Beatty and the battle cruisers had not been fortunate. We must not regard the North Sea at the time as an area where only British and neutral flags were flown. From the shelter of the mine-strewn waters around Heligoland, the German warships made occasional excursions, for they could not rot for ever in harbour. Germany's battle cruisers had more than once raided the English coasts. Her battleships had made stately progresses in short circles in the vicinity of the Jutland and Schleswig shores. But so far, Sir David Beatty had been unlucky. At the Battle of the Bight of Heligoland on August the 28th, 1914, his great ships had encountered nothing more serious than enemy cruisers. At the time of the raid on Hartlepool in December of the same year, he had just failed, owing to fog, to intercept the raiders. In the Battle of the Dogger Bank on January the 24th, 1915, an accident to his flagship had prevented him destroying the whole German fleet of battle cruisers. It was clear that the German fleet, 
if caught in one of their hurried sorties, would not fight unless they had a very clear advantage. Hence, if the battle was to be joined at all, it looked as if the first stage, at all events, must be fought by Britain against long odds. On Tuesday afternoon, May the 30th, the bulk of the British Grand Fleet left its bases on one of its customary sweeps. It sailed in two divisions. To the north was a battle fleet under Sir John Jellicoe, the first, second, third, and fourth battle squadrons. One battle cruiser squadron, the third, under Rear Admiral the Honourable Horace Hood. The first cruiser squadron, under Rear Admiral Sir Robert Arbuthnot Bart. The second cruiser squadron, under Rear Admiral Heath. The fourth light cruiser squadron, under Commodore Le Mesurier, and the fourth, eleventh, and twelfth destroyer flotillas. Further south moved the battle cruiser fleet under Sir David Beatty, the first and second battle cruiser squadrons, the fifth battle squadron under Rear Admiral Evan Thomas, containing four ships of the Queen Elizabeth class, the first, second, and third light cruiser squadrons, and the first, ninth, tenth, and thirteenth destroyer flotillas. It will be noticed that the two divisions of the Grand Fleet were not sharply defined by battleships and battle cruisers, for Sir John Jellicoe had with him one squadron of battle cruisers, and Sir David Beatty had one squadron of the largest battleships. On the morning of the last day of May, the German high sea fleet also put to sea and sailed north a hundred miles or so from the Jutland coast. First, went Admiral von Hipper's battle cruisers, five in number, with their usual complement of cruisers and destroyers. Following them came the battle fleet under Admiral von Scheer. With a few exceptions, all the capital ships of the German navy were present in this expedition. What the purpose of von Scheer was, we can only guess. Warned of the British sailing, he may have hoped to engage and destroy a portion of the British fleet before the remainder came to its aid. He may have contemplated a raid upon some part of the British coast. He may have been escorting cruisers which were to make a dash for open sea and act as commerce destroyers. Or there may have been some far-reaching design associated with the sea war against Russia. It is idle to speculate on the precise reason which brought out von Scheer, but it seems probable that it was no mere practice cruise. German public opinion was beginning to demand some proof of naval activity since the submarine campaign had languished. It may be that von Scheer's enterprise was a gamble forced upon him by the state of popular feeling at home. The last week of May had been hot and bright on shore, with low winds and clear heavens, but on the North Sea there lay a light summer haze, and on the last day of May Loose grey clouds were beginning to overspread the sky. Sir David Beatty, having completed his sweep to the south, had turned north about midday to rejoin Sir John Jellicoe. The sea was dead calm, like a sheet of glass. His light cruiser squadrons formed a screen in front of him from east to west. At 2.20 p.m., Galatea, Commodore Alexander Sinclair, the flagship of the first light cruiser squadron signalled enemy vessels to the east. Sir David Beatty at once altered course to south-south-east, the direction of the Horn Reef, in order to get between the enemy and his base. Five minutes later, Galatea signalled again that the enemy was in force and no mere handful of light cruisers. At 2.35, the watchers on Lion saw a heavy pall of smoke to the eastward and the course was accordingly altered to that direction, and presently to the north-east. The first and third light cruiser squadrons spread in a screen before the battle cruisers. A seaplane was sent up from Engadine, once the Cunard liner Campania, at 3.08, and at 3.30 its first report was received, flying at a height of 900 feet, within two miles of hostile light cruisers, it was able to identify the enemy. Sir David Beatty promptly formed a line of battle, and a minute later came in sight of von Hipper's five battle cruisers. The first stage, 
3.48 p.m. to 5 p.m. Of all human contests, a naval battle makes the greatest demands upon the resolution and gallantry of the men and the skill and coolness of the commanders. In a land fight, the general may be thirty miles behind the line of battle, but the admiral is in the thick of it. He takes the same risk as the ordinary sailor, and, as often as not, his flagship leads the fleet. For three hundred years it had been the special pride of Britain that her ships were ready to meet any enemy at any time on any sea. If this proud boast were no longer hers, then her glory would indeed have departed. At three-thirty that afternoon, Sir David Beatty had to make a momentous decision. The enemy was clearly falling back upon his main battle fleet, and every mile the British admiral moved forward brought him nearer to an unequal combat. For the moment, the odds were in his favour, since he had six battle cruisers against von Hipper's five, as well as a fifth battle squadron, but presently the odds would be enormously against him. He was faced with the alternative of conducting a half-hearted running fight with von Hipper, to be broken off before the German battle fleet was reached, or of engaging closely and hanging on even after the junction with von Scheer had been made. In such a fight, the atmospheric conditions would compel him to close the range and so lose the advantage of his heavier guns. And his own battle cruisers were less stoutly protected than those of the enemy, which had the armour of a first class battleship. Sir David Beatty was never for a moment in doubt. He chose the course, which was not only heroic, but right on every ground of strategy. Naval battles are not won by playing for safety. Hawke pursued Conflans in the stormy dusk into Quiberon Bay, and Nelson, before the Battle of the Nile, risked in the darkness the shoals and reefs of an uncharted sea. Twice already, by a narrow margin, Beatty had missed bringing the German capital ships to action. He was resolved that now he would forego no chance which the fates might send. Von Hipper was steering east-south-east in the direction of his base. Beatty changed his course to conform, and the fleets were now some 23,000 yards apart. The second light cruiser squadron took station ahead with the destroyers of the 9th and 13th flotillas. Then came the first battle cruiser squadron, led by Lyon. Then the second, and then Evan Thomas with the fifth battle squadron. Beatty formed his ships on a line of bearing to clear the smoke. That is, each ship took station on a compass bearing from the flagship, of which they were diagonally astern. At 3.48 the action began, both sides opening fire at the same moment. The range was 18,500 yards. The direction was generally south-south-east. And both fleets were moving at full speed, an average, perhaps, of 25 knots. The wind was from the south-east, the visibility for the British was good, and the sun was behind them. They had ten capital ships to the German five. The omen seemed propitious for victory. In all battles there is a large element of sheer luck and naked caprice. In the first stage, when Beatty had the odds in his favour, he was destined to suffer his chief losses. A fortunate shot struck indefatigable, Captain Sowerby in a vital place, and she immediately blew up. The German gunnery, at the start, was uncommonly good. It was only later, when things went ill with them, that their shooting became wild. Meantime, the 5th Battle Squadron had come into action at a range of 20,000 yards and engaged the rear enemy ships. From 4.15 onward, for half an hour, the duel between the battle cruisers was intense and the enemy fire gradually grew less rapid as ours increased. At 4.18 the German battle cruiser, third in the line, was seen to be on fire. Presently Queen Mary, Captain Prowse, was hit and blew up. She had been at the Battle of the Bight of Heligoland. She was, perhaps, the best gunnery ship in the fleet, and her loss left Beatty with only four battle cruisers. Happily, she did not go down before her superb marksmanship had taken heavy toll of the enemy. The haze was now settling on the waters, and all that we could see of the foe was a blurred outline. The sea was full of submarines, 
but by singular good fortune the british ships passed through them without mishap meanwhile as the great vessels raced southward the lighter craft were fighting a battle of their own eight destroyers of the thirteenth flotilla nesta nomad nicator nabra pelican petard obdurate and nerissa together with moorsum and morris of the tenth and turbulent and termagant of the ninth moved out at four fifteen for a torpedo attack at the same time as the enemy destroyers came forward for the same purpose the british flotilla at once came into action at close quarters with fifteen destroyers and the light cruiser of the enemy and beat them back with the loss of two destroyers this combat had made some of them drop astern so a full torpedo attack was impossible nestor nomad and nicator under commander the hon e b s bingham fired two torpedoes at the german battle cruisers and were sorely battered themselves by the german secondary armament they clung to their task till the turning movement came which we shall presently record and the result of it was to bring them within close range of many enemy battleships both nestor and nomad were badly hit and only nicator regained the flotilla some of the others fired their torpedoes and apparently the rear german ship was struck the gallantry of these smaller craft cannot be overpraised that subsidiary battle fought under the canopy of the duel of the greater ships was one of the most heroic episodes of the action we have seen that the second light cruiser squadron was scouting ahead of the battle cruisers at four thirty eight southampton commodore goodenough reported the german battle fleet ahead instantly beatty recalled the destroyers and at four forty two von scheer was sighted to the south-east beatty put his helm to the starboard and swung round to a northerly course from the pursuer he had now become the pursued and his aim was to lead the combined enemy fleets towards sir john jellicoe the fifth battle squadron led by evan thomas in barham now hard at it with one hipper was ordered to follow suit meanwhile southampton and the second light cruiser squadron continued forward to observe and did not turn till within thirteen thousand yards of von scheer's battleships and under their fire at five o'clock beatty's battle cruisers were steering north fearless and the first destroyer flotilla leading the second and third light cruiser squadrons on his starboard bow and the second light cruiser squadron on his port quarter behind him came evan thomas attended by champion and the destroyers of the thirteenth flotilla the second stage five p m to six thirty p m it is not difficult to guess what was in the mind of von scheer and von hipper they had had the good fortune to destroy two of beatty's battle cruisers and now that their whole fleet was together they hoped to destroy more it seems clear that the weather conditions that afternoon made zeppelins useless and accordingly they knew nothing of jellicoe's presence in the north they believed they had caught beatty cruising on his own account and that the gods had delivered him into their hands from four forty five till six o'clock to the mind of the german admirals the battle revolved itself into a british flight and a german pursuit the case presented itself otherwise to sir david beatty who knew that the british battle fleet was some fifty miles off and that it was his business to coax the germans towards it he was fighting now against heavy odds eight capital ships as against at least nineteen but he had certain real advantages he had the speed of the enemy and this enabled him to overlap their line and to get his battle cruisers on their bow in the race southward he had driven his ships at full speed and consequently his squadron had been in two divisions for evan thomas's battleships had not the pace of the battle cruisers but when he headed north he reduced his pace and there was no longer a tactical division of forces the eight british ships were now one fighting unit it was beatty's intention to nurse his pursuers into the arms of jellicoe for this his superior speed gave him a vital weapon once the northerly course had been entered upon the enemy could not change direction except in a very gradual curve without exposing himself 
to enfilading fire from the British battle cruisers at the head of the line. He was, as the French say, a crochet, and, though in a sense he was a pursuer, and so had the initiative, yet, as a matter of fact, his movements were mainly controlled by Sir David Beatty's will. That the British Admiral should have seen and reckoned with this fact in the confusion of a battle against odds is not the least of the proofs of his sagacity and fortitude. Unfortunately, the weather changed for the worse. The British ships were silhouetted against a clear westerly sky, but the enemy was shrouded in mist, and only at rare intervals showed dim shapes through the gloom. The range was about 14,000 yards. In spite of the difficulties, the British gunnery was singularly effective. One German battle cruiser, perhaps the Lutzow, fell out of the line in a broken condition, and others of their ships showed signs of increasing distress. As before, the lesser craft played a gallant part. At 5.05, Onslow and Moresby, who had been helping Engadine with the seaplane, took station on the engaged bow of Lion, and the latter struck with the torpedo the sixth ship in the German line and set it on fire. She then passed south to clear the range of smoke and took station on the fifth battle squadron. At 5.33, Sir David Beatty's course was north-north-east, and he was gradually hauling round to the north-eastward. He knew that the battle fleet could not be far off, and he was leading the Germans on an easterly course, so that Jellicoe should be able to strike to the best advantage. At 5.50 on his port bow he sighted British cruisers, and six minutes later had a glimpse of the leading ships of the battle fleet five miles to the north. He at once changed course to east, and increased speed, bringing the range down to 12,000 yards. He was forcing the enemy to a course on which the British battle fleet might overwhelm them. We must now turn to the doings of the battle fleet itself. When Sir John Jellicoe was informed that the enemy had been sighted, he was distant from Beatty between fifty and sixty miles. He at once proceeded at full speed on a course south-east by south to join the battle cruisers. The engine rooms made heroic efforts, and the whole fleet maintained a speed in excess of the trial speeds of some of the older vessels. The commander-in-chief's own tribute deserves quotation. It must never be forgotten that the prelude to action is the work of the engine room department, and that during action the officers and men of that department perform their most important duties without the incentive which a knowledge of the course of the action gives to those on deck. The qualities of discipline and endurance are taxed to the utmost under these conditions, and they were, as always, most fully maintained throughout the operations now reviewed. Several ships attained speeds that had never before been reached, thus showing very clearly their high state of steaming efficiency. It was no easy task to effect a junction at the proper moment, since there was an inevitable difference in estimating the rendezvous by reckoning. Moreover, the hazy weather made it hard to recognise which ships were enemy and which were British when the moment of meeting came. The third battle cruiser squadron, under Rear Admiral Hood, led the battle fleet. At 5.30, Hood observed flashes of gunfire and heard the sound of guns to the south-westward. He sent Chester, Captain Lawson, to investigate, and at 5.45, this ship engaged three or four enemy light cruisers. For twenty minutes, the fight continued against heavy odds, and here occurred one of the most conspicuous instances of gallantry in the battle. Boy, first class, John Travis Cornwall was mortally wounded early in the fight, and all the crew of the gun, where he was stationed, lay dead or dying around him. He nevertheless remained alone at his post, awaiting orders and exposed to constant fire. He was only sixteen and a half, and he did not live to receive the reward of his courage. I recommend his case for special recognition, wrote Sir David Beatty, in justice to his memory and as an acknowledgement of the high example set by him. Chester rejoined the third battle cruiser squadron at 6.05. Hood was too far to the east, so he turned north-westward and five minutes later sighted Beatty. He received orders to take station ahead, 
and at six twenty he led the line bringing his squadron into action ahead in a most inspiring manner worthy of his great naval ancestors he was now only eight thousand yards from the enemy and under a desperate fire his flagship invincible was sunk and with it perished an admiral who in faithfulness and courage must rank with heroic figures of british naval history this was at the head of the british line meantime the first and second cruiser squadrons accompanying the battle fleet had also come into action defence and warrior had sunk an enemy light cruiser about six o'clock canterbury which was in company with the third battle cruiser squadron had engaged enemy light cruisers and destroyers which were attacking the destroyers shark acasta and christopher an engagement in which shark was sunk a survivor of shark has described the scene right ahead of us and close at hand we saw two columns of german destroyers we were racing along at the time and our skipper took us at full speed right towards the enemy lines there was a column of their small craft on each side of us and as soon as we got abreast of them we attacked at close range and managed to torpedo a couple of enemy destroyers one on each beam all the time we were getting it hot guns were popping at us from all quarters and we were firing back as hard as we could go as well as using our torpedo tubes of course a fight under these conditions could not last long for us we had been engaged about ten minutes when two torpedoes hit fairly one on each side of our ship and ripped three holes in her so that she sank almost at once at six sixteen the first cruiser squadron had got into a position between the german and british battle fleets since owing to the mist sir robert arbuthnot was not aware of the enemy's approach until he was in close proximity to them defence was sunk warrior passed to the rear disabled and black prince received damage which led later to her destruction meanwhile beatty's lighter craft had also been hotly engaged at 6.05 Onslow sighted an enemy light cruiser 6,000 yards off which was trying to attack a line with torpedoes, and at once closed and engaged at a range from 4,000 to 2,000 yards. She then closed the German battle cruisers, but after firing one torpedo she was struck amidships by a heavy shell. Undefeated she fired her remaining three torpedoes at the enemy battle fleet. She was then taken in tow by defender who was herself damaged and in spite of constant shelling the two gallant destroyers managed to retire in safety i consider the performances of these two destroyers wrote sir david beatty to be gallant in the extreme and i am recommending lieutenant commander j c toby of onslow and lieutenant commander l r palmer of defender for special recognition again the third light cruiser squadron under rear admiral napier which was well ahead of the enemy on Beatty's starboard bow, attacked with torpedoes at 6.25, Falmouth and Yarmouth especially distinguishing themselves. One German battle cruiser was observed to be hit and to fall out of the line. From a quarter to six to 6.50, while the two British fleets were coming into line, the situation was highly delicate and the fighting was necessarily intricate and confused. The position at 6.50 was shortly as follows. Beatty had turned toward the German van and his course from 6.50 onward was southeast, gradually moving towards south. The first and second battle cruiser squadrons led, then the third battle cruiser squadron, then followed the divisions of the battle fleet. First, the second battle squadron under Vice Admiral Sir Thomas Jerome, then the fourth, containing Sir John Jellicoe's flagship Iron Duke, and finally the first, under Vice Admiral Sir Cecil Burney. In the weather conditions, it was impossible to work the fleet by independent divisions, so the formation adopted was a single line. Evan Thomas's fifth battle squadron, which had up to now been with Beatty, intended to form a head of the battle fleet, but the nature of the deployment compelled it to form a stern. War Sprite had her steering gear damaged and drifted towards the enemy's line under a furious cannonade for a while she involuntarily interposed herself between warrior and the enemy's fire matters were presently put right but it is a curious proof of the caprice of fortune in a battle 
that while a single shot at the beginning of the action sunk indefatigable, this intense bombardment did war sprite little harm. Only one gun turret was hit, and her engines were uninjured. At 6.50, then, the two British fleets were united, the German line was headed off on the east, and Beatty and Jellicoe were working their way between the enemy and his home ports. The grandest sight I have ever seen, wrote an eyewitness, was the sight of our battle line, miles of it fading into mist, taking up their positions like clockwork, and then belching forth great sheets of fire and clouds of smoke. The enemy was now greatly outnumbered, and the skill of the British admirals had won a complete strategic success. But the fog was deepening, and the night was falling. It looked as if daylight might be wanting to give the British a chance of winning a decisive victory. The third stage, 6.50 p.m. to 9 p.m. The third stage of the battle, roughly two hours long, was an intermittent duel between the main fleets. Admiral von Scheer had no wish to linger, and he moved southward at his best speed with the British line shepherding him on the east. We have seen the nature of the British dispositions at this moment. The whole fleet now formed one fighting unit, but it will be clearer if we take the work of the battle cruisers and the battleships separately. Beatty had succeeded in crumpling up the head of the German line, and his battleships were now targets for the majority of his battle cruisers. The visibility was becoming greatly reduced. The mist no longer merely veiled the targets, but often shut them out altogether. This not only made gunnery extraordinarily difficult, but prevented the British from keeping proper contact with the enemy. At the same time, such light as there was, was more favourable to Beatty and Jellicoe than to von Scheer. The German ships showed up at intervals against the sunset, as did Craddock's cruisers off Coronel, and gave the British gunners their chance. Of the effects of the gunnery, an extract from an officer's letter gives some conception. One of our twelve-inch gunships put her salvos into a German ship so accurately that the enemy vessel heeled right over under the heavy blows. Of course, the German went out of action. If the twelve-inch gun could do this to a ship, how much more destructive must be the well-directed fire from fifteen-inch or thirteen-point-five-inch guns? It was the big calibre that told, and it was a gunner's battle. Our gunnery was better at all points than that of the enemy. From seven o'clock onward, Beatty was steering south and gradually bearing round to southwest and west in order to get into touch with the enemy. At 7.14 he sighted them at a range of 15,000 yards, two battle cruisers and two battleships of the Koenig class. The sun had now fallen behind the western clouds, and at 7.17 Beatty increased speed to 22 knots and re-engaged. The enemy showed signs of great distress, one ship being on fire and one dropping astern. The destroyers at the head of the line emitted volumes of smoke which covered the ships behind with a pall and enabled them at 7.45 to turn away and pass out of Beatty's sight. At 7.58 the first and third light cruiser squadrons were ordered to sweep westward and locate the head of the enemy's line, and at 8.20 Beatty altered course to west to support. He located three battle cruisers or battleships, and engaged them at 10,000 yards range. Lyon repeatedly hit the leading ship, which turned away in flames with a heavy list to port, while Princess Royal set fire to one battleship, and the third ship, under the attack of New Zealand and Indomitable, hauled out of the line heeling over and on fire. Once more the mist descended and enveloped the enemy, which passed out of sight to the west. Then came a great shock, which sent a quiver through every British ship as if a mine or a shoal had been struck. Some great enemy vessel had blown up somewhere in the mist to the westward. To return to the battle fleet, which had become engaged at 6.17 p.m. during deployment with battleships of the Kaiser class. It first took course southeast by east, but as it endeavoured to close, it bore round to westward. The aim of von Scheer now was escape and nothing but escape, and every device was used to screen his ships from British sight. Owing partly to the smoke-palls and the clouds emitted by the destroyers, 
but mainly to the mist, it was never possible to see more than four or five enemy ships at a time. Their ranges were roughly from 9,000 to 12,000 yards, and the action began with the British battle fleet on the enemy's bow. Under the British attack, the enemy constantly turned away, and this had the effect of bringing Jellicoe to a position of less advantage on the enemy's quarter. At the same time, it put the British fleet between von Scheer and his base. In the short periods, however, during which the Germans were visible, they received a heavy fire and were constantly hit. Some were observed to haul out of line, and at least one was seen to sink. The German return fire at this stage was feeble, and the damage caused to our battleships was trifling. Von Scheer relied for defence chiefly on torpedo attacks, which were favoured by the weather and a British position. A following fleet can make small use of torpedoes, as the enemy is moving away from it, while an enemy, on the other hand, has the advantage in this weapon since his targets are moving towards him. Many German torpedoes were fired, but the only battleship hit was Marlborough, which was happily able to remain in line and continue the action. The first battle squadron, under Sir Cecil Burney, came into action at 6.17, with the third German battle squadron at a range of 11,000 yards. But as the fight continued, the range decreased to 9,000 yards. This squadron received most of the enemy's returned fire, but it administered severe punishment. Take the case of Marlborough, Captain George P. Ross. At 6.17 she began by firing seven salvos at a ship of the Kaiser class. She then engaged a cruiser and a battleship. At 6.54 she was hit by a torpedo. At 7.03 she reopened the action, and at 7.12 fired 14 salvos at a ship of the Koenig class, hitting her repeatedly till she turned out of line. Colossus of the same squadron was hit, but only slightly damaged and several other ships were frequently straddled by the enemy's fire. The 4th Battle Squadron, in the centre, was engaged with ships of the Koenig and the Kaiser class, as well as with battle cruisers and light cruisers. Sir John Jellicoe's flagship Iron Duke engaged one of the Koenig class at 6.30 at a range of 12,000 yards, quickly straddled it and hit it repeatedly from the second salvo onwards till it turned away. The second battle squadron in the van under Sir Thomas Jerram was in action with German battleships from 6.30 to 7.20 and engaged also a damaged battle cruiser. In the van of the battle fleet, acting as a link between Jellicoe and Beatty, went Rear Admiral Heath's second cruiser squadron, which had now received Duke of Edinburgh from the first cruiser squadron. There also was the fourth light cruiser squadron under Commodore Le Mesurier, which attacked enemy destroyers at 7.20 p.m. and again at 8.18 in support of the 11th destroyer flotilla. In the second attack, it came under the fire of the enemy battle fleet at between 6,500 and 8,000 yards. Calliope, the flagship, was several times hit, but without serious damage. The light cruisers attacked the enemy with torpedoes and at 8.40 an explosion was observed on board a ship of the Kaiser class. In these actions, four enemy destroyers were sunk by our gunfire. By nine o'clock the enemy had completely disappeared and darkness was falling fast. He had been veering round to a westerly course, and the whole British fleet lay between him and his home ports. It was a strategic situation which, but for the fog and the coming of night, would have meant his complete destruction. Sir John Jellicoe had now to make a difficult decision. It was impossible for the British fleet to close in the darkness in a sea swarming with torpedo craft and submarines, and accordingly he was compelled to make dispositions for the night which would ensure the safety of his ships and provide for a renewal of the action at dawn. In his own words, I manoeuvred to remain between the enemy and his base, placing our flotillas in a position in which they would afford protection to the fleet from destroyer attack and at the same time be favourably situated for attacking the enemy's heavier ships. At the same time, Sir David Beatty, to the south and westward, had made the same decision on his own account. He informed Sir John Jellicoe of his position and the bearing of the enemy and turned to the course of the battle fleet. The Fourth Stage 
night of may the thirty first june the first the night battle was waged on the british side entirely by the lighter craft it will be remembered that beatty had with him the first second and third light cruiser squadrons and the first ninth tenth and thirteenth destroyer flotillas the first and third light cruiser squadrons were continuously in touch with the battle cruisers and usually ahead of them there they protected the head of the british line from torpedo attack the second light cruiser squadron was at the rear of the battle line and at nine p m it repelled a destroyer attack upon evan thomas's battleships at ten twenty southampton and dublin were in action with five enemy cruisers and lost many men during the fifteen minutes fight at half past eleven birmingham sighted several heavy ships steering south these were some of the enemy battleships slipping past the british stern in the fog and darkness in the rear of the line were also fearless and the first destroyer flotilla which during the night observed a battleship of the kaiser class utterly alone and steaming at full speed this solitary ship seems to have been attacked by destroyers further astern for presently from that direction came the noise of a heavy explosion the thirteenth flotilla under captain james ferry in champion was also astern of the battle fleet at half past twelve on the morning of first of june a large vessel crossed its rear opening a heavy fire as she passed on petard and turbulent at three thirty champion was engaged with four enemy destroyers and an hour before moresby had fired a torpedo with success at four ships of the deutschland class beatty's destroyers having been in action since four o'clock in the afternoon the principal attacks were made by the fourth eleventh and twelfth flotillas which accompanied jellicoe and which had had less continuous fighting castor commodore hawksley in the eleventh flotilla sank an enemy destroyer at point-blank range the twelfth flotilla captain ansel and j b sterling attacked a squadron of six large vessels including some of the kaiser class the third ship in the line was torpedoed and blew up and twenty minutes later the fourth ship in the line was also hit onslaught of this flotilla was severely damaged but sub-lieutenant chemis and midshipman arnott the only officers not disabled took the ship out of action and brought her safely home the heaviest fighting fell to the lot of the fourth flotilla under captain wintour two torpedoes were observed to take effect but tipperary was sunk with the greater part of its crew captain wintour was killed early in the action when lieutenant kemp took command two rafts were got away from the sinking vessel and a number of survivors from them were afterwards picked up but the young lieutenant went down with his ship the british destroyers of all the vessels engaged in the battle won perhaps the greatest glory they surpassed wrote sir john jellicoe the very highest expectations that i had formed of them an officer on one of the flotillas has described that uneasy darkness we couldn't tell what was happening every now and then out of the silence would come bang bang boom as hard as it could go for ten minutes on end the flash of the guns lit up the whole sky for miles and miles and the noise was far more penetrating than by day then you would see a great burst of flame from some poor devil as the searchlight switched on and off and then perfect silence once more the searchlights at times made the sea as white as marble on which the destroyers moved black wrote an eyewitness as cockroaches on a floor at earliest dawn on june the first the british fleet which was lying south and west of the horn reef turned northward to collect its light craft and to search for the enemy but the enemy was not to be found partly he had already slipped in single ships astern of our fleet during the night partly he was then engaged in moving homewards like a flight of wild duck that has been scattered by shot he was greatly helped by the weather which at dawn on june the first was thicker than the night before the visibility being less than four miles at four o'clock a zeppelin passed over the british fleet and no doubt by wireless single to any remaining german units where lay the safe passage all morning till eleven o'clock sir john jellicoe waited on the battlefield watching the lines of approach to german ports and attending the advent of the enemy but no enemy came 
I was reluctantly compelled to the conclusion, wrote Sir John, that the high sea fleet had returned into port. Till 1.15pm the British fleet swept the seas, picking up survivors from some of the lost destroyers. After that hour, waiting was useless, so the fleet sailed for its bases, which were reached next day, Friday the 2nd of June. There it fueled and replenished with ammunition, and at 9.30 that evening was ready for further action. Results The German fleet, being close to its bases, was able to publish at once its own version of the battle. A resounding success was a political necessity for Germany, and it is likely that she would have claimed a victory if any remnant of her fleets had reached harbour. As it was, she was overjoyed at having escaped annihilation, and the magnitude of her jubilation may be taken as the measure of her fears. It is of the nature of a naval action that it gives ample scope for fiction. There are no spectators. Victory and defeat are not followed, as in a land battle, by a gain or loss of ground. A well-disciplined country with a strict censorship can frame any tale it pleases, and stick to it for months without fear of detection at home. Therefore Germany claimed at once a decisive success. According to her press, the death blow had been given to Britain's command of the sea. The Kaiser soared into the realms of poetry. The gigantic fleet of Albion, ruler of the seas, which since Trafalgar for a hundred years has imposed on the whole world a bond of sea tyranny, and has surrounded itself with a nimbus of invincibleness, came into the field. That gigantic armada approached, and our fleet engaged it. The British fleet was beaten, the first great hammer blow was struck, and the nimbus of British world supremacy disappeared. Germany announced trivial losses. One old battleship, Pommern, three small cruisers, Wiesbaden, Elbing, and Frauenlob, and five destroyers. It is a striking tribute to the prestige of the British Navy that the German fairy tale was received with incredulity in all allied and in most neutral countries. In a small mountain village in the Apennines, the inhabitants of which, owing to economic difficulties, had small enthusiasm for the war, the news arrived that the British Navy had been beaten. That is a lie, was the unanimous decision of the village. Nothing on earth can defeat the British Navy. But false news, once it has started, may be dangerous, and in some quarters, in America, even among friends of the Allies, there was at first a disposition to accept the German version. The ordinary man is apt to judge of a battle, on land or sea, by the crude test of losses. The British Admiralty announced its losses at once with a candour which may have been undiplomatic, but which revealed a proud confidence in the invulnerability of the Navy and the steadfastness of the British people. These losses were one first-class battle cruiser, Queen Mary, two lesser battle cruisers, indefatigable and invincible, three armoured cruisers, Defence, Black Prince and Warrior, and eight destroyers, Tipperary, Ardent, Fortune, Shark, Sparrowhawk, Nestor, Nomad and Turbulent. More vital than the ships was the loss of many gallant men and officers, including some of the most distinguished of the younger admirals and captains. Even if Germany's version of her losses had been true, it is scarcely necessary to say that they were heavier than Britain's in proportion to her total strength at sea. But her version was not true. It was not half the truth. The port of Willemshaven was closed to the world that no man might verify the actual casualties. It is probable that Pommern, whose loss was admitted, was not the old Pommern of that name which was believed to have been sunk by Commander Max Horton in the previous July, but a new first-class battleship. It is not yet possible to estimate the total German losses, owing to the conditions of low visibility during the day battle, and the approach of darkness before the action was completed. Sir John Jellicoe, basing his calculations upon the results of careful inquiries, issued a list that, in his opinion, gave the minimum as to numbers. According to this list, Germany lost two battleships of the largest class, and one of the Deutschland class, one battle cruiser, five light cruisers, one of which may have been a battleship, six destroyers, and one submarine. These were certain and observed losses. In addition, one first-class battleship, 
one battle cruiser, and three destroyers were seen to be so severely hit that in all likelihood they went down before reaching harbour. It should further be remembered that many of the ships which escaped were so seriously damaged by gunfire and torpedo attack that they would not be available for many months. The German fleet returned to the Elbe bases, lacking some of its finest ships and with most of the remainder out of action. It is only the ignorant who imagine that the loss of a few ships could mean a weakening of British naval prestige. A fleet, if it is to be better than scrap iron, must be risked gallantly when occasion offers. The real test of success is the fulfilment of a strategic intention. What was Germany's aim? Her major purpose was to destroy the British command of the sea. In that she never came near succeeding. From the moment of von Scheer's return to port, the British fleet held the sea and is still holding it. The blockade which Germany thought to break was drawn tighter than ever. Her secondary aim was so to weaken the British fleet that it should be more nearly on an equality with her own. Again she completely failed, and the margin of British superiority was in no way impaired. Lastly she hoped to isolate and destroy a British division. That too failed. The British battle cruiser fleet is today a living and effective force, while the German battle cruiser fleet is only a shadow. The result of the battle of May the 31st was that Britain was more confirmed than ever in her mastery of the ocean. Its effect on the campaign at large was at once apparent. Russia was established in her control of the eastern Baltic, and Germany's grandiose scheme for aiding her eastern campaign by sea perished in the smoke of the Jutland battle. One word must be said upon British tactics and strategy. From a technical point of view, the battle appears as an example of a tactical division of a fleet undertaken in order to coax a laggard enemy to battle. Such a plan has, of course, its own risks, but without risks no admiral or general has ever won success. Criticism and discussion inevitably follow all naval actions, unless, as in the case of Nelson's three battles, they are so obviously conclusive that argument is futile. But if the Battle of Jutland had not the dramatic close of Trafalgar or the Nile, yet in a true sense it was decisive. It defeated, utterly defeated, the German plan. If it was not, as with two hours more daylight it would have been, a complete destruction of Germany's sea power, it was a complete demonstration of Britain's crushing superiority. So David Beatty faced great odds and great difficulties in the spirit of Hawke and Nelson. He once more showed wrote the commander-in-chief, his fine qualities of gallant leadership, firm determination, and correct strategical insight. He appreciated the situation at once on sighting his enemy's lighter forces, then his battle cruisers, and finally his battle fleet. I can fully sympathise with his feelings when the evening mist and failing light robbed the fleet of that complete victory for which he had manoeuvred, of which the vessels in company with him had striven so hard. It is a tradition of the British Admiralty that it praises sparingly, and only praises when the merit of an achievement is beyond question. The well-chosen words in which it approves Sir John Jellicoe's leadership are more impressive than the rhetoric of the chiefs of parvenu navies. The results of the action prove that the officers and men of the Grand Fleet have known both how to study the new problems with which they are confronted, and how to turn their knowledge to account. The expectations of the country were high, they have been well fulfilled. My lords desire to convey to you their full approval of your proceedings in this action. Not less conspicuous than the leadership was the amazing fighting quality of the British sailors. It was more than a century since Britain had had the opportunity of a first-class naval action, and it may confidently be said that not even at Trafalgar did the spirit of her seamen shine more brightly. The story of the fighting of a battleship like Marlborough, a cruiser like Southampton, and destroyers like Tipperary, Onslow and Defender will become part of our national epic. It is no case for the flowers of rhetoric. Such a spirit is best praised not in the literary epithets of the historian, but in the simple and heartfelt tribute of the man who guided it. The conduct of officers and men, wrote Sir John Jellicoe, throughout the day and night actions was entirely beyond praise. No words of mine can do them justice. 
On all sides it is reported to me that the glorious traditions of the past were most worthily upheld, whether in heavy ships, cruisers, light cruisers, or destroyers, the same admirable spirit prevailed. Officers and men were cool and determined, with a cheeriness that would have carried them through anything. The heroism of the wounded was the admiration of all. I cannot adequately express the pride with which the spirit of the fleet filled me. End of the Battle of Jutland by John Buchan Sixteen Months in Four German Prisons by Henry Charles Mahoney Edited by Frederick Talbot Chapters 8 and 9 from Prison 2, Senelager, The Black Hole of Germany This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 8 Badgering the British Heroes from Mon. It was about a fortnight after my arrival at Senelager. Our rest had been rudely disturbed about the usual hour of 2 a.m. by the sentry who came clattering into the barrack roaring excitedly, Domestre! Domestre! C., who after the departure of K., had been elected captain of our barrack, and who was also the official interpreter, answered the summons. He was required to accompany the guards to the station. A further batch of British prisoners had arrived. By this time we had grown accustomed to this kind of nocturnal disturbance, so after C had passed out the rest of the barrack resettled down to sleep. I was astir just after four o'clock. It was my turn to serve as barrack room orderly for the day, and I started in early to complete my task before five-thirty, so as to secure the opportunity to shave and wash before parade. I was outside the barrack when my attention was aroused by the sound of tramping feet. Looking down the road I was surprised to see a huge column of dust, and what appeared to be a never-ending crowd of soldiers, marching in column. It was such an unusual sight, we never having witnessed the arrival of more than a dozen prisoners at a time, that, especially the moment I descried the uniforms, my curiosity was aroused. Many of my comrades were astir and partly dressed when I gave a hail, so they hurried out to join me. The army, for such it seemed, advanced amidst clouds of dust. As they drew nearer, we identified those at the head as Belgian soldiers. They swung by without faltering. Behind them came a small army of French prisoners. We could not help noticing the comparatively small number of wounded among both the Belgians and the French, and although they were undoubtedly dejected at their unfortunate capture, they were, apparently, in fine fettle. But it was the men who formed the rear of this depressing cavalcade, and who also numbered several hundreds, which aroused our keenest interest and pity. From their khaki uniforms it was easy to determine their nationality. They were British military prisoners. It was a sad and pitiful procession, and it was with the greatest difficulty we could suppress our emotion. The tears welled to our eyes as we looked on in silent sympathy. We would have given those hardened warriors a rousing cheer, but we dared not. The guards would have resented such an outburst, which would have rendered the lot of the British, both civilian and military, a hundred times worse. The soldiers, battle-stained, blood-stained, weary of foot, body, and mind, walked more like mechanical toys than men in the prime of life. Their clothes were stained almost beyond recognition. Their faces were ragged with hair and smeared with dust. But though oppressed, tired, hungry, and thirsty, they were far from being cast down, although many could scarcely move one foot before the other. The most touching sight was the tenderness with which the unwounded and less injured assisted their weaker comrades. Some of the worst cases must have been suffering excruciating agony, but they bore their pain with the stoicism of a red Indian. The proportion of wounded was terrifying. Every man appeared to be carrying one scar or another. As they swung by us, they gave us a silent greeting which we returned, but there was far more significance in that mute conversation with eyes and slight movements of the hands than in volumes of words and frantic cheering. 
the brutal reception they had received from their captors was only too apparent those who were so terribly wounded as to be beyond helping themselves received neither stretcher nor ambulance they had to hobble limp and drag themselves along as best they could profiting by the helping hand extended by a comrade those who were absolutely unable to walk had to be carried by their chums and it was pathetic to observe the tender care solicitude and effort which were displayed so as to spare the luckless ones the slightest jolt or pain while being carried in uncomfortable positions and attitudes over the thickly dust-strewn and uneven road the fortitude of the badly battered was wonderful they forgot their sufferings and were even bandying jest and joke their cheeriness under the most terrible conditions was soul-moving no one can testify more truthfully to the taply cheeriness of the british soldier under the most adverse conditions than this little knot of civilian prisoners at senelager when brought face to face for the first time with the fearful toll of war the unhappy plight of our heroic fighting men as we watched them march towards what is called the field which was nearly a mile beyond our barracks provoked an immediate council of war among ourselves it was only too apparent that we must exert ourselves on their behalf unfortunately however we were not in a position to extend them pronounced assistance our captors saw to that but we divided up into small parties and succeeded in giving all the aid that was in our power the soldiers were accommodated in tents we had observed the raising of a canvas town upon the field and had been vaguely wondering for what it was required were german recruits coming to senelager to undergo their training or were we to be transferred from the barracks to tents at first we thought the latter the more probable but as we reflected upon the size of canvas town we concluded that provision was being made for something of far greater importance the belgian prisoners were sent into the stables these however were scrupulously clean and emptied of all the incidentals generally associated with such buildings because the civilian prisoners had been compelled to scour them out a few days before consequently the belgians had no room for protest against the character of their quarters except perhaps on the ground of being somewhat overcrowded a number of the french soldiers were also distributed among the stables but the surplus shared tents near their british comrades upon reaching the field the prisoners were paraded each man was subjected to a searching cross-examination and had to supply his name and particulars of the regiment to which he belonged all these details were carefully recorded in the preparation of this register the german inquisitors betrayed extraordinary anxiety to ascertain the disposition of the british troops and the regiments engaged in the battle line evidently they were in a state of complete ignorance upon this point nearly every soldier was requested to give the name of the place where he had been fighting wounded and captured but the british soldiers did not lose their presence of mind they saw through the object of these interrogations and their replies for the most part were extremely unsatisfactory the man either did not know could not recall or had forgotten where he had been fighting and was exceedingly hazy about what regiments were forming the british army in some instances however the desired data was forthcoming from those who were the most severely wounded the poor fellows in their misery failing to grasp the real significance of the interpolations it was easy to realize the extreme value of the details which were given in this manner because the germans chuckled chattered and cackled like a flock of magpies as may be supposed owing to the exacting nature of the search for information the registration of the prisoners occupied a considerable time later during the day of their arrival we civilian prisoners had the opportunity to fraternize with our fighting compatriots then we ascertained that they had been wounded and captured during the retreat from mons but they had been subjected to the most barbarous treatment conceivable they had received no skilled or any other attention upon the battlefield they had merely bound up one another's wounds as best they could with materials which happened to be at hand or had been forced to allow the wounds to remain open and exposed to the air bleeding and torn they had been bundled unceremoniously into a train herded like cattle and had been four days and nights travelling from the battlefield to senelager during these ninety-six hours they had tasted neither food nor water the train was absolutely deficient in any commissariat and the soldiers had not been permitted to satisfy their cravings even to the slightest degree and even if they were in the possession of the wherewithal by the purchase of food at stations at which the train had happened to stop 
what with the fatigue of battle and this prolonged enforced abstinence from the bare necessities of life it is not surprising that they reached sendelager in a precarious and pitiful condition among our heroes were five commissioned officers including a major these were accommodated at sendelager for about a fortnight but then they were sent away whither we never knew beyond the fact that they had been condemned to safer imprisonment in a fortress among the prisoners were also about two hundred men belonging to the r a m c taken in direct contravention of the generally accepted rules of war they were treated in precisely the same manner as the captured fighting men there were also a few non-commissioned officers who were permitted to retain their authority within certain limits one of the prisoners gave me a voluminous diary which he had kept and in which were chronicled the whole of his movements and impressions from the moment he landed in france until his capture including the battle of mons it was a remarkable human document and i placed it in safe keeping intending to get it out of the camp and to send it to my friend at home upon the first opportunity but ill luck dogged this enterprise the existence of the diary got to the ears of our wardens and i was compelled to surrender it the next morning the wounded received attention the medical attendant attached to the camp for the civilian prisoners dr asher was not placed in command of this duty although he extended assistance a german military surgeon was given the responsibility the medical arrangements provided by this official who became unduly inflated with the eminence of his position were of the most arbitrary character he attended the camp at certain hours and he adhered to his timetable in the most rigorous manner if you were not there to time no matter the nature of your injury you received no attention similarly if the number of patients lined up outside the diminutive hospital were in excess of those to whom he could give attention during the hours he had set forth he would turn the surplus away with the intimation that they could present themselves the next day at the same hour when perhaps he would be able to see them it did not matter to him how serious was the injury or the urgency for attention his hours were laid down and he would not stay a minute later for anything fortunately dr asher who resented this inflexible system would attend the most pressing cases upon his own initiative for which it is needless to say he received the most heartfelt thanks before the duty of examining the wounded soldiers commenced there was a breeze between dr asher and the military surgeon the former insisted that the patient should receive attention as they lined up first come to be first served and irrespective of nationality but the military doctor would have none of this his hatred of the british was so intense that he could not resist any opportunity to reveal his feelings i really think he would willingly have refused to attend to the british soldiers at all if his superior orders had not charged him with this duty so he did the next worst thing to harass our heroes he expressed his intention to attend first to the belgians then to the french and to the british last they could wait notwithstanding that their injuries were more severe and the patients more numerous than those of the other two allies put together this decision however was only in consonance with the general practice of the camp the british were always placed last in everything if the military surgeon thought that his arbitrary attitude would provoke protests and complaints among the british soldiers he was grievously mistaken because they accepted his decision without a murmur the queue outside the hospital was exceedingly lengthy the heat was intense and grew intolerable as the day advanced and the sun climbed higher into the heavens to aggravate matters a dust storm blew up the british wounded at the end of the line had a dreary long and agonizing wait half dead from fatigue hunger and racked with pain it is not surprising that many collapsed into the dust more particularly as they could not secure the slightest shelter or relief from the broiling sun as the hours wore on they dropped like flies to receive no attention whatever except from their less wounded comrades who strove might and main to render the plight of the worst afflicted as tolerable as the circumstances would permit dr asher toiled in the hospital like a trojan but the military doctor was not disposed to exert himself unduly to make matters worse this despicable disciple of Escalapius came out and notwithstanding the drifting and blowing sand ordered all the british prisoners to remove their bandages so that there might be no delay when the hospital was reached the men obeyed as best as they could but in many instances the bandages refused to release themselves from the wound the military doctor speedily solved this problem 
He caught hold of the untied end of the bandage and roughly tore it away. The wounded man winced, but not a sound came from his lips, although the wrench must have provoked a terrible throb of pain, and in some instances induced the injury to resume bleeding. Finding this brutal treatment incapable of drawing the anticipated protest, he relented with the later prisoners, submitting the refractory bandages to preliminary damping with water to coax the dressings free. With their bandages removed, the soldiers presented a ghastly sight. Their clothes were tattered and torn, blood-stained and mud-stained, while the raw wounds seemed to glare wickedly against the sun, air, and dust. It was pitiable to see the men striving to protect their injuries from the driving sand, in vain, because the sand penetrated everywhere. Consequently, the gaping wounds soon became clogged with dust, and it is not surprising that blood poisoning set in, gangrene supervening in many instances. Under these conditions, many injuries and wounds, which would have healed speedily under proper attention, and which would have left little or no permanent traces, developed into serious cases, some of which resisted all treatment, finally demanding amputations. The mutilation which ensued was terrible, and there is no doubt whatever that many a limb was lost, condemning the wounded man to be a cripple for life, just because he happened to be British, incurred the hostility of the military surgeon, and was intentionally neglected. Matters were aggravated by the military surgeon coming out of the hospital finally, after the men had been standing uncomplainingly for several hours in the baking heat, going a certain distance along the line, then brutally telling all those beyond that point that they could rebind up their wounds and come to see him the next morning. He had no time to attend to them that day, he remarked. I do not know how our wounded heroes from Mon would have got on had it not been for Dr. Asher, the RAMC prisoners, ourselves, and a British military doctor who happened to be among those captured on the battlefield. The latter was not discovered for some time because he refused to reveal his identity. Subsequently realizing the serious turn which matters were taking, and observing the intentional and systematic neglect which was being meted out to his unfortunate fellow countrymen, he buckled in and did wonderful work. Prince L. and K. also toiled incessantly in the attempt to ameliorate the plight of our wounded, Many of the soldiers were absolutely without funds, but these two civilians extended them the assistance so sorely needed out of their own pockets, purchasing foodstuffs from the canteen, which they distributed together with other articles which were in urgent request, with even liberality. The lack of funds hit our wounded exceedingly hard. Although they were on the sick list, they received no special treatment. They were in dire need of nourishing food suitable for invalids, but they never received it. They were compelled, in common with ourselves who were in tolerably good health, to subsist on milkless and sugarless acorn coffee, cabbage soup, and black bread, which cannot possibly be interpreted as an invalid body-restoring dietary. As a result of this insufficient feeding, the soldiers commenced to fall away. This systematic starvation, for it was nothing more or less, rendered the soldiers well-nigh desperate. In order to secure the money wherewith to supplement their meager and uninviting non-nutritious food with articles from the canteen, they were prepared to sell anything and everything which could be turned into a few pence. Khaki overcoats were freely sold for six shillings apiece. For sixpence you could buy a pair of puttees. Even buttons were torn off and sold for what they would fetch. One morning, on parade, a soldier whose face testified to the ravages of hunger tore off his cardigan jacket and offered it to any one for sixpence in order to buy bread. Little souvenirs which the soldiers had picked up on the battlefield, and which they treasured highly, hoping to take them home as mementos of their battles, were sold to any one who would buy. As a matter of fact, some of the soldiers were prepared to part with anything and everything in which they were standing in order to get food. While we fraternized with the soldiers at the very first opportunity to secure details of their experiences, which were freely given, and to learn items of news, the German guards interfered. We had been kept in complete ignorance of the progress of the war, and now we were learning too much for our captors. I may say that all we heard about the war was the occasional intelligence given when we were on parade. Major Bach would stroll up with German newspapers in his hands, and with fiendish delight would give us items of news which he thought would interest us. Needless to say, the fragments always referred to brilliant German victories, and he used to watch our faces with grim pleasure to ascertain the effect they produced upon us. At first we were somewhat impressed, especially when he told us that Paris had been captured. 
but when he related ten days later that it had fallen again and that london was in german hands we smiled in spite of ourselves because we had trapped him in his lying we were now separated from our soldier friends from whom we had gained a more reliable insight concerning the state of affairs the german guards also gave themselves away by relating that they were embittered against the british soldiers because they had fought like devils and had wrought terrible havoc among the ranks of the german army consequently the only opportunity which arose for conversation was during the evenings around the canteen even then we had to be extremely cautious if the guard saw one or two civilians associated with a group of tommies he would come up force us apart at the point of a bayonet and make us proceed different ways our practice was to mingle singly and discreetly with the soldiers and then upon return to barracks exchange nudes we had gleaned i may say it became an unwritten law of the camp that if a civilian took a soldier into the canteen and asked him any questions he was to reciprocate by treating the tommy to some little dainty which was obtainable if we asked nothing the soldier got nothing this latter attitude was not due to our resenting the idea of treating the soldier but because many of us were poor or empty in pocket ourselves although we did a considerable amount of forced labor we never received a penny for it i had a tilt at my guard one day over the payment of prisoners of war although i knew nothing about the international law upon the subject i made a venture do you know i asked that as prisoners of war we are entitled to sixty fenics sixpence a day for what work we do ya yeah, ya yeah, he grinned but it costs us ninety fenics a day to keep you after deducting the sixty fenics you still owe us thirty fenics a day the idea of being in germany's debt for our board and lodging was certainly humorous if any one asked me how much it cost the teutonic government in this direction i should consider a halfpenny a day a very liberal figure the efforts of the prisoners to supplement their meagre and monotonous official allowance of food by purchases at the canteen were handicapped by the avariciousness and unprecedented rascality of the unprincipled rogue who was in charge of this indispensable establishment when a soldier had secured a few pence say a shilling by the sale of this or that personal belonging and proffered the coin to the canteen proprietor this worthy would pick it up shrug his shoulders and disdainfully push the shilling back with the remark english money no good here i can get very little for it at this pronouncement the soldier's face would fall but dreading denial of a brochin of which he was in urgent need he would grow desperate he would push the coin across the counter again it must be worth something now how much will you give for it he would ask pleadingly with further demur elevation of eyebrows puckering of brows and hesitancy the canteen proprietor would complete a mental arithmetic sum in currency exchange at last he would reluctantly quote a figure and as a rule it was about fifty per cent below the face value of the coin thus the soldier's shilling would only be valued at sixpence in german money the soldier satisfied at being able to get a brochin even at such a sacrifice would submit but although the unwarranted depreciation was robbery it was not the worst feature of the methods of this greedy money-changer the soldier would receive not five english pennies or fifty german fenics as his change but a french half-franc then the next time he visited the canteen for another brochin or something else he would put down the half-franc he had previously received again the soldier received a rude surprise the canteen proprietor would reluctantly say that the french money was useless to him there would be a repetition of the previous bickering over the british shilling and at last the astonished soldier would learn that he could only change the french half-franc at a discount of forty per cent in this instance the change would be the equivalent of two pence in english money but it would be given in belgian coins upon the third occasion when the british soldier visited the canteen to buy a brutchen and proffered the belgian coinage he would learn that this had also undergone a sudden depreciation of fifty per cent so that by the time the soldier had expended his shilling he had really received goods to the value of about threepence it was a cunning method of conducting business and the canteen proprietor was a master in keeping the hated currency of the three nations in circulation among themselves and always exacting a heavy charge for its acceptance with such a novel means of wringing the changes upon soldiers of the three nationalities it is not surprising that the canteen proprietor waxed rich within a very short time such a state of affairs not only adversely affected the soldiers but the poor civilian prisoners as well at last things came to such a pass that one of our interpreters f k the fellow-prisoner whom i had met at vesel prison 
tackled the canteen proprietor upon his unfair method of conducting business and emphasized how harsh it was upon the prisoners who were not flush in funds for this attempt to improve our position f k had to pay the penalty the canteen proprietor promptly reported the interpreter to the commanding officer of the camp who forthwith sentenced our comrade to three days cells for daring to interfere with german organization the germans in their determined intention to prevent the british civilian and military prisoners from mingling adopted the most drastic measures guards were posted everywhere and we were sternly forbidden to enter the soldiers reservation if we were detected the guards were instructed to let drive with their rifles without giving any previous warning the anti-british sentiment was so acute that any one of our guards would have been only too delighted to have had the chance to put this order into effect and that upon the slightest pretext as he would have been upheld in his action we decided to give these amiable wardens no opportunity to turn us into targets there is no doubt that we were regarded as little less than desperadoes of the worst type our troops had given the germans such a severe shaking up as to throw our guards into a state of wild panic this was proved only too conclusively by an incident which occurred one night after we had retired we were not permitted to put our heads out of the windows to do so was to court a bullet also according to instructions on this particular night after we had turned in one of the prisoners unable to sleep owing to mental worry and the heat strolled to the door to get a breath of fresh air as he stepped out into the dusty footway a terrifying fusillage rang out and continued for several minutes we all sprang up wondering what was the matter the poor fellow had been spotted coming out of the door by the sentry who too excited to recognize the man had fired his rifle at the prisoner for all he was worth instantly the guard turned out the prisoner brought abruptly to his senses had darted back into the barrack safe and sound but fearfully scared only the wild shooting of the sentry had saved him from being riddled the guard itself upon turning out evidently thought that a rebellion had broken out or at least that a prisoner had escaped seizing their rifles they blazed away for dear life they did not aim at anything in particular but shot haphazardly at the stars haystacks and trees in the most frantic manner imaginable and so rapidly as their magazine arms would let them undoubtedly the germans were half mad with fear it rained bullets around the barracks and every man within crouched down on his bed away from the windows through which we momentarily expected the bullets to crash none of us dared to move for fear that there might be a collision with one or more of the missiles which pattered around us the next morning we were paraded hurriedly the guard ran about among us searching every corner of the barracks as if bereft the roll was called with wild excitement a prisoner had escaped had he not been seen by every imaginative member of the guard but when they discovered that we were all safe and sound and that we were perfectly composed they presented a sorry array of stalwart warders their sheepishness provoked us to laughter when we learned the true reason for all the bother but it brought home to us the extreme danger of falling foul of such a panicky mob the military reservation was fenced off from our quarters by barbed wire the rule ran that no prisoner on either side of the barrier was to advance within a meter's distance about one yard of the fence guards were on duty to see that this regulation was obeyed one day a british tommy in a moment of forgetfulness ventured within the forbidden distance within a flash the excited guard standing near by raised his rifle and jabbed fiercely at the soldier the bayonet got home in the luckless tommy's shoulder and passed clean through from front to back the ugly point of the bayonet protruding about three inches this incident and unwarranted savagery although born of nerves sickened and also roused those of us who had seen it seeing that the soldier was quite unarmed the sentry might have used the butt end of his weapon just as satisfactorily but no it was a swine of an englander who had infringed the rule and the bayonet was the instrument for correction to be plied with the utmost effect seeing the desperate condition of the british wounded and the inhuman manner in which they were treated one might naturally conclude that they would have died off like flies Senelager has the most evil reputation among the german prison camps for systematic brutality and unprecedented ferocity but to levy such an accusation is to bring an immediate german denial in reply they turn to the official reports and retort that conditions could not possibly be so terrible as they are painted otherwise the camp would be certain to reveal a high mortality on the other hand the death rate at senelager is strikingly low 
and the German official smiled contentedly while the press comforts itself smugly. The presentation of the low death rate is even likely to arouse doubt in the minds of the unsophisticated British at home. They are not versed in German cunning. Senelager camp carries a low death rate for the simple reason that a prisoner is not permitted to die there. When a man has been reduced to a hopeless condition and his demise appears imminent, he is hurriedly sent off to some other place, preferably a hospital, to die. By a slice of luck he might cheat death, in which event, upon his recovery, he is bundled off to another prison, but he seldom, if ever, comes back to Senelager. During my period of incarceration only one man, B., who was sent to Paderborn Hospital to die, as the Germans thought, but who recovered, returned to Senelager. When a man was hastened out of the camp in this manner, we never knew his fate. It became a byword that few men went from Senelager, but none returned. Consequently, whenever we saw a sick case leave the camp, we surmised that the poor wretch was making his final journey to the great beyond. We assumed his speedy death from natural causes, as the German authorities would relate, to be inevitable. CHAPTER Nine, THE PERSECUTION OF THE PRIESTS Although we British prisoners, both civilian and military, constituted the principal butt for the spleen of Major Bach, we never raised the slightest audible complaint or protest, although inwardly and in the seclusion of our barracks we chafed at the unrelenting tyranny to which we were exposed, and against which we were completely helpless. In strict accordance with the instructions of the Commandant, we were always the last to receive attention. If we ever had to go to the hospital to receive any treatment, and were the first to arrive at its doors, we had to kick our heels outside and possess ourselves in patience as best we could, until all the prisoners of other nationalities had seen the surgeon. As a rule, we had a lost journey. The surgeon, in his haste to get away, either would notify us that our cases could not receive inquiry until the morrow, or he would treat us in a perfunctory manner. As at the hospital, so at the cookhouse at mealtimes. We were never given our rations until all the others had been satisfied. The consequence was that we generally went short of food. The first to be treated received liberal quantities of the cabbage soup. What was left had to be eked out amongst us. The damned English swine can wait. This was the dictum of those in authority, and the underlings were only too eager to fulfill it to the letter. If there were the slightest opportunity to deprive us of our food— on the flimsy pretext that we had not answered the summons with sufficient alacrity, it was eagerly grasped. Under these conditions we had to go supperless to bed, unless we could procure something at the canteen, or our more fortunate comrades came to our assistance by sharing with us the comestibles they had purchased. Some ten days after the appearance of Major Bach, a new target for his savagery and venom appeared. This was a party of Belgian priests. I shall never forget their entrance to the camp. We were performing necessary daily duties outside our barracks when our attention was drawn to an approaching party surrounded by an abnormally imposing force of soldiers. Such a military display was decidedly unusual, and we naturally concluded that a prisoner of extreme significance, and possibly rank, had been secured and was to be interned at Senelager. When the procession drew nearer, and we saw that the prisoners were priests, our curiosity gave way to feelings of intense disgust. They were twenty-two in number, and were garbed just as they had been torn from prayer by the ruthless soldiers. Some were venerable men bordering on seventy. Subsequently I discovered that the youngest among them was fifty-four years of age, but the average between sixty and seventy. The reverend fathers with clasped hands moved precisely as if they were conducting some religious ceremonial among their flocks in their beloved churches, but the pace was too funereal for the advocates of the goose-step. They hustled the priests into quicker movement, not in the rough manner usually practiced with us, but by clubbing the unfortunate religionists across the shoulders with the stalks of their rifles, lowering their bayonets to them and giving vent to blood-freezing curses, fierce oaths, coarse jests, and rewarding the desperate endeavors of the priests to fulfill the desires of their captors with mocking laughter and ribaldry. The brutal manner in which they were driven into the camp as if they were sheep going to the slaughter made our blood boil. More than one of us clenched our fists and made a half-movement forward as if to interfere, but we could do nothing, and so had to control our furious indignation. However, the moment the priests entered Senelager, we received a respite. Officers and guards turned their savagery and spite from us to visit it upon these unhappy victims by night and by day 
and at every trick and turn. Clubbing with the rifle was the most popular means of compelling them to obey this or to do that. More than once I have seen one of the aged religionists fall to the ground beneath a rifle blow which struck him across the back. No indignity conceivable, besides a great many indescribable, was spared these venerable men, and they bowed to their revolting treatment with a meekness which seemed strangely out of place. After one more than usual ferocious manifestation of attack, I questioned our guard to ascertain the reason for this unprecedented treatment, and why the priests had been especially singled out for such infamous ferocity. Ah! he hissed, with a violent expectoration. They fired upon our brave comrades in Belgium. They rang the bells of their churches to summon the women to the windows to fire upon our brothers as they passed. The dogs! We'll show them. We'll break them before we have finished. They won't want to murder our brave troops again. The words were jerked out with such a fearful fury that I refrained from pursuing the subject. Later I had a chat with one of the oldest priests. It was only with difficulty we could understand one another, but it was easy to discover that the charges were absolutely unfounded, and were merely the imagination of the distorted and savage Prussian mind, when slipped from the leash to loot, assault, and kill for the first time in his life. A night or two later a few of us were purchasing food at the canteen. Suddenly four soldiers came tumbling in, dragging with them one of the most aged of the fathers. He must have been on the verge of threescore and ten, and with his long white beard he presented an impressive, proud, and stately figure. But the inflamed Prussian has no respect for age. The old man was bludgeoned against the counter, and at his abortive attempts to protect himself the soldiers jeered and laughed boisterously. One of the soldiers called for a suit of clothes which was served out to prisoners, and for which we were supposed to pay six marks, six shillings. The leader of the party of soldiers grabbed the suit and, pushing the priest roughly, shouted, Here, you can't work in the fields with that garb you are wearing. You've got to buy these. Six marks. Hurry up. You've got to put them on. The priest, who did not understand a word of German, naturally failed to grasp the meaning of the command. He promptly received a clout to knock some sense into him, the soldier meanwhile shaking the prison-like suit to emphasize what he meant. In mute protest the priest shook his robes to indicate that he was quite content with what he was wearing. "'Come on. If you don't change, we'll do it for you.' At this threat there was a wild outburst of demoniacal mirth, in which the girl behind the counter, a brazen jade, joined uproariously, as if in anticipation of some unusual amusement. She reached over the counter, craning her neck to secure a better view of an unexpected spectacle. As the Reverend Father did not respond to the command, the guard gathered round him. Before we could realize what was happening, his crucifix and rosary had been roughly torn off, and with his watch and chain had been thrown upon a table standing alongside. His robe was roughly whisked away in the twinkling of an eye. But the prisoner did not move or raise a hand in protest, even when he was bared to his underclothing in front of Fräulein, who signaled her appreciation of the sight by wildly clapping her hands, laughing merrily, and giving expression to ribald jokes. The proud manner in which the victim surveyed his tormentors only exasperated them still further. By the threat of the bayonet he was compelled to stand up in front of these degenerate members of the human race, and the girl behind the counter, whose laughter could now be heard ringing above the frantic shrieks of the soldiers. We, who were unwilling witnesses of this revolting spectacle, were grinding our teeth in ill-suppressed rage. Never during my sojourn in Senelager, even when submitted to the greatest torment, have I seen the British prisoners roused to such a pitch of fury. As a rule, we effectively maintained a quiet, if not indifferent, and tractable attitude, but this was more than flesh and blood could stand. But the priest never relaxed his proud composure and self-possession. He looked so penetratingly at the laughing jade that I think it must have penetrated to her very soul. Her wild mirth ended abruptly in a strange semi-hysterical shriek, as her eyes met his look of intense scorn. She winced and was effectively cowed into silence. I may say that the floor of the canteen was of concrete, but upon this was a layer of mud, slime, grease, and other filth brought in from outside upon the boots of those who frequented the establishment. This was now a noisome, muddy carpet, some two inches in thickness. The Germans, one may happen to recollect, have ever paraded their love of cleanliness before the world, but this floor was the lie direct to their vain boastings. At the sight of the old man standing there erect before them, the victim of unparalleled humiliation, 
but his spirit as strong and as unyielding as ever, the fury of the soldiers knew no bounds. One, giving full vent to a fearful curse, placed his hand upon the table upon which the crucifix, rosary, and watch were lying. He gave a swift, fiendish glance at the priest, towering above him, and with a vile oath swept the articles to the floor, where they ploughed through the greasy, revolting slime. It was then that the badgered and baited father broke down. As he watched his beloved and revered crucifix and rosary suffering defilement and serving as the rude sport for the iron heels of the uncivilized Huns, the tears coursed down his face copiously. He gave a slight start as he saw the articles flash through the air, but suppressed the cry of horror which sprang inadvertently from his lips. But the soldiers were not yet satisfied with the agony which they had created in the father's heart. One grabbed his rifle and, lowering the bayonet in a threatening manner, ordered the priest to pick up his sacred treasures. The priest stooped down to obey the instructions, but this was not sufficient for his persecutors. He was driven to his knees and forced to grope among the repulsive mud for his revered religious tokens. With great difficulty he recovered them, battered, crushed, and covered with the filthy accumulation upon the floor. As the reverend father drew himself once more to his full height, clasping his treasures desperately, he brought his hands together, and closing his eyes, we saw his lips moving in prayer. This was the last straw. Grating our teeth, our faces white with passion, and our fingers itching to seize those barbarians round their throats to choke their lives out of them, we nearly threw discretion to the winds. Had one of us made a forward movement, we should have sprung upon them with the ferocity of bulldogs. Those four soldiers never knew how near they were to meeting their deserts upon that day. As it was, we merely scraped our feet in impotent rage. It was this fidgeting which aroused their attention. They turned and must have read our innermost intentions written on our faces, for instantly they grabbed their rifles and rounded upon us. With a motion which could not be misunderstood, and uttering fierce curses, they ordered us to get outside. We refused to move, although confronted by ugly pointed bayonets. It was a tense and critical moment. The soldiers undoubtedly saw that we were now thoroughly roused, and, strange to say, they appeared to lose their heads, for they stood stock still, apparently frightened by our determined appearance. One of our party, although as enraged as any of us, yet had maintained more complete control over his feelings. He saw the utter uselessness of our making a display of physical protest. With a quiet, "'Come on, boys,' he stepped towards the door. It saved an ugly situation. The movement to the door and the crisis had passed. Fiercely glaring at the soldiers, with our jaws ominously set and our fists clenched, we retreated. Our action revived the courage of the guards. They at once sprang forward to jostle us out, prodding and attempting to club us right and left. As we hurried through the open door, we gave a final glance at the priest. He had turned his head and was looking steadily at us, and if ever conversation were carried out by looks, there were volumes in his gaze. His eyes told us how impotent we were in the hands of these brutes who were brave because they had their loaded rifles. They told us of his appreciation of our sympathy in his hour of humiliation and torment. They extended us heartfelt thanks for our willingness to come to his assistance, combined with a mute instruction not to lift a finger on his behalf, since the plight of one and all would become infinitely worse. We passed into the street, and the door was slammed upon us. Once outside, we allowed our feelings to have full reign. We point-blank refused to go away, and fell to discussing the situation somewhat fiercely. Evidently, the tones of our voices persuaded the soldiers within that they had gone far enough, because shortly afterwards the priest reappeared, and under escort was hurried away to his quarters. When we next saw him, we endeavored by diplomatic questions to ascertain the reasons why he had been subjected to such torture and indignity. To him the greatest humiliation was that his torment had occurred before a woman, but otherwise he refused to refer to the episode. His retort, in a placid and resigned voice, was, I only trust that God will have mercy upon them. The priests were denied all opportunity to move about the camp. There were scores of co-religionists among us, but they were steadfastly refused the comfort which the fathers could have given them. The priests were not permitted to minister to the spiritual welfare of their flocks. As a matter of fact, by the strict instruction of Major Bach, no religious services of any description were permitted in the camp, at least not while I was under his sway. To the members of the Roman Catholic persuasion, the browbeating, badgering, baiting, and buffeting of the helpless priests acted as a red rag to a bull. But what could they do? Protest was merely so much wasted energy. Communication with anyone outside the camp was absolutely impossible. 
to have reviled major bach for his cruelty and carefully planned barbarity would only have brought down upon us further and more terrible punishment of such ferocity as would have made every one long for the respite of the grave but the priests could not be broken no matter to what physical and mental sufferings they were subjected even major bach discovered to his chagrin that his devilish ingenuity had encountered an insuperable obstacle to wreck his revenge he now compelled the fathers to carry out all the dirtiest and most revolting work in the camp duties so repulsive as to be beyond description but the good men never murmured they did exactly as they were bidden and even the guards at last appeared to realize the fact that their fertility in torment was of no avail in attempting to infuriate their meek charges major bach however was by no means cast down at his failures one morning he ordered the twenty-two priests to be paraded they were then loaded up with a variety of cumbersome and heavy implements spades picks shovels and such like each load would have taxed the strength of a young man in the pink of condition and strength to carry and yet here were old men raging between sixty and seventy years compelled to shoulder such burdens but they did it an order was rapped out the guard wheeled and the tiny party moved off we discovered afterwards that they were marched three miles along the sandy road in the blazing sun to a point where they were roughly bidden to dig a huge pit throughout the morning and without a moment's respite they were forced to ply their tools their taskmasters standing over them and smartly prodding and threatening them with their rifles if they showed signs of falling from fatigue or if they failed to maintain the expected rate of progress to such old men who probably had never lifted the smallest and lightest tool for many years if ever it was a back-breaking task however they clung dutifully to their work until the hour of twelve rang out now they were remarshalled their tools were reshouldered and they were marched back to camp for the midday meal by the time they reached the barracks all the other prisoners had consumed the whole of the available soup there was nothing for the priests it was explained that they should have hurried so as to have arrived at an earlier moment then they would have received their due proportion meals could not be kept waiting for dawdlers was the brutal explanation of the authorities the priests must be made to realize the circumstance that they were not staying at a hotel this by the way was a favorite joke among our wardens the priests bore visible signs of their six miles tramp through crumbling scorching sand and under a pitiless sun as well as of their laborious toil excavating the large pit but their distressed appearance did not arouse the slightest feeling of pity among their tormentors being too late for the meal they were relined up and under a changed guard were marched back again to the scene of their morning's labor naturally upon reaching the pit they concluded that they would have to continue the excavation but to their intense astonishment the officer in charge ordered them to throw all the excavated soil back again into the hole this was one of the most glaring examples of performing a useless task merely to satisfy feelings of savagery and revenge that i encountered in senelager although it was typical of major bach and his methods he took a strange delight in devising such senseless labors doubtless the authorities anticipated that the priests would make some demur at being compelled to undo work which they had done previously with so much effort and pain but if this was the thought governing the whole incident the officials were doomed to suffer bitter disappointment the priests whatever they may have thought silently accepted the inevitable and displayed as much diligence in filling the pit as they had shown a few hours before in digging it still the afternoon's shoveling caused them greater physical hardship than the plying of the pick in the morning they had been denied a midday meal and their age enfeebled physique proved barely equal to the toil a basin of black acorn coffee and a small fragment of hard brown bread cannot by any manner of means be construed into strong sustenance for such a full day's work during the afternoon one or two were on the verge of collapse from hunger and fatigue but their indomitable spirit kept them up and the pit was duly filled by the time the labor had been completed the evening was advancing for the fourth time that day they shouldered their burden of tools and set out on the three miles tramp to camp we saw them come in and our hearts went out in pity to them they tottered rather than walked their heads bowed as if in prayer and their crosses of tools sinking them nearer to the ground seeing that they had walked twelve miles and had put in some eight hours of grueling work it was a marvel that the older members of the party had not fallen by the wayside yet although footsore weary worn and hungry they retained their characteristic composure in silence they discussed their frugal evening meal of lukewarm black acorn coffee and black bread some of us out of sheer sympathy secured some brotchen for them 
but they accepted our expressions of fellow feelings very sparingly although with extreme thankfulness they refused to say a word about their sufferings or the agonies they had experienced during their labor and long walk i got the story from one of the guards who had accompanied them but even these thick-skinned disciples of culture and brutality were not disposed to be communicative the stoicism grim determination and placidity of the reverend fathers constituted something which their square heads and addled brains failed to understand they had never experienced the like while major bach never repeated the senseless pit-digging and refilling program for the priests his invention was by no means exhausted direct incentive to rebellion proving comparatively abortive he now resorted to indirect pettifogging and pin-pricking tactics harassing the unfortunate priests at every turn depriving them of food or something else reducing their rations giving them the most repulsive work he could discover and so forth but it was all to no purpose those twenty-two priests beat him at every turn for major bach to try to break their proud spirit was like asking a baby to bend a bar of steel what ultimately became of these prisoners i cannot say in fact i do not think there is any one who can definitely relate their fate other prisoners now commenced to arrive in increasing numbers and the breaking in of these crowds to the tyranny and brutal existence of Sinologer camp appeared to demand the complete attention of the authorities certainly the new arrivals provided major bach with all the entertainment he desired some say that the priests were distributed among other camps others that one or two succumbed to the persistent ill-treatment meted out to them and still more that they are yet at Sinologer. no one can say precisely only one fact remains for a time they occupied the sole attention of every one in the camp because they constituted the most prominent target for the fiendish devilry of major bach then they suddenly appeared to slip into oblivion the probability is that they were swallowed up among the hundreds of french british russians poles serbians and various other races who were now pouring in being somewhat retiring in their nature the probability is that the priests were overlooked and forgotten in that troublous maelstrom of outraged humanity known far and wide as Senelager Camp. End of chapters 8 and 9 of Sixteen Months in Four German Prisons by Henry Charles Mahoney Read for LibriVox by Marianne Spiegel